welcome to the Bahrain International Circuit for race four, season eight of the FIA World Endurance Championship. We're ready for racing to begin in the BAPCO eight hours of Bahrain. The last race in this calendar year of season eight and the last World Endurance Championship race of this decade. Next time we convene, we will be in the United States of America and we'll be in 2020. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to our coverage of the Bahrain Eight Hours. Weather set fair for the day after some rain during the week and a lot of rain forecast for tomorrow. Today's race, which starts in daylight, but rapidly descends into night, should be nice and warm and dry. Down on the grid, Louise Beckett and Alan McNish. And alongside me in the commentary booth is Graham Goodwin. We'll be talking you through the runners and riders and the pitfalls potentially of this longest race of the season so far. Points and a half are up for grabs here or in the Arabian Gulf. And this will be the midway point of the season. After four hours in Silverstone in Shanghai, six in Fuji, this track and the race duration pre presents another whole different set of challenges for the drivers, for the cars, and for the engineers. And the super abrasive coarse nature of the track here will also have its part to play. From here we head to the Circuit of the Americas in February, then to Sebring in March, and then to the traditional warm-up for the Le Mans 24 hours, Spa-Francorchamps, before the season finale in Le Mans. With the great and the good out on the grid amongst the teams, McLaren shareholders, uh, McLaren director is here as well. Zach Brown in his capacity as the boss of United Autosports. And the Bahrain circuit, 5.4 kilometers. Very, very tough on tires and brakes. Those hairpins after long straights mean a big braking effort and slow speed acceleration, which also has the potential to really destroy tires. So tire life and brake life are going to be absolutely critical. 2017, 199 laps. This is a relatively green flag race. There are great sight lines, lots of runoff areas, so safety cars and yellow flags, he says, are famously relatively few here. Last time out, 2017, Toyota won in LMP1, uh, Rebellion won in LMP2, where they were then racing. The 71A, of course, the Ferrari won GTE Pro, and the 98 Aston Martin, which lineup remains only Paul Dallalana in that car, they were the GTE AM winners. Uh, race records set by Lucas Degrassi, Alex Brundle in LMP2, Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the Ferrari, and Miguel Molina in the AM class. And Miguel is now in the Pro class Ferrari in place of the winner here last time out, Sam Bird. So uh, some very familiar faces, many of whom return. Lucas Degrassi, Alex Brundle racing in other quarters. Well, there is the fabulous trophy which reflects the big building in the center of the circuit here, the race control tower. And here, Gerard Neveu, the uh, CEO of the company that runs the World Endurance Championship, Pierre Fionner, who is the president of the Automobile Club de l'Ouest, the uh, group that governs the Le Mans and Le Mans series rules across the globe. And everybody with just 25 minutes before the start of the season of the uh, last race of the uh, year. Jean-Marc Fino from the uh, Peugeot Sport Group. Peugeot announcing that they will come in in the Le Mans, Pro uh, the Le Mans Hypercars category, teamed with Rebellion, yeah. with the chassis very rightly designed by Orica. So that is another new announcement for Hypercar. Toyota have already announced their commitment to that. You just saw Jean-Eric Van, double Formula E champion, who is here with the G-Drive crew in LMP2. They are here for the first time this season. They will also race, we believe, in Spa as a warm-up to the Spa, the Le Mans 24 hours. Uh, 98 Aston Martin winners last time out in the GTE AM class, but Paul Dallalana joined this time by Darren Turner and Ross Gunn. So that has been the lineup for this season. A different looking lineup at the front of the AM class. 98 Aston Martin didn't claim pole position. They struggled a little bit in qualifying to find the pace they wanted. But qualifying in the race are going to be very different. Kells are fish indeed. Graham Goodwin, lots of dis different strategies possible because 
This doesn't divide up very neatly either for GT or for prototypes, and nobody's got enough tyres to be able to keep throwing new tyres at their car when they desperately really want to. Uh, absolutely. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Lovely weather at the moment here, as Martin Avon says. But lots of factors here, not least, of course, what to this point is a unique race distance for the WC race teams. Tyres are a major factor, so are those things, the brakes. And we've seen some, uh, some, some real dramas in practice and qualifying so far with brakes. Jake Salman, Adelifa, the chief executive, and a very popular figure here at the Bar International Circuits. Uh, the pipe band at the front of the grid for what is the weekend uh, leading up to National Day here in Bahrain and huge celebrations around the kingdom uh, through this weekend. Big crowds, all sorts of things around, yeah. and major traffic for that matter. And uh, I know we're expecting a fair number of people around uh, the circuits through this race weekend. 83 Ferrari here, third place in the GTE AM field after qualifying. And uh, Richard Dean, Zach Brown, Zach Brown on the left, chief executive of the McLaren, but also the boss of United Autosports. He is the uh, titular head, Richard Dean there on the left, former racing driver. Uh, he's very much the man who is the daily operating officer and a very familiar figure from Le Mans for many years, the former head of Audi Sport, Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, now part of the steering uh, group in the uh, ACO, who look after uh, the rules of Le Mans and these championships. New lineup again in the 88 Dempsey Proton car. Tom Prining is the consistent factor there, the Porsche Junior driver, Adrian Delina back on board. And uh, Kamadal Kubesi joins the, with the Abu Dhabi Racing uh, banners on the 88 car. And Khaled, uh, very experienced GT racer and uh, a great opportunity to race in the Gulf States for him. Uh, absolutely, and uh, great to see him back. The only ever race winner in WC history thus far for the Gulf region and delighted to be back after having uh, looked over his daughter's car karting careers and uh, budding karting careers at that doing extremely well both of them there's an overall view of the park if you like 57 is the pole sitting car in GTM team project one Ben Keating Larry Tenford and he just enjoys pole position yeah Martin Haven and Jerome Bleeker more than a 57 car yeah Ben Keating doing a great job he had several spins in free practice and he said afterwards that going out on low fuel and fresh tires for the very first time was quite disorientating car felt very very different wasn't sure how far he could push it Larry Tenford has set the bar high for him gave him nearly a second advantage over the second fast his car and Ben managed to knock it out of the park a really strong qualifying lap so it is the 57 team project one car that starts on pole position that's the GTE AM field as part of our endurance racing open door policy driver's autograph session on a nice warm and sunny morning no jackets no sheltering from the cold or the rain here and not too flailingly hot either, giving the fans a chance to meet the drivers up close, to see the cars, talk to the teams as well. And one of the great parts of the World Endurance Championship is very much the open policy, trying to involve the fans as much as possible. That's uh, Dr. Volkan Ulrich there, looking for an uh, autograph from Chris Dyson, by the look of it. Yeah. And actually, there's been more Audi news over the last, or more former Audi news over the last 24 hours. Lena Gade, who was the engineer uh, for the winning Audi for several seasons in World Endurance and at Le Mans, uh, now working as uh, an engineering director back in Thetford in the UK, has just been elected head or nominated head of the FIA's GT Commission. So congratulations to Lena Gade. Young ladies, if you're watching motor racing, you're interested in the STEM uh, group of sciences and technologies. If you're thinking, I was talking to a young lady this morning who wanted to be either a doctor or an engineer so she could follow motor racing. Uh, yeah, get involved. There is absolutely no sex barrier whatsoever on the engineering side or indeed nowadays on the racing side of motorsport. Uh, if you have the interest and the enthusiasm, this sport needs engineers as much as it needs drivers and engines. Right, right too. Well, here is the better placed of our two Aston Martins. Way down at the tail of the field between the last AM cars on the grid is the 97 Pro Class Aston Martin. Maxime Martin 
and Alex Lynn struggled in qualifying with that car. Their teammates struggled as well. Uh, Lynn and Martin in sixth place, and uh, the reason is that actually I don't think Max managed to complete a legal lap, and so the car only with one lap. The only car behind them, the 54, AM class, AF Corsa, Ferrari also not completing a lap with both drivers. That starts 31st. So fifth place in the class is the sister car, Marco Sorensen and Nicky Team. Nicky flat spotted a set of tyres or flat spotted a tyre in their qualifying set. So they're not starting on those tyres, but they will have to use them later on in the race. Miguel Molina will start the 71 AF Corsa Ferrari. It was the 71 car that won last time out. Ferrari were fourth and third in the GTE Pro class. There's Antonio Felix da Costa. So the 51 car is the better qualified of the two. James Collado and Alessandro Pierre Guidi, winners on the road last time out in Shanghai. And at the front of the field are the two Porsche GTs. And Kevin Esther will start the second of them, car number 92. Jimmy Bruni will start car number 91. And they told us yesterday in the afternoon before qualifying that if there was a chance of shooting for pole and the extra point, both teams would go with a second set of tyres. And uh, that may compromise their race a little later on, but they are going with that anyway. Andre Negrau with the Senior Tech Alpine team. They had a bit of a tough qualifying time as well. Yannick Dalmas, who is our driver standards advisor and also uh, one of the safety car drivers chatting there with Alexandre Coigny. Well, here's the second place car in the GTE Pro class. Michael Christensen, Kevin Estra. And Porsche leading the manufacturer standings from Aston Martin and Ferrari at the moment. And if Porsche can, in eight hours from now, still be 1-2 in GTE Pro, they will be very pleased indeed. Jimmy Bruni, Richard Leitz narrowly squeezing their teammates out of pole position. So another point goes in their personal bag. And at the end of the season, Graham, we may end up with a, a situation where one point decides the championship. So a point for pole, it can be a real turning point in your season. I absolutely remember with this variation in points awards through the varied uh, race distances this year, there's all sorts of factors that the teams will not have had to deal with in previous seasons, apart from Le Mans 24 hours. It's 1.5 points uh, compared to the regular race distances, as you said a little earlier in the broadcast, for this race distance, which, let's face it, is more than 50% of the racing we've had so far. 14 <laughs> hours yes. across three races uh, to eight hours here into the darkness and under the floodlights at Bahrain. This is a completely different challenge for a number of these teams. Into the LMP2 field, high-class racing, number 33, one of three cars on Goodyear tyres. There's Anders Fjordback just going out of shot. Shares with uh, Kenji Yamashita and marvellous Mark Patterson, who, when he gets to Le Mans at the end of the season, will become the oldest driver in history to start the 24 hours, which is quite some achievement and still fit as a butcher's dog. I was chatting to him and a bunch of guests he had in the garage this morning, walking them around the car, sitting them in the car, showing them uh, how these racing cars are put together. And Cool Racing, newcomers to the championship this year, they stepped up from the European Le Mans series with the same sort of machinery, and boy, they've really hit the ground running, having a really good time uh, of the season so far. Had a crash in qualifying, and... Uh, 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 in free practice, lost a lot of the time running into the qualifying session, but cool racing, ending up in fifth in the class. Bruno Senna, one of our pole sitters with Pierre Fion, and Bruno will start the pole sitting rebellion. Double pole sitting rebellion, of course, uh, pole double for the Rebellion R13 after doing exactly the same in Shanghai last time out, followed that up, of course, with that famous win. Uh, faultless race from the number one squad and they've come in with a bit of a spring in their step uh, the whole of the rebellion racing crew here's one of the other stories though tires good here yep talked to Ant Davidson during the driver's uh, autograph session he said we just don't know where we are compared to the Michelin runners in terms of longevity of tire how the whole thing is going to work so that's going to be an interesting comparison for them. 
Here is our first sight in the World Endurance Championship this season of the G-Drive team, Roman Rusinov, the young Dutchman, Jop van Oetert, and Jean-Eric Van, the double Formula E champion. Looks like Jop is going to be the man chosen to start the car. Uh, he had uh, a great debut in European Le Mans series last year in LMP3, stepped up into LMP2 and held his head very firmly above water there, one of the uh, quick boys in that category and did superbly at Le Mans last year as well. So he's now in the World Endurance Championship lineup in that car. He's also raced already this season for Racing Team Netherlands when Nick de Vries was on uh, Formula One weekend duty, uh, winning the Formula Two Championship. So he's got experience. Now we're just about to line everybody up on the grid for the national anthem. A little uh, top up with water for our pole sitter in LMP2, Paul De Resta for United Autosports. Uh, Phil Hansen, Felipe Albuquerque, his teammates. Paul's last race is here in 2012, 2013 uh, in Formula One, of course. He comes back every year as a, as a TV analyst, but last time he raced here was uh, four, uh, six, six years ago. Yeah, so more than half of the decade ago, but getting ready to climb on board. And it'll be his job to pace the LMP2 field behind the LMP1 cars. Ladies and gentlemen, please be outstanding for the national anthem of Bahrain, played by the Ministry of Interior Police Band. Thank you to the Bahrain Minister of the Interior Police Man. Thank you. So the Bahrain national flag and national anthem. This is Bahrain's National Day Celebration Weekend, a four-day weekend of celebration of uh, the country's independence, the accession to the throne of the Bahraini royal family back in 1971. Well, looking now into our LMP1 field, car number six, Team LNT's Ginetta, Mike Simpson, the starter, shares with Guy Smith, and Chris Dyson making his debut in the car in the World Endurance Championship, has tested the car, was due to be driving earlier in the season, but commitments in North America made that really unrealistic. Well, let's get down to the grid with Louise Beckett and catch up with the boss. The calendar for next season for the WEC has been announced this week. And Gerard Neveu, can you tell us about the new additions we have? Yes, of course. Uh, in uh, complement of the current existing uh, major event we have, like Silverstone, like Fuji, like Bahrain, where we stay today. Like we have also with uh, Super Sebring in Florida, then also Spa in Belgium, and of course, the Super Final of Le Mans. We have had two very big plays for the motorsport, especially for the sports car. Monza in Italy in October in 20. And in 21 February, we're back in Africa, in South Africa, in the fantastic place of Kayalami. So that's, that's permit and that makes us allow it to provide an incredible calendar with a fantastic place, only dedicated for the pure motorsport, which is corresponding to the WC. It's going to be a good one. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the 2020 season nine calendar, 2020-2021, was announced yesterday. And it is a mouth-watering prospect. Go and look for it online. Uh, let's take a look then at Toyota, the two TSO 50 hybrids on row two of the grid. Again, feeling the uh, performance detriment, let's say, of the extra success weight that has been added and extra success penalties have been added to the car. 
in fourth place. The number seven car, Mike Conway, starts that one. Uh, he will share, of course, as ever, with Camus Kobayashi and Jose Maria Lopez. And in third place, car number eight, Sebastian Buemi, will start the faster of the two Toyotas in qualifying. Kaz Nakajima and Brendan Hartley, his teammates this season. So that's where the Toyotas find themselves. They are the championship leaders from Rebellion and Team LNT. But they are not on the front row of the grid for the second race in a row. And this time, the Ginetta number five from Team LNT finds itself in second place after qualifying. Charlie Robertson will start. Ben Hanley and Jordan King are his teammates. So a mixture of youth and experience. Ben Hanley, frankly, still looks like he's 20-something rather than uh, in his early 30s as he now is. And on the front row of the grid, on pole position, leading the field away, will be the number one rebellion. Bruno Senna will start the car and the teammates Gustavo Menezes and Norman Nato, who did the second qualifying run, this time with Bruno, uh, will be joining in, in during the race. And again, Norman Nato, his second qualifying runs. He was also down to do the qualifying in Shanghai. They took pole there. They've taken pole here as well. So I said, you're 100% record. He said, yep. So said, right, you need to stop now. He said, no, 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 I don't want to stop now at all. We want to keep getting poles. So Rebellion will lead the field away. They won on the road in Shanghai as well. Their first victory at the chequered flag uh, in LMP1. Outright victory in the FIA World Endurance Championship. Winners at Silverstone last year after the exclusion of both Toyotas for technical issues. But in Shanghai, they were first to the flag. So it's a slightly overcast day here at the Bahrain International Circuit. The weather is warm and our starting grid is led by Bruno Senna in the number one rebellion and Charlie Robertson in the number five team LNT Ginetta. Toyota Gazoo Racings, Sebastian Buemi and Mike Conway start on row two and Mike Simpson starts in row three. Alongside him will be the LMP2 pole sitter, Paul DiResta, ahead of Jackie Chan, DC Racing's Ho Pintung, and G-Drive's Job van Oetert. And Davidson starts the Jota 38 car, Cool Racing's 42, started by Nico Lapierre, ahead of Kenta Yamashita in the Goodyear Shod high-class racing car, and Andre Negrau, who starts for Senior Tech Elf. Racing Team Netherlands have Geert van der Gaard, Settelaar have Roberto Lacourt, and those are the LMP2 starters. Front row of the GTE Pro class for Porsche, with Jimmy Bruni ahead of Kevin Estra. Then the two Ferraris in team number order, Alessandro Pierre Guidi from Miguel Molina, and Marco Sorensen is in fifth place in GTE Pro. GT and pole sitter Ben Keating for Team Project One. He will start. Calder del Cabasi starts for Dempsey Protons 88 team ahead of Francois Perodo on row 11. On row 12, it's GJ Perfetti, the reigning champions in the 56 Team Project One AM car ahead of Golf Racing. Mike Wainwright starts there. Paul Dallalana in the 98 Aston ahead of Sally Yolick in the number 90 TF Sport Aston. And behind them, Von Grimes for Red River Sport and Motuaki Ishikawa for MR Racing. All the gentlemen drivers are starting in the AM field. So Christian Reed completes that in the uh, Dempsey Proton 77 car ahead of the pro car of Max Martin. And Thomas Floor will start the last car under grid, the 54A of Corsa Ferrari. So all the gentlemen drivers starting in the AM category. We'll have to wait and see how that pans out with tyres, brakes, fuel and strategy. Alan Munish, hot foot from the grid. It's not a particularly hot day today. It's not going to rain, but the daylight won't last for very long. How is that as a driver on this track? Is it going to be difficult in the darkness or is it well lit? We've had races that have gone into the darkness here before and uh, it is a tricky situation because you've got two things. One is the visibility, but with the lights that are round about the circuit, and also these cars race at Le Mans, and uh, in Le Mans it's significantly darker than it is here. 
and also the speeds are higher as well. So I don't think it's a problem there. The bigger problem they're going to have to try to balance out is going from a day tyre, so for example, a medium or hard for Aston Martin, towards a softer tyre, which you can run in cooler conditions at night. I've just written down the temperatures at the moment because I'm interested to see how it cools off. At the moment, 25 degrees air, 30 degrees track. I expect that'll be very different at uh, six hours time at nine o'clock. We still got two hours to run towards the end. Yeah, absolutely. And so we were talking uh, earlier on with the Aston Martin crew and they are trying to find a balance between having to have some speed in the heat of the day and having a car that still works, as you say, where the track temperature might be half what it is now. And that's a real challenge for the engineers and for the drivers to try and find a balance that doesn't handicap you too badly, either at the beginning or at the end. Tuoto Gazi Racing uh, and LMP two winners, uh, Rebellion last time out. GTE Pro A of Corsa and in GTE Am, the 98 Aston Martin racing car. They were our winners here in 2017. Giving the green flag is Arif Rahimi, the chairman of the board of directors of the Bahrain International Circuit. And don't forget, you can find live timing and a whole host of other content on the WEC app, including Louise Beckett's latest hilarious game show, Who's Helmet? I didn't do very well with that particular no. game, and <laughs> theory I should have done. But uh, my helmet, old helmet, wasn't in the list, so... <laughs> you probably couldn't even recognise your teammates. I don't think my helmet's actually even legal, as uh, it's been such a long time ago since I pulled on that helmet. However, this warming up lap is quite a short one. It's four and a half kilometres uh, round here, but with mostly straights and slow speeds, it doesn't really give a lot of opportunity for them to warm up the tyres, but especially the brakes with that heavy, heavy braking down into the first corner. Just remember what happened at the start in Shanghai, the uh, fluff start rather, but a jump start from three of the LMP1 cars. Rather unusual happening on the front row this time around. Charlie Robertson, second consecutive race, he will start from second position on the front row, but in a different car, because uh, he's swapped Ginettas since, uh, since Shanghai from the six to the five. Running through the grid there, through our LMP2 field, and David Turner ahead of Nico Lapierre. Kenti Yamashita and Andre Negrau. Sinita Kalpine, a spin early in qualifying means they have one set of tyres fewer than anybody else. They were horrendously flat spotted. And I was talking to Andre and the crew this morning, and they said, yeah, we, it, we just can't rescue them for the race. We can't race them. So they are four tyres down before they even start. So they know they're in a hole. And this is going to be a race to try and survive. In our GT class, well, how are they going to skin their particular tyre cat? They're, the GT teams always keep a weather eye on each other. And I was talking to Paul Howarth at Aston Martin Racing. He said in the last race, they're not sure now whether the Porsche team went for a full tyre change right at the end or a two tyre change. He said, we don't know what they can do on a two-tyre change, so left sides only, as it would be here, as it was in Shanghai. And so they're a little bit short on information on what their rivals might do. That makes it hard to plan, Alan, what you're going to do. Yep, uh, you obviously want to be leading the race to try and control it, but other people have very, very different strategies throughout it. One person with a clear strategy is going to be Bruno Senna, leading from pole position. Bruno, how were the brakes? All was good. Everything was good. Yeah. Thank you, mate. I presume then it's a brand new set of brakes on that Rebellion car, just need to bed them in on the warming up lap. And uh, information all good. Kaleem Bahudra, the CEO of Rebellion, obviously slightly tense and nervous, but uh, my bet is that Charlie Robertson will give him a very, very good run for his money down to the first corner. Well, they're going to have to be very careful about when Bruno Senna accelerates. That's what happened in Shanghai. The pole sitter didn't pull away as fast as everybody expected. They need to be in two by two formation. Paul De, uh, Paul De Resta is just holding the LMP2 field back a little bit to give them space. Safety car pulls off at the last minute, and we wait for the lights to change. They need to come down their grid line, so Bruno Senna is doing exactly what he should do, leading his queue down the grid markings, and they need to spread out behind in the GT class. The lights change. 
Now you can pass at the line. Was Charlie Robinson ahead or was he not? It was close. He's trying to out drag center into the first corner. The pole sitter has the inside line on driver's right. It's going to be a long way round to the outside. Can Robinson pull off the block? Pole? Yes! To spin! Ball spin. The Toyota's through to lead. It's going to be the. Uh, yep, Rebellion's out. And that is, that is going to destroy the rear tyres. The Rebellion 37 has gone around as well. So Toyota number seven leads. Paul De Resta in second place. G Drive up to third. And then Senior Tech Alpine, the blue number 36 car in fourth. Cool Racing in fifth. One LMP1 car survived turn one. Everybody has got moving again, though. And then. Uh, Sorry, and Ferrari yeah. is leading the GTE Pro Battle. Got ahead of the Porsches that were on the front row of the grid. One of them struggling quite far back. There are the two Ginettas, five and six. There's the Toyota behind the red and white. And there's the G-Drive car looking for second. Jan van Oyten trying to take the lead away from Paul de Resta. Race start will be investigated. Well, no surprises there. But uh, cold tyres into corner two. And it looks as though the Ginetta driver, Charlie Robertson, had just overcooked it under braking and clattered Bruno Senna out. Now, where is Senna? Further down the field. There's Ann Davidson ahead of Giorgio Senna. Giotto in that Dallara. Here is the Porsche number 92 that started second in class. And it is still second in class. Yeah, of course, the Ferrari got ahead. And the 91 Porsche is down to fifth in category. Safety car. And that may be for debris at the first turn. There was also things flying up in the air as they came through turn four. But uh, that start was certainly not what Rebellion wanted or alternatively what uh, LN team wanted. But let's listen to what uh, Bruno Senna says about that start. What a fucking bastard. I know, mate. I know. Uh, apologies yep. for the language, Bruno. Clearly very, very upset. Leading from the start is the biggest deal that they wanted to achieve and uh, it all went very wrong for them. Well, let's remember back to the last race as one of the Toyotas clearly has had a bit of side to side damage and you can see on its left hand, so the right hand side as we look at it, one of the dive planes is off. This is a replay of the start. Robertson tries to go around the outside to get to the inside for the next one as he turns in, loses the rear and uh, that just tanks then the Rebellion that spins around. There's damage also to that Rebellion as well. And the number eight Toyota got tagged in there by the back of the spinning cars. That's why he was coming up to the pit wall, right with the number eight car. Yeah. There's the, the tag, and he's gone wide. And, uh, yeah, just a little bit of damage there. And he was pulling over to the pit wall to try to actually allow them to see if there was any damage. Because at this moment in time, they'll get some data, downforce data and things like that. However, a visual is always a very good thing. There it is. Yeah. And uh, the left-hand side dive planes are damaged. That's possible to change with a full nose at uh, the first pit stop. But that depends on the car performance and balance as well. Damage on the back of the number five Ginette of Charlie Robertson as well. So take a look here, he just loses it under braking, cold tyres. He hasn't lost it under braking, I actually think he's lit up the rear wheels, trying to get far enough alongside to block pass going through there. It, it was a move, it was maybe a little bit opportunistic at this stage, considering the performance that both of those cars have had, they've kind of gifted um, a big advantage towards Toyota. Yeah, as much as the Rebellion guys have been throwing their heads in their hands, so too, I'm sure, will have been Lawrence Tomlinson, boss of LNT. So safety car is out. And while you were out on the grid, I was saying to Graham, this, car, this uh, racetrack famously almost never has safety cars or yellow flags. <laughs> well, there you go. 25th position in the train for the Rebellion. The number one car, Bruno Senna, um, after that uh, tag into turn one. And also, just two positions ahead of it as well is Martin in the Aston Martin in GTE Pro, which is uh, he's actually sixth in the GTE in that category. Yeah, but don't forget he started on the last row of the grid. He was 30th, so he's made up seven places because that car didn't set a second yep. lap in, in qualifying. The interesting car rides at the back. We just got a shot of it. 37, Jackie Chan DC Racing with Hope in turn. They started well up on the grid. They're now right at the back of the queue with only one car, Khaled El Kabe. He also got caught up in that. He's behind them. Well, there's two kerfuffles. There was a kerfuffle at the first corner that we saw, which was obviously Rebellion LNT principally, now looking at uh, how they're going to replace the rear end of the car. 
Um, but also there was another kerfuffle at turn four as well, and you can see the damage there. And yeah. that's got to that they've got to come in because that is a performance. And the other thing is that the chances are that it's also going to fall apart from there. That's dangerous. Yeah, actually, it's not performance. That is actually a dangerous situation because the rear wing end plate on the right hand side does not have the support that it should have, and so the rear wing will twist naturally with speed and downforce. And the rear bodywork is just flapping around in the breeze, and they're only doing 50 miles an hour. So as soon as they get up to speed it'll start to tear itself off the moment the pit lane is open they are going to have to come in yeah it's uh, but the rebellion from their perspective yes they've lost a lot of time i'd just like to remind bruno how far back they were before they came to their dominant first win uh, in china just a few weeks ago so therefore it's not all gone it's eight hours however wasn't the start that you'd want. No, he's going to have to double stint on tyres that have been spun, and he spun again, trying to loop the car around and get it going. So marshals are running out to try and do some more tidying up. Uh, the one good thing in the pack of cards dealt to them there is, of course, we're behind the safety car. So whilst position uh, is out of position, the actual time lost is tiny compared to where it would have been had that race day green. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Now, one of the factors here is that they have been very carefully trying to warm their tyres up before the start. All those tyre temperatures are now going away. So it's going to be a tough restart as well. Let's get down to the Rebellion garage. The Rebellion engineers and, and uh, mechanics are ready for the car to come in. Norman, we all saw what happened there. Just tell us. Yeah, well, it's a shame. He had a quite a good start. It uh, was tight uh, in, uh, in corner two. Uh, well, that's racing, I would say, but like, yeah, now the question is, the car OK? We still don't know exactly. Uh, we are not 100% sure, so we're going to try to do lap or two, see everything is OK. If everything is OK, we'll keep going and try to come back. If not, we'll have to stop and see what's wrong with the car. But for now, like, we don't, I can't say more because well, obviously we, we're not sure yet. Of course, thank you. Thank you. And anything else he wants to say probably isn't suitable for broadcast anyway. Commendable sang foie by uh, Norman Nato. So our race leader is Mike Conway in the number seven Toyota. Now that all broke very nicely for him. Yes, we're only in the first few minutes, eight minutes into eight hours, but nevertheless, they've got track position that they can't possibly have expected to have had this early in the race. So in corner two, plan A for the number seven Toyota immediately went out of the window. I mean, that's quite early in the race for anybody's plans to get uh, kiboshed, isn't it? Yeah, it depends what their plans actually were, because he was sniffing down the inside into the first corner. The Toyotas were actually looking to try to get ahead um, as they went into turn one. And so I don't think they were just always looking at the long game. They've got the hybrid boost off there. And uh, as you see here again, another replay and uh, from this angle, you see also the scrapping at the further back with the Porsches and the Ferrari. Yeah, in the background, you saw the Ferrari lunging between the two Porsches. You picked that up absolutely while we were watching at the front of the field. Number eight gets caught in the uh, kerfuffle. Yellow flags ahead of the Racing Team Netherlands car. This is going up into turn four. This is the second here. You see it from the Ferrari in the right-hand side and sliding. Oh, it's a bit of a block pass there. That was a bit of a, more of a motocross <laughs> sort of overtake than uh, anything else. And the Aston Martins actually had a pretty good start and run up there. Aston, uh, or one of them anyway, is up to third place with Sorensen at the wheel. Interesting, we were following the Aston and it clearly said yellow in his cabin. Yep. So that pass was under yellow. Safety car coming in, the lights are off. So now trying to get prepared, catch up. Zach Brown looking on from United. They're second overall at the moment with Paul DeResta at the wheel. I think Paul's going to have to look in his mirrors there because Jop van Oyter was already sniffing uh, down the inside into turn eight and turn nine before it went to safety car. Will be this first time one of Zach's cars has run second in a race this year? I'm not quite so sure. As CEO of McLaren then, uh, obviously they uh, they definitely ha are getting more used to being up at the sharp end of the grid, but uh, from an LMP2 point of view, it's not very often they're running right behind the Toyota like this. If we get a chance to see that in-car again coming down through Turn 1, Turn 2, I think the Jackie Chan DC racing car was off to the right-hand side before we got to the Rebellion. 
Yeah, I think so too. I'm not sure what happened there. So we go green again after nine minutes into the pits comes the number five Team LNT Janetta. And it is Mike Conway who leads the field from Compagno, Paul de Resta, Jot van Oetert third for G-Drive. In fourth place is Nico Lapierre. And fifth now, racing team lens, Guillaume van der Gaard. Watch the Aston Martin with a great run in the slipstream as Marco Sorensen trying to get down the inside of the 92 Porsche of Kevin Estra. I think there will be a lot of work in the stewards' room. Lots of damage visible there. Louise Beckett down at Team LNT will catch up with uh, some thoughts maybe from Lawrence Tomlinson once the race settles down. Here's the number eight Toyota up to ninth place, Sebastian Buemi. But with that damage and under pressure from former teammate and Davidson right behind in 38. 33 just in front. That's the high class racing car, Kenti Yamashita. And Toyota making short work of it. Oh. oh no, has to have a deep lunge down into nine and ten. Let's hear from the number eight Toyota crew. I have no boost, come on. Bravo 11 1, Bravo 11 1 to get to normal running mode. So it's like uh, he's got no power there, but uh, from the running mode, I would suggest it's something that hasn't quite reacted back to race mode from the safety car. And uh, he's got to try to rectify that with some various switch positions. Yeah, that's really disappointing, isn't it? Bruno Senna working his way through the front runners in the GT Pro class. And you can see how determined Sebastian Buemi had to be to dive down the inside of the LMP2 car without the hybrid boost to help him push his way uh, under acceleration. So Senna carving his way through the field, now up to 14th. Two GT Pro cars lie in front, the red Ferrari, that's the class leader. And that is uh, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, Kevin Estra in the Porsche. And here comes the number eight Toyota down inside the Signetic car of Andre Negrau. The ground can't afford to get involved battling there. There are t uh, a set of tyres down anyway. Doesn't need to be locking up on this lot. No, I think he's managed to get that speed part of it sorted out. Well, not, not too much, actually. It's not looking like there's a heck of a lot of acceleration out of that number eight Toyota. Well, we'll have to wait and see what happens with him as he works his way through the field behind Mike Simpson in the... Or ahead, rather, Mike Simpson in the Ginetta is behind the up van Oetert. There he is. Black Ginetta locking up as they come down through the S's. And Simpson picking up a place as they complete that lap, but Charlie Robertson leaving the pits now, but has lost a lap. Two and a half minutes in the pits for the number five car involved in that first lap. Yeah, incident. I think there was quite a lot of damage there. It was more than just putting a tail on. Also, uh, Louise was down there and mentioning that uh, the wheel arch area was also damaged. So I assume that it's actually been difficult to locate everything back together. Toyota number seven, our race leader from Paul de Resta for United Autosports. And Mike Simpson now passed Jot von Oyten up to third place. So there is the lead that Toyota has. At the end of the last lap, it was 4.9 seconds. It will only grow over an LMP2 car. This is our lead battle in GTE Pro. Ferrari, Porsche, and now Aston Martin. And the second Aston still in 20th place with a couple of cars between him and the back of Jimmy Bruni in that 91 Porsche. And that 91 Porsche of Jimmy Bruni and 51, the lead AF Corsa of Pierre Guidi. And that's going to be invested because of the race start going down into sort of turn one area. I presume it is from that block pass. Well, Louise reporting for the pit lane that they think they fixed the body damage and that they will get a report from Charlie Robinson once he's got some lap, a lap or so under the car to make sure there's nothing else of a knock-on effect. 37 coming back up the field. Here's the battle for second overall. Car number six, that's the Ginetta of Mike Simpson behind Paul DeResta in the United Autosports LMP2 car. Well, that move that put the Ferrari in front up at turn four under yellows, we think, is going to be investigated. And uh, it may well be that they need to come in and serve a penalty. Passing up the yellows is as frowned on here as it is everywhere else. Well, let's see, because it could also be in the way that uh, there was a movement at the start that had one of the Porsches going off the circuit as well. And so we need to let the stewards do their work, yep. uh, look into it in the cool, I would say, root stewards room. That is now we've got uh, the LNT 
coming past Paul de Resta and up into second place overall. Double yellows at turn one and Paul Dallalana's 98 Aston Martin has gone off there. And that car uh, has now rejoined. So racetrack is green again. And there's about the length of the back straight between the number seven Toyota and Mike Simpson in the Ginetta. So we'll have to wait and see. There's Simpson going down towards the final corner. And from uh, Mike Conway back to Bruno Senna is actually 21 and a half seconds. So Senna is, uh, in terms of lap time, he's basically not far away from Conway, who's at the front, and Senna's actually coming through the field. That means they're going to have to beat Toyota, not so much on pace, but on strategy. 97, pro-class Aston Martin trying to go by the AM-class pulse to Ben Keating. Keating trying to hold his line, not kill his tyres, not run off wide, not incur penalties. And he's got a, a pro-class GT car and the LMP1 Janetta coming back past the 97 Aston. That's past Maxime Martin. Disposes of the Porsche in a way that the Aston only wishes it could do. The problem for the pro-class cars is the cars in the AM category are the same car. They're the same spec of car, and so it's only drivers that make the difference. And the Aston Martin guys are saying, if you get stuck behind a, an AM class car for two or three laps, that's enough to almost kill your front tyres, and the understeer then becomes unmanageable. No further action between the Rebellion and the number five Team LNT Janetta from the start of the race. They're seeing that as a plain racing incident. Well, uh, certainly the, Gine the, uh, the Rebellion wasn't to blame for that. But uh, they're not going to have any further action in that one. I think they may have taken a different view if it was the Rebellion that came into the pits with damage to the car. Yeah. Uh, as it was, it was uh, the offending uh, Janetta of Charlie Robertson that actually had to come in for the bodywork damage. On board was... with, yep, on board with Charlie, carving his way now in through the uh, GTE field. Well, he's got blue flags being shown to him on his monitor. That means that they're actually being waved for the cars in front rather than necessarily any cars catching him from behind because the leader is still half a lap away. As he's leapfrogging his way along that GTE Pro field. Well, Bruno Senna making up ground. What are the teams saying? I just say to stay a pressure in the window. Everything looks fine from here. For sure, we're going to try to test them. We have a lot of rotation turning to the right. Not so much. Okay. All right, so there's a little handling imbalance from that. Let's take a look here. Locking up behind Ann Davidson in the 38 Jota Sport car. That's down at turn nine and 10. That's a tricky element of the track. Plunging downhill through two left or a left-hander into a, a sharper left-hand hairpin. Yeah, it is at any time, never mind uh, when you're trying to wake your way back through. I think it's going to get much trickier when they get into the second stint on the tire, uh, when they actually have lost quite a lot of that front grip. Not the braking grip, but the actual lateral grip. So we're now back to the GTE Amfield, which is all pretty much compacted and close together right now. Well, look at the running order at the top, 57, 56. Those are the two Project One Porsches. Ben Keating leading the champion of Gigio Perfetti. And of course, as Francois Perodo, that's the white Ferrari with the red, white, and blue on it. That's third in GTE Pro. So Perfetti, Paul Dallalana is fourth. Uh, I beg your pardon, Paul Dallalana is third. Uh, Ferodo, Perodo is fourth. Sally Yollop fifth in that red Aston, and then in sixth place, the red Ferrari of Red River Sports, Bon Grimes, on board with number eight, Toyota. And this is steaming up behind Paul Resta, our LMP2 leader. This is for third place overall. And Sebastian Buemi flashes the headlights, and Paul Resta pays absolutely no attention to psychology games. If you're going to come by, you're going to have to do it on pace. It's a long front straight, though, and the Toyota Pulling out just to try and break the toe. And here comes De Resta in the LMP2 car. The Toyota's run out of hybrid boost, but Buemi defending against the LMP2 car coming back in front of him into turn one. Safety car procedures under investigation by the stewards as well. That's standard operating practice. 
Uh, as Boemi gets up into third position there, we've just got two of the cars involved in that first lap. Ferrari out of position now uh, with Rebellion. Now back up to the top ten, eighth position for the number one. Jackie Chan DC Racing's 37 car now on the tail of the LMP2 train. And Maxime Martin has, as uh, uh, you said a little earlier, Martin, got by the eight GTM leader and is on the train of the GTE Pros. So the only other car out of position, of course, Charlie Robertson, who is storming back to try to grab back uh, that lap lost to the contact and subsequent damage. Well, 12 seconds covers the GTE Pro field, of which about uh, two and a half covers the top five. So 10 seconds back, effectively, is Maxime Martin in the last of the Astons. Race leader then to number seven, Mike Conway. Then we will uh, probably change the front end at the stop. Right, OK. Uh, didn't look like there was any yep. contact there. No, but just remember that Toyota are very adept at uh, changing the nose and the tail of the car to rebalance the car, not because there's damage, but to try to give it either a little bit more front grip or a little bit more rear grip or alternatively overall efficiency or something else. So they play with those parts of the car as uh, something to change during pit stop and refueling. Team LNT's Mike Simpson, you just saw in second place, he and third place Sebastian Buemi have just set their fastest race laps, not quite as quick as Mike Conway's fastest lap. And here's the GT Pro cars. Well, they, you can see at 97 now, eight seconds back from this clump of five. And there he is in the back of the shot. That's what the gap is. It's the short back straight behind the pits from first to last in the GTE Pro field. So still out front is the Air Force of Ferrari of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And that car under investigation for uh, a move and contact with Jimmy Bruni in the 91 Porsche that started on pole position in the class. 92 that started second, Kevin Estra. The white Porsche is still second. Then the bright yellow Aston, that's Marco Sorensen in the 95 Dane train car, that's third. And they are just outside the top dozen. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, all together in GTE Pro and the sixth place car. Now that's kind of possibly going to change their strategy a little. Leader coming down into the GTE Anfield in traffic. And Thomas Floor loops around right in front of him. Floor battling with uh, Motoaki uh, Ishikawa. And uh, had got by <laughs> Jose Maria Lopez. Oh, oh, that was close. Don't watch. It's not good for your nerves. You've got to find something else to do, Alan. It's sometimes watching the TV is... And I just say, we're going to be watching this TV for eight hours, so I think <laughs> therefore... Yeah, well, that's our job. That's our job. job. Do as I say, not as I do on this occasion, but he's yeah. now coming back through the field, and Bon Grimes is now looking in the red Ferrari, so you've got TF Sport car, the Porsche defending, and Grimes going round the outside. He'll be on the... No, he's missed the apex, I said there, so he's not going to have to do it. Bon Grimes is really developing as a driver. He's developed a lot under the tutelage of uh, Johnny Molan, but I've got to say, he's actually starting to get quite feisty as well. Mike Wainwright's the guy that is the attacking bar up front, but behind him you've got uh, Reed as well in the Dempsey Proton. Yeah, Christian Reed hugely experienced. Here's a battle in our LMP2 class racing team Netherlands, trying to get by Gerard van der Gaard, trying to get by Nico Lapierre in the uh, cool racing entry. Can't quite get it done. Cool racing car squirming off the corner already, spinning up the wheels, and that's going to cost them traction. Here we go with Racing Team Netherlands on the inside into turn four, throws it up the inside. You'll get penalised if you run out wide with all four wheels. He does that once, but too many times, and they will incur a penalty. That's TDS as a team up to second and third uh, behind the leading LMP2 car of United Autosports, Paul De Resta. De Resta still fourth overall, has not yet been passed by the number one rebellion of Bruno Senna. I tell you, I've got to say that one area where I think it's going to play in to United, and especially De Resta's... Uh, here's a replay of the start, we'll come back to that. Diving down to the... at the start, you've got here a fantastic overview. Now, the Ferrari is inside the Porsche right at the very first corner in the background. So, in fact, that was a clean pass, but yeah, there but was contact. But he locked up to get to that yeah. point. That's the thing. We also definitely saw that was where the Jackie Chan DC racing car spun off in the background in traffic yeah. Yeah. before yeah. the impact with the B2s. So now, under yellow flags, this is up to turn four. 
watch the uh, watch the 37 car on the back here. Yeah. In the middle of that group. Yellow roof and spins just after the apex, presumably. Yeah, the Ferrari them. got down the inside. But look at it. Look at the wheel. The inside wheel. Yeah, yeah. There, it's locked up. Bonk. I think it's from that because it pushes the other car off the circuit. Yeah. Now it's the first corner. And, uh, you can argue whether you would like it as racing or not. Um, it was a bit aggressive, but I can understand it happening, and it's actually, I've done it before myself. While well, watching that, Bruno Senna now back up into fourth position and closing on the leaders, taking tenths out per lap here, under 24 seconds now from the lead. Well, he's in the last uh, five laps, considering he's been overtaking cars, he's only dropped one second to Mike Conley, who's had the serene opportunity just to be leading up ahead. However, saying that, coming back to the thing I was going to talk about was actually Paul De Resta. He has been here in Formula One, and it's not because of the Formula One, I think he's got an advantage in the strategic battles at the moment. It's the fact he was here with a tyre that you had to really baby to try to get to the end and it was actually one of his best results in F1 was here in Bahrain. And so his ability just to gently baby the tyre to the end, I think is going to be quite a critical factor for United today. But there's also quite a mind game going on. If you've done really well at a track before, you tend to like it. If you like it, you tend to drive better at it. There's that driver psychology thing. Yeah, I loved racing at Spa. It was one of my favourite circuits in the world. I've had pole positions there like you wouldn't believe, never won a race. So Thanks. I'm not sure it always goes in that Thanks, way. Al. Thanks. <laughs> Don't worry. I do, I do know what you You're going under that one. <laughs> It's, it's a never-ending battle. Fastest race lap for Roberto Lacorte in the Settler car at the tail of the LMP2 field. The battle's all the way down. Racing Team Netherlands now well clear of the cool racing car. That was only a couple of laps ago we saw um, Geert van der Gaard going by Nico Lapierre. Now he's closing on Jacques van Oite for third. Yeah, this is about uh, half stint now. And this, that's uh, where you see uh, the Signatec Alpine running wide they're going very wide at turn nine you don't want to be doing that for the fact is that out there there's a lot of sand as well and that picks up into the tire and it takes a good two or three laps to try to really clean it out of the tire as well yeah these tires are soft like chewing gum and when you drop it on the carpet it picks up fluff well the cut tires do exactly the same here mike conway mike simpson and sebastian Buemi are the top three in lmp1 bruno senna up to fourth and Charlie Robertson, the remaining LNT car, is down in fifth position. Now, we're expecting the LNP1 cars to split this into a 10-stint race over eight hours. So it's going to be interesting to see whether anybody goes new tyres early on, whether they're single stinting early on, because the tyre degradation will be tough early on, but much better later on in the race. No further procedure between 51 and 91 at the start. I was going to say, actually, Alan, if you penalise the Ferrari for trying to let take the lead, where it, where it, it didn't look like contact was the intention, I think that would have been a tough penalty early in the race. So no further action on any of the start or safety car investigations. That's good. We like racing. We do. Signatec Alpine using the trap there. Great work by our trainer Grau. Really great work. Cool racing car, Nico Lapierre out fumbled there. Not often Lapierre gets caught out in traffic. He's so experienced, but good work by Andre de Grau. He used the fact that Lapierre was boxed up behind the AM class Porsche and pulled away. Yep, it's also Lapierre wily enough to realize the game was up very, very early and not trying to sort of defend the indefensible. And uh, so they both lived to get to fight another day, but Negrau was very, very forward thinking there. Think about your tyres, think about your brakes. Andre Negrau in fourth place ahead of Nico Lapierre, talking to the Aston drivers about brakes, and uh, they were saying that just by lifting and coasting, and the same actually with Phil Hansen was saying, lift and coast for just a second or, or, or so into the heavy braking areas can make a huge difference to the life of the brakes and the tyres. Well, the brake temperatures and the increase is uh, quite a bit less. And here we see a replay and uh, he just gets a nice, nice run up the hill. And uh, Lapierre gives up the ghost there. And then Negrau has actually got a beautiful line in through to overtake the Red River Sport Ferrari as well upon Grimes. Well, there's Pierre Rag, his teammate, who uh, ruined the set of tyres in qualifying. They know they're in a tough position. And Senior Tech Alpine, always competitive team. Here's Bruno Senna. 
Ah, now then, uh, more trouble might be heading the way of Team LNT because Charlie Robson is under investigation for entering the pit lane during the third safety car lap. There is a light that is illuminated on the driver's right that says pit in closed. And clearly, although the team told him to come in, he should have ignored them while the pit in closed light was lit. Well, I think what happened was because it had went to green, then they thought the pit would be open, but because the lead cars, I'm sure, hadn't actually overtaken, and he hadn't done his third lap anyway, so it should have been on the next one. That's a new team into maybe not quite having the overall view of all of the detail of the regulations. However, they're there to be read. Yep. But it is, as we said, this is their fourth race ever for Team LNT. Uh, the mechanics here at the racetrack also build the Ginetta cars, uh, these and all their other race cars and road cars during the week. So uh, they are definitely learning as they go. Back into our GT Pro battle, Alessandro Pierre Guidi holding off Kevin Estra's Porsche. Marco Sorensen in third. Marco's younger brother, Lassie Sorensen, who races in Euro NASCAR, he'll be part of the rookie test on Sunday, tomorrow. So let's hope he's used to the rain. Down the inside, number eight Toyota, Sebastian Buemi from third place. Splitting our leaders in the GG Pro field. And there are AM-class cars ahead as well. We've now got number seven out on his own, and uh, Mike Conway rather, with half the circuit to himself and everything else bottled together in the other half, all three classes. Yeah, but I'm very interested because Mike Simpson's up to second place and he's got a clear view as well. Now we're going to see the relative speed between the Toyota and the LNT uh, as uh, we're now going back to the GTE AM battle. And uh, you've got a Ferrari, you've got an Aston Martin and a Porsche there. And that is uh, the battle for fourth, fifth and sixth, Perodo, Yollock and Wainwright. Yeah, late change in the 98 Aston to Paul, put Paul Dallalana in at the start. Everybody else went with their gentleman drivers, and so the 98 Aston has done exactly the same. Uh, team Project 1, Ben Keating leading from his teammate G.J. Perfetti, the two orange and black Porsches, and then uh, Paul Dallalana's in third, and then this lot, the white Ferrari, AF course is Francois Perodo. The red TF Sport Aston is Sally Yollock. Right behind him, right behind him, Mike Wainwright in the Gulf. Uh, Porsche drives around the outside, exactly as we saw earlier on, getting good hook up, up that hill out of turn 11. Yeah, it's actually a problem now because you'll be getting to the point where the front tire is dropping. You may have understeer, and if you put the power on at that moment, it can snap to oversteer early. But if you've got a hooked up and balanced car, which the Porsche obviously is, then you can work up through. Uh, there's another excellent opening stint, by the way, from Ben Keating in the lead of the GTM class. Uh, one of the bigger leads, uh, the bigger gaps here, is what, 13 seconds to the good uh, after what, just half an hour of running. Yeah, really strong run in qualifying after a, a couple of spins, three spins, I think, in the final free practice session, and uh, really getting his head down. He was so excited to be starting from pole position on the grid when Louis spoke to him this afternoon. And we just uh, just saw there Charlie Robertson just sizing up Ben Keating to go ahead of him for the first time in this race. Toyota number eight, Sebastian Buemi, just ahead of Bruno Senna, and look how the gap has come down from 4.5 to 2.9 in three laps, four laps. Yeah, and uh, Senna was one second faster than Sebastian Buemi in the previous lap, and right behind you've got the Ferrari and Porsche battle. But now let's go to Sebastian Buemi. Okay, you will have uh, free air now, and we will compare the cars in free air, and if it's not needed, we will not change the front end, but if we confirm, we will do. That's uh, now the free air, so there's no turbulence, and that's correct, because he's got half a straight looking at the back of Mike Simpson's LNT, and what they will do is they will, A, get the numbers from the downforce figures, which is on the dampers, so they understand the downforce of the front, and also the driver's feeling, and uh, clearly they don't want to change the nose uh, from the damage that it received at that first corner spin at the beginning of the start. And the reason they don't want to change it is it just costs you more time in the pits. A little bit. You can actually change it uh, in a very quick time. Yeah. However, saying that, that means you've got one less option. And if it's OK, keep it on the car. It's a known quantity. Putting something else on the car reduces that known quantity aspect. But the, the spare nose will be set up in the way that the original nose was, surely. Oh, no, you same. can change it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, would, yeah. You yeah. know, if you're looking for understeer, you would change it to, yeah. to make sure. But also, naturally, if it is a new nose, then ultimately it is a 
has got a higher downforce value because through the course of this race, running over these curbs with the G-forces, this splitter rubs coming down the hill or in the braking into the first corner, then naturally it takes away that newness and that newness actually is downforce performance. Looking into our GC Pro lead battle, 71, Miguel Molina just ahead of Jimmy Bruni at the front of the field. His teammate Alessandro Pierre Guidi similarly being shadowed by the 92 Porsche of Kevin Estra. And in between the two Ferrari Porsche battles is Marco Sorensen and Aston. You can just see in front of us here. So there is Sorensen with the bright yellow Aston. Here's the battle between 71 and 91. This is fourth and fifth. 71, Miguel Molina in the red Ferrari. 91 right behind him, Jimmy Bruni, the pole sitter, don't forget, in that GTE Pro class. So Toyota leading and Team LNT in second place. Rebellion of Bruno Senni. 147.3 for Bruno Senna last time round. 147.9 for Sebastian Buemi in clear air. So in clear air, Buemi losing six tenths of a second on that one lap to Bruno Senna. Now, we talked about how this race is going to be high on tyre degradation. And Toyota, coming off all the slower corners, able to exploit four-wheel drive traction. Alan McNish, is that effectively going to give them a big advantage in tyre wear terms. Yes, it will do because it will allow them to distribute over all four tyres, but that's not something that uh, the Jota Sport car of uh, who's in that and Davidson. Run, and Davidson as he slings it down the outs inside and makes up another position. Now, that car has got Goodyear tyres and uh, with the Goodyear tyres it was a big question mark for, and I think for most of the paddock during qualifying was Actually, how good are the Goodyears going to be in the race for the longevity of the race? Looking at the way that Ant was able to stop the car, turn it, and then get back on the throttle, and I would suggest they're hanging on pretty well right now. And I think the weather is really helping Goodyear. From what Ant was saying in the uh, autograph session this morning, uh, Michelin have come with tyres ideally suited for hot to not-so-hot conditions, whereas we're starting out in not-so-hot, and as the sun disappears, we'll go to quite a lot less hot than that. And so the Goodyear guys, who don't have so much of a choice, believe that actually their tyre compound might work at least as well as anything that the Michelin guys have got available. Uh, to complete the entry for Eduardo Freitas, it is no further action for car five for that safety car procedure. We did see that message pop up. There's a question raised about uh, it popping into pit lane, Alan, uh, on the third safety car lap. Yeah, popping in too early, but I presume that uh, the end review that actually the safety car was in and also the lights were off and it had actually passed the line at the time. And, you know, it, it could have been within tens of seconds, but uh, from yep. that, there is no further action, which will be a relief for Charlie Robertson, because after the start to then have that as a secondary penalty, I think would uh, probably yeah, frustrate his afternoon even more. Kick a man when he's down. There is Charlie Robertson. Now there's number six car rather, Mike Simpson, uh, diving between the two AM class Ferraris. And as that's happening on the screen, on the timing screens, Charlie Robertson clears the GT Pro field. So his next target now, he's got about a minute to make up to get there, is the back of the LMP2 uh, field. Let's go to Toto Great. We are losing mainly the uh, high speed sector. So we will uh, change the content because anyway we have 7 hours and 20 minutes to go, so it's better to do it at the beginning. So they are going to change the nose on the car, so the high speed sector they're talking about is where they've just came through and also up here. Now up here is not because he can't go flat out, it's more than likely as the Settler LMP2 car spins at turn 13 and has a little reverse off and continues back on but more the case coming back to the Toyota that he'll be putting in more steering angle, which means the tire, the front tire, does more work than it actually has to. Yeah. If you want a balanced car, there, you know, you've got an eight-hour race, we're right at the beginning of it, as they point out. Don't, don't run around with an untied shoelace when tying it up is going to take you only a couple of seconds. So uh, we could expect to see that at the end of the first stint, which will be... Actually, coming up not too shortly, yeah, 38 minutes in the books, so somewhere around 42, 43 minutes maybe. Another two or three laps, I would say. They're looking at 25 lap stints, Graham was uh, saying earlier on, and uh, that will be 
about 23, 24 for the first one. But they did have that safety car, which yep. elongated maybe back to 25. Rebellion should be in maybe a lap before, and uh, Team LNT probably another lap before that, just purely because of the efficiency and the way that uh, they're able to stretch the fuel, but also for the Toyota, the electrical mileage. Now, the question is, will Bruno Senna have got by for third place before he needs to pit? Might take him another two or three laps to really be with the Toyota. And then he's going to have to try and work out, which is things that you don't really get to do in free practice, where you're going to be able to pass this car. Off the corners, unlikely. Into the corners, much more likely. Or hopefully be handed a little bit of a break in traffic. Something that just causes the Toyota driver to have to ease off the throttle a little or get onto the brakes a little earlier, but doesn't compromise Senna's own run up behind him. I always was trying to work that out from the first lap of free practice where you couldn't, could not overtake. And then when it came up to a real competitor, it was purely opportunistic. Could you get it done here or not with the, might, the understanding of A, who's in the car? Yeah, that's a factor. And also just your previous experience. Miguel Molina versus Jimmy Bruni. The gap is inches. Oh, he's done it. So that was opportunistic, so he's actually already done it. He's going to get overtaken now to the hybrid boost, but he'll get the slipstream and overtake again as uh, the hybrid was out. And Bruno Senna is now up to third place. Yeah. Unfortunately, Sebastian Buemi, he had that boost coming off the corner, then ran out of juice, and Senna came steaming right by. And now he puts the 88 car of Caladel Cabesi between the two of them. So an AM class Porsche and the Toyota can't use its grunt out of the first corner. Kaleem Bahudra looking a little bit calmer than he was in the first <laughs> lap. The Toyota garage arms folded a little bit sterner than they maybe were on the first lap. But saying that, uh, the last sector, which is big, long straights, you saw the difference with the way when the hybrid boost drops off. That was where Senna was able to overtake. Now, as we get into this battle, Mike Wainwright's got ahead of Sally Yolland there, hasn't he? Rebellion ready to receive Bruno Senna. So Wainwright in the Gulf Porsche having a really great run ahead of Sally Yolland. He's now moved himself up to fifth in class, chasing Francois Perodo's Ferrari. And the Toyota nearly losing the, the other good bit of its nose that didn't get damaged there. Yeah, that was a little bit of a squeeze. He was up over the curb on the inside. And you can look at the right-hand side tyre, the amount of pickup that was on that. As uh, now the Jota Sport, the first of the LMP2s, Anthony Davidson, who is now on the small picture on the bottom left, he's already in the pits for his first pit stop. Now, he will stay in, double stint the tyres, change at the front of the field, Porsche. I don't know, that's the 91, 51, 71, yep. yeah. So Jimmy Bruni ahead of Miguel Molina. Molina coming back at him. Miguel's not giving this one up, is he? No. Well, listen, there's a long eight hours of door handle to door handle racing. We expect to see a lot of this. That was out of turn four. And the Porsche just about keeping it legal. Rear view mirror is that illuminated screen in front of you. Got to say, that was a very, very wide line from Jimmy Bruni there as uh, Bond Grimes has spun. And look at the debris already. You said in free practice, this is like driving on a cheese grater. It just shreds the rubber off the cars. Jota changing rear tires, and that's going to be the... No, the rear, oh, the rear the end. Rear end. Okay. And uh, remember, they had that sort of spin and things at the beginning. That's why Anthony Davidson was back. Maybe he got tagged in there as well. As now Rebellion is in the pits, Bruno Senna doesn't, don't think they're going to do any tires there. It's purely and simply refueling and going again. Here okay. we see the overtake for third place. Right round the outside. It was just Buemi defended because he ran out the hybrid boost and Senna uh, just went round the outside. The thing was, Buemi was actually on the dirty part on braking and Senna was then able to cleanly brake, got past, got overtaken and then overtook again as they went down past the start finish line towards turn one. No tyres for the Rebellion. Louise Beckett reports from the pit lane. And here's our LMP2 leader, the man who was second overall at the start. Paul de Rest is in, so too is Racing Team Netherlands. Don't expect to see driver changes here either. Jop van Oetert, uh, Gerry van der Gaard, rather. He, uh, Jop van Oetert, isn't in Racing Team Netherlands. He is in uh, G-Drive. So G-Drive now lead with van Oetert. Senior Tech staying out, Cool Racing staying out. But United, Racing Team Netherlands, High Class, Jackie Chan, DC Racing. So all three Goodyear cars have been in. And don't expect to see driver changes or tyres being put onto the car 
at this stage. And Alan, a lot of the teams in different classes are saying the first three hours probably are going to be the worst for tyre degradation. After that, the second set of tyres get less punished. 33 high-class racing are changing tyres. Ginetta's in as well in the background of that as there's a flurry of pit stop right now. Yep, from and second place, that's Mike Simpson. And there is the 33 high-class car and the 37 Jackie Chan DC racing car. So all three Goodyear shot tyres have come in, but high-class changing the fronts didn't... Oh, left sides only. So it doesn't look like uh, Team LNT, uh, I beg your pardon, Team Jota or Jackie Chan DC racing changed tyres at all. Lunge down the inside from the Porsche into the braking area. And that was the 91 car moving back ahead of 71. I think if we speak to Jimmy Bruni later on, he'll say it was calculated overtake as opposed to a lunge down the inside. But whichever way, he got the job done. No penalty for crossing the white line from the racing side into the pit lane side. There is a penalty for going the other way, though. If it's you're coming out the pitch, you've got to wait right to the end. Yeah, feeds you basically down to the apex of turn one. Alessandro Pierre Guidi leads in GTE Pro for Ferrari. Kevin Estra second for Porsche. And here is, uh, well, slew of yellow cars. That's 57, that's our AM class leader. And Racing Team Netherlands back out of the pits. And two driver in as well. This is from the lead of LMP2, Cinetec and Cool Racing also in the pits. So all of our LMP2 cars now have stopped. And this is synchronized spinning from Red River and from the yeah. 77. That was uh, up at turn 12, the flat out long right hand of the battle, obviously started earlier on in the corner and they had a little tag and as you said, synchronized spinning. We saw Bond Grimes recovering earlier. We yeah. didn't know that somebody else was involved. Now that was uh, was the 77, so that was Christian Reed. So Bon Grimes has dropped down to 10th in GTE and Christian Reed's still being shown as seventh place. So Christian Reed may have been making a move there. I think Bon Grimes was in front of him and behind Sally Yollock. Leading in the AM class, Ben Keating still from Egidio Perfetti. Paul Dallalana third in the 98 Aston. The best of the Ferraris is Francois Perodo in fourth. On board with our race leader, Mike Conway, still yet to stop. So he's not only out front going fastest, but running longest on fuel. That's the holy trinity, isn't it? Yep, that's what you want. And there's been an overtake here because Van Oyter was ahead of the racing team Netherlands car. The G-Drive was ahead of racing team Netherlands before the stop. Now, uh, Guido van der Garde stopped one lap earlier than his Dutch teammate normally, but actually not in this particular race. And so Van der Garde is now up a position and Van Oyter is that back down a position. And both cars are run by TDS Racing, so they're stopping with the same, uh, in the same neighboring garages, but with the same crew. 77, that is uh, the car of Christian Reed. Toyota in the pits. That's why you see the P beside the number seven in the ranking on the left-hand side. This is the lead car of Mike Conway, brings it in. Drinks bottle change, a little bit of a clean of various items, trying to get all that rubber pick off, pick up off the car, and obviously refueling, no tires. Number eight car, Sebastian Brummy, yet to stop, but he comes in on the same lap. So no tires yet for Conway, and he's off with a fresh tank of fuel and a quick clean and brush up. We expect now to see that nose change that the team told Sebastian Buemi would happen. So clean of the screen. And you can do that while you are fueling. There's the damage and wow, you can see yeah. the hole in there as well. And that hole will actually uh, start to delaminate a little bit. And it's, that's aero wise, it's not efficient. You may not be losing him too much, but it's not going to get any better over the course of the time. That's why they're doing the nose change now. New nose on. Here we see the replay from the first corner to start. 
And hearing it, did you hear there that Charlie Roberts, when he did put the throttle, there was a wheel spin. He lit up the rear wheels, and that's why he lost it coming into the into the left hand and clouted the rebellion. So Mike Conway out to the pit. Sebastian Remy has followed as well. Conway resumes with the race race lead ahead of Team LNT's Mike Simpson and Bruno Senna third in the rebellion. Looking here into our GT Anfield, Francois Perodo stays in that white Ferrari ahead of Mike Wainwright and Sally Yollock. Sally in the red TF Sport Aston. There's Tom Ferrier in the middle of the bench at TF Sport. He's here with his wife and his young son, who's 18 months old, was eating pasta with daddy at lunchtime. And Tom in a white shirt amazingly managed to avoid getting any of it on him. A phenomenally quick pit stop, by the way, from the lead car, the number seven car, 50 seconds only, uh, at least 11 seconds quicker than anything currently behind it on track. So just 50 seconds. Could that even be a full uh, fuel load, Alan? Well, they don't have much fuel to put in. The no, tank's sure. not very big. Um, I'd have to look at the delta of running down the pit lane to be able to do it. Remember, their sister car replaced the nose, yes. which was 16 seconds. Uh, was the difference between them, but it, as you say, it's a very quick pit stop relative to everybody else being LNT and also Rebellion. Yeah, the only prototype that's no, uh, not so far had a routine stop is Charlie Robertson in the number five, Ginetta, because they stopped early, of course, to have that uh, tail changed. He's now back up to ninth position, by the way, overall, still lap down the leaders. Now, what we didn't see was whether or not he was topped up with fuel at the same time, which might give him another four or five laps longer than the leader, that way. three laps, yeah, so three laps longer than leader, so looks like they just topped him off, which is standard operating practice, Alan. Yes, it is, it is. Uh, just coming back to the Toyota, strategically, they may be looking at things very much towards the end of the race. If you don't fill up, if you have got equal stints through the race of a lesser fuel amount and lesser laps, then you can actually try to maybe conserve the tide a little bit more. However, saying that, they actually did more laps than anyone else. This stint will be the this will be the telling point is how long they go in this particular stint, Graham. Christian Reed in the 77 Porsche being passed by Thomas Floor, who started last on the grid in the AF Corsa uh, Ferrari. So he moves up the order into sixth place in GTE Am, and right behind is Motowaki Ishikawa in the number 70 MR racing car. Aston Martin's Marco Sorensen is the first of the GTE Pro cars to pit, and the first GTE car of any kind. That's 50 minutes, including a safety car. That's early. That is short on fuel. That is an early stop. He's out, Nicky Team gets in. We've been told 30 to 31 laps for the GT cars. Uh, that's not that. No, the TF Sport guys are telling me they reckon 61 minutes. So just able to divide an eight hour race into eight stints, basically. I think we need to look to see whether the other Aston Martins are and uh, whether it's something specific that looks like it's probably just run out of tires, actually, because they're already changing tires. Are they going to do all four? OK, so now they're trying to roll the dice and use longer sticks when the tire wear is less, or the tire degradation is less later in the race, and try and keep their pace up now so they don't drop too far behind. Paul Deresta stays in the United Auto Sports number 22 car, leading in LMP2 from Gerda van der Gaard and Jan van Oetert. Senior Tech Alpine's Andre Negrau still in fourth place. We've had a number of cars, particularly in the GTM class actually, already given final warnings for exceeding track limits. They're going to be looking at the incident between 77, Christian Reed, and the 62 car of Bon Grimes. So we saw that incident, the two of them spinning in synchronization. Again, you can see the driver safety messaging screen on the right. Showing Gerda van der Gaard that blue flags are being shown ahead of him. And as he comes down the straight, it's actually for the number five Team LNT Janetta, which doesn't make it to the apex in front. So he's being shown the blue flags. It's not that they're being shown to the uh, that was Toyota. In front. That was the Toyota. Yep. He's putting a lap on it. Yeah. So that's the number seven car going by him. So in fact, the Janetta is coming up behind as well. Charlie Robertson now pitting, by the way, to the final. So we'll now know where Charlie is on his fuel stint. Blummy, that Ferrari didn't rotate very well. Little damage on the front of 29. 
and in comes Charlie, Ro uh, Charlie Robertson. Let's catch up with Aston Martin's Marco Sorensen. He's with Louise Beckett. Marco Sorensen making good progress through the field in your stint. Uh, that was quite early to come in. Was that scheduled? Yeah, that's all, all part of the plan. It should work out that we might be able to, to jump the others and then maybe stay ahead and then control it from there. So we did it in Shanghai uh, and uh, we tried we tried again here. So both cars are in uh, different strategies. So yeah, it'll be interesting. Is it also with the thought that uh, going on to eight hours, maybe it would get cooler, you may be able to use the tires for longer. Is that part of it as well? Yeah, I started on the qualifying tires just now, so they were not new. So it's kind of just tire managing, um, but for sure, it was good to go up and get some positions to begin with um, and then it was kind of managing and the others went a little bit away and then I came a little bit back towards towards the end but it's kind of finding the rhythm out there and that's that's a hard part because you cannot push every lap so you have to kind of bring everything down and then get into a fast rhythm but not lose too much. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you Luis, thank you Marco Sorensen. Interesting there that the guys told me that it was unlikely they would start on the set from qualifying because of that flat spot they'd have to use them later on in the race. They've obviously decided we're going to do a single stint, right, we'll, we'll get them out of the way immediately. The problem with that flat spot is first of all, you've got the vibration. And secondly, Alan, you need to leave a little bit more, Alan's midway for a mouthful of crisps. You need to leave a little bit more leeway because the car doesn't stop so efficiently, it tends to vibrate a bit in the braking area. And these things are so, even a GT car is so finessey for driving that a flat spot is just aggravation all the way through your stint. It is at high speed, no question about it, but uh, obviously it wasn't too bad. It was not ideal, but uh, they were able to clean it up, tidy it up enough to be able to get the job done. Orange car is Jupp van Oyten, second in LMP2. The dark blue top cover of the Senior Tech Alpine number 36 car. That's third place in class, uh, fourth place rather, that's Andre Negrau. He's catching up Van Oyten, who's third. They've got the uh, GTE Pro third place car behind, uh, between them, Jimmy Bruni's white Porsche. I've got to say that Negrau, we've seen him already dispose of Nicola Lapierre. He's now on a march to get onto the back of Job Van Oyten for third place. Uh, up above is three seconds is uh, Van Oyten's sort of stable mate in Guido van der Garde. But the man on the charge right now is Negrau in the Signatec Alpine number 36. And don't forget, they haven't changed tyres, so this is the set that he started on. He's just making them work. He was absolutely ready for the race when I chatted to him this morning. See a little fit of the head staggers there from the G-Drive car, a little twitch as it came up the hill, starting to lose the front end, Jan van Oyten. Yeah, well, we're into the second stint. When you actually do stop and go back out, the tyre drop-off is immediate as uh, Jean-Éric Verne looks on. Uh, yep, a little bit of a question. that The car doesn't look very stable. That's the difference between the two of them. The, the G-Drive car doesn't look stable in the braking area. It was moving around a lot, whereas uh, right behind it, Signet Al Alpine looks as if it's very sure-footed. Well, both those cars are the same class. There's the 70 car, Motowaki Ishikawa running out of room, getting dirt on the tires as he continued his race, lost a mirror, so he's had, was that contact early on, or, well, here's the answer. No, it's contact. No, no, no. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Uh, number five, that was, so that was Mike's, uh, Charlie Robertson, rather, not Mike Simpson. Got to say, that was, yeah, Charlie's uh, day isn't getting any better. Um, that was just squeezing across into trying to get his braking line, but not actually realizing that he wasn't completely past the Ferrari. Ishikawa there was completely innocent. Now, these are getting back to this LMP2 battle. You've got the Aurus and the Alpine chassis, both of which are effectively the same design, the same aerodynamics. They've got the same Gibson engine and they're using the same tyres. But for the G-Drive team, it's the first time this year that the drivers have run on those tyres. Running out wide there is the 88 car. And that is uh, Caladel Cabasi. Uh, Alan's right, by the way, uh, the Signature Alpine on the charge, but the other two LMP2 cars, they're absolutely tearing uh, the track at the moment. Kenta Yamashita in the high-class racing car, number 33, in the 51s, the 53s of Negro ahead, and into the 50s, and Davidson uh, coming back. Both those cars on the Goodyear rubber. And between them, they are 5th, 6th and 7th, high-class racing Jackie Chan 
and Jota and around the outside Andre Negrau having to abuse the track limits a little there but Jan van Oetert the way the car's chattering away under braking but look at Yamashita behind catching yeah. the pair of them and catching them very quickly indeed yeah, good point. And look at the pickup as well that was flying out there I can't believe Van Oetert went to the inside to defend but uh, that didn't I think understand or realize that the ground would just try and sail right round the outside Now, don't forget, yeah. as Louise just reminds us from the pit lane, 33 had fresh air tyres at the stop, and I think it was left sides only, as she reported at the time. But the G-Drive car is clinging on here. He's going to have a rival in either mirror. No, he's got no grip at all, and again round the outside. And the only question is whether he, he's, oh. able, he's got it done. Yeah, yeah the G-Drive car looks quite vicious under the driver at the moment yet van Isaac really struggling so Andre Negrau went around the outside and Kenti Yamashita is having a little look here as well Bon Grimes is in the pits Red River Sport that car don't forget knocked into a spin or in a spin in uh, contact with Christian Reed and what there was there a message about those yeah, two cars yeah, it's no, it's still being investigated it was a double spin if you remember yeah. uh, Bon Grimes suffered remember this is the first race we've seen the Arasira one, the 26 car, on the Michelin rubber. Yeah. But again, on the Michelin rubber, 36, the Cinetec, Cinetec Alpine, that car now up to uh, third place in class, but on his Goodyear tyres, Kenti Yamashita is closing in fast. And the G-Drive car, it is the first time they've run this year on the Michelin tyre. It's different from the Michelin tyre that used in the European Le Mans series last year and they've been using Dunlops all year this year. And here's Andre Negrau under pressure from Kenta Yamashita from High Class. The two blue cars, the white roof is Sinitek Alpine, Andre Negrau. And Yamashita is right with him. He's got a little bit more tire grip. He's gonna to have to use it and break later down the inside. Out comes Bon Grimes. And wisely, I think, bearing in mind the fact that they are really severely tyre limited in the number of healthy tyres they got for the race, uh, Senior Tech Alpine's Andre Negrau lets him go. 92 Porsche is in the pit lane, so is Miguel Moller in the 71A of Corsa Ferrari, so is the other Aston Martin of Maxime Martin. So apart from the top two, we've now got our GT Pro class in, which means the AMs should follow. Here is the pass, high class racing, moving up to third place. Cinetec crossed the line once in third, having got by the G-Drive car, which is now down to fifth. And this is where high class and Yamashita went around the outside of Jot van Oeter. Nothing wrong with the Dutchman's driving, as we saw from Le Mans now, but he lost two places in one lap there, because he's got no tyres under him. Russia change of tyres. So no extra back on his way. Driver change as well. But new tyres there for the Ferrari, though. Let's catch up with Rebellion. Just had a false due to the six. Copy, mate. Copy. Nothing on the metry yet. Or control on a shift or a dump shift. Cool. This is the third eight. I got from third to third, and then from first to third. Oh, he's missing a gear somewhere. I think he's missing it, I think it's in there, it's just not necessarily going in, but normally it's in a stacked uh, way where you can only go through the gears. Yeah, this is about the second position, this is Mike Simpson being caught now by Bruno Senna, just one car between them, and half a second. That long stop, by the way, the second stop for Charlie Robertson, where they had to change a fuel flow meter on the number five car, that's why it was a minute and 50 seconds for the, until then, recovery number, th the big swap. Yeah. The slide of the breaking for the 26 there. And Van Aito has been passed by Hopin Tung in the 37 Jackie Chan DC racing car. So the G-Drive car that two laps ago was third is now sixth. And their rear tyres and their front tyres have gone off. He is now in absolute free fall. He's in free fall, but he's four seconds a lap slower than the race leader Paul De Resta on that last lap. Charlie Robertson's day that didn't start very well and got a little 
worse is getting worse still because he has been handed a drive through for clattering Motowaki Ishikawa's number 70 and class Ferrari. We saw that a few laps ago. So drive through penalty for them. And our leaders are in from GT Pro. Alessandro Pierre Guidi staying in. And was there a driver change? Jimmy Bruni to Richard Leitz. So uh, Louise Beckett says no. As we lost the pictures there, there was no driver change here. Then is the battle for second. Bruno Senna still up behind Mike Simpson in the team LNT Gianetta. Just to explain a little bit while this battle heats up is now that Gianetta's struggling a little bit with his rear grip as well. Um, the fuel flow meter that Graham was talking about is a part that's fitted to all of the LMP1 cars and it's to regulate the amount of fuel flowing in to the engine and uh, that is one of the ways that they can control the difference of performance between a normally aspirated and a turbo. Now they are fitted to the side of the actual monocoque itself and uh, so they are easy changeable items. However, obviously it's uh, been exceeding the allowance of fuel to, and so therefore required. But alternatively, it's not been giving enough. It's not been doing what it needs to do. Or if they've been forced to change it because it's not sending the signals that it should do to the, uh, to the uh, officials to monitor the fuel flow. So, pass has gone the Jota Sport car. The G-Drive car loses another place. And there is the battle for second. Mike Simpson, car number six. And two cars further back on the road. Bruno Senna, car number one. As Senna's, Senna's last lap, was only one tenth quicker. His previous lap, six tenths quicker than Mike Simpson as they battle for second place. Mike, Mike Simpson struggled through turn two in much the same place as Charlie Robinson did on lap one, and that's given the rebellion a run. Yeah, he's not able to get it done there, but he'll get it done in the next half lap, I'm quite sure. They're getting to the point where you need tire grip, and you can see the, that there's a significant amount more for Bruno Senna. Yeah, you see there under braking, Mike Simpson drifting away from the apex. Then even on nodding terms with the corner. Yeah, that's, he's going through the same sort of experiences there that Jop van Oyter's going through. And uh, now getting the power down, it's, it's a matter of time. It's either going to be into this next corner, or I'm sure going to be out of it. Well, the other factor for Simpson is the Jota Sport car is going to be getting closer and closer, and it's going to be robbing his nose of clear air the same way that his is doing to Senna's. So he's going to start losing grip down through the quicker corners and into braking areas as well. And Jeanette has lost the rear grip. It's more the rear than the front, and the yeah. car's just walking around, and all he's, he's kind of a passenger for most of the time. Frustration for the driver trying to stop the rears just spinning up and continuing the damage to those tyres. He's not in a position to get by the Jota Sport car van Davidson. Here you can see struggling to get the power down. Getting a bit close and personal, but not too close and personal. Well, but now the Gineta does go by. <laughs> yeah, blimey. That is quick in a straight line, no question about it. The AR engine. Boris Thomason was saying the first day of free practice they were running five strips of tape on the radiator to allow the car to get up to temperature. He was saying they're going to have to put a thermostat in the system to block off the radiator like a road car because it's running so cool. They were trying to get the car, the engine, up to 80 degrees and it was just refusing to do so. Now, obviously, you've got a lot of cooling. It's easier to take some radiator away from the car than it is to enlarge radiators in, uh, in most racing cars. However, if you have got an overly sized radiator, that's aerodynamic drag as well as weight distribution as well as an unnecessary item you're lugging yeah. around for eight hours exactly. and putting tape onto it uh, is not a good way to do it. Uh, down the pit road comes Christian Reed, who was the leader in the GTE AM class and driver change there. And it's the last of the first pit stops for all the classes. Christian Reed bringing the 77 car down after that tag with uh, Bob Grimes during his stint. Uh, looks like they've got uh, damage on the nose there, so nose is loose and wobbly. With Andre Negrau, and right behind him, we're now on board with racing team Levin's Piero van der Gaard. It's the battle for third. As Bruno Senna continues to try and get by Mike Simpson for second. Simpson's doing a solid job in defence. Oh, he's got a good bit of straight line speed advantage over the Rebellion, so in that respect, he's. Uh able to keep him behind, but I'm actually surprised he's been able to do that. There's a drive-through penalty that Charlie Robertson had for that incident. 
uh, with uh, the Ferrari coming out down into first corner replay again, just moving across too early, tagging the Ferrari, sending the Ferrari wide and also damaging its mirror. A lot of the GT drivers do say that prototype cars come past you and stop dead, forgetting that you're going to need all the track that they're already occupying to slow down in because the GT cars take much longer to get to down to cornering speed. And that's one of the issues when you're in a quicker car, you have to leave enough room, don't you? Yeah, but it was in that respect, it wasn't really compromising the entry to the corner too much by breaking a straight line as the G drive Van Oetersen that right. uh, is quite an early pit stop by Neuter, getting rid of those tyres. But yeah. now let's go to Kevin Estrin. And he is driving uh, the Porsche that is... What is he in the race? In the pits. Kevin Estrin has handed over to Michael, Sar uh, Michael Christensen sorry, in the 92 Porsche. A difficult start for everybody, but uh, how did it go for you? Yeah, I was okay. I was on the outside at the start, and then I saw that the Ferrari brake very late. So Jimmy, Jimmy went to the left. I had not so much room, uh, so I brake more, and uh, and then they contact, so I could pass Jimmy. Then I was following the Ferrari, and uh, to be honest, at the beginning I had the same pace, and later on he was a bit better. Uh, but now there are some different strategy. Aston undercut us, so I pitted very early, which uh, might bite them to the end. But uh, we'll see. Okay, thank you. Well, this is where you split the difference between your team strategy. You've already heard that Aston Martin have done that, Porsche doing that, no question. I'm sure that Ferrari doing that as well. And at G Drive, Jot van Oetens handed over to Jean Eric Van. They've obviously got, okay, it's not the end of a stint, but it's the end of the tyres. We're just losing so much time. We've got to change the tyres. As a result, we change the drives. In comes Racing Team Netherlands. And this is Gerda van der Gaard coming in from sixth position. He dropped like a stone as well, in the yeah. same way, about five laps later than Van Oeter, but exactly the same situation. And so they're pitting early for the second of those cars. Both the DDS cars are clearly not good on the tyre. Yeah, whatever setup they've gone for is not working early on. It might work later in the race. Double wave yellows out there to pick up. I'm guessing that's uh, the 70 MR racing Ferrari mirror there, Craig Goodwin. Uh, I think you're probably right. Uh, just to say it was 12 laps on that uh, second stint for the G-Drive car, 14 wow. for Racing Team Netherlands. So about half a stint for the 26, a little more than that for the car we're looking at now, the 29. Was that a nose there for, G for Jota Sport being, uh, it was in the garage, not necessarily being prepared to go on the car. Fritz van Aert is getting into the uh, Racing Team Netherlands car, and I think that's possibly not a bad idea. If they're half a stint in, the AM drivers, the bronze drivers, are going to have to drive two and a half stints to get their minimum drive time out of the way. So if he does one and a half now, then he could do another stint later in the race when conditions are better and maybe the tyres might be a little fresher. 37, 38, those are the two Jota Sport run cars. One for Jackie Chan, DC Racing 37. The other one under uh, Sam Hickner's Jota Sport team's own name, car number 38, both on Goodyear tyres. And this is the battle for fourth place. High class, the other Goodyear shot car in second. But these guys, we believe, didn't fit new tyres. And high class did at the last stop at least two. I've got to say, Anthony Davidson's really settled in very well to this car and this programme. Obviously, someone we know from uh, having won the FIAWEC LMP1 World Championship with Toyota, funnily enough, at the circuit a few years ago. But uh, he's someone that I think actually did maybe underestimated a little bit how difficult competitive LMP2 was, but certainly got to grips with it right now. Yeah, he's really loving his time in these cars. Very competitive. Yeah, you're racing everybody in the class, not just maybe the other guys in the garage, which is the situation, or was the situation certainly last year for Toyota. Just in front, 36, that is Andre Negrau. And uh, Negrau is still in third place in LMP2. And at some stage, that Senior Tech Alpine car, they're going to have to triple and quad stint their tyres because they are a lap, uh, a set of tyres down after they were uh, killed in qualifying or in free practice in a spin. So they've got a real tyre problem on their hands. That means that they have got five and a half sets for this eight hour race as opposed to the six and a half sets that everybody else in LMP2 has got. That's, that's got to be a bit of hard work. Yeah. So everybody is, is looking at double stinting most of their tyres 
They're going to have to double stint all of their sets, probably. 37, 38, nose to tail. And hope in turn. Oh. Oh. And Davidson goes right by now. I wonder if there was just a little radio message. Ant is quicker. Let him go by. Hour and a quarter into the race. Already, we're firmly in to the evening here in Bahrain. Bahrain International Circuit, the final World Endurance Championship race of the calendar year and of a decade. Race four of the season, season eight, getting ready to return to racing in Bahrain for the first time in a couple of years. On pole position, Bruno Senna in the red, white and black rebellion alongside him, Charlie Robertson in the Team LNT Janetta. Toyota's on row two of the grid and the number eight car looking to try and make a move down the inside, but it was the rebellion of Bruno, Bruno Senna that covered off the corner, not quite keeping his nose entirely clear of Charlie Robertson, and Robertson spinning up the rear tyres, clattering himself and the leader off the road, also damaged to the number eight Toyota, as number seven went through for the lead, and then behind, all sorts of chaos in GTE Pro at the first corner, a lunge from the Ferrari put it into the lead as everybody else tried to keep their wheels and wings intact. Safety car was out at the end of lap one for two or three laps. Damage on the rear of the Ginetta would force an early pit stop for them, but it handed a runaway lead to the number seven Toyota. It was Ferrari versus Porsche and Aston Martin, one, two and three. Then Ferrari versus Porsche, four and five in the GTE Pro class as the second Aston caught up in GTE Am. Ben Keating in the 57 Project One Porsche led from pole position and the kerfuffle at the start allowed him to build an advantage on his AM class rivals. LMP2 saw Paul de Resta second overall at the restart. He was soon passed by the recovering LMP1 cars. First Mike Simpson went by in the Ginetta. Battles in LMP2. Gerda van der Gaard for Racing Team Netherlands, working his way up the order past the number 42 cool racing car of Nico Lapierre. And then retaking the lead, the 91 Porsche squeezing back in front of the 71 Ferrari. First round of pit stops on the hour mark for the GTs. And by that stage, the Aston Martins were back in the hunt, running nose to tail. Out front though, still the number one Toyota. Hour and 16 minutes into the eight hours of Bahrain, the longest race of the season so far. Martin Haven, Alan Anish, Louise Beckett, and in the booth with me here, Graham Goodwin. Graham, today they're going to do as many hours racing as Silverstone and Shanghai put together. Correct, and as we rejoin live action, we're back into a positional battle. Third position this time, Mike Simpson ahead there with all over the back end of the Ginetta, the number eight Toyota of Sebastian Boemi. Traffic here could give the opportunity for a bit of hybrid boost, but straight line speed advantage still for the Ginetta, beginning though clearly to struggle on those tyres again. There's a yeah. great punch here, yes, punch here goes through. But does he? Now he's trying to box Simpson in behind the air, of course, of Ferrari and Francois Perodo, but he can't. And so uh, through goes Simpson and the Toyota nips through the gap as well. In fact, uh, is it still Francois Prodo in 83? No, he's handed over to Nick Nielsen. Uh, 90 Aston Martin, that is currently lying in fourth place. Charlie Eastwood's taken over from, from Sally Yollock. They were always expecting to do a single stint at the beginning for their gentleman driver, and I think most of the teams have done that. Ben Keating stays in for a double. He's leading in GTE Am, as the Toyota still try and, tries to find a way by the Ginetta. But the Ginetta picks up its skirts and canters off down the straight. The hybrid boost will not be enough to get the Toyota uh, to have the job done. Mike Conway leads in car number seven for Toyota. Bruno Senna second in the number one rebellion. Gap between them is nearly 50 seconds. Conway is being relentless in opening up the margin over everyone else in the field. Because as he knows, the longer the race, the more opportunity there is for things to go wrong. On board with Sebastian Buemi, still trying to pick a way through Mike Simpson's defences. Graham Gooden, actually, this team LNT Ginetta, we're now deep into the second stint. We can't be far away from pit stops. 
he's still holding the Toyota Bay despite the high tyre wear here, despite the slow corners he's having to fire off, and despite the Toyota using four-wheel drive to uh, nurse his tyres a little better. So Simpson's tyre management is actually really good. Well, we saw an excellent example of exactly where the comparative performance has been delivered here. Watch again as we come up the corner, the punch of the Toyota, but then when the, the uh, Ginetta actually gets the power down, it just has no answer for the straight line speed of that Ginetta. This time, nobody's trying to cover it off. Goes around the outside, almost always does it this time. But he had to have elbows out to do it, didn't he? Yeah, Mike uh, Simpson. Mike out, Simpson off. Outbraked himself there a little. What he was trying to do was force Sebastian Buemi to outbreak himself, go too shallow into the corner, and then lose traction up the hill. But Buemi just gets the move done. Alan, uh, you've got to use your strengths, haven't you? Yeah, you do, and uh, Boemi's strength was that he had the acceleration initially, and he also then had the correct line into the corner. So if Simpson was going to bully Sebastian Boemi into sort of backing out of it, I think he was maybe a little bit naive on that one. But in all honesty, he was struggling anyway. He's, I know you're talking about positive use of the tyre life, but uh, it certainly wasn't to the levels that uh, they're going to need to be able to satisfy the tyre allocation. Alexandre Kwani in the cool racing car, struggling now, isn't he? Look, Andrea Beliki, he's taken over at Setelar. They're getting towards the end of their stint in these LMP2 cars, but uh, Beliki, the quickest of their trio, and Kwani now looks like he's struggling for tyres. How much is he struggling? Well, the red, white, and blue car behind him is the LMP leader coming up to lap him, Paul de Resta. So that's how much cool racing struggling. Well, now, in terms of what it feels like inside, do need to talk to the, the Settelar drivers to see what the, the Delara feels like inside, because from the outside, it looks like they're running down a cobbled street when everybody else is on a road circuit. Yeah, we're speaking to Harrison Newey, who drove this car at uh, Le Mans, and uh, he said it was a bit like a pogo stick, and it wasn't <laughs> the easiest thing in the world to drive. Feels as bad as it looks. Well, let's get down to cheese drive with Louise Beckett. The 26 G Drive coming in for a scheduled stop, but it would seem changing tyres fairly early in the race. Yeah, I think we picked the wrong tyres for the start. Uh, we changed them, different compound now, and let's see how it goes for Jeff. Um, that we were just sliding a little bit too much, and therefore we overheated them too quickly. The 29 car suffered the same issues towards the end. The first half of my first in, we were very competitive, and I wasn't overdriving the car or anything. We just turned in and you. Yeah, you lost the rear, so I had no traction, I couldn't break late, and yeah, you were just a sitting duck at one point. So what were you on? I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> he thought for a moment, I nearly got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, we, we could see his lips start to form <laughs> Mur of Medium. Well done, Louise. Oh, it was <laughs> Mur of Michelin. Uh, well, ah, yeah, it was that would have been the good was, answer. It's it learning quickly, isn't he? <laughs> well, the, the choices here are... Uh, a soft and a medium, but I, I don't think he started on medium. I think they started on a soft and found out it was not working the way they'd hoped. Into the pits, car number six. This is Mike Simpson from fourth place. So 20 laps to, for Mike, so clearly I think you're right. Those tyres were not uh, 23 laps and then 20, but uh, it was 23 laps with that safety car, remember. Chris Dyson jumps in. Be his. his first FIA WC race in the Ginetta. And first what was his last? In, in WC, uh, 2013, in the, the Greaves uh, Zytec. Yeah, Greaves Zytec, 13, yeah. Silverstone, you're right. Yeah. Very good. So, welcome back to Chris Dyson. He spends most of his life racing in the IMSA WeatherTech Series in the US. Uh, well, actually, Trans Am this year, and uh, he's his, uh, his runner-up in the championship. He uh, wasn't with us for Fuji because there was uh, something the championship decided didn't quite go his way, but loving those, let's not forget, 850 horsepower tube frame cars. Yeah, horsepower greatly overrated, <laughs> unless you've got it, obviously. Do, do they sound like real racing cars? Oh, I'm, yes. I'm, yes. Yes. I'm, I'm yes, guessing. Yes, yes. Trans Am never been underwhelming in its noise value. On board with Mike Conway, the uh, Toyota now, well, remains 49 seconds ahead of Bruno Senna. So actually, he's not escaping at all. He escaped 293,000, 0.293 of a second quicker than Senna on the last lap. And Conway working his way through traffic, Senna working his way through traffic as well. So, honours pretty even at the moment. Yeah, at this stage, 
To be honest with Toyota and the way that Conway is driven and pulled away, I think uh, they're in a very, very strong position with that number seven guard. I don't think the Rebellion's actually got very much in store for it as we speak. Uh, so it's a case of trying to manage what happens around and about, make sure there's no mistakes. Uh, LMP2 stop for the Jota Sport car, and Davidson brings the car in from third place as we see uh, Cool Racing's Alejandro Kwani trying to hold off the uh, Racing Team Netherlands car. They've had a forced earlier stop. That's just about spot on schedule for uh, the 38 car, 22 laps with uh, Ant Davidson, but it's an impressive stint. Well, there is. Uh, the Jota Sport Garage, Berto Gonzalez limbering up, but Luis saying from a distance it looked as though Ann Davidson might be staying in for a triple. But Luis Beckett, what, the, the, a dummy from Roberto Gonzalez, was it? come round as if he was going to get in the car but then came back again so looks like Anthony's staying in yeah Anthony Davidson waving Roberto Gonzalez away going no actually I'm I'm good we're going and of course without sort of 40 degrees of track temperature or air temperature rather it's uh, a lot more human in the cars uh, Paul De Resta is in the pits the LMP2 leader who had started to lap his LMP2 rivals and there's Gerda van der Garde up the inside of the cool racing car of Alexandre Quigny. And Quigny looks like they've decided, right, we're just going to have to stick in on these tyres. <laughs> See in the garage, lots of jubilation there. Nick de Vries really enjoy, in, enjoying that move. And in comes the uh, high-class racing car from second place. And actually, that's an impressive stint. 22 laps from Kenta Yamashita. And uh, 151.792, the average for that, for that stint. Better yeah, than Paul de Resta. Moved forward massively. Yeah. yeah. And uh, those good years are, I would say, the target to have at this moment in time in LMP2. Yeah, they started in eighth place in LMP2. Now, they did benefit a little from the chamozzle at the start, but on the other hand, that's not what, what got them ahead after an hour and a half. Uh, yeah. Great stint from Yamashita. You could see there... Um, getting ready for driver changes up and down the pit lane. Uh, with that, by the way, the only driver in LMP2 in this last stint that's been quicker than Yamashita at Davidson, and just by a couple of hundreds. Full set of tyres going on to high-class racing, so that'll be a slightly longer pit stop. Uh, if there was a driver change, and there was, I think, at United, yeah, Phil Hansen leaves the pit lane, he's probably got a full set of tyres as well. So even in the high tyre degradation phase of the race early on, looks like they're being able to keep their tyres alive for a double stint because Paul de Resta's pace really did not drop off, did it? In comes Bruno Senna from second place. Louise Becker in the pit lane, girding her loins and perhaps getting a bleep button ready to interview Bruno Senna if he gets out of the car. Gus Manez is... Uh, Nominato, rather, getting ready to get in. It's Gustavo uh, it is Menezes. Menezes. Okay. Never, never second guess your first guess. And you see there just cleaning the man at the front, cleaning out the brake ducts and all the rubber that was popping out of there. There's a lot of pickup already out onto the circuit. We've done one and a half hours of this race so far, six and a half to go. It's going to be like a litter bin of rubber down the back straights, which will make overtaking very, very difficult. And also, if there's a safety car, you'll get all of that onto the tyre. But uh, it's going to be a complete new set here for Gustavo Menezes, as he's now in the car. and. Uh, Bruno Senna preparing his language for a game of mind your language. <laughs> yeah, well, that's possibly not available on the app yet, unlike uh, whose helmet, but uh, mind your language, yes, we'll go with that. So Bruno Senna stops from second place, hands over to Gustavo Menezes, Mike Conway still out in the lead Toyota. Really strong team spirit in all these squads. You saw there, Gustav Brunez is going, come on, mate, come on, let's make this a good one. And there is the number eight Toyota now up to second place for Sebastian Buemi. 
Now it's going to be interesting because uh, by the time we see this end of the second stint, you can start to predict forward how many overall stints they're going to be and whether they're going to need a, a one more splash of fuel stint for the Rebellion relative to the Toyotas, which will bring Bohemi really back into the game. Battle of third in GTEM. The 56 Porsche was in second place before the last round of stops. Uh, ben Keating still leads for Team Project One, the other black and orange car. Um, second place now up to second, Ross Gunn, who took over after the first stop from Paul Dallalana. Third place now is 56, and Luigi Perfetti, who started the car, stays in, ahead of Charlie Eastwood, who's taken over from Sally Ollock. So two of the top four have kept the starting drivers, the AMs, in. The other two have put some of the young pros in and are making up gaining track position, gaining ground. So this is an interesting strategy battle of track position versus tyre life and where it leaves you towards the end. Flyby by the Royal Bahraini Air Force. They'll be doing an awful lot of that this weekend, celebrating the National Day. F-16s fighting Falcons there from the airbase to the south of uh, the Sakia circuit. Into the pits comes the, the 20 to 36 uh, Sintec Alpine. That's driver change. Bruno Senna uh, in uh, defensive mode with the helmet still on. You know, he's actually he's got connected to the pit wall so he doesn't go have to go across and then he speaks and gives the rundown of the car from the pit wall. But it looks like TF Sport Charlie Eastwood is right in the slipstream now. Eastwood in what, I have to go to be honest, was a pretty slow qualifying for that car. They've been one of the standouts in qualifying and also the championship leaders at the moment. Now just slides down the inside and moves up a position. Now I've got an answer for why the Astons underwhelmed a little bit in qualifying compared to their free practice pace. And this is from the horse's mouth. Because of where the engine is in the Aston, the front tyres are significantly heat shielded from the heat of the engine that sits between them. Which means that with a short lap to warm up your tyres, you start your qualifying run with tyres that are not warm enough at the front. And so they're saying, we didn't have enough tyre temperature at the front, couldn't generate enough tyre temperature at the front without taking the edge off the tyre, so they didn't have the one lap pace of the mid-engine cars. Francois Perodo's car, the 83, uh, dives down the inside. That's Nick Nielsen now, isn't it? Trying to find his way by Mike Simpson. Simpson doing a good job in that second stint. Yeah, oh, no, it's Ben Barker, in fact, in the golf car. Perfetti's just lost three positions in half a lap, though because he lost two in that turn eight corner. Now, like Ben Keating, he stayed in at the first stop. He stayed clearly on the same tyres. So these guys who have changed drivers, they may not have fresher tyres, but they've at least got fresher drivers. And they've got some of the young pros in the cars as well. Set to last stop, driver change there as well. Roberto Lacourt did the first stint. And Alex, uh, who was the second one? Andrea Baliki, so driver change, it looks like, Graham. Ben Barker made way past Nick Nielsen as well. Nick Nielsen, by the way, gets a chance in the pro Ferrari in the rookie test uh, tomorrow. But uh, Ben Barker, two places and about three corners. Yeah, so Ben Barker on a charge up the order. Nick Nielsen in the white Ferrari behind. The red Ferrari behind him would be 51, which is second, James Collado, in the uh, GT Pro class. And he is chasing the Aston Martin of Nicky Team that leads in pro. And uh, you see the G-Drive car there with now Jean-Éric Vernet the wheel. He's up to second place. Now, admittedly, a little bit out of sync on the pit stops because he stopped so early. Bruno Senna with Norman <laughs> Nato and Hugues de Schonac from Orica, the boss of Orica on the right-hand side. And, uh, yeah, clearly with that hand movement, still discussing the first corner. Bruno... I think he's going to need a, probably a few minutes before speaking to Luis. No, no, once you've talked talk to Hugues de Schonac, uh, that's it. He's just apologised for getting caught up. I think he's ready for Luis Beckett. Let's go and hear what he has to say about the first corner of the eight hours of Bahrain. Bruno's got back to the team. He's been speaking to everybody here. Um, obviously devastating for that opening of that race. Yeah, I think uh, the Ginetta missed the memo that's an eight-hour race and, uh, you know, attacked so hard into turn one. I was, into turn two, I was I was very nice. I didn't squeeze him off the track or, or anything. I wanted everybody to have a good race. And then he just didn't take uh, didn't take the hint and hit me. Uh, we, had, we were dead last and had to fight. Uh, but now there's a big gap to the Toyota. We're going to have to fight very hard. It's a shame. We have some damage in our car and this is not the way that this race is supposed to go. 
but still six and a half hours to go. We're going to push very hard and hopefully we can uh, recover. As you say, there's six hours to go. Can you can you bring it back? I mean, the pace of the first Toyota is very strong, so we're going to really have to do something very special here. We obviously didn't expect to have uh, this gap to recover. Uh, but hey, we're, the, the fighting spirit is still on. I just hope that uh, the other guys are you know, thinking a bit more now for the rest of the, like, rest of the race. Uh, still was a good job by everybody and uh, we're on a fight. You mentioned slight damage. Uh, the team haven't actually touched the car other than a standard pit stop. Uh, we heard you radio back saying there was some, some movement in the car. So how is it handling? Uh, it's a bit different from left to right. So obviously there's something going on in the suspension. Obviously, we had a correct session, we had a suspension, some issue with the suspension. So this is not exactly ideal for us if we take a hit on the corner. But hopefully it's going to hold on and we're going to finish the race without any issues. Thanks, Bruno. Thank you. So you see the Toyota stops there, Bruno Senna giving the debrief, the thing he said about in uh, practice session with the suspension was actually the hub. There was a fluid leak as well, which stopped him running in free practice at the end of free practice once. They lost a bit of time there, 25 minutes. And uh, now they're back on their way. But there's also, as he said, quite a big gap. However, Gustavo Menezes back in the car with those new set of tires has just done the car's fastest lap of the race on that previous lap as uh, the two Toyotas have now been in. Uh, it's actually done two consecutive fastest laps for that car, 145.5 followed by 145.4. A uh, couple of problems they had, didn't they, with the uh, with the rebellion in free practice, including that fire, that brake fire yep. uh, with the, uh, the uh, broken seal, wasn't it? It was actually the hub that moved, which then caused the brake problem, which then caused the fire, which then caused the fire extinguisher, which then caused all the <laughs> loss of time. That's funny, because when we were looking at it, I say, look, the fire has really blued the hub where the metal changes colour because it's overheated. Clearly, the bearings had gone, the hub had failed, and, and in fact... Something had gone wrong It was there. that that had led yeah, to, the, uh, to all the overheating. Number eight is in, fresh set of tyres, fresh driver as well. Uh, we saw uh, Kamui Kobayashi taking over the number seven. Uh, didn't spot who just jumped in, so I was looking at other things. Who jumped into number eight, Graham? Did you uh, see? I didn't spot that, just so I was looking uh, at the message on screen. I'm black and white. Oh, black Bre and Brendan Hartley. Yeah, black and orange flag for car 83. That's the AF Corsa That's Ferrari. That's Nick Nielsen, yeah. Excessive I, temperature in the cockpit. I, I'm amazed that Bruno Sedden didn't get pinged for that. <laughs> to be honest, after the first lap, he must have been boiling with rage. There is a regulation that you're not allowed to have uh, a temperature in the cockpit oh, seven degrees, above seven degrees, above outside air. So if outside air is 22, then it can only be 29 in the cockpit. And clearly they've exceeded that regulation. Yeah, yeah. So black and white flag means we're not warning you about it. You need to come in and get it fixed. We are giving black and orange flag card 83 for excessive temperature in the cockpit. We're giving black and orange card 83 for ex excessive temperature in the cockpit. The team must call the car in and repair. Now, right now, the air temperature is 23 degrees, so it would normally have to be above 30 degrees, which I have to say is still pretty cool for a car. We've raced here in uh, the first round of, uh, or the first Bahraini race in the middle of August when it was 42 degrees outside air. So it was, you know, getting on, knocking on 50 degrees Celsius in the cockpit. However, saying that, regulations are regulations, whether we like them or not, and uh, you've got to abide by them, and hence the reason, they're there for a reason, which is a safety reason for a driver. Well, some, some of our raised temperatures, maybe at Silverstone in the spring, you might need a heater in the cockpit to get up to <laughs> Let's hear from Toyota. Hey, can we, you're on the hard new set on the left, and the uh, on the right, we go for 50. Just we have to reset some PC adjustment. I will give you the driver default in the main train. Copy. All right, so fresh set on the left, a set that used in qualifying, two pairs, the two tyres that used in qualifying on the right, which means they can do another one of those. Left side fresh, right side used in qualifying at another stop. And all he's going to do is change the balance, the traction, and a whole load of other bits and pieces on the car, cycling through the steering wheel, punching in the correct, uh, data and then it'll adapt the car's brain to tell it when to use the hybrid, when to recoup and everything else to try and balance out the performance of the, those tyres across the car. Well, let's get down to United Autosports. Phil Hansen leads in LMP2. His teammate Paul Resta started at the front and stayed out there. 
Louise Beckett is with him now. A very cool and calm Paul Darista making it back to the team. That was a great run from you, running second overall at one point. Yeah, I mean, it was a bit chaotic at the start, as it always is. It seems to be quite bad at the moment, but managed to get through it. Picked up a bit of damage with the Toyota coming back on the track. He rejoined quite sharply and caught the back tail of our car. Not enough damage to cause any issues, but it was a nice stint. We managed to extend it as well compared to some others who are struggling, but tyre wear is going to be key. Uh, it's going to be a management game all the way through, but as long as they've got that comfortable margin, you can keep going. But listen, there's still well over six hours to go. And um, when you're racing around here, always something can throw a surprise. So keep my head down. I'm not in the car for a long time again, and then get back in and uh, hopefully do the same again. You've, you've been here with Formula One. You did well here in Formula One. Uh, so have you got the key to how to get by in uh, Bahrain? Uh, I always uh, had good results here, actually, in Formula 1. I had a, a P6 and a P4, narrowly missed the podium in a car, an F1 that wasn't quite at the sharp end. So it'd be nice to eventually stand on that podium. Um, but obviously, the top depth where we need to be. It'd make a big dent, obviously, in our championship as well, because we've been quite unlucky with reliability. But that's the nature of how this sport is, the endurance side of it. And um, we'll just keep plucking away at it and hopefully come 11 o'clock when the check and fly drop. You're in that position, but you know you can be unlucky just with traffic, safety cars, and uh, it is a nail biter. And I think this class, that's what it uh, always, always throws up. Well, I'll speak to you in a few hours, probably. Thank you. Paul well, Esther there, quietly confident, I would say. Uh, at the moment, Phil Hansen is leading by 13 seconds over Jean-Éric Verne. But uh, I would say that Jev is probably starting to drop back again as Hansen's tyre advantage is starting to come into play. He's enjoying this weekend without a shadow of a doubt. He's a man that uh, does wear his heart on his sleeve, rather. And I don't think I've seen him smile as much um, in quite some time as I've seen this weekend. He's clearly thoroughly enjoying this race. One significant uh, announcement from race control, by the way, that five-second penalty uh, we told you about a little earlier on the 77 car after the incident with the 62. Uh, Christian Reed and Bon Grimes, that five-second penalty to be added to the pit stop is now cancelled. Well, that's interesting because they've clearly judged from video evidence and uh, data that there was a penalty to be served and then more evidence has been presented or maybe the drivers have... Uh Christian Reed's still in the car now. The, the drivers may well have been interviewed, so we'll wait and see how uh, there'll be no further uh, uh, movement on that anyway. Uh, the other significant th update is for the number 83 AF Corsa. After that black and orange flag saying they must come in and repair the car, about a minute and a half on pit lane, Manu Collard now aboard the 83, but that repair, at least their first attempt at that repair, is done. Yeah, so either they are moving the sensor away from the driver or they have uh, opened up a, a few cooling vents. Talk about cooling vents, Ginetta had a major problem with brake overheating in the previous race. As Graham Goodwin, they have brought out new cooling ducts. They were hand carried out, in fact, in overhead uh, luggage. Um, untested, but hopefully, you know, at least CFD or some, uh, some such as has led them to believe they will be more efficient. Have the, have the team given any feedback yet on, on how they think they're working? Uh, spoke to Mike Simpson about exactly that uh, just before coming to the booth and says they have not really had any problems at all with either car on brake cooling uh, since those new ducts were actually fitted. That'll be Andy Lewis, the chief designer of the, uh, the G60. Uh, so they appear to have kind of crossed a line that they've been struggling with all season with that car. You'll remember, I'm sure, gentlemen, the brake explosion that one of the cars actually suffered uh, at Fuji into turn one. Uh, that was you know, a, a clear kind of effect of the symptom of uh, brakes overheating. Uh, the number uh, five car at the moment, though, in its recovery drive, now with Jordan King at the, at the wheel, uh, puts in a purple sector in sector one and sector three and puts in the fastest lap of the race as I speak. 145.240. It's a long way back for that number five car. It's Poe going up and down the order. Yeah, that uh, Jordan King's just got into that car, so it's a brand new set of tyres and uh, putting it to good use at the moment. Just got to remember though, when you bring bigger brake ducts, it generally means more drag, which reduces your straight line speed. However, that particular car, I think, was probably on the slippery side, maybe too slippery anyway, and uh, so it's the better part of the compromise. This circuit, though, is the hardest of the season for brakes and also for brake temperature that bleeds back into the system as well, with 10 pit stops through the, the course of the race, the heat soak 
from the brake system into the caliper is uh, quite a high risk point. But in our GTE Pro battle, the lead still with Nicky Team at Aston Martin Racing. They haven't done one shorter stop or one fewer than anybody else, so on performance, they have somehow managed to get themselves in front of this battle. James Collado versus the man we ride with here, Michael Christensen. So there's two ways of using their limited tyres. Burn them up early for track position or save them to have something fresh towards the end and hope that the, the guys who burned them early get then brought back to you by a safety car. You think Aston Martin might have split the difference? The 95 car started in front, they're giving it a chance to jump away and have 97 perhaps with a little bit to fight with later? They have split the strategy in the past and uh, it doesn't surprise me that they would do that today. However, round here you've got to look at the average number of safety cars and the risk of that happening which is actually quite low yeah this race historically and admittedly this is a longer one than usual they haven't actually had that many safety cars uh, but when they do come they tend to be reasonably long but let's go to Pierre Giddy who is uh, 51 his teammate James Collado is in the car at this moment in time further action for the 51 Ferrari Alessandro at the start of that race. We could see you locked up, so it was a racing incident, but how was it for you? Yes, I had a chance in the, in the start to, to gain some position. I knew I was starting with the new tyres and uh, the, the two Porsche in front were on old. So I saw the door was quite open, so I tried and it worked. I had a small lock up, but at the end nothing, nothing was bad. The tyres were fine. And um, then I had the good paces, I could manage very well, quite well the first thing. And Aston did it on the cut, and now he's in the lead, but uh, they have to pit earlier, so let's see, it's still a very long race. Sure, uh, and how is the car out there? How's it handling? The car is handling quite well, honestly. I'm pretty happy about uh, the job we did in the weekend, and uh, the balance is okay. We know in this track the tire deck is very high, so we need to manage the tires since the beginning, especially in the double steam. This is uh, this will be the key of the race, and uh, I hope uh, we we will do a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Smile on the face of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Here is our GTE Am lead battle. Ben Keating, who's been in from the start in the yellow and black Porsche Team Project One been run down now by former British GT champion Ross Gunn in the AMR 98 Aston Martin. See how much more the lights are showing now. Where are we? It's quarter to five. By five o'clock the sun will be dropping below the horizon and by 5.30 Alan it'll be pitch black outside. So we're in that it very much speeded up witching hour that you get at Le Mans when it sort of just heads off into night time. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it, you can see the lights around about the circuit, so it does keep it quite illuminated anyway. But as you said, by five o'clock, then it is going to be dark. But at five o'clock, we still have six hours, a normal WEC oh, yeah. race still to run all the way to the end. We've only have done two hours by the time we get to that particular point. Right now, though, the racing's uh, pretty fierce. I think uh, people have got to be a little bit mindful about the fact that there is six hours still to go, and I don't mean body or damage or anything else. I mean just the way that they actually fight with other people on track for track position. Uh, because, you know, if you just make a little lock-up, it can actually be quite a detrimental effect with the limited sets of tyres you've got later on. But with GTE Pro, it is so close that you can't afford to give something away, so you have got to fight for every little square centimetre that you can. Uh, your point, by the way, uh, Martin, about Ben Keating, absolutely correct, being chased down by a lost gun, but Ben has been in from the start. Only two of the gentleman drivers have stayed in for their second full stint, so both of them, within the next quarter of an hour, will have passed their minimum driving time, which means the remainder of the eight hours, if the, che uh, if the, uh, the um, teams chose, it is two hours? Two hours 20. Oh, by it's, of course, it's changed because it's... Uh, because it's a long race. No, you're absolutely right. And, and in fact, what I want Louise to do is get down to Team Project One, because you're right, only two gentlemen drivers stayed in. Ben Keating, Team Project One 57, who leads the class, and Ichidio Perfetti, although he is now handed over early to David Heinemeyer Hansen. So the, the other one is Thomas Fleur. And uh, Thomas Fleur stayed in. Thomas okay. Fleur stayed in and has now been in for 51 laps. No, no, no. Egidio Perfetti has handed over early yes. to David Heinemeyer Hansen. 
and one of the questions that I wanted to ask is how the ideal is to put the gentleman driver in to do a double stint and then a half stint later back timing that maybe from the end of the race to get those over other 20 or 25 minutes in but it's how do they stand up to it now everybody else started the gentleman driver took them out after one stint Egidio, Luis has just said in our ears, looked absolutely destroyed by an hour and 40 minutes of racing. But Ben Keating is not only still in the car, but he is still leading the class. All right, fresh young Ross Gunn has caught up to him and is only a couple of tenths behind. But that still means that Egidio will need, at the end of his stint, 20, maybe 25 minutes. Yep. And I want the team to tell us, how are they planning to do that? Where? Is that strategy going to work out? Because they can't forget it. It's got to be a key part of their race strategy for six hours. Yeah, my apologies for the uh, for the error on driving time. You're absolutely right. Minimum for a bronze in GTM is two hours and 20 minutes. But I would suggest that uh, from that point of view, you wait till he's recovered as a driver. Yeah. You also see if there is going to be a very long safety car, and you whack them in then, and uh, then. Alternatively, you've got to take it like you would have taken anyway, which is under full green racing, yep. and put him in for a, a short splash stint. It kind of wonders how long their shortest stint is going to be on fuel. Yeah, but well, you, you do it to the end of the race, so if you know your three stints from the end of the race, or three and a quarter, you put it in for the quarter. And uh, yeah, it's not ideal, but it's maybe the lesser of two evils. Well, let's talk about the Porsche team specifically. Louise, you were just saying in my ear that they too in between 92 and 91. You saw that happen at the last stop. Yeah, just at the last stop when Jimmy got out the car. Um, the 91 changed left side only, and the 92, which is coming first, changed all four tyres. Right, so they are trying to see how the wear is working, thank you, Louise, between those two different strategies. Well, remember that Porsche were uh, the team, especially the, the car that was on pole position with Jimmy Bruni uh, at the wheel, then uh, they actually used two sets of tyres in qualifying. Not that that makes a heck of a difference in terms of the end of the race. However, it's preferable that you actually do uh, you, it's preferable that you, you know, you've got those tyres for the race itself. Well, we talked about the collision between Red River Sport and the 77 Dempsey Proton car. Originally, Dempsey Proton's driver, Christian Reed was handed a five-second penalty. That was rescinded, and we now see why, because the five-second penalty has been added onto the next pit stop for Red River Sport. The car then was being driven by Bond Grimes. Now, at that stage, we didn't see the beginning of the incident. They just came into shot spinning in synchronous, uh, synchronous spinning. However, at that stage, Von Grimes had been ahead of Christian Reed, and we assumed that Reed had had a bit of a lunge. What may well have happened out of our sights is that, Lee, uh, that Christian Reed had crept by, and Von Grimes was having a lunge to try and get back, and contact was made. So uh, the stewards of uh, different camera angles, track camera angles, as well as data from the cars to look at. So they've decided that the Red River Sport driver was actually to blame for the incident. And so he will spend five seconds longer in the pit lane than it would normally be the case. 24 degrees of track temperature, 25. All right, that's not so bad, considering it's been a fairly overcast day. Air temperature, air temperature hovering, hovering around 23. So it's nice warm shirt sleeve weather. However, hopefully everybody has come with uh, at least a body warmer or a sweatshirt or something because it is going to get cool quite soon. Change of that lead, we're expecting get Ross Gunn. As the Martin Factory driver, of course, now goes by. Gentleman driver Ben Keating, it's taken an hour and 52 minutes for that to happen. What a fantastic near total double stint there from Ben Keating in the 57 Team Project One car. Down pit lane comes the 26 hours. And you have to point out, of course, that Ross Gunn hasn't been chasing Ben for those two hours. Uh, he's been chasing for this stint, but Ben Keating still in the top two. G drive back in. Don't forget, it was a short stint last time because they had to bring Jot van Oetert in and put new tires on the car. They put John Eric Van in as well. Now, one of the things that Jeb has to do in Formula E is uh, rub his tummy and pat his head at the same time as driving a racing car. There's an awful lot of cerebral balancing of various different demands in Formula E. Is that going to help him here, where he's trying to drive a very different car, but also 
try and think first and foremost about the tyres rather than the lap time. Well, don't shrug at me, you're a team manager. The reality <laughs> yeah, is that he's got to have that special spatial awareness anyway in every in every race in LMP2. You know, you, you have to push it, but you've got to push it to the limits of what's available to you. That particular stint was a 23 lap stint, so it wasn't a short one as we had to do its next stint. For me, that will be the critical point, whether it is actually a short stint. It's the degradation there. The circuit itself is getting more rubber down. So I would have thought that it is, it's is—it's going to be a little bit easier for them. However, it's not going to be still perfect. That's going to be probably in another couple of hours' time when they'll really be able to lean on it and try to use their advantage. So it's, I think this next stint will still be a bit of a struggle for them. This is ridiculous. Yeah, I know. Uh, we do our best on our side, can we? We just have to wait for the opportunity, can we, at the moment? Just wait for the opportunity with traffic, maybe. Yeah, a little bit of frustration there uh, creeping in from Kobayashi, who's leading, but he's got a 42-second lead. The issue is that he can't get anywhere near uh, the number six, which is driven by Chris Dyson. Now, uh, through down the straights, he can do it on the initial acceleration, but he can't lap that car. As you can see, it just pulls away into the distance. And overall, lap times are dropping about two seconds, one and a half to two seconds, to Gustavo Menezes, who's uh, creeping up behind in the Rebellion. Now, this is what Rebellion want is a situation like this to try to gain back some of that uh, disadvantage that they got from that spin and attack from the LNT of Charlie Robertson at the first corner. Yeah, in this stint, about 10 seconds taken out of the lead by Gustavo Menezes, down to about 41 seconds now from just over 50 when he was going to pull the car. Just remember when Gustavo got in that he got a new set of tyres, Bruno Senna did the double stint and so therefore he's on a fresh set and uh, he's putting it to good use. It reminds me a little bit of uh, his race at China. He went into the car, Norman Nato sort of struggled a bit with the car balance, went into the car, his first lap on the tyre was a blistering fastest lap. And uh, that set, I would say, the mentality up that he was going to attack. However, he did say that it probably wasn't the ideal thing for tyre life to do it that way. <laughs> now, talking about not ideal tyre life, Back in the pits, not just G-Drive, but Racing Team Netherlands, who also had to shorten their last stint because of lack of rear tyres. So TDS, that runs both cars, has clearly not got a handle on how this works. Number seven, the leader trying to go by, and Aston Martin makes it. I'm losing time. I think they are looking at me. You will pass me if you don't stop me quickly. I'm a tech now. No, 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 please, no. He has more new times. Stay out, relax, and I know you what to do. I'm checking. Heard it all year, haven't we? Particularly on Porsche Radio. You're doing a great job. We're in a tyre management phase. You're doing a great job. We're in a tyre management phase. Just keep doing what you're doing. No, that engineer's not doing a tyre management phase, he's doing a driver management oh, yeah, phase. Right the driver's here. doing Absolutely. the tyre management phase. And uh, that's where it's a critical part of it, is to see the overview. And the driver in the car has got a limited view. It's what he can see through the visor and what he can see through the rear view camera. And uh, the engineer's got to give him the overall spatial view. Yes, the Aston's catching you behind. Yes, you're going to drop. It's not a case of you're running out of tyre. It's a case that he's in a different tyre strategy. Just absorb it, take it, and we'll make it towards the end. Just seen a pit stop, or not just not seen, but there has been a pit stop for the 95 Aston Martin. There's 97, Alex Lynn harasses Jimmy Bruni. 95 has been into the pit lane. Nicky Team in the car. Now, that's a double. Marco Sorensen started the car, did a single stint, so Nicky Team stays in for a double stint. So it looks like they're starting to feel that the tyre degradation is levelling off and they can make the tyres last for another run. Yeah, they stopped early with that particular car, put themselves slightly out of sync, and, uh, you know, as cooler it gets, but also, more importantly, the rubber goes down in the circuit. It helps the tyre life that little bit more. Uh, the voice on the radio, Luca Masse, the engineer that moved to Porsche with Jimmy Bruni when Jimmy moved over from his long, long stretch at Ferrari. To give you an idea of the difference here that's, that's putting him in that kind of slightly panicky voice phase, the difference between his lap stint to the moment, uh, Jimmy Bruni and Alex Lane, who's chasing him, under three tenths of a second, uh, but he's also dropping a tenth or so to Michael Christensen through the stint. 
trouble. Yeah, trouble at the middle for David Heinemeyer Hansen. That's not how he talks. Uh, the 56 Project 1 Porsche, the reigning champions, with the in the uh, GTEM class being wheeled back into the garage now. He was last on the road because that car had made one more pit stop than anybody else other than the uh, 83 AF Corsa car. And of course, when you stop, you're going less quickly than cars that haven't stopped. This is an unforced stop, and it looks as though they may have a little bit of a heating issue, or overheating issue, something loose at the front. So behind that big impact structure are all the cooling systems for the uh, mid-rear engines Porsche 911. A little bit of a dive plane, looks like that's come off there. You can see the scraping on the bottom of the car and the uh, underside of the splitter that Alan was talking about that degrades the aero performance of this. Chris, Chris Brody working in the background, that's a Ginetta. Which one? Number six Chris out Dyson. of fourth place. Chris Dyson looping it around in that downhill braking area, nine into ten. Yeah, tricky corner, I'm sure he got a little bit wide and uh, then as he turned in, looped around. The difference with grip from line and being offline is going to get bigger and bigger. Even though we talk about the circuit rubbering in, it's not the whole circuit, it's actually only the driving line of it, which then means there's a bigger contrast between online and offline. It also means it's more important to stay on the line. If you went to make a cup of tea five minutes ago, there's nothing wrong with your television. It's just suddenly become nightfall. Cup of tea, good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Big Those time. last couple of shots, look at that. Look how can, uh, once you get to the equator, the faster the sun plummets and then shoots up into the sky in the morning, nightfall comes here almost as you sort of take your sunglasses off. Oh, suddenly it's night. It's like drawing the curtains, it really is. Oh, but it is, uh, yes. but uh, meantime, right. Rebellion, uh, Gustavo Menezes now under 38 seconds, so he is beginning to make real impact into that lead. Remember, 50 seconds, as Alan said a little earlier, on this uh, stint, new tyres for Gustavo Menezes. That's made a big part of the impact, but impact it most certainly is. And yep. you're beginning now to see response from Kamui Kobayashi. Yeah, Kam Kamui Kobayashi is just pushing on right at the head of the field, same as Mike Conway did, but as you say, the rebellion is closing. 36 seconds, six hours to get in front. That's, that's the bare bones of it. We are just past the two hour mark in the race, two hours and 40 seconds into the eight hours of Bahrain. And still no indication who's gonna win in any of our classes. The class leaders, Kamu Kobayashi, number seven Toyota Gazoo Racing, leading LMP1 and overall. Leading LMP2, no longer second overall, United Autosports, number 22 car of Phil Hansen. Leading in GTE Pro, 51 AF Corsa, James Collado. And his Ferrari is a whole eight tenths of a second ahead of Michael Christensen as his teammate Jimmy Bruni, uh, his teammate is under pressure rather from uh, Alex Lim. And in the GTE Am class, Aston Martin 98 AMR team of Ross Gunn leads and has for a couple of laps now from Team Project One's Ben Keating, the number 57 car that started on the class pole, made it almost through two hours in front and Ben Keating, it'd be really good to hear from him at the end of his stint, which will surely come probably in the next five minutes or so. Uh, TF Sport lying in third place with the Aston Martin of Charlie Eastwood on board with Alex Lynn. I just saw the 42 car, the cool racing uh, car of Alex Borja. Uh, Anthony Borja dived down on the inside. And even the LMP2 drivers are saying the GT cars, when they're well driven, and all of these are, are so hard to get by, Graham, because the speed differentials are all but non-existent. Once these things are actually got up to speed, they are remarkably rapid, and the conversations that have been had, the technical uh, dis discussions that have been had about the changes that will come next season for LMP2 have had to take that into account. This is about keeping the LMP2s away from next year's new class, the hypercars. You've got to take account of the tiny, at times, uh, straight line speed disparity between the LMP2s and these fantastic GT cars. And it's full back, second place for high class, under pressure now from Roberto Gonzalez, the gap coming down lap by lap. And the Jota Sport car right with, uh, not a teammate, but a fellow Goodyear shod runner. So Phil Hansen leading for United Autosports is 48 seconds ahead of, yeah, about 48 seconds ahead of this battle. And his fuel back inches ahead of Roberto Gonzalez. Gonzalez looks like he is closing. Now, a high-class car 
is on older tyres because they changed after the first stint, whereas Jota kept Ant Davidson in for two stints on the tyres. So Roberto has got a tyre advantage in hand. Red River Sport coming out, Charlie Hansen leaving the pit lane there. Not quite sure whose headlights it was leaving earlier. We've got two hours in where we could tell which car was which. We've now got eight hours where quite a lot of it <laughs> is uh, identifying the headlight glare coming down the straight. Uh, not as bad as Le Mans, as Alan said at Le Mans, it gets properly dark for much of the lap. And then the camera can go to sleep anyway. Uh, but here we will have a little bit more difficulty in identifying who, for instance, is in this queue of cars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight down the straight. It's only when they actually get under the camera you can see the Porsche at the head of that group. But that is the uh, LMP2 battle you were talking about. High class racing, Zanders Fjordback fending off. Roberto Gonzalez. This pair, by the way, about 50 seconds back from a dominant leader in LMP2. Phil Hansen at the wheel of the number 22 car at the moment. But this is the number five, Janetta, looking up the inside of the 38. Don't think he's going to get it done quite there. Switch to pit lane. Here comes one of the Aston Martins in to the pit stall. That will be 98. Uh, 90. Okay. No, it's not. It's uh, apologies. That is a 97. 97. OK, so that's a pro-class car. Pro-class Ferrari is in as well. 51. Yes, 51 is in. So, Jens Collado helps to strap in Alessandro Pierre Guidi. 71 is right behind as well. So, Davide Rigon. Is there going to be a driver change there as well? Take the camera round to the right. Camera round to the Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, Miguel Molina being strapped in as well. So, driver changes in both Ferraris. Doesn't look at the moment as though Ferrari are splitting their strategy. Aston is getting maybe left sides only. That looks like left sides only on 97. So they're going to stay with older tyres. Now, there's uh, six hours. There's still a lot of racing to do. Sometimes you have to give up a little now to have a little more later. Tyre change on the Ferrari in the pit lane as well and we also saw the golf racing car in the pits ben barker brought it in after mike wainwright started it mike, so, uh, so ben barker pitting that car from fourth after a storming run uh, up through the field we'll does he stay in now andrew watson takes over so they're doing single 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 so i'm going to ask louise beckett to go down to project one for when ben keating comes in give him a moment to have a breather but i want to see what two hours of heads down gt racing does to a 50 something year old car salesman which is what ben keating is meanwhile we'll get down to team project one and the other team team 56 and catch up with matteo cairoli and find out what their problems were Matteo, we can see all the guys working on the car, working hard on the car. What is the problem? Uh, actually, we have found um, an issue on the exhaust. Actually, there was a big hole and uh, we could not continue. Otherwise, the car could have catch on fire. So for safety reason, we we had to stop and we have nothing we could, uh, we could do. It's just bad luck again. I'm so sorry for the team because we were doing a great job until, uh, until this point. But, you know, our race is, is fully compromised. OK, thank you. That's a very disappointed Matteo Caroli, holding exhaust and uh, correctly the safety decision made to pit the car. Uh, Chris Dyson, meanwhile, uh, in and does Chris rejoin the number six car? First stint in LMP1 in the WC for the American driver. Didn't look from what we saw as though there was Stays a driver in. change. There is a driver change here, though, in the 88 car. Not Angelo Negro and Will Bamba. That was last time. This time, Tom Prining. Uh, pitted the car from third place. By the way, uh, Paul Dallalana back in the 98 Aston Martin. That's now dropped to second. Ross Gunn's done his stint. Ben Keating is still leading. Joy Gazoo Racing lead in LMP1. United Autosports lead in LMP2. Aston Martin's number 95 car bounces back to the top of the GTE Pro class as the pit stops shuffle through. They are out of sync with the other five cars. And Team Project One, Ben Keating in the 57 Porsche that started on the GTE AM class pole two hours and seven, eight minutes ago. 
is back in the lead as the 98 Aston has just pitted. So too has the 88 Dempsey Proton Porsche from third place. So Ben Keating started at the front, stayed at the front bar three laps when he was caught and passed by a young pro. He's still at the front and he is still in the car. Graham Goodwin, not only a fast, efficient, and, and uh, well-driven stint, but he's staying out longer than all his rivals. That's Pitch absolutely now. perfect. Well, let's hear from the number seven Toyota of our race leader, Kamu Kobayashi. Yeah, can we keep pushing? The gap has increased again to 39 seconds, 39 seconds, seven more laps to go, seven more laps to go. Well, Graham Goodwin, as we heard from Toyota, you're pointing out that in the lead in GTEM, Ben Keating has already done two nearly hours. two yep. hours and nine minutes of the yep. race. How can they get another 10 minutes out of the tank of fuel? Oh, no, he's in the pits now. I was just saying, he pits there, he's had a double stint. So well over uh, two hours and eight minutes. Yeah. He's got so what do you, so what do, you do now? Leave the tires on, put in a short fill of fuel, send him out for 12 minutes and just get his stint done. Then you're back on strategy. And, and it, it will be 12 quick minutes as well. Okay, tyres are changed. Uh, I don't know, is Ben stayed in? I'm not Can't sure. I can't believe he'll stay in for a third stint in this. Well, no, but well, he only needs to do 10 minutes now. Yeah. It's it's nine, two hours, nine minutes and 25 seconds, 29 seconds, two hours. You know, by the time he comes out, it'll be two hours, 10 minutes. He needs to do 10 minutes, then come back in, then full set of tyres, full driver change. Otherwise, somehow in the race, they've got to bring the car in and put him in for 10 minutes. He's in now, unless he's utterly dead, and he's not from his lap times. I, I can't believe they, they'll have taken he's, him out. He's, he's coming, you're right, he's back out in the car. It's yeah. the third stint. Into the pits, by the way, comes the Rebellion. And for the first time, after two hours and ten minutes in this race, the top five cars are LMP1s. Uh-huh. Jordan King he made his way back up through the LMP2 field, through the pit, uh, that pit stop cycle, for the time being at least, with fuel only for the Rebellion on the way right now. Yeah. There he goes, the car, the four and a half litre Gibson V8 fires up and off she rumbles. It is the number seven and the number eight uh, Toyotas now first and second, courtesy of that stop. That will change again with the Toyota stop to come in just a few laps time. Then the Rebellion, then the six and five T L and T uh, Ginettas, they are the top five. Well, there is Uke Shonak sitting in the back or standing in the back of the Rebellion garage. He and Peugeot Sport and Rebellion very much on the cards to be teamed up for a hypercar program in what will be season 10 by the time they get to us. They're not coming yeah. in next year, are they? They won't be coming next year, but yeah. uh, it does seem to be the case that they are at least shooting for uh, an opportunity to join in before the 22-23 uh, season. So at some point in 2022 is what's being targeted. Uh, certainly, every indication is they're going to try and get to, to WC Racing as early as possible because, let's face it, their big target is not just the World Championship, it's not just the Le Mans 24 Hours in yeah. 2023, it's the centenary Le Mans 24 Hours in 2023, which will be one of the biggest races in the world. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. Yeah. Ever. After the uh, centenary of the Indy 500, there's certainly a, a, a reasonable bar to be met there, isn't there? A um, couple of years ago. So on board with our race leader, Kamui Kobayashi is a minute ahead of Brendan Hartley. As about you say, Gustavo Menez is down to third. About five more laps on this stint, four or five more laps on this stint. Uh, we are about, we've just seen Gustavo Menez actually pit the Rebellion. And five more laps for the number five Ginetta to complete this pit, the latest pit cycle for the P1s. be interesting to see whether or not, where in fact uh, we've got to have the Toyotas in as well, because they owe us a stop five, compared. Five, five laps each. Yeah. Elliot. <laughs> very good in the truck. Very good. <laughs> Haven't seen that one before. Excellent. Um, so yeah, Toyota back up to 1-2. Gustavo Menezes, uh, the Rebellion seems to be doing a really good job on its tyres. The pace didn't really drop away at the end of Bruno Senna's second stint. If anything, he was still catching the Toyotas. And as the tyre degradation lessens and lessens as the race progresses, then Toyota's four-wheel drive advantage is perhaps going to be even less of a factor than it was when Bruno had his tail up and was charging after them in his second stint. But... We'll have to wait and see how 
the change of temperature of the track surface affects the various different cars and their tyres. Because Alan, like like every other aspect of motor racing, everything changes. It, nothing ever stays the same during a race. On oh, a circuit especially, it's a sort of living creature effectively. And uh, it is evolving, the car's degrading aerodynamically, tyre grip brakes, everything else as the circuit's improving. Uh, and you've got to make the right decisions at the right time. And uh, so from that perspective, it is about management. That's where experience comes into play. And uh, when you talk about that, you mean team experience. Uh, you heard Jimmy Bruni earlier on being coached by his uh, engineer. You also talk about uh, driver experience as well. And that's where I think the LNT guys are probably going to struggle relative to Toyota or to Rebellion. Um, but this car has got someone that uh, is going to be at the wheel quite soon uh, and uh, they've got a depth of experience in terms of driving the car to make sure it gets to the end. Yeah, they do, but is this another short run for Cool Racing's number 42 car, Graham? I, I, I had a feeling that, I mean, they, they made a short no, run before, is, so this is a full fuel run, okay. It's, what, it's one lap short of what they've done so far, so okay. 22 lap uh, stints out of 223 lap stints. Okay, so tyres are ready. Let's see if they do. Well, it's unusual to see them change the outside tyres first, but they are doing both sets in our Senior Tech Alpine as well. And they come in from third place. Pierre Rag has he handed over the car to, uh, I think he has changed drivers in the Senior Tech Alpine car. That rather looked like that was Andre Negrau's bright yellow A on the side of the helmet. I saw a picture of uh, John Eric Byrne going through the S's there as it cut back towards uh, the end of this pit stop. And that car we saw earlier on dancing around with Job Van Oyt at the wheel. And now with Jeff on his second stint, looks very, very similar. Yeah, um, he did say it's a very, very different car to how they've been used to running it all year on Dunlop tyres. But it's utterly different from anything we're used to. So. I think they're in a bit of a world of pain, this race. Uh, Pierre Rag stayed in at Senior Tech Alpine. Nico Lapierre took over a cool racing during those stops. There is Pierre. You feed out right onto the apex in turn one, Alan, and it's, you've got to have your wits about you the second you come out of the pit lane. Absolutely. Oh, your engineer has to have his wits about you as well to tell you there's traffic passing so that you are aware you need to look and you need to maybe just sort of breathe in a little bit because it squeezes into that sort of area of turn one. But there was no incident on this occasion and Lapierre is on his way in the cool racing car and the Signatec Alpine is uh, out there with Pierre Ragged Wheel. Just a co uh, confirmation that, that we are at almost exactly the point uh, in the stint, the second stint on those tyres, the 26 car, where Job van Utrecht pitted for new rubber. So this is the second stint of those. Remember, Job van Utrecht telling Louise that there was a change of uh, a change of compound actually for uh, for this stint. The, the, the comparison in lap time though across those two stints, two short stints at this point, is dramatic. It's 154.6 across that 12 lap stint for Jan van Utrecht. It's a 151.8, three seconds quicker for uh, for Jean Eric Verne. Uh, I think that's a change from the soft to the medium, which is degrading less, holding up a little better. Battle for the lead in GG Pro. Nicky Team in the out of sync number 95 as Settler have uh, a driver change going down there in the pits in LMP2. Right behind the Aston though is Michael Christensen. Don't forget that both Porsche teams used a second set of tyres in qualifying. You might say, look, they've only done three laps, but it does put a really severe heat cycle through them, and that chases you through the rest of the life of the tyre, Alan. It is also the fact that when you come down the pit lane that you're picking up the sand and rubbish that's also there as well, which then sits into the rubber, and uh, you can't get rid of it overnight, because you can't do anything to it overnight. But when you go out with a fresh set, you never actually have that issue. Lap 63, there you see it there, GT lap Pro record. lap record. Wow. Miguel Molina in the Ferrari, in the 71 Ferrari. He's currently sixth in class, but uh, obviously not in speed. Here comes Christensen. Did you see the way the Porsche squirmed off the corner there, lighting up the rear tyres, giving a couple of black marks on the road? That's not great for tyre life, but when the leader is, when you're breathing in more of his exhaust fumes than the are of fresh air, there's always that temptation to just give it a little bit more to get by. Yeah, but he's good on the brakes. Look how much the Porsche pulled in on the brakes into turn four. And I'll see it again here. Very, very stable and also up to the apex. 
So I'd say that the Porsche's definitely got a better tire life underneath him. It's just he's quick in the areas of the circuit and he can't easily overtake. So he's going to have to wait and be patient. Something that, yeah, racing drivers are not very good at. Another very good performance in the Porsche came last lap around. It came from Ben Keating, fastest lap of what had been the leading cars race. It deep now into his third stint in that car, and he is just now two minutes away from having done the minimum time. No, I know, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Sally Olek ahead of Adrian Delina. Sally Olek back in the TF Sport Aston, the red car. Adrian Delina, the better placed of the two Dempsey Proton cars. 88 there, ahead of 77. That's the car that has got the blue highlights. Louise Beckett back from uh, a quick break to recharge her batteries and hopefully she'll be waiting at team project one for ben keating started in the lead of the race and apart from two laps has led every lap in gte am until his second pit stop where alan he was 12 minutes shy of the minimum drive time so they've sent him back out again as Agendalina just squeezes by Sally Ollock, and that is a change for fifth place in GTE Am. So Ben Keating has gone back out into a third stint, uh, and I said I, uh, my natural reaction would be you put in enough fuel to get him to do another 10 minutes, then bring him back in, and then you've done a tiny short stop, but right. you've covered your minimum drive time. No. Nobody else has. They're going to leave him in. He's quick enough here. He's quicker, quicker than anybody else around him at the wow. moment. Uh, they, they can leave him in for a substantial stint here. We're about ready to see the Totas in. We're on the final lap of this stint. Louise Beckett reporting. All the Aston Martin drivers on the pit wall. Well. We're quite a long shy oh. of celebrating victory. Uh, so the 98 of the AM class, 98 Aston Martin leading in its class, the 95 leading in its class. Maybe they just want to get a good view of this battle. Great view from behind the racing team Netherlands car, Nick de Vries. He can't get by them either. And look at the way the Porsche is sliding there as it rotates around the apex. That's not good. Unexpected stop for Kamu Kobayashi, the race leader. No, that's on, that's on schedule. Okay, good. So 75 laps completed. This is their fourth stop. Porsche crew liking this battle as well. But Alan, that rotation at the apex showed us that the Porsche may not have quite as much tire as it thought. Yeah, I think it's got, he's certainly got more than, oh my goodness, that was a bit of a, a shunt there. Between that's the, why they're that's looking. That's why they're looking, is uh -huh. the 98 70 had a, a bit of an attack and it's on the right hand side of uh, the Aston Martin Paul Dallalana there and uh, Cozzolino at the wheel. So it's going to be a little bit of look there. I think the Aston will be okay. I think actually it's a Ferrari that's probably got more risk of damage from that side-to-side -side impact. Well, confirmation comes in our ears from Louise. She's talked to the pit. Yes, Ben Keating is going to attempt to do a third consecutive stint. Um, can I just point out Ben Keating is not in the running for a young driver award <laughs> uh, in, in any poll that I know of at the moment, but uh, this goes to prove not all heroes wear capes. Some of them wear dinner suits style racing driver suits. Yeah, everybody else is going off for dinner, in fact, and just going to leave Ben out there until he runs out of fuel, uh, either personally or in the car. I, I maligned him. He's not a 50-year-old uh, car salesman. He's 48 years old, and uh, he is a car salesman, or rather, he employs car salesmen. He owns 17 different franchises, I think it is, in Texas. So Ben Keating, the car guy, staying out in the GTE AM class. Uh, famously, by the way, when he was running the, uh, the Chrysler Viper uh, in IMSA competition, out for that matter at the Le Mans 24 Hours, uh, was the man that was selling more Vipers in the world than anybody else. We, a man, we know a man like that who ran cars in the American racing who did the same with Porsches. As uh, champions, Dave Mirage. Uh, so 95 versus 92. This is the lead battle in GTE Pro. And so Porsche splitting their strategy. Um, now the 92 car chasing at the front. 91 being a little bit more conservative with the tyres. Aston Martin have changed their strategy as well. 95 here stopped a little out of sync with the rest of the field. 97 is trying to play the long game, and at the moment, Aston's are first and fourth. 97 car in fourth place. 
51 is the better of the two Ferraris. Alessandro Pierguidi is taking the car back from James Collado. Now, if you remember the four-hour race in Shanghai, basically James Collado um, sat and watched the telly for a couple of hours and then eventually went, OK, all right, I'll do the second half of the race. But here they're doing stints and stints apart as they did in the six-hour race in Fuji. So presumably that's just for driver freshness rather than for any other consideration because you don't want to do four hours in a row. To be honest, you've got a regulation. You can't do more than four hours in any six hour rolling period anyway. Yeah. And so you do have minimum, maximum driving time respectfully there. But at the same point, I don't personally quite see the benefits to switching every stint. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem a logical thing for me, but clearly for them it works. And uh, so there is a, there's obviously a good reason behind it. They don't do it for nothing. I'm just yeah. kind of not really aware of why they would want to do it. Well, some of the teams are doing it and some aren't. So for instance, the lead car here, the lead Aston, Nicky teams in a double stint, but this is only the third stint of the race. So Marco Sorensen did a single at the beginning. Yeah. Now that, that might be down to tire degradation and all of the other bits. It was about the fact of also they put a tire on to, uh, to Nicky. And uh, so therefore he should start with that tire and see yeah. it through to the end of its life. Yeah. Uh, that's the way you understand the tire degradation. It's the way you understand the outlap, the inlap, the grip availability. And those are the times where you can easily lose one or two seconds. And we know the GT Pro is defined by one or two seconds. Well, not again, defined by 10 or 20 or 30. Usually. Again, with the Porsches, Sorensen started and is now doing the third stint. Oh, dear. Red River Sport have got a trouble magnet in the Ferrari this weekend, haven't they? That was a lunge down the inside from uh, Jean-Eric Van in the second place G-Drive LMP2 car. There's the leader in LMP2 coming through our GTE Pro battle. The red, white and blue of the Anglo-American United Autosports team. And see the way the LMP2 car, its big advantage is early in the straight. Once the GT cars get to maximum velocity, it's a little harder to get by as he shows as he squeezes by the Aston. Chance for the Porsche. The Aston post pushed a little offline, Alan. Yeah, a little bit offline gives an opportunity to remember. The Aston's a bit quicker on the straight, however, the Porsche's fantastic on the brakes, especially into four. But now the Aston is going to defend to the inside. A little bit of a gap, then he's going to look at it. But no, the Aston squeezed him across. And you saw the amount of muck that was being thrown up by the Aston. Rebellion are in the pit lane. Gustavo Menez is pitting from second. And Louise saying that they look like they're ready to wheel the car back into yeah. the garage. Here we go, they've got a problem. Remember they said that they had a little bit of a gearbox issue with... Uh, they, they wasn't actually going through the gears correctly, and we've got the radio now from one. I just keep the gear and it just, it just went through, and now I had a swimming thing to see. Yeah, gearbox issue there. Yeah. That car so well, they've taken it to the pit. And of course, the other issue, Bruno Senna was saying it was quicker to turn in one direction than the other. So clearly, something in that collision on the first corner of the race has bent either the front or rear suspension. So this might be make sure you get to the end of the race. Don't forget, there are five cars in the class. If you finish within the determined finishing number of laps, you will get points and a half for whatever position you're in. There's no guarantee your rivals will make it. You must get to the end of the race. Yeah, you get 15 points if you finish fifth in this particular race itself uh, for LMP1 because of that points and a half. And normally that would be what you would need for third place in a normal six hour race. And so, yeah, it is a case of making it to the end. And as well with the problems that uh, the LNT uh, number five, then it's not out of the equation that they'll be higher up than that. The issue, issue, mate. Issue, issue. Please confirm. Second gear on the second third now. But flash, flash, flash. Is this up to four? E shift, that's uh, the electronic shift in terms yeah. of the gearbox. And uh, that's the problem. The motor at the back, they're changing, they've taken the rear off. And it could be a multitude of things there, but so it could be quite a quick stop, but I think it's unlikely. Yeah, the actuator could just be shifting the levers too far to select second, but if you're missing two gears, then you really are potentially in a world of pain. Red River Sport with Johnny Molam at the wheel.
uh, back from retirement for this season and last. And the 86 right behind, <laughs> and the one before that, yeah. Um, more retirements than old Blue Eyes himself. Uh, right behind him is uh, Andrew Watson, who is second in the GTM class now in the Gulf Racing Porsche, behind Paul Dallalana in the 98 Aston. Third, still Ben Keating, the 57 car. And uh, Keating's last lap was at a two minute 0 0.1, a 201, and a two minute 0 0.3 for the cars in front of him. So Ben Keating on his third stint, going quicker than the two cars that are ahead of him in class. Yeah, and Alex Lynn here, fourth in category. They were, remember, Aston's were struggling like mad in practice, especially qualifying. They're now first and fourth, and this is first, second, third, and fourth in GTE Pro. It's a fantastic turn, and it's a fantastic race. So now, let's go on board with the car we're on. Oh, the Dane train makes sense. <laughs> the Dane train makes sense. This is a train and you're behind the Dane. That was the comment there from Tristanson being another Dane. Absolutely. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, should say, say, by the way, you talked about uh, the pace, continuing pace from uh, Big Keating. Third fastest driver in the class on the last lap around. Uh, the uh, fastest was the uh, Porsche factory driver, Matt Campbell. And here we go. A chance now for Michael Chris Marco, Michael Christensen rather, to try and get by Nicky Team. Not sure he's close enough, and the G-Drive car is ruining any opportunity he had to pull out. But look, first the Aston, second the Porsche, right there is the Ferrari that is in third place on the road, and the next car behind them is the Aston that's in fourth. So the Dane train is actually backing everybody up. It, to his teammate, the 97 Aston, is closing in on the Porsche and the Ferrari ahead, and the Ferrari... No, I thought that was the Ferrari's headlights. That's the number eight Toyota going inside the Porsche. I thought the Ferrari was having a bit of a, a late lunge there under braking. The big winner out of this is not necessarily just Alex Lynn. It is also Nicky Team because uh, the Porsches said to us after qualifying yesterday, they wanted to be in clear air because that is the best way in the category to keep your tire. If you are behind another GTE car for a long exposed period of time, it really does hurt your front tires. And uh, so therefore the Nicky team is able to sort of control and manage it extremely well, as expected, because he's got a few bits of experience of this. But uh, right now it's one, two, three, four, and Alex Lynn is sitting in a perfect position. I've crawled up behind them, but being able to manage everything to this point. Just to bring you back up to speed with Rebellion, Gustavo Menezes is now down to 11th place. The car's still in the garage. The car has started on pole position that gear selector issue and while they're working on that they may well be going around checking the suspension we might find out they cha changed a corner of the car to not only give them the correct number of gears but also wheels that point in the right direction the other car in the pits is still the project 156 car with that hole in its exhaust not a regular service item i'm saying on a 911 race car so that's probably going to be a longer stop one is back out though down and gone and so they are uh, three laps behind the leaders. Two laps behind LNT. Yeah. And the leader is uh, at turn 13. So they'll stay three laps down, won't go four laps down. Here comes one, two, three, four GTE Pro cars. There are only uh, a, a Porsche and a Ferrari missing from this. So. Uh, there's the Porsche in fifth place behind the uh, Rebellion, so they're all close together still. And Molina's another eight seconds behind them, but remember Molina did the fastest lap and the lap record just uh, about maybe 10 or 15 minutes ago, so it's not a lack of speed that's causing him to be off the back of this particular one. The car that I'm interested in is the car we're looking at is the Ferrari of Pierre Guidi. He has always been one that uh, is an aggressive person in, behind the steering wheel and does like to throw it down the inside. He likes to make a move happen. He doesn't sort of wait for it generally to come to him. And so I think he's going to be the one that will be sort of pushing his way through, trying to get through past uh, the Porsche up ahead. And he has to, because if not, he's going to have Lynn crawling over the back of him, which is already the case. And they are going to be hungry for a win after losing the win, of course, in Shanghai to Ride Heights infringement post-race. But that particular infringement's under appeal, and so therefore they may get it back at the moment. They are not the winners of the Shanghai race. However, in January, when the appeal actually is heard, <laughs> then uh, they may do. The unfortunate yeah. thing is it sort of clouded over that particular result. Yep. However, rules are rules, as we know, uh, but it's not something that, from a driver's point of view, you forget that straight away. 
you know, it's not something that would ever lean on your mind more than the flight home. Yeah, Gustavo Menezes is doing battle in amongst uh, that little group. There he goes. What will be, I'm sure, a spirited attack back. He rejoins, by the way, in 12th position, quite right. Three laps down from the leader. Uh, a further lap down as uh, that's that's, uh, that corner marker has been in and out. Uh, so many times this the, the, uh, the showing this just this two and a half hours so far. Yeah, I think Eduardo's given up trying to get it fixed back in. Uh, there have been full course yellows in the past to reposition corner marks. There's three corners where they've got those little bollards on the inside. But in the end, they only last so long. There's one down on the apex of the corner there. Once they've been hit a couple of times, normally it ruins the bottom of the pylon and it won't go back in the old governor. I had a real battle for pole position here one year with Marcel Fessler. And um, the cone at the first corner had been knocked out and uh, the session was red flagged to actually put the cone back in place. And Marcel asked afterwards, who knocked the cone? And they said, you. you. And he actually hit it right in the middle of the car. So he had the whole car over the curb on the inside. <laughs> was, oh, OK, sorry, I didn't quite see that. Centre punched it well and truly. Uh, pit stop for car number 47. That's Settilar Racing uh, when they uh, stopped and the car was handed over to Andrea Andre Beliki. Now, that is unlikely to be speeding in the pit lane, but it may be one of the other rules, such as there was nobody there with a fire extinguisher, they hadn't attached the earth wire or whatever else. So. Uh, there may be a penalty to serve there. Back on the back straight once more with the drag strip on our left separating us as we look at it from the pit lane and the main straight further left, our top four. And in again comes Racing Team Netherlands, Nick de Vries. Stays in, no, gets out. Fritz van Aert getting back in. That's so, uh, more or less on schedule. It's 21 lap stint for Nick de Vries. So how long was... Fritz did a single didn't he? So how long was his stint? How much more does he need to do? Because the minimum in LMP2 is two hours. He's done 22 laps, uh, so he's got a substantial period. He's got to do, uh, well, a, a, a effectively a stint and a half. Yeah. So uh, that is for it. Oh, sorry, two, two full stints. Yeah, I would think it's it's fringing on two full stints, isn't it? Not long 40, shy. It's about 40 minutes for a stint in LMP2. But they may well do it as singles and then put, let's say, Guido back in on this set of tyres, which are fresh for Fritz, helps keep his pace up. Yep. Guido can deal with the, with the uh, older tyres. So you, you give your gentleman driver, your lowest rank driver, the bronze driver, um, the, whew, the best opportunity he can. Um, Red River Sports' Johnny Molam getting dive-bombed again down the inside. There's Ben Barker. Uh, now that your Bergmeister is retired, surely he is the tallest Porsche driver on the planet. I should think so. Very close. And uh, Red River Sport with the Gulf Porsche that's second in class, Andrew Watson. Uh, what's the gap? 1.3 behind Paul Dallalana in the uh, 98. The green and yellow Aston Martin, or yellow and green Aston Martin. The Nicky team on old rubber here is doing a fantastic job of holding off this snapping, snarling bunch. See how defensive the Porsche went so early there. The Porsche is starting to run out of rubber compared to the Ferrari. And for Alex Lynn, fourth in the queue, yeah, this is a golden opportunity. If the Porsche gets pushed aside, contact, damage on the front of the Ferrari, something dragging on the right-hand corner. And if they fall apart, we could have an Aston 1-2. Pierre Guidi's through. He's up into second place. The Porsche got compromised a little bit in turn 10. Had a run on the Aston. The Aston pulled away, and Pierre Guidi took uh, advantage of both of them. Now I expect Pierre Guidi to launch it down the inside somewhere of the Aston Martin. Well, let's hope he launches without making contact, because bits of front wing tend to damage the uh, oh, he's wide rear tyres. Very, very wide there, all four wheels off the circuit in 13 leading on to the back straight. Some of an enigma here for Alex Lynn. Do you actually go for the position or do you just use the in-car camera to get a million hits on YouTube? <laughs> What's going on in front of you? That's his fantastic stuff. Uh, Alex Lynn's a racing driver. He's not a YouTuber, <laughs> so therefore I would think he's going straight for that opportunity. Yeah. As race leader there, last pass Kamui Kobayashi uh, puts another lap on this GTE battle is in the pits. You've got uh, the G-Drive car with Roman Rusinov, I think, getting in. Yeah, I think it must be. Roman hasn't turned a lap yet, so he needs to at some stage. Now the deck has uh, started to drop off a little bit. Maybe it's the time. Yep. It was a full uh, stint from Jean-Eric Verne. 152.2 his uh, stint average on. 
Richard Leitz is coming on to the back of this. He was about five seconds back. Now it's reduced significantly. So Leitz in the second Porsche. Is the car just coming into the back of the shot there? And uh, this is really going to be a five-car train in the next two or three laps for the lead of GTE Pro. That's it. Uh, I think new on the, the left and used on the right-hand side for the G-Drive, Louise was saying in their pit stop. <laughs> Kevin Estra watching the action on screen. And it is now, it is still Nicky Team leading this queue of pro cars. Uh, Ferrari's got a bit of an acceleration yeah. on the inside, looking to do exactly what he did with the Porsche in the last one. And I think he's got it done. He's on the inside, a little deep break into it. And Ferrari's in the lead. Puerguini's taking the lead from Nicky Team. But Nicky Team, with older tyres, has forced everybody else to sit behind him for the entire stint, pretty much, and squander their new rubber on trying to get by him. So, sure, the Ferrari has got in front, but it, it took newer tyres to do so, and most of that early tyre advantage was just to catch the Aston Martin. Now, huge queue of cars coming through, including... Uh, 37, that's the Jackie Jandisi racing car with the yellow nose, that's second place. And the 42 car, the cool racing car down in seventh in LMP2. Jackie Jandisi racing in second, and 6.7 seconds ahead, Will Stevens is of Roberto Gonzalez in the Jota Sport car. In the pits, car number six, the team LMT car of Chris Dyson. Now, he completes a double stint. And so the Ginetta will shed him, I think, and take on a new driver. And we'll see third position to the team car. As Jordan King has had a really very good stint indeed aboard the number five, uh, has made his way back through the LMP2 field. Remember, slightly out of sequence here because of that early stop for the damage in the turn two collision uh, on the very first lap. But uh, I think uh, Chris Dyson will be well pleased with that. Yep. Chris Dyson saunters away. And uh, Guy Smith taking over for his first stint in the car. So topping up fluids for the driver, the drinks bottle, and making sure all the oil uh, containers and everything are sorted out. And the Team LMT guys affecting a full tyre change. Looked like new on our side, the left-hand side, and used tyres on the right-hand side. They didn't have that glossy sheen of the mold release agent. So left sides and used on the right. And a little bit of a slow getaway from when the car dropped to the ground. Usually it should be instantaneous engine start. Oh, and that's a bit of a tag there and he spun. And that's trouble. Alex Lane may end up with a penalty for that. I don't actually, I feel a little bit sorry for him because uh, the 29, which is driven by Fritz Veneer, pulled in front of him and then went straight onto the brakes, which then takes the aero away from the front of the Aston Martin. And then he kind of just can't do very much about it. Well, uh, I'm sure they again, they'll look at the footage and they'll look at the data from the two cars as well. And if they decide that Fritz Veneer didn't make the pass safely. Actually, no. It, I'll, I'll come back on to that particular one. I do think Lynn's probably going to get a get pinged for it when you see it in the second time. But at this moment in time, he's braked and he hasn't quite. He's expected Van Aert to be quicker into to the To be ball. out of the way, yeah. And he's gone to the Alex has gone to the inside to try and avoid running yep. into the back of the Racing Team Netherlands car, which is why he was tucking to the inside. To, to me, as a, as a layman, that looked like trying to avoid the hit. Well, I think the first thing is that he expected Fritz van Aert to be a bit quicker towards the apex from the braking yeah. point to release and carry more speed and misjudged uh, that particular aspect to it. Whoa, lunge from the Porsche. Another one. Yep. And so almost a vault there too was the Jota Sport car. That had yeah. very hard to stay out of that, uh, out of that uh, moment, but yep. that is another change. Roberto Gonzalez, 12 seconds behind Will Stevens, and that is the Jota Sport car just there in front of this battle for second. And here comes the Aston trying to put the pressure back on the Porsche. He's awesome. trying to get the power down to use the acceleration up the hill. Yeah. The Porsche's not very good in this section of circuit. And he hasn't quite got it done. Okay. You know, we're talking about strategies and how the different strategies they pitted early and maybe looking towards later on a safety car. We've had one safety car. Yeah, we have. And that was right at that's, the beginning of the race. That's probably a lot. Yeah. yeah. I don't think anybody really factors in any advantage of a safety car on lap one because it affects everybody. 
Francois Peredo getting back into the 83 AF Corsa Ferrari. That's his second stint in the car, I think. Um, it but, is. But the guy who has gone right from the start to uh, make sure that there are no dramas with his drive time, Ben Keating, clearly buoyed up by pole position yesterday after qualifying. He was absolutely ecstatic that uh, he and his young teammate managed to grab pole position in the class. It was the first for Ben Keating, first also for uh, Larry Tenforda, and uh, they have led most of this race in the GTE AM class. While we've been enthralled by the, and correctly so, by the GTE Pro Battle, there's been a change to the lead in GTE AM because Andrew Watson has the 86 Golf Racing car ahead and is pulling away, whilst Paul Delano is now being caught pretty quickly by Ben Keating. There's 4.2 seconds the gap. Keating just over 10 and a half seconds off the lead. Now, Delano's not in a double stint, is he? But the tyres possibly might be. Ben Keating, we know, had fresh tyres after double stinting them at the start. He's got a fresh set on. So if Ben Keating either A, stays in, incredibly, for a fourth stint, or B, gets out, that car then, wherever its position, is likely to have, uh, yeah, possibly having old tyres on. Although, unlike the pro-class cars that have only got 26 tyres for qualifying in the race, the AM-class cars have 34, so that's two full sets more so it might be that when Ben Keaton gets out, the next driver to get in may have fresh tyres as well. But in terms of where it all stands with the uh, gentleman driver swingometer, if you like, uh, Golf Racing, the uh, lead car at the moment, the 86 car, now in the hands of Andrew Watson. Mike Wainwright has done one full stint, therefore yep. he needs to do about another hour and 20 minutes. So a uh, double. Absolutely. Yes. Paul Delana needs to do another full stint. He's about uh, just over midway through his second stint. That Ben Keating, as we say, whenever he steps out the car now, does not have to get back in. He's done two hours, 44 minutes already yep. uh, of the two minutes, two hours, 20 minutes that he needed to do. So he is... And is still catching the car ahead of him. <laughs> I know. Well, those fresh tyres have reinvigorated uh, what was already a vigorous drive for Ben Keating. It, it is just possible, if he stays out all the way, he's only 12 seconds behind the leader, it is just possible that the pole man, after a triple stint, might pit as the GTM leader again. So, <laughs> in which case, Louise might need to interview him sitting down, to it's, be honest. It's so far the driver of the race. Absolutely right. Now, the other thing is that the 98 Aston Martin crew, Paul Dallalana, Darren Turner, Ross Gunn, they will be absolutely thrilled to have got to the end of lap one without being torpedoed by a car from behind, no. because that has happened at every race so far this season. So that's a win for them, effectively. From here on in, you're not going into the garage with damage after lap one, you've got a chance. Oh, four wide. wide. And that is uh, the Rebellion going by the number eight Toyota to unlap itself one of its laps on the second place Toyota. So Gus Menezes, that must have felt very good for him going down the straight and overhauling the Toyota. Not yet for position, but we've got five hours for that to happen. Nicky team now has dropped to the back of the GTE Pro field, having put up that staunch defence. That was the charging Miguel Molina. Uh, who's now on the back of that train, or what remains of the train, with uh, Nicky team having just dropped to sixth. Now, how long has Nicky got to survive before he can go back into the pits? Six Louise... laps. All right, Louise is saying Marco Sorensen is getting ready. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure that they're going to bring, him, bring him in six laps early. No, they're unless they absolutely have to. He's now at the point in this stint that Marco Sorensen was when they came in early and took them off, uh, off sequence. He's three seconds slower than most of the cars in the class, so per lap. So he is actually losing ground quite significantly. And to put that into, into perspective, uh, Nicky Team in the pro Aston Martin did a two minutes 2.9. The AM leader in the Gulf Porsche did a, two, uh, a one minute 59.8. And Paul Dallalana did a two minute 2.1. So only eight tenths on that lap slower than Nicky Team in what is an identical car effectively run by the same, uh, out of the same garage by the same crew, but with uh, a gentleman driver rather than the pro in. So Nicky Team hasn't forgotten how to drive but he has definitely run out of tyres. 
Pinnacle Racing in the pits as our second, uh, uh, third hour uh, is not too far away. And our fourth set of stops now starting for the LMP2 cars. Almost three crazy hours of racing already. Just one to go, oh, just five to go in the eight hours. Yeah, Alan Manish going, how much longer is this going on? Five hours, 10 minutes and a couple of seconds more racing. So a long way from working out yet who is going to win any of our four classes. As of now though, number seven and eight Toyota one, two in LMP1. Things are not as they may seem, however. In LMP2, United Autosports just stopping from the lead. Jackie Chan, DC Racing second, G-Drive third, but G-Drive in woeful tyre trouble that may not yet be resolved. In uh, the GTE Pro class, the long-time leader, the 95 Aston Martin, Nicky team is now dropped to the back of the field. A, of course, a Porsche and Aston Martin are one, two, three. There is United Auto Sports car. Problem with the gun on the left front. But now, Phil Hansen has handed the car over. Or is he staying? He must have handed over. He's getting ready to go out. There's 37, Jackie Chan, DC Racing. Will Stevens is out. Uh, Hopintung started the car, so I think that means Gabriel Aubrey has probably got in. And they are doing, uh, well, they're using used tyres, at least on one side of the car. And just to round out the picture, in the GTE Am class, Golf Racing's Andrew Watson setting some stunning lap times. The only man in class below a two minute lap. He's leading from Ben Keating, who's now back up to second in Team Project One, ahead of Paul Dallalana. So Keating, the pole sitter, who's led most of the first three hours of this race, has overhauled the Aston of Paul Dallalana to move back up to second. Fred Goodwin, he may yet come in and end his stint as the race leader. Uh, he may, but uh, Andrew Watson, the golf racing car, is having a storming time at the moment uh, at the lead of that race. Just watching that United Autosports pit stop, it felt like it was pretty long. It was a minute and 36 seconds, so they've yep. lost a bit of time there. I think you mentioned possibly a problem with the gun, uh, but lost about 15 seconds there. It's as if there was something else on that left front as well, so I'm yep. not sure whether they were actually having an inspection at the same time when the wheel was off. 95 is in, the Dane train, that Nicky team, probably hot, sweaty, with a lot of very odd hair stuck to him. Hands over to Marco Sorensen. 28 laps on that stint uh, compared to 31. The car can theoretically manage on okay. fuel. It's only managed 31 once. Uh, 25 laps for Marco Sorensen, took the car strategy, then a full 31 from Nicky team, and then 28 laps on that stint. 
This is the battle for third, the Aston of Alex Lynn ahead of the Porsche Ferrari battle and the Porsche 91 is Richard Leeds ahead of Miguel Molina. Molina, winner here in GTE Am, or the fastest lap here in GTE Am the last time we raced here. He's a pro driver this time, still trying to find a way by Alan. I think that was a little bit risky by Molina the way that he played it into the corner, he compromised quite a lot, so it had to be a very rust a robust defence by uh, Leeds, but Molina still looking down the inside into the final corner. Tricky place to do it actually into there because of the way that the corner actually turns and then drops down. But uh, Leeds is certainly on his way, but Molina is the quicker of the two right now. Unfortunately, Miguel Molina coming all the way down the straight on basically, basically what's a rally stage of filth. Uh, so his tyres will be covered in lumps of rubber that don't give him good grip. And again, you can see all the dust being thrown up behind the car as he comes offline down the main straight. They get stuck behind a 36 senior Tech Alpine car that basically comes to a halt at the apex. And that 36 car now in third place in LMP2, Pierre Rag at the wheel, having taken over from Andre Negrel. Oh, Miguel! Oh, yeah, but he sticks his nose down the inside but not completely, so he's always going to tag the back of the car if uh, they do actually have contact. And so he's putting himself at risk, because if he does that, then he'll be the one that takes the penalty more than likely. Yeah. And he, he's also got the chance of uh, spinning himself, as we saw nearly there. And it is not helping the tyres either. The key factors here for GTs and everybody else, tyre life and brakes. Well, the person that's gaining out of this particular fight's Alex Lynn, who's now got a bit of breathing space. And think, mm. thank goodness, this is on the previous lap where uh, he gets moved right off and he's up completely off the circuit on the inside. Looks good, but uh, ultimately didn't quite get it done. And uh, Leitz was able to sort of sing it around. This is at the point where Leitz turns in. Again, he's at that three quarter area and uh, just not enough as now the 98 goes back out. Yep, had lost at second place, came in in third, Paul Dallalana, but he's now handed over, I think. Let's get down to the Geneta Garage to Team LNT and hear from the man who started car number five, Charlie Robertson. Charlie Robertson in the number five was the starter of this race. Um, you, <laughs> I don't know what to say with your stint, everything happened for you, didn't it? Yeah, it was uh, a bit of a spiral, to be honest. Obviously, the start um, was less than ideal. I got a, a good run on Bruno, and uh, I had the inside for the for the left. And to be honest, the wheel spin just caught me out, and uh, and I got sideways, and unfortunately, collected him with the rear. Um, a mistake on my part. Um, I misjudged how much rear grip I would have on the opening lap. So uh, I'll learn going forward, and you know, I think we suffered quite badly from it. We lost a lap. Um, with uh, with changes we had to make in the pit lane. So we're fighting back through now. Jordan's in the car, up to P3 at the moment. Understand that Rebellion have also been in the box. Um, so yeah, it's a long race. Obviously the opening stint was, was, wasn't was ideal, but happy that we're, uh, we're pushing back through now. As you say, we've still got a long way to go. Five hours? Yeah, five hours. So, you know, um, it's a, it's a long way and, and eight hours is uh, is a long time to race in. So yeah, we're still quite positive we can get something back out of it. Uh, already out to P3. We know Toyota is so slick on the stops and uh, if we want to challenge them for anything, we've got to hope for uh, for a mistake or, or some pretty mega pace. And we've got some good race pace. So yeah, just keep pushing. Eight hours is this race. It's the longest Janetta has ever run. So do you think that you're going to be okay going all that way? I know you're going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. So. We've done Le Mans, obviously, but that's a very different race. He is very difficult on um, on brakes, and uh, we've been brake cooling, trying to do our best. So, yeah, cooling the brakes down will we'll hopefully get us to the end. And, and we, yeah, it's the longest race we've done this season, so hopefully we'll make it. Thank you. Cheers. Scott Charlie Robinson. The accent clearly shows he's been spending a lot of time in Yorkshire recently. He sounds a bit more Emmerdale than uh, Dr. Finley. Ask your father. Uh, Kamu Kobe, Ashley, Brendan Hartley, one, two, and Team LNT uh, with Jordan King and Guy Smith, three, four, in the LNP1 class and overall. Let's get back to our pro class GTE battle and hear from the 91 Porsche. 
How many announcements will the pitch stop? Because we lose point of time. So Rex, if it's happen again, let it go. I don't want you to space from the Aston Martin and I want you to overtake the Aston Martin. Uh, Ferrari has used it two more times than us. Well, there you go. Again, the engineer has to do more than engineer the car. He has to sort out the nut loose behind the wheel as well. Ignore the Ferrari. I want you to overtake the Aston Martin. We're in a battle with the Aston because they're on the same tyre strategy as us. Ferrari doing something different. Let him go. Don't burn your tyres up. And, and you've got to have that pit wall perspective that the driver can't have, Alan. Yeah, you do, and uh, I take issue with you calling the driver the nut that's loose behind the steering wheel, but anyway, that's uh, it's part of the thing, but uh, it was a very deep and late manoeuvre there by Molina, and uh, the 91 just sort of basically backing out of it in the end, and now the Ferrari will get past the Aston pretty quickly. This is where the, actually the Ferraris generally have got very good traction out of uh, turn 10 and uh, looking to get down the inside into 11. Not in this one, but uh, I think they'll be going past pretty quick. You can see what Aston Martin have done here. They have got old tyres on one side, fresher on the other. Boys, what do you do next? It's imperative. We keep trying position here, but we take the four new tyres. Copy that. That is the plan. That is the plan. So Alex then, Going to Tim, going, we've got to have new tyres, otherwise we're going to give up any chance of anything. OK, yeah, we're on board with that. That's the plan agreed. So does that mean he's likely to stay in, or is he going to hand the car back? We'll have to wait and see. If they give four tyres, then normally I would expect there to be a change of driver yeah. as well. Ben Keating has finally pitted after two hours, 59 minutes of... Uh, GT and racing handed the car over to Larry Tenforda, brought the Team Project One Porsche that started from pole into the garage in second place in class, Graham Goodwin. And that's a huge stint, very nearly three hour triple stint by Ben Keating. Uh, as we just go back just briefly to the battle in GT Pro before we uh, talk about that amazing stint from Ben Keating. Uh, what I think we're hearing that radio message was two different versions of the same message. You've yeah. got to keep track position, but he's lost it there. Uh, has to cede the position to the Porsche. It runs wide, though. The Aston Martin's got to get it back. Yeah, uh, he's conceded two positions, basically, the Porsche and also the Ferrari up ahead. And so, oh, and the Porsche's completely <laughs> off the circuit there on the inside. So if he had held the position, he would have done it illegally by regulation. Yeah, fantastic close quarters racing. This is what GTE Pro gives us. GTM does so often as well. Think back to Fuji and the battles between some of the Ferraris in GTEM. But the pro class drivers, you know, these are guys who are competing at world championship level. Yeah. And this time the Porsche, as you said, Alan, it's just a little bit better hooked up off the corner. He's got the overlap, but the Aston speed down the straight pays. He can flash the headlights all you like. Alex Lynn still gets to turn in in front, but will he be quicker up the hill? He's got the inside line for the next one, but it is going to be around the outside, I think, by the Porsche to get it done, and he's managed to achieve it. drive through penalty for disrespecting blue flags for Johnny Molan. Uh, he was under investigation for that a long while ago. That's where we saw the Red River car being dive-bombed a couple of times into turn one. Uh, they obviously decided that he wasn't opening the door wide enough for the cars that had to squeak by him. They didn't make contact with him, so if they got by, I'm not quite sure how that's a penalty, but that's why I'm not a steward. Let's get down to the Toyota pit and catch up with the driver of car number eight, Sebastian Buemi. There's no doubt about it that the start of that race really affected the rest of the number eight race. So. Yeah, obviously uh, I was trying to stay uh, out of trouble, you know, in the first two corners and uh, and clearly, yeah, I saw the Ginetta spinning into the Rebellion, trying to avoid. I had obviously to go off track and then when I came back, I had a a contact with an LMP2, I tried to do the best I could, you know, to stay on the line, but obviously that was not enough. And then we had to change the front end and obviously damage the tires massively. So it wasn't an ideal start. We, we are now second and uh, obviously quite a bit uh, behind car number seven, but we never know what can happen. You know, there's still five hours to go. So what is this? What is it you're going to be looking at? Because everybody's saying tires, obviously. Is there brakes? Do you have to consider that as well towards the end of the race? Yeah, obviously we have a very similar strategy to car seven. 
uh, which is right now the the only opponent. Let's say if we don't have any issues, so we we'll try to to see what what happened. You know, we seem to be quite quite competitive now. And uh, obviously, if there is a safety car or a full Cosielo, we, we never know. So we keep pushing until the end. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we heard earlier from, uh, I think it was from uh, Paul de Resta, that uh, it wasn't in fact an impact with either of the LMP1 cars in turn two. But as the Toyota came back up to track, it was a brush with the United car, it was the, uh, the, the point at which the damage was caused in the brake car. But uh, as he says, tyres so critical here that any kind of damage you actually suffer like that is going to have a knock-on effect. And the knock-on effect at the moment of all of that, um, with the delays that they had, is they are 75 seconds back from the team car, in the hands of Kamui Kobayashi, Kobayashi uh, in second position. So it's Toyota Gazoo Racing 1-2, 7 from 8, then it's the Team LNT uh, Genetas, as one of those cars comes down pit lane now, uh, with the five, and it is the five car, uh, yeah. and the six, then the number one rebellion back into fifth position. And the 97 Aston as well, so Alex Lynn coming in to hand over to Maxime Martin, he will have four new tyres, we just heard that, get out of the way oh. with your wretched LMP1 car if you don't mind. Waving the Ginetta on, uh, <laughs> obviously having a little bit of trouble finding the pit box, Alex bounces out, Maxime Martin will get in. Uh, that was Jordan King bringing in the uh, number five Ginetta after it was Jordan a King in the wrong in the wrong store, wasn't it? Yeah. Come here, that's me. No, no. We're British, but we're not your lot. Carry on. Get out of the way. <laughs> Had to fire the car up again. He's obviously just seen a stick hanging out and go aim for the stick. No, wrong stick. Um, yeah. <laughs> Fundamental stuff again. Um, so Alex Lynn comes in and that puts Aston Martin right down to the tail of the pile in the class as well. Was that two tyres or four? Well, they, we said they said they were going to do all four. So it looks as though they may well have done. Now Larry Tenforda has taken over in the GTE AM class from Ben Keating. So we're going to send Louise from one end of the pit lane to the other to catch up with Ben. This is uh, earlier on when they had the overtake, and it was then. This is later on at turn eight, and the, the sorry, the Aston Martin struggling a bit prior to that pit stop with the traction issues, which you can see definitely as they come out of this next corner. Porsche lining up two corners beforehand, and then executing the acceleration, which didn't quite happen, but uh, got the cut back here out of turn eleven and up the hill, and then the job was done. Now, the battle between Miguel Molina and Richard Leitz in the 91 Porsche is under investigation, and that'll be where Leitz forced Molina all the way off track when the Ferrari was already alongside him. We saw that quite clearly when they were catching Alex Lynn before both of them went by him. So we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Meanwhile, Toyota Gazoo Racing 1-2. Expected it to take quite a long time for to get up to first and second. Uh, it took a little less time than they expected. Number seven car coming out of turn two in the lead of the race after the front row men um, contrived to tangle. We heard Charlie Robertson uh, admitting mea culpa. He just got the rear of the Ginetta. The rear wheels spinning up under acceleration far more than he thought. Clattered into Bruno Senna, took Senna and himself out of the fray. And the leader is into the pits. Ben Hanley has just stopped, uh, just got into the number five Team LNT car. Guy Smith got in last time round, so we'll probably do a double stint. Golf racing car from the lead. Andrew Watson is in GTE AM. That's the black car that we've just gone by as we follow the Toyota. So Watson may stay in for a double stint in that. Mike Wainwright in that car has done one stint, needs to do two more. And that will put uh, what is a Porsche 123, Dempsey Proton will now go first and second as Gulf Racing dropped to third, possibly fourth, possibly fifth. Porsche is going very well in the GTE AM class. Ferrari 1-2 in the GTE Pro class, ahead of the Porsches and the Astons. Toyota 1-2 in the LMP1 class and overall. While United Autosports continue to lead, they've led every lap barring pit stops in LMP2, ahead of G-Drive, who seem to have got on top of their tyre issues. With Roman Rusinov managing the pace. Alessandro Pierguidi 
Ferrari number 51 and teammate Miguel Molina both in together. They're only 15 seconds apart. Alan? That was a new set on the left-hand side and a scrubbed set on the right. The right-hand side uh, had a tyre that I presume was run in qualifying and uh, is being cleaned up, tidied up, and is back on the car and on its way as the sister car comes into the pits. Brendan Hartley is now running down towards his pit stop. Flag out. Both those Ferraris, by the way, bang on schedule. Richard Leitz due in on the next lap. He takes the lead for the time being. Hartley hairs out and in gets Kaz Nakajima. Well, it's uh, asked Louise to report earlier from Rebellion. Now, we heard from Gustavo Menezes, didn't we, that they were having to change the E-shifter, the electronics that control the gear shift, but they didn't do any suspension work on the car. Now, Louise is in the garage and can't hear us. She was saying that uh, that was all they'd had to do. So, uh, if the car is slightly out of balance, it is still slightly out of balance. Brand new, shiny tyres. Going on to the Toyota, at least on our side of the car. Yeah, and I think it would be the same principle with uh, the right-hand side being used and the left-hand side, when well, say used, slightly used, and the left-hand side being you. Continuing the rhythm of double stints reach the drivers, Mike Conway and Kamui Kobayashi have doubled in the number seven car. We've now got uh, Pachita Lopez aboard for the first time. Sepuemi and Brendan Hartley have completed their doubles in the eight, and indeed it's Kaznakajima on rotation. All very orderly stuff at the moment for Toyota. Well, that's how you win races, isn't it? By being firmly in command of what you're doing. Yeah, you win and races by the making, car. making less mistakes from the rest as well. And uh, that's the thing. You know, from the first corner onwards, then the others were contriving to gift it towards Toyota. And uh, they they can execute now a clean and tidy race all the way through. This particular battle, though, is one that's going to still be defined by the least number of errors and a good bit of strategy towards the end in terms of when you can hold on with the old tyres more than when you can gain with the new Double stinting Richard Leitz in the 91 Porsche that comes in as our GTE Pro leader. And there are tyres on the apron. They can't start changing tyres till they finish fooling with fuel. Too much alliteration for this time in the evening. That's a new one, though. That's a brand new one. Are they doing lefts only? There's only two tyres. There's none other on the ground. I think this is left sides only. Yes, it is. So fresh side, left side, and old side, right side. So again, all of the GT Pro teams, and I'm sure the AMs, are looking at trying to stretch out their tyre usage. There's 57, Larry Tenforda, the black and yellow car. Second in the GT AM class is right ahead of him, Mike Wainwright. Wainwright doing his second stint, and Paul Dallalana, fourth in the GT AM class, is right behind in the yellow Aston. And here is Aston losing to Porsche. Tenforda down the inside of Dalalana, and through he goes for third. Well, the leader of the class is Adrian Delina, but he is now pitted in the 88 Dempsey Proton car, and that puts Gulf Racing's Mike Wainwright as of now in the lead. Will he still be the leader in a lap's time? Well, Mike Wainwright, one of the AM drivers in this Pro-AM category. Larry Tenforda, absolutely in the young Pro class, one of the top three, uh, I think they ended up in fourth place in the uh, Porsche Mobile One Super Cup this year, but a race winner and in contention into the very final race of the year for the championship. It was eventually won uh, for the third straight time by Mikel Amamola. Just up ahead of them, coming out of the pits is MR Racing Ferrari with Ishikawa at the wheel as well. And so even though he's not in the battle in this particular battle on track, He's uh, going to be in the mix of it somehow because uh, and he's going to take a little bit of time to get up to speed. But I'm not sure that uh, Ten Van Oort is going to take the time to do that as he now looks down the inside. He's on the wrong point, so he's not going to get the acceleration out of the corner like he did on the last lap. Right behind him in the Aston, Paul Dallalana is rubbing his hands with glee metaphorically because if Larry Tenforda has a lunge on Mike Wainwright, leave as the black Porsche of line, then Dallalana is close enough to go straight up the inside like a rat up a drain pipe. Uh, one quick question, really, about uh, Paul Dallalana. Last, uh, last stint was only 23 laps for 
uh, the Canadian. And it was only 58 seconds on pit lane, which looked to be fuel only. Yeah. I'm not quite sure why you'd have done that. Well, I'm not sure either. The, the way the car is moving around, though, it does look a little bit like he had a fuel only stop. Yeah. Larry Tenforda took over on stint old tyres from Ben Keyes, who were nearly stint old tyres. Uh, didn't see what happened with Mike Wainwright when he took over from Andrew Watson, but I'm guessing if I was the team boss, I'd have given him a fresh set of rubber to try and hang on in front. Give your gentleman driver, your bronze driver, as much of an opportunity as you can. Make the professionals, make the young guys struggle with slightly less rubber. Yeah, alternatively, he could look that he's only going to do, uh, you know, one hour, say yeah. one hour 40, and you don't fill it up for that. And you save the time on the pit lane and you save the energy into the tyre as well. I think you're absolutely right. They've, they've, they've basically turned a time pit stop for, for fuel, haven't they? For, for what the he's going to require. Indeed, he's going to do that. Larry Tenforda to the inside. Mike Wainwright covers off. Uh, a chance for Paul Dallalana to run by him. Lose one place if you have to. Don't over, con uh, over defend and give away a second. Dallalana is right there. Who's coming up behind them? 22, LMP2 leader through slots. The United Auto Sports car. And that is Felipe Albuquerque. First time in the car for Felipe. And he's working his way through this GTE Am lead battle of equals. But again, the 57 that started on pole position is back at the front. And just to underline, uh, we are three and a quarter hours in, and this is the first stint in that black and yellow car for one of the pro drivers. Ben Keating started it on pole and brought it in in contention for the lead of the race. Mike Wainwright, I mean, he's defending really strongly here, really making the other Porsche work hard for the pass. Yeah, and uh, he's quite right as well, because this is the race lead that he's defending. It's not just an overtake. I think that was a bit late, chap. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's should've, you should have been clapping a little bit earlier on that one. But uh, he sandwich. should be happy with it's it It's sandwich, well. absolutely. Yeah. It's sandwich, yeah. Good goodness gracious. Well, coming back to one thing there, United Autosports, we were talking about the good years at the start of the race and how the good years were really making a march on the first couple of uh, stints. But it's United Autosports with the Michelin tyre, then G Drive of the Michelin tyre, and then it's the two, uh, the, the two Jota Sport cars on the good years from there. But the good years don't seem to have had the effect as uh, the temperatures have cooled off and the grip has come up that was maybe expected at the beginning. So three and a quarter hours into the eight hours in Bahrain, Toyota 1-2. This is Jose Maria Lopez, our race leader in the number seven TSO 50 hybrid. A warm, dry day in Bahrain for the eight hours, round four of the FIA World Endurance Championship, the last WEC race of this calendar year and indeed of this decade. Getting underway with Bruno Senna in the red, white and black rebellion, pacing the field to the line ahead of Charlie Robertson in the all-black team LNT Janetta. Toyota's second and third on the grid and the GT field hanging back from LMP1 and LMP2. Rush down to the first corner, inside line, the advantage for the pole sitter, tries to make enough room for himself. Charlie Robertson, the number five Ginetta, right there, and then spins up the rear as the turbo cuts in, clatters off Bruno Senna. Off two goes the number eight Toyota. It makes contact with the LMP2 leading United Autosports car as it comes back on. Into turn one, a brave move from the Ferrari up the inside to take the lead away from the front row starting Porsches in GTE Pro as the carnage happens in front and the safety car is strangled. Three laps later they go green. Toyota number seven who avoided the dramas. Mike Conway running away in the opening stint. Ferrari, Porsche, Aston Martin as ever. The battle at the front of GTE Pro intense and swinging to and fro as they work their tyres. Ben Keating leading the GTE Am class from pole position and leading comfortably in the Project One Porsche. United Auto Sports number 22 car, Paul DeResta was second overall when the safety car pulled in. Moving up into second position, the uh, team LNT Gianetta, the car number six that was not so delayed. 
and then coming up behind him from what was 14th place after the safety car, the number one, uh, number one rebellion, fighting its way back through and up into second place. Sun starting to sink as eight hours of racing continues and contact between the AM class cars. Drama for the Rebellion with gear shift has cost it three laps. Number eight, Toyota moving up to second, Giletta's third and fourth. More contact, this time in the GTE Pro class. Battling for fourth place behind the Aston of Alex Lynn. Miguel Molina going through, battling up into second rather, behind the lead Aston. After the 95 car held up a whole queue of cars, its sister car tagged the 29 into a spin. The LMP2 car leaving it little room to maneuver. And after three and a quarter hours, Toyota still lead outright. <sighs> On board with our race leader here in Bahrain, the eight hours of Bahrain, the longest race so far in season eight of the FIA World Endurance Championship. As many hours of racing in this one encounter as we've had at Silverstone and Shanghai put together. So the longest race of the series so far, points and a half. So not 25, but 38 points on offer for victory. And the gap for second place as well. Uh, 27 for second, 23 for third. So significant points to be earned here. And at the moment, Toyota Gazoo Racing are going to extend their team's advantage over Rebellion. If nothing changes, they are first and second at the moment. Jose Maria Lopez leading in the seven. Kazuki Nakajima in second place in car number eight. Team LNT with their two Ginettas in third and fourth. And the Rebellion up to sixth place overall. Still fifth in the LMP1 class, but still a lap behind the Rebellion, uh, the Team LNT Ginettas. Although it has unlapped itself once on the field since he was delayed. In LMP2, Felipe Albuquerque taking over after Paul DeResta started the United Autosports LMP2 car. And then Phil Hansen put in uh, strong stints as well. Felipe now taking over as darkness has fallen. And he too will be in for a double stint. In second place in LMP2, G-Drive. They recovered after early problems, having chosen the wrong tyre compound, made them stop earlier. Jan van Oyten really struggling for grip and lost six positions before they finally uh, accepted the inevitable and pitted him. The tyre selection seems to be working better. G-Drive in second with Roman Rusinov in LMP2. Third, Jackie Chan, DC Racing. Fourth, Jota. And fifth, Senior Tech Alpine ahead of high class in six. In our GTE Pro Battle, 51 Ferrari, Alessandro Pierre Guidi ahead of the 92 Porsche. We ride with Kevin Estra. This is the lead battle. And it has seesawed between Aston Martin having the upper hand, Porsche having the upper hand, and Ferrari having the upper hand. And Alan McNish, a lot of that is down to how they are using a very limited number of fresh tyres on their cars during each of these stints. Yeah, there was a lot of work done in the first and second practice, especially the second practice, because that was uh, roughly at this time of uh, the evening as well, to try to understand how they could eke out extra performance out of the tyre for longer. And it means that as the one, number one spins, that is the Rebellion Racing yep. that's recovering on the circuit. Gustavo Menez is down at turn one, and uh, he's looped it around and uh, on his way again. Now, but uh, they're down in sixth place overall. He's got a couple of LMP2 cars behind him. Not Ginetta, or, Ginetta. Ginetta. Not too far in front of him, though, is 36. The Senior Tech right. Alpine LMP2 car. Hold on a second. He's gone in. No. I was just wondering yeah, if he got all at sixes and sevens trying to nip inside a P2 car, but he hadn't. That was one of the AM-class Ferraris in front of him. Uh, Graham Goodwin is in the booth with me and Alan McNish. Graham, uh, watching the strategy unfold, a little too early perhaps to predict much. Uh, one thing I can predict with absolute certainty, unless something dramatic happens in the next 60 seconds, we're going to go to the third-place car. <laughs> Guy Smith is due on pit lane on this lap, I believe, and is just 16 seconds ahead now of what was, of course, the delayed number five car we heard from Charlie Robertson the Louise in pit lane earlier after the dramas of his stints at the beginning uh, of the race. Uh, but uh, Ben Hanley, 
uh, together with Jordan King and Charlie Robertson fighting back and will be in third place uh, when uh, Guy Smith pits the car very soon indeed. Uh, back though with GT Pro, gentlemen, this one just continues to serve up the entertainment. <laughs> very close indeed, Kaganestra. Just piling the pressure on Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And these two are under investigation for an incident that happened nearly an hour, 50 minutes ago, actually, yep. at uh, turn 10, where the two of them kind of obviously got into each other a little bit. I think that means we've got investigations at the moment into both Ferraris on both Porsches or vice versa. <laughs> That's probably a fair representation of the race. <laughs> Right, let's get down to GTEM and to Team Project One, to our driver of the race so far, Ben Keating. He's with Louise Beckett. Coming back from a triple stint, Ben Keating, I'd just like to say hi, my name's Louise. I did interview you on the grid, but that was so long ago, you may not remember. What an amazing run that was from you. Oh, uh, thank you. It's really exciting out there. It's a lot of fun. You know, I just uh, drove for three stints, uh, got all my driving time out of the way. Uh, that wasn't necessarily the plan, but uh, I was doing well enough out there and I felt good in the car. They just decided to leave me in there and uh, get it all done. But uh, it was a lot of fun out there. And uh, you know, I, it was fun to get out of the car and uh, change clothes and come uh, at the end of, after three hours of racing, see one, two, and three right there uh, uh, in turn one. Make a Larry made a pass for the lead again, so uh, fingers crossed. Uh, so far, so good. We hope that we have uh, taken out one of the stops uh, by leaving me in for a full three stints. Uh, hopefully, we make one less stop than everybody else, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Good strategy. I'm going to let you go and get some food because you haven't eaten since breakfast. I'm sorry, that was too loud. I couldn't hear you. Go and eat. Okay, I'm going to go eat. Sounds good. Thank you. Going for food is never a bad call. Never, ever a bad call. Now, look at this. We've got AM class cars, we've got P2 cars, we've got Pro class cars. Here's the chance then for the Porsche 92. Kevin Estra still all over the back of Las Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Through goes the United Auto Sports car. They're trying to get by the Dempsey Proton. AM class Porsche and the door closes, but the Dempsey Proton car somehow finds enough room to avoid contact. And Alan, when you're the AM class driver there, survival is absolutely critical. Somehow try and make enough room for all these other loonies coming past you. You've definitely got to be uh, very aware of what's around you, and that's where I think the GTE guys, their spatial awareness is incredible. I'm, I'm sure they've got, you know, human sonar that works for them <laughs> because they're able to see, they're able to look and actually spot the apex up ahead and the braking points and things, millimeter precision, plus also to know what the speed and the closing gaps are behind. I think that is a skill set that if you stuck any LMP driver in there, they would be terrified. I know I would be, that's for sure. Well, Khaled El Kabaisi was the guy in the 88 Dempsey Proton car. He knew that there was something coming up behind him, and then suddenly the set of lights that he could see became three sets of lights, and he had to try and survive all that, and he did with uh, significant aplomb. The battle for the lead in GTE Pro continues. 92 Porsche, we're riding on board right behind. And as you talked about earlier on when we were in the Porsches, it's the early part of the corner into the apex where they really have a big advantage on, it seems, both the Ferrari and especially the Aston Martin. But it's, it's converting that into a pass off the corner that is producing the difficulty for them. As we ride down the straight, the Ferrari's just creeping inches away. You can see it look just millimetres further and further away. So the Porsche will close under braking. And on the back straight, he had enough to just squeeze alongside, but not enough speed at the end of the straight to complete the pass. Way better under braking, way better through those tight twisties at turn one and turn two, but you're right, straight line speed. So look now wow. at the 22 and the 26 car. They are a lap apart now. Right, because G-Drive were in second, and they have clearly dropped back now behind the two Jackie Chan and Jota cars down to fourth place. So in fact, United Autosports Felipe Albuquerque has lapped 
the th fourth place car in LMP2. That's an astonishing what? run so far for United Autosports, Zach Brown and Richard Dean's team. Now, I know we've got over four and a half hours left, but my goodness, what a run they're having. I was sorry, sorry, Alan. I was going to say that's two things. What a run they're having, but also what a bad run that the G-Drive car is having and TDS are having as well, because they're also with uh, the other car in that team is racing team Netherlands. What? Wow, now there is a, a bit of confusion between two cars. You saw a Ferrari pulling out to go by an AM-class rival who then moved further right, further right, further right. I'm coming into the pits, mate. That was nearly um, an unintended pit stop, I think, for the Red River Sport Ferrari, which was the car that was found himself in the wrong place. 98 Aston is in. Is this a short stop? Just looking now. It's Paul Dallalana it is, is getting six, out. That is 16 laps on right, the Right, so he's yeah. done his drive he time, has. I think, and that it, means... Remember as well that the short fill, and yep. then that was right. then the uh, allowance of that. Uh, pointed out to me, we saw it, I didn't quite understand it, Something happened in that last stop. He was changing tyres, but left as they were trying to change one. He, there, was, there was one of the... Uh, one of the there was definitely confusion. The tyre man got, got knocked over. It's very hard. Very hard. Really worried about the tyres, mate. I know, I know it's hard. Really worried about the tyres. Everything at the moment. They really just take care at the moment. Save a bit of fuel if we can't pass. Yeah, it is very hard. This one is not a hot race because uh, even though we've had somebody that got penalised for the cockpit temperatures, it's not hot outside. You know, we're down to 20 degrees, um, which we've had at Silverstone before. Uh, but it is just such a difficult one for the tyre, where the driver is always just feeling and teetering on the edge. He can't lean on it, even though his natural instinct is to lean on the tyre and get the performance out of it. If he does that for one or two corners too much, then it'll never recover. And you heard his engineer saying to Kevin Estra, look, if you can't pass, look after the tyre. He's still having a go. You've got the outside shot and him inside. Looks like nothing's going on, but he has driven right around the outside of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. I'm sure the Portuguese will be going nuts. Having just told him to preserve the tyre, he's just gone by. Yeah, but the opportunity was presented there with Bond Grimes in the third or fourth car in that train now at the back of it, which is uh, the uh, Red River Sport GT Am car coming down into turn eight, so through seven. Uh, then it opportunity was there and he took it, and that's what you've got to do. And just between them now is another of the Ferraris. That's the AF Corsa car, Francois Perodo, the white car. And a squeeze through. Alessandro Pierre Guidi, though, look how much ground he lost there to the Porsche. There you go. He just got caught. He went one side, and then the Porsche went right round the other side. Got the cut back and accelerated up the hill and uh, got the job done very, very early. Traction out the turns from that Porsche is uh, magnificent. Well, that's a funny thing. The traction's been good, but the traction's been excellent from the Ferraris earlier yep. on as well. Yep. I think he just he was down on the inside. He was on the dirty part, and uh, so I mean Pierre Guidi at this point, and so he was compromised on his line round the corner, and then he was on the curb on the exit as well, and it was a perfect line and execution by Estra. Yeah, Kevin Estra just had enough room to plan the manoeuvre and put it to bed beautifully. So, Porsche lead from Ferrari, Aston Martin in third, 95, Marco Sorensen in that car. Then the 71 Ferrari, the 91 Porsche and the 97 Aston Martin. Let's hear from the 97 car. Yeah, Maxine, we can get past this Porsche. We can get past it. All right, so... Management. Yeah, everybody trying to hurry up and save tyres and brakes at the same time. It's not an easy balancing act, Alan, but it's one that every racing driver has to do almost every time you're sitting in a car. Yes, very, very true. And also from an engineering point of view, just giving a little bit of encouragement. What also is very helpful to know is where other people have been able to overtake it as well, because you get one or two opportunities with the guys at this level, and it's called the element of surprise. And once that is gone, it is very, very tough. We saw with Nicky Team when he was struggling massively with tyres earlier on in the Aston Martin. He was still able to hold everybody back because he knew where he was quick and he knew where they were quick. And so, like I say, you've got to get up to them and get it done straight away. Yeah, he saw everything that they got to show him, rebuffed all those shots, and then that was it. Uh, until he absolutely had no tyres left, he could hang on in front. And that 95 car 
is now back up to third place. I mean, they've been up and down like the Assyrian Empire, all of these three teams. Ferrari have led, Aston have led, Porsche have led, and now Porsche seem to be fading. And again, the, you know, in the last hour, we might have all of our GTE cars on fresh tyres, but until then, it's a mix of old and new, and some and none, and four and two, and... Well, it is, as the United Autosports are in the pits leading in the pit stop we saw in the bottom left of the screen was Mark Patterson in the high-class racing car starting, starting his second stint. About to say, since that overtake happened with Kevin Estray, he's just disappeared. He's doing three seconds up the road now from Pierre Guidi. He, yeah. Ferrari has got no response to that. Well, he's saving tyres and brakes. That's why he's getting so much quicker, Kevin Estra. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how that works. Here are our class leaders. Toyota number seven in front in LMP1. United Autosports in the pits, but still leading handsomely in LMP2. Porsche 92 in LMP uh, GT Pro. And Porsche 57 in GTE Am. And the Aston Martin looking for a pass on the 91 car. This is for fifth position. Maxime Martin chasing Richard Leitz. And look at the tyre debris offline. That is only going to get worse. We've still got more than four, well, nearly four and a half hours to go. Yeah, when we say that uh, this is for fifth position, but it's also only 15 seconds off the race lead of Kevin Estra, who has correctly, as Graham says, disappeared with a three second advantage over Pierre Guidi. As uh, two Joto Sport cars are in the pits, Jackie Chan DC racing in front, and uh, then the Richard Mille Goodyear car sitting behind. And as they came in then that order, so they depart in that order. Gabriel Aubrey stays in, I'm sure. Oh no, Felipe Albuquerque is handed over. Oh no, beg your pardon. Uh, who was it? Was Antonio Felix da Costa in that car in the 38 before? He was in the he car. Was. Before, okay, yeah. so they're double stinting, which makes No, 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 sense. he's not left the pitch yet. No, yes, but no. Uh, we didn't see a driver change. I'm sure they were double stinting. And he does. Yeah, so they come out behind. G drives Roman Rusinov inches behind G drives Roman Rusinov, who is fast approaching the end of his second stint on those tyres, isn't he? So uh, no, he's six laps in to, oh, is uh, to this second stint on those tyres. Oh, okay, right. So they've been not so much out of sync as we thought. Uh, remember, Van Oetert sort of struggled on for a long, long time on them, yeah. which dropped him from the front to the back of the LMP2 grid. Uh, well, again, uh, so he will have done what he was told. Stay out there, stay out there, until eventually the writing was on the wall in foot-high letters. And they said, all right, we're going to have to... We can't hang on. We've lost so much time. We can't hang on for fuel. We're just going to have to change the tyres. And that was also the sister TDS car, um, which is the Racing Team Netherlands car. They had the same problem at the beginning. Both cars had what was not a great tyre choice on. And uh, unfortunately, they both lost a lot of time. G-Drive have recovered. They sort of stabilized. They've been hovering around the top three, either just outside or in it with Roman Rusinov, their bronze driver, Racing Team Netherlands. Nick de Vries back in the car, but they're eighth in class, and they're a long way off the leaders, uh, United Autosports, or even the Jota Sport, Jackie Chan, G-Drive battle. Well, Racing Alan, Team Netherlands have had a good season so far, but they don't want to be giving away a handful no, of points here. They don't. It's been. Alan said a little earlier about this uh, this performance, this team performance from the United Autosports. And LMP2 this year has been characterised by that extraordinary performances in individual races. Yeah. We saw that from Racing Team Netherlands with an amazing display from Linda Fries at Fuji. We've seen it from Jota Sport as well, and we've seen it right now for United Autosports. Consider this gentleman for a moment. If you get three of those team performances in one race, what a race we're going to get. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Well, again, you know, everybody has a chance to shine. Um, but it's slightly interesting because with G-Drive, you're comparing a team of who one member is Roman Rusinov, with no disrespect to him, never a professional driver, certainly never raced at, you know, anything like GP2 or GP3 level in single-seaters. Fritz van Aert, professional businessman, hugely successful. But in the United Autosports lineup, Phil Hansen, Felipe Albuquerque, Paul DeResta, you've got three pro drivers. So it's... You know, if you give them a footstep in front, it's going to be really hard to catch them. Really, really hard to catch them. They've basically just got to 
deliver and perform. And of course, in this first season in the WEC, in the first season as well with the Orica chassis, they had their problems at Silverstone, uh, big problems with both cars in uh, WC and EMS. Since then, the beginning's kind of unlocked this, but uh, Alan? Yeah, they also have uh, strengthened massively their engineering force as well in uh, the middle of the season. And I think that is starting to bring a little bit of fruit to the uh, to this as well, where they're understanding the consistency and how to be able to deliver consistent performances. But it's been very impressive from United, but as expected, to be honest. Uh, should uh, slightly correct you, by the way, uh, Martin. Uh, Roman Rusinov did do Formula 3000, albeit the Euro Formula 3000. Yeah. yeah, but he's also a gold driver. He's rated oh, yeah. a gold driver. Yes. Now. Yep. So, you well, know, it's not as if he is uh, an amateur without experience. Yep. He has got a lot of experience. He's won in uh, WEC and he's won in ELMS as well. He has. Yeah, you can't win uh, four straight championships in ELMS without coming to the notice of the FIA's uh, license regulators. Uh, the number 91 Porsche. Oh, somebody spun in the background. That's uh, a car that's a 70 uh, Ferrari. A, of course, a Ferrari. Yeah. Uh, MR Racing, rather. Ishikawa at the wheel of that car. Uh, 91 Porsche being given a black and white warning flag for contact with the 71 Ferrari. That's Richard Leeds and Miguel Molina. That was 40 odd minutes ago. Uh, Roman Rusinov, by the way, 17 race wins in his WC career. This wow. Is, this is where we see the Ferrari here at the bottom of the screen, just locks up the rears as he, I think he was putting a bit more pressure on the brake pedal to stop running into the back of the racing team Netherlands car of uh, Nick de Vries. Uh, he's also just been reported to the stewards for not respecting the blue flags. We've already had one penalty uh, for that already, which is a drive through to the 62 Red River racing car. And noted as well, by the way, replacement door on that car, red door on that side, uh, yeah. where the mirror was knocked off earlier in the race. So the red replacement door clearly has a mirror on it, whereas the original one didn't. Do you reckon that was taken from another AF Porsche car somewhere that's... Maybe, I mean... 92 Porsche leading. This is the sister car that we are watching up front and uh, they're in fifth place so we're on board with Martin in the Aston Martin in six but now here's Eduardo Freitas. I get information of rain at T14, I get information of rain at T14, the, the track is declared wet from now on, track is declared wet from now on. Now the significance of that is not that the track is soaking but that if you need to you can use wet weather tyres. We've opened the back door of the commentary box in and the TV compound at the end of the paddock and there are tiny spots of rain but it might rain heavily. Now Louise Beckett just before Eduardo came on the radio was saying 92 Porsche team have all jumped up and started to look excited and that's presumably because the driver has reported spots of rain. Now if it's spots the track is hot, it'll absorb a lot of water in the co really coarse grain, and the slicks are hot, so it, it's not a drama. However, if we get a mini deluge, then suddenly there could be a lot of scrambling for the pit lane. Yeah, you've got here, you've got uh, a lot of abrasion, and uh, it's from the, the tarmac and from the temperature exactly as you say, cause, so you can stay on slicks for a long, long time round here. You've got to obviously be careful that you don't get onto the curbs and you certainly don't get onto the AstroTurf. Um, however, saying that, it's uh, you can run quite a long time into sort of tricky conditions. Here we see a Ferrari running, trying to run round the outside, but 92 squeezed into the apex. Yeah, and desperate to try and avoid drama there. No further action on the Inter yeah. in, uh, uh, on that situation. 92 is now in the pits. So he said they jumped up. He's very, very slow coming in. He was defending and so, so slow there as he came down the refilling. But Louise is shouting in her ears that uh, the dollies are out as well. So the lead car of Kevin Estra could be going back into the garage. And yep. it is. And in it goes. That was a big, big lock-up, not under that much pressure, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, but he was trying to actually stop the car so he didn't have the collision with the Ferrari as well. He was offline, he was on the dirt. Changing. Yeah, but this is... Well, changing tyres will be standard. It's something else oh. underneath. Give me the grip. Brakes? Yeah, it is. That's the brake caliper grippers that he's talking about. Surely, are they doing brakes? It's something on the left rear. Now, even at Le Mans, they don't change brakes on the GTE cars. It's a standard operating practice in things like the Spa 24 hours in the GT3 cars that have significantly different brakes. And there is a, a purpose-made 
uh, window, a five minute pit stop that every car has to take to allow for safe brake changes. But is that brakes on the Porsche? Louise is down there. We'll get her to find out maybe from uh, Michael Christensen. Yeah, there we go. We're just uh, with Michael Christensen, Louise Beckett. Let's find out. Oh, she's being waved away. OK, so we can't find out yet what the drama is. Here's drama for second and third. Roman Rusnov versus Gabriella Aubrey. The orange G-Drive Aurus versus the Jackie Chan DC Racing Orica. Aubrey much Tony. quicker, much quicker uh, at the moment. That's Aubrey's it. second stint for him as well. But Goodyear tyre versus the Michelin. Pip stop infringement for 47, Settle R Racing, that's their second of the uh, evening. So they get a drive through. And Roman Rusinov is clinging on tenuously here, isn't he? he? Goes around the outside of the Team Project One Porsche, but he's not got much to answer the uh, charge of Gabriel Aubrey. Oh, and it's all over. It's not all over, don't worry. There's fireworks up in the sky to uh, a part of celebrations for Bahrain's National Day. Long weekend of celebrations going on. Some gigs down the road on the beach as well, I understand. And Terry Grant plying his smoky trade somewhere in the environ. Through comes the number eight Toyota now. Can Gabriel Aubrey hoover up? No, you see the Toyota slapping on the motorway where somebody comes up behind you, then sits in the outside lane, going slower than you are, and then eventually drops back. So the Toyota to get in the way of Gabriel Aubrey who then has to focus again on trying to get by Roman Rusinov in the orange G-Drive car. Oh, and it looks like Aubrey was having a spin there as they came off the corner, lit up the rear tyres. Let's take a look at the fireworks, though. Sl slid out wide there, the tail of the car. He didn't spin it, but it definitely did not get hooked up under acceleration. Let's hear what the 92 Porsche team are saying. I called for the splitter and the underfloor because I was touching in the front, I think, under. All right, that might be the end of the race. The engineer closest to us in the cap, you just saw that hand across the throat gesture. If they're going to have to change the splitter and the underfloor, we're only half on it, we're only halfway in. There's four hours still to go. Yeah, but I think that is a secondary thing, splitter and underfloor at the front touching. But uh, he was obviously stopping them doing something. Right. Uh, as opposed to necessarily it's all over now. I think that was more a case of uh, stopping a conversation or something else that was going on yep. at the back of there. Right, looks like they're ready, whatever they were fixing in the left rear, and um, hopefully Louise will be able to get a little bit more gen once they've understood, or once they've informed Michael Christensen entirely what the problem was. Uh, looks like, as you say, maybe the floor, the underfloor, they're just going to leave as it is. Tyres going on to the car, fuel it's already had, so it will go back out and rejoin the race, but it will be significantly behind. How many laps has it lost? Two, probably be three by the time it rejoins, so it'll be about trying to salvage the points. Salvage the points, but uh, the points are for the World Championship, and that's where I think it's going to be very, very tricky for them, because in GTE Pro, you know, that car's leading, and uh, it'll take them right out of the game, because uh, at the moment, they're 10 points ahead of the, their sister car, Bruni and Leeds, and so it, it'll probably actually bring the whole championship closer together. They were 10, then 9 after qualifying. That's true, yes. So, yeah. And the gap between first and second is 11 points. So even if they were second to their teammates one, they'd still be behind in the championship. But they have so, to try to get yeah. something out of it because of the Absolutely. one and a half points for this particular race. And we've got... A t an eight-hour race still to come in Sebring. We've got two six-hour races and a 24-hour race. Let's get down to the Porsche garage, find out what went wrong. Michael's been looking on at the team fixing the car. He's now talking to the team to see what happens. Michael, I know you had the radio on the whole time. Tell me what the problem was. Yeah, Kevin reported some issues on uh, car behavior uh, on the last two laps, and yeah, we. He said it was no puncture, so we had to uh, have a look at the car. And uh, it looked like we had a damper failure, so that was really unfortunate. So we had to change the damper and uh, yeah, try to repair whatever we could on the car and uh, keep going. Looked like a bit of confusion there at the end with the tyres going back on. Yeah, it appeared that Kevin had a flat spot on the inlap because the car was behaving really odd. So he uh, managed to, to make a flat spot on the, on the inlap. And uh, yeah, we had to change the tires, and we were not sure if there was a flat spot or not. So everything had to be checked before we were leaving, not to uh, having 
another, another pit stop. Thank you. Drama for Khaled El Kabasi in the 88 Dempsey Proton car, looping the car around heavily into the barriers under braking. And that is at... That's at the last corner. Yeah. 10 14. Okay, so he comes straight back into the pit lane, damage to the left rear corner. Look at the black marks that the tire is leaving. Left front is broken. So that's a long pit stop for that car. Seconds to full course and they yellow. were in fourth, in it's third, in fourth place ahead of 77, which came past them after the accident. It's the, it's the front left that's causing the, the line. To full Martin. course yellow. Yeah. Right. We're, although the car is out of the way, there is debris still. You can see the underfloor there. Ten. And that's Nine, why we're going full eight, course yellow. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow, full course yellow. We have debris on driver's left at T14. We are going to replace bollards. We're going to pick debris a little bit all over the place. So a little bit of house clear, clearing going on and uh, into the pit lane goes the quite badly damaged 88. Now, the significance of all the damage at the front is that's where all the cooling systems are. It's also lost the front of the floor. So we've had one safety car on lap one for one, two laps. And we are now under full course yellow. So almost halfway through before we get to the first actual really ra racing interruption. He just caught the end of that barrier, didn't he? Yeah. Just before the, uh, the barrier line widened. I think he must have hit it in the last half metre. And he got quite a big hit. Got away from him under braking, and that's a suggestion that he was catching the car in front a little faster than he thought was going to be the case, and had to really just anchor everything up and uh, broke away from him at the back. Once that happens, there is nowhere left to go. So uh, trunking and cooling systems and wiring and everything else will be investigated. That's going to be a bit of a long stop. So double trouble for Porsche teams um, with the 88 car in the pits for a long stop and the 92 car also in the pits for a long stop. Kevin Escher has now rejoined the race though but well here's 88 just ahead of 77 and this was the battle for third or fourth in the uh, GTE AM class and catching the Red River Porsche uh, I think maybe he was distracted by the 77 car behind just for a fraction. It doesn't take much, does it, to... Yeah, the sister car pulled out uh, from behind and maybe that was it. Maybe that it was just he missed his breaking point. Yeah. Uh, while that's all happening, by the way, we're right into the uh, pit stop cycle for the lead group uh, with the number seven car in and out. Pichito Lopez stays uh, stays aboard the car. Ben Hanley as well on uh, on the uh, uh, after 23 laps again. Uh, regular clockwork lately. Ben Hanley uh, stays aboard that car. H8 in the garage. 77 coming in like almost everybody in the GT field heading onto the pit into pit lane as soon as you get there. Of course, under full course yellow, you are limited to an 80 kilometers an hour maximum speed on track, 50 miles an hour. So everybody will have their thumb on the limiter button. And it can take you several minutes to get to the pit lane, by which time full course yellow might have evaporated yeah, for the, some of them. The, what I, I didn't catch because I was too busy looking at something else was whether or not the lead car and the five Ginetta were already on pit lane as it went full course yellow. Uh, because there's time to be gained here by the others now pitting on a full course yellow for the full stop. That includes the number eight, Toyota, and the Rebellion. Well, have a look in your book and see whether they were due to be in Oh, now. they were. They 100%. were due to be in, 100%. OK. Uh, which is why I say it's quite possible they pitted on the full green, yeah. but only for part of their stop on the full course yellow, whereas the number eight now, and Rebellion yeah. now, and the United Autosports car, um, now, that will be early. That was after just eight laps. And, of course, the significance of that is if you pit under green, you're still stationary for just as long, but everybody else is going an awful lot quicker than 80 kilometres an hour. If they pit under full course yellow, their pit stay stop won't be any faster, but your lap, while they're stationary, will be an awful lot slower. Both Toyotas made 56-second stops 
but it's not until a couple of minutes from now that we'll find out what Correct. their in and out laps were. And so the, the point is not how long they're on pit lane, yeah. it's whether or not they're on it's pit how lane. How fast the others were Correct. going. Correct, yes. exactly that. Right, so we are 30 seconds away from ending our full course yellow. So at four hours and eight minutes to go, we will go green. Driver change in the number six car. And uh, that is the starting Fair. driver getting back in, Nine, isn't it, into number six. Eight, so that seven, will be uh, Mike six, Simpson taking five, over once more. Four, three, two, one. Full course yellow removed. Green, green, green. Away we go. Wherever you are on the track, you go green immediately. You do not have to wait until you cross the start line. And if you are very good at restarting, you can often pick up a spot. Let's hear from the GT Porsche team. Something broke. I don't know if there is a puncture or something. I think a puncture. I will check. It's four times new. Uh, if you see the alarm, it's just because it's low the pressure, the something pressure. So don't worry. Okay, there is something broke. No, 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 don't worry. Something is wrong. All right, well, both Porsches. Oh, yes. Both Porsches it's have fallen straight away, the right floor hand is side. Flapping around at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, but I would also suggest it could be a very similar thing to the other car. Damn it, failure. Yeah, because it's popping around at the right yeah. front. They're looking for that. The engineer would be also concerned it was pickup or something from mm. the full course yellow, and you need to sort of clean that off. But the Porsche has got a problem. But we could see on the right rear. It's right. No, it's the, the right front. Look, it's, it's scra scratching yeah. down at the right yeah. front with the spark. It's on. It's on the rim. Don't worry, the, it's the low alarm. No, yeah, but look at the back. Yeah, but just let's see when they get into the pits. It's the right front that's down. What that's a disaster it. for Porsche. One in, within two I mean, or three laps. And these, are, like and these are the drivers who are the top two in the championship in GTE Pro. Yep. What a disaster. Started first and second, nine points apart. And these guys must have thought that they might be getting a good deal out of this race. How many laps had that tyre done? Well, hang looking now. I'm not sure that's even the tyre. The wheel, look at the wheel. Look yeah, at the yeah, state no, of the wheel. It's, it's the, utterly the nuts destroyed. Utterly destroyed. So the nut sheared or, or just came off. I they, don't know no safety retaining pin holding it in. Now that might be going back into the garage to get the hut. And they also need to look at the right rear because whatever was flapping up and yeah, down it's ain't going to fix itself in a hurry. Yeah. That's, that's just out the pits. So that was a brand new set out of the pits. Uh, look, well, it's, I don't know whether or not they changed the yeah. tyre, unfortunately, from the data we have here, but that was, I think, his second lap on that stint. So there's either a, a stay holding the floor or a loose exhaust or something at the back we saw flapping up and down clearly. Now, they in the garage see the same pictures as us. So whether the data is telling them or not, visually, you know there's a problem. Well, their brakes has just fallen apart, hasn't it? Oh, it has, but what it has done, just minutes. it's brought Aston Martin right back into the game because uh, Sorensen's third in the championship and uh, they are 15 points behind as we stand and this is going to bring them right into the mix of it. Well, they, they've resorted to the Birmingham screwdriver for fixing it, which really means it's broken. Yeah, but this is something with the upright in the hub. Well, let's hear what the Aston Martin team say. Maxime Martin is now our leader in GT Pro. Stay off the big curves, stay off big curves at the moment. <laughs> that would Both suggest... Both have had punctures. Yeah, yeah. That good would shout. You, what happens here is that you use the curb, but you also cut over, so that corner there, they cut over the inside of the curb, which has got a sharp edge to it. And so it can be the fact when you're coming back over the inside sharp edge, you cut the inside shoulder of the tyre. And uh, the GTE cars can do this. The LMP cars cannot because of their right heights. Well, and so the GTE cars explore parts of the circus that others don't. <laughs> Is that because they're green, like certain beer brands? Well, as Doc Hudson always says, stay on the grey stuff, son. That's what it's there for. Yeah, but the, a racing circuit, as far as the driver's concerned, is everything that is legal. And that means three quarters of the car off the track if need be, if it's faster. Well, if you don't like your tyres, feel free. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly what's happening. But sometimes it's a little bit uh, luck of the game the way it goes. However, the fact that uh, different things have happened to two Porsches yeah. in the space of a few laps is just extraordinary.
Uh, two points to make as we carry on looking at these pictures of the frantic work going on to repair the number 91 car. New fourth place car uh, after a long stop for the Team LNT number six car, nearly three minutes on pit road. Uh, Norman Nato takes the Rebellion back up into fourth position. Now just over a minute and a half back from the other car as the 91 comes back onto the apron. Uh, the other uh, thing to look at here is the lap time just put in by Ricardo Gonzalez. 148.618 is the fastest yeah. lap of that car's race, and he is the gentleman driver. Now, we could still see one of the horizontal strakes in the splitter there flapping around, and that's to direct the air laterally rather than to create the downforce. So it's it's helping to evacuate the, the air from the brakes and cooling and everything else, but it's it's not critical. However... It's critical. That's the thing. It is critical. It's at the back of the car, and it actually helps keep control over the downforce and the consistency of downforce as the car is moving around vertically under braking and accelerating and also under lateral as well and I'm quite surprised they didn't change the whole back of it you oh, still that, see no, it that is the whole that is almost the whole floor the real problem for them is Sorry, if the stewards I, look I'm at it and go there. that's just, gonna come off you're just, back in the pits just look at the back of that Porsche the next yeah. shot coming out of turn four this corner here if we can see it it's actually on the right hand side at the back on the bottom of the floor and then it's dangling vertically okay with the shadow it's difficult to see there and uh, that has got quite a lot of aerodynamic effect and if it falls falls off, then it's got a massive aerodynamic effect. If it didn't, it wouldn't be there. Uh, should that add as well, remember, this is the first year of the completely redesigned 911 RSR, and one of the major things they did to it was to give themselves more opportunity to manage the air at the back of the car by rerouting the, the exhaust to the side of that car. Well, we're going to hear from uh, Ricard Leitz in the number 91 car, back in pit lane, uh, down with Louise on pit lane right now. Richard Leitz was looking on there, watching the team fix the car, so tell me what happened with the 91. Well, I don't know exactly because uh, I was already out of the car, uh, but after the pit stop uh, suddenly Jimmy reported a puncture and as we saw the mechanics repaired something on the front right, uh, so I have to investigate also, but for sure we got some damage on the underfloor now uh, because we scrapped it uh, one lap around, but I think at the moment the time lost is anyway so much, so it's about finishing it now, uh, the race, and get some points. Still got four hours. Yeah, but I'm not sure about losing a lap or getting it back, so it's quite difficult with the uh, not very often safety car we have here. So, I mean, any, anything is possible until the end, that's true, but uh, I think it's uh, in this high competitive class, not very easy. Okay, thank Got to say, it looks like we are going to have different top two in the GTE Pro class, but we've had four hours and only the last five minutes of our drama for the GTE Pro cars. We've got another four hours to go. There's by no means any guarantee that their rivals won't at least some of them have dramas. For all of them to have dramas, you might be asking a little bit much, though. The festivities for National Day here in Bahrain continue trackside or just across from the track. And uh, the racing continues four hours in, four hours to go. Little quick recap Toyota 1 2, car number 7 ahead of car number 8 LMP1. Then 22 United Auto Sports leading in LMP2. Let's hear from the 92 Porsche team. Oh, you put the chair on the field. At the moment, no. At the moment, no. I'll update you. Just yeah, just be sensible at the moment. We're trying to work everything out. Sensible driving. Well, Kevin Estra saying, do I have to stay off the kerbs? No. Just do it for the minute until we really figure out what led to the damper failure on one car and to the puncture and the loose wheel on the other. Was it the puncture that caused the wheel to come loose? Was it a wheel nut that wasn't on at the pit stop? They forget, they've all just had that full course yellow stop. And the Porsches stopped as well then, didn't they? So he might might only have been on one lap out of the pit stops. It was two laps, I think. Well, sorry, it's one lap one out. Lap. It yeah. was uh, one lap out of the pit stop for Ricard okay. Elites. That suggests that the nut was never on properly in the first place. And that's a, that's a very rare occurrence, as you might imagine. And uh, well, teams are in the habit of of putting nuts on properly, generally. Yeah, rather extraordinary. It was two laps out for 92, so it was two completely different problems. Yeah. Very soon after pit stops from both cars. But when it's going well, never stop it. That's a, that's a rule for life there. Uh, 
Toyota leading in LMP1, United Autosports lead LMP2 as we get to the halfway mark here in Bahrain. Aston Martin have bounced back to the top of GTE Pro and Team Project One, the 57 Porsche, still leading at the midway stage, having started from pole in GTE Am. So there is our pro class battle, 97 Aston ahead of the 51 Ferrari and the 95 Aston and the 71 Ferrari and the Porsches are both two laps adrift and deep in the mire. down four hours to go in the eight hours of Bahrain round four of the FIA World Endurance Championship season eight the last race of this calendar year and the last of this decade for the FIA World Endurance Championship welcome back everybody for the second half of this race Martin Haven Alan McNish Graham Goodwin and Louise Beckett in the pit lane your team here with the WC TV crew trackside in Bahrain. Starting as a warm afternoon, not scorching temperatures. Mercifully, the wind and the rain that afflicted the Kingdom of Bahrain earlier in the week have not been part of the race. The track was declared wet about 20 minutes ago when there were a few spits and spots of rain. They have passed, as so often is the case here in Bahrain. Being a little island in the Arabian Gulf, the wind and the weather tend to go either side of us. Alan McNish, uh, lots of pit stops under full course yellow for our Ooh. GT team, but not all of them were the smoothest. Yeah, that's uh, Puer Giddy in the car now. Eh, of course, a drop in the car before the left front wheel nut was on. Had to bring it back up and then uh, to, to tighten the front wheel. It's been a little bit tense within the GTE battle. We had two Porsches obviously having the problems within a couple of laps of each other and they're first and second in the World Championship and uh, AF Corsa dropping the car there. That's pulled the 71 AF Corsa Ferrari back into contention a little bit but it's Aston Martin 1 and 2 something I don't think Aston Martin would have necessarily have believed earlier on in this race when they were dropping like stones at the end of their stints. But, but they've led before, they've dropped back, they've led before, they've dropped back and they were expecting to be strong later in the race with the tyre degradation dropping away rather than earlier on and, and it's been it's been a real yo-yo battle between the two Astons, the two Porsches and the two Ferraris depending on who had fresher rubber than their rivals Graham. Uh, that was a change on that tyre after just six laps Alan on the Ferrari both those cars have been out for six laps so that was a very short stint so is that maybe another bit of debris? Remember there was debris because of the crash down yep. at this final corner with Al Kabassi in uh, the Dempsey Proton car. And so there could have been some punctures that were picked up from that. It seems odd that there was so many as a uh, bit of uh, swipe across the nose there of uh, the TF Sport, Aston Martin. Uh, Johnny Adams in that, Thomas Flor is in the Ferrari just up ahead. Johnny Adam now singing down the inside into the last corner. But uh, I think his uh, nose has probably got a little bit of Ferrari across, uh, paintwork across it. So change there for fifth position as the TF Sport Aston goes ahead of the AF Corsa Ferrari. And uh, Johnny Adam continues on his way. But once bitten, twice shy. If, if somebody slams the door like that on you, then you make darn certain you are clean as you go by the next time. Thomas Floor is not too far behind down into turn one. So Johnny Adam will just be keeping a weather eye on the mirror to make sure that uh, the gentleman driver behind him gets on the brakes at the right point and maybe Johnny will have to be 
cautious to roll off the throttle if the car behind seems to be accelerating up towards you as you hit the brakes. Not much to choose between the pace of the two cars. Leaders in the AM class, Team Project One, the number 57 car, after a triple stint uh, for its starting driver, Ben Keating. Uh, it is currently being driven by the man who, with him, claimed pole position for the car, Larry Tinforda. Mike Wainwright second in the Gulf Racing Porsche and Ross Gunn in the 98 Aston in third position. The AMR car has had a better race of it all the way through so far than the TF Sport Red Aston Martin. And uh, it's the first race this year that the 98 Aston hasn't been speared by somebody else's accident on the first lap of the race. Well, the track declared wet earlier on by Eduardo Freitas. It won't now be declared dry. It means that if it happens to rain heavily and people want wet weather tyres, they are allowed to use them. Uh, however, they have been told they may turn their high intensity rear lights off because there is no rain anymore falling. It's only a few little drops. Uh, they're more likely to be hit by uh, the dead cartridges of firework rockets, I think, than raindrops coming down now. Little conflab inside AMR. The guys in the red suits, by the way, are the refueling guys. So I'm just looking at uh, the update of the stint lens for the next pitch stops. And so the team are actually starting to prepare what they will need. And uh, so it's not a bit of a surprise. It's all pre-planned. But however, sometimes the best laid plans of ice and men and all that sort of thing do gun after glee. But it's a case of then it's got to be very quickly updated and the mechanics have to be super prepared. Race leader coming up behind a 97 Aston Martin that leads the GTE Pro class and making very short work of him. But Pachito Lopez looks like he's starting to run out of rear end as our commentary cabin shakes under the explosions above us. It's a tough life. <laughs> yeah, this car is basically led from coming out of the first corner, didn't yeah. lead into the first corner. But uh, with the incident between the Rebellion and the LNT at turn two, then uh, they've led every single lap since then. Jop van Oyter getting ready to take over from Roman Rusinov. Rusinov in the orange G-Drive car, second in LMP2. There's the Jota Sport car in third place. Roberto Gonzalez at the wheel there. 97 is in, leader in GT Pro. Yeah, it's gonna be a... A tear off coming off the windscreen. And look at the amount of filth on the car. All those yeah. little black flecks and bits of rubber that have been flicked up. That's how dirty cars look at the end of a Le Mans 24 hours. We're only four hours in here. Yeah, but they're also taking it off the radiator entry yeah. duct as well as now Van Oyt, uh, sorry, Rusinov's got to really hang on here uh, because directly behind him is Gonzalez. Gonzalez has definitely got more acceleration out and uh, I would expect him to be able to get this job done prior to uh, Rusinov coming into the pits, but Rusinov's defending pretty sternly. Yeah, he always does. Roman Rusinov is a very strong driver, as you say, gold rated, and uh, he always does a good job. He's good in attack, he's good in defense, he knows where to put the car, and as you can see, the, the rubber debris around the track, the racing line, the overtaking positions are getting fewer and fewer, the racing line's getting narrower and narrower. Basically, if you stay on the clean bit, you're just about safe. Yeah, you are. Um, however, Gonzalez, uh, he's won 24 hour races. He won the Daytona 24 hours in the LMP2 category earlier on this year, back in January. A big celebration for him with Dragon Speed Racing. And Hope right. Pinton is yeah. catching as well. Uh, and there go comes uh, that uh, Roman Rusinov pulling into the pits. That is on, on schedule for Roman. But the G-Drive car is slightly out of sync with the others because in their Correct. second stint of the race, they had to shorten it up because they've made a poor tyre choice. So well, worth saying, by the way, that both Hope and Tom, and for that matter, uh, Gonzalez, both way quicker on this stint than anything close to yeah. where Roman Rusnov has been. It's been a stellar stint from Gonzalez. And, and this is what the Goodyear shot guys, Ann Davidson was telling me about, before the race this morning, this is what they were worried about, was surviving until the track really rubbers in and the tyre deck becomes a little less significant and the temperatures start to drop a little. They were worried they might get left behind by Michelin. Goodyear have one choice of tyre here. Michelin had two, but as it turns out, the Goodyear tyre cars are still very much in the hunt. One step ahead still of these two, who are second and third, 
It's the United Auto Sports car now. That is a Michelin shot car. They got a big break early in the race, and they haven't given away any of that advantage. Oh, it's a 54-second step. Yeah. It's yeah. not just a small step, it's a huge step. They've delivered from the word go as a new set of tyres go onto the G-Drive. They've yeah. held that gap. I think that's the point here, yeah. is they've held it. It's been, a, 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 I think they've had it at a minute, briefly, uh, but I, this is as low as I've seen it be, uh, be for some uh, yeah. quite some time. It's been an excellent display for these guys. Well, the first four hours have definitely been a Advantage United Auto Sports. They bowled well, they batted well. Now we're into the second half. Let's see if Jota and Jackie Chan can come back and maybe overhaul them or at least get into a position in the final hour where they've got a chance of getting a hand on the jugular. At the moment, on pace where we are with the current stints, this is a point at which the Goodyear cars are certainly catching. They're taking something out of. Uh, United Auto Sports cars, about 152 on average on this current 11 lap stint from Felipe Albuquerque. That's a couple of seconds down on what we're seeing at the moment from the 38 and the 37. So that's just going to be where they are with the tyres they've got available. Although last time round, not much to choose between them. And actually, Felipe Albuquerque's last lap, 152.4. Mike Simpson in the fifth place car, which is an LMP1 Janetta going just, uh, what's that, five seconds quicker on the lap. So the gap between uh, LMP1 and LMP2 is reasonable in pace, but United Auto Sports keeping their nose in front. In the GTE Pro class, 91 Porsche, uh, ahead of the 92 car by a minute, but they are both a lap down on their rivals. And there is our AM class leader, I believe, Larry Tenforda in 57, yes it is, with the purple mirrors. And uh, again, first half of the race, uh, largely due to the daring do of Ben Keating, has been very much advantage in the AM class to that 57 car. Here we are then, four hours in, four hours down. Toyota 1-2, Team LNT, Rebellion, and the second Team LNT car all together, but a lap behind. United Auto Sports lead by nearly a minute from Jota and Jackie Chan, DC Racing, Senior Tech Alpine, G-Drive, and Racing Team Netherland next up ahead of High Class, who have struggled a little. Uh, cool Racing and Setilar. Our GTE Pro leader, currently the 95 Aston, ahead of the two Ferraris. And the second Aston, 97, is in fourth. Of the Porsches, both losing time, have now dropped behind the leaders in the GTE Am class, which uh, are Larry Tenforda and Ross Gunn. And then at Gulf Racing's Mike Wainwright, ahead of Dempsey Proton's Christian Reed. TF Sport Aston is in fifth place in the class, ahead of the A, of course, of Ferraris, uh, 54 and 83. And one car remains in the garage, the 88 Dempsey Proton car. That's had significant damage. 56 Team Project One car back out on track, but a long way behind. 31 laps behind the leaders who have completed 135 laps here in Bahrain. He drives Jean-Eric Van in the centre of the pit wall. Hasn't spent much time in the last couple of years coming from fifth place back in his Formula E career and in uh, the European Le Mans series where G-Drive regularly races. They've been very much front runners. Pit to the title this year for the first time in five seasons. A very impressive run of form with different cars, different tyres, different teams and different driver lineups. And here's the leader coming through traffic, going by the 77 Dempsey Proton car, Christian Reed. And now catching the 97 Aston Martin through on the inside into turn 11 and starting the climb up the hill. Well, Anna McNish with brakes and tyres being uh, very much expected to be a limiting factor on this highly abrasive track. The advantage in LMP1 was surely always with Toyota. They may not, might not have had the fastest car. They've got a very efficient team, very good drivers, and the four-wheel drive traction of the hybrid system helping to mitigate some of that potential tyre wear off the slower corners. Yes, to the tyre wear and also the brake wear off. They can manage it a little bit more with the electrical recuperation in the braking areas at the end of the straight as well because of the fact they're lifting off prior to the end of the straight, slowing the car down with the recuperation, then hitting the brakes. So the brake requirement is a little bit less. I would say also the fact is they've been here and they've won here before, so they understand exactly what it means, their simulation 
is going to be very strong. Um, but looking at the right-hand side of this car, the, the rear wheel, it looks like the engine cover is maybe not completely locked in place. There was a small gap on the right-hand side just above the rear wheel. But uh, in general, these guys, unless there is a problem, they are just trying to manage the gaps towards the end of the race now. Well, it was always really looking as if it might be Toyota's race to lose, but the number seven car certainly was gifted a big advantage right from the very first corner. Toyota started third and fourth, but out of corner two, the number seven car was already in the lead as the front row uh, cars conspired to go off together. On board with Ben Hanley, look in the center of the dash. Normally, uh, that's a single digit for the gear selector. For some strange reason in the Ginetta, it doesn't say fifth gear, it says 5.0. Now, what happens if it comes up as 5.5? Does that mean it's half got a gear and half not? Yeah, you're in between gears. Yeah. Car 71 overtaking under full course yellow. Drive through penalty for Davide Rigon. That's the second place Ferrari in the GTE Pro class. It's all starting to come unraveled in GTE Pro. Three hours and 45 minutes to go. The first three hours and 45 minutes were full of close racing action, but relatively little drama. And suddenly, both Porsches effectively taken out of the hunt by different issues with dampers and tyres. And now AF Corsa looking like they're shooting themselves in the foot by being a little uh, anxious to overtake under full course yellow. Driver change here at high class. And uh, who was in the car before? It was Mark Patterson. So he gets out and uh, Kenti Yamashita gets back in. Match the second stint, the uh, Toyota Junior driver. Or did he do a double before? He might, might well have done a double before. Sticker fresh Goodyear tyres going on. So it looks as though he is definitely getting in for a double stint. Mark Patterson, two single stints in the car. I think that he has. I don't think he's doubled. Conflav on the pit wall. So clearly, pit stop coming up for number eight. Currently being driven by Kazuki Nakajima. And just, again, engineer and driver checking out what the plan is, where we're we going to go, what we're going to do. You like to have your head around it before you get in the car, Alan, so that everybody is singing from the same page on the hymn sheet. Yes, correct, and also to try and understand exactly uh, what the others are doing as well in terms of tyre wear, tyre choice, what the, the sensitive areas you've got to be careful of because it's not necessarily that the driver getting in has been sitting there listening to everything all of the time, uh, especially in an eight hour race or a 12 or a 24 hour race. We just just seen Felipe Albuquerque, the leader in LMP2, allowing the number 36 Cinetec Alpine car of Thomas Laurent to go by him and unlap itself from the leader. Uh, the answer of Mark Patterson, by the way, is that effectively it is a double stint, although he did stop on a caution, so he split that stint uh, more or less in half. So he has done 40 plus laps now. All right, well, let's get down to the pit lane. Mark Patterson is out of the garage, but his troubles haven't stopped yet because Louise Beckett is there to chat to him. has just stepped out of the 33 high class. How's it going for you? I'm not sure I heard the question, but you might have asked if I felt okay out there. The car was beautifully set up so we could drive it hard. The only guys I care about are Roberto and, and Fritz, two other good bronze drivers. I think I'm right inside their time. That's all I can do. Now I've heard you've signed up for Le Mans again. Oh yes, if I, uh, I had a little injury last year. So this year, it allows me to be uh, the oldest Lamar driver ever. So if that comes about, if everything holds together, we'll be setting that record as a team and as a, somebody who belongs in an old age home. Well, it's good to see you fighting fit again and I look forward to seeing you at Le Mans. Thank you. Thank and the you. rest of this race, of course. Good, good. Thank you. He's it, fantastic. He's mega. Uh, Mark Patterson uh, talking to one of the guys who's regularly shared a car with him, and a professional LMP2 driver that's regularly shared a car with him, out training on a bike. Mark destroyed them. 
destroyed them. He is fit as a butcher's dog's personal trainer, that man. And as well, at the same time, it's a smile that he had on his yeah. face there and the drive and determination, and that is a very big part. We always must remember it's not necessarily only about the professional drivers, it's also about the guys that make this a special paddock, and uh, I have to say, people like Mark Patterson do that. And in the, in the yellow and black car, that's the only driver, or one of the only two drivers he says he cares about, which are guys in his bracket. So Fritz van Aert in the uh, black and yellow racing team, Netherlands car, Roberto Gonzalez in the G-Drive car. That's who he's basing himself against. And his job is to bring the car back in one piece, have as much fun as he can, and lose as little time to the pros around him as he can. He's benchmarking himself against the gentleman drivers. He's doing a fine job. and. Uh, he was doing a great job earlier today, showing a guest, group of guests around him who had stopped to chat to him in the pit lane. And he said, hey, come in, take a look at the car. Got them all sitting in the car, walked and talked around them, encouraging uh, the young daughter there about her desire to get into engineering. Yeah, great, come on and do it. And just uh, like so many people in this paddock, just so much fun to be around, a real, uh, yeah, real live wire. And the other and th uh, sorry, the other thing that I do enjoy is when they do have some success, they appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, not, you know, sometimes a sort of battle-weary pro racing driver does lose a little bit of that feeling for it. And I remember Fritz van Aert when he won the race in Fuji. It was like a little boy at Christmas. It but, was a fantastic sight to see. Getting pole position, they were beyond themselves. You know, that was kind of a high after the disappointments of last season with the Dallara chassis. They were so excited, and yeah, it was like Santa came early. In fact, Santa does come early for Dutch children. Uh, Santa Claus in uh, comes very early uh, in December, but uh, he came for them uh, in the end of October. And of course, in racing driver terms, you're only as young as the uh, only as old as the driver you're passing. So if you if you get by some of the younger guys, keeps you young. Golf racing getting ready as I think up and down the pit stop uh, pit lane, we are ready for stops. So in comes Mike Wainwright. And bouncing up and down on his toes, Ben Barker getting ready to go back into the car. Ben is a normal sized racing driver. He's just been stretched out a lot. I know so, the feeling. And uh, Louise was saying, I think in our ears while we were chatting uh, about number 88 now, the universal sign of Retirement, Louise, the 88 garage door has come down. Yes, I've just gone past the 88 uh, garage door is down. There's still some guys working on the car, but nowhere near as many as there were, and I can't see any of the drivers. All right, that sounds like the end of the race for the 88 uh, Dempsey Proton car. Part of what they have to do, maybe, is getting the car around. Is that going to be doing rookie testing tomorrow? No, just getting it back in one piece to go into the uh, transporters to head to North America now. Back with our battle between the Jackie Chan DC Racing and Jota Sport cars. They came into the pits 1.3 seconds apart, and they are currently oh, 0.6 seconds apart. And hoping tongue completely off the circuit there at turn seven and the long downhill flowing fast, fast left-hander. And uh, that's allowed uh, Roberto Gonzalez just to close up that little bit. Gonzalez has definitely got the speed of hoping tongue. They're so, so closely matched as uh, here we see the overtake where uh, Hopin just slides down the inside into turn four and a couple of corners later runs very, very wide. Now these two cars are actually within the same team so they'll have a little bit of the same overall guidance and, uh, but they're competing in a way as the 42 is going very, very slowly. The cool racing car is in, coming into the pits and it's not going quickly at all. Cool racing car is down there in seventh place. Coigny is at the wheel, and uh, the last lap was pretty quick, but uh, this lap has been, they've got a, yeah, t 12 seconds off in the middle sector alone. And four and in a, the first sector as well, and so it's been a problem from the start of this lap. And he's been weaving the steering wheel a little bit there as well. Could it be a puncture? We've had a spate of those lately. Trying to see if it was looking down on the right rear, but it didn't look to be. Uh, the relevance of uh, Sheikh Mohammed being in the garage as a McLaren shareholder, of course. Zach Brown is the part owner of United Autosports and also uh, CEO of McLaren. 
so that relationship continues. So cool racing car, cool racing of course, one of four teams that stepped up from the European Le Mans series last year into the World Endurance Championship this year. Driver change has happened. Cool racing, Setilar, high class, and um, who's the fourth? Uh, United Auto Sports, of course, our race leaders. Left rear, uh, right rear, sorry, right rear only change on the tyre. Uh, so, so maybe it was, a it was a puncture on the right rear. Yeah, OK. And in fact, I think all of our new teams in LMP2 have really done extremely well already this season. Uh, racing right at the front of what is a very competitive customer racing field. Anthony Morgan taking over from Alexandre Quigny. Quigny quite badly, uh, it's Quigny who was injured in that crash, wasn't it? It's at, uh, uh, LMS in Silverstone, yeah. that's right, it was yeah. T-boned after a spin. Uh, missed the race that the team won on the debut in the WC. But was back day. For, yeah. uh, and he back did come King. down to the yeah. podium he on, did. on, on crutches, crutches he did. on the podium. On the, on the car. But uh, raced again at uh, Fuji. That's a very quick recovery. Yeah, much of it was expected to be away until at least Shanghai, wasn't he? So uh, it's pelvic fractures, wasn't it? Yeah, I know. Uh, again, we, you know, we talk about the the gentleman races in the field. He certainly shrugged that off. Hard as in nails, absolutely. Thomas Floor in the pits in the 54 Air Corsa Ferrari, and away that goes. So Charlie Eastwood ready at TF Sport, which means that the 90 Aston Martin is due on the pit lane as well. Johnny Adams in at the moment. Charlie Eastwood's had a shave, looks about 14. Uh, he is about 14, morning. that's why. <laughs> and he's not. in third place, that car, where Johnny Adams dragged it up into third place yep. behind uh, Ross Gunn and another Aston Martin. And then the Team Project 1 car that's leading it is a little bit up the road of that pair. 54 car now with Giancarlo Fisichella. They've taken the pin out to Fisichella, so uh, stand by for action. Is he young enough to have raced here in Formula One? Yes. Oh, yeah. He's They've been racing here 15 years. He must have been, must have been. Yeah, he's not uh, Fisichella. He's been racing. He's raced here, definitely. In F1. In F1. Larry Tenforda uh, hasn't done Super Cup here. Might have done Carrera Cup Middle East. Uh, all those cars run by Walter Lechner Middle East, Lechner Racing Middle East. Uh, that's one of the support races this weekend. Larry Tenforda racing in Carrera Cup Deutschland and also in the Mobile One Super Cup this year, as well as WEC. So, what a busy Porsche calendar. Fisher Keller, of course, also raced to GT Pro for Ferrari. Very good. In the earlier years. Ben Keating, two hours, 57 minutes and 48 seconds behind the wheel. That's pretty epic in an eight-hour race, isn't it? Other, uh, other people might say, little greedy. Yeah, so they, I was going to say a little <laughs> earlier. There are, there are, you know, beloved they are, most certainly by the fans, the, uh, the incredibly enthusiastic gentleman drivers, but Mark Batson and uh, Ben Keating are amongst that select group who are truly beloved of the fan yeah. base. Yeah. Uh, because of the way they go about these things, the passion, you know, the, uh, the, their raw speed, but also always bring something interesting to it. Always works hard to do it. And after a year that brought disappointment with Le Mans with the exclusion of his 4GT, to see him driving with this level of competence is just, it's supplying us. It's excellent to see him. Well, again, you know, you're only as good as your last time in the car, and his last time in the car got them pole position. So Absolutely. I, I don't suppose he was even remotely um, not looking forward to the start of this race. We are closing in, by the way, gentlemen, on the next round of uh, LMP1 pit stops. Should be seeing the uh, Toyotas in about four laps, uh, the number five Ginetta in about one lap, and a couple of laps until we see Norman Nato down pit lane in the Rebellion. Uh, also, come back on the point, Giancarlo Fisichella has done five Grand Prix here. Ah. Finished any of them? Uh, oh, that, that's why you've got the data page open. I thought you had the answer to your questions. I wasn't expecting you to remember. We're also within two or three laps of the lead LMP2 cars going down pit lane, so it's going to be pretty busy down there for Lou in just a few minutes' time. But well, we've not long seen that the second and third place car, uh, Jackie Chan DC Racing and Jota Sport stop, and Cinetech Alpine are in at the moment. Um, After a 24 lap stint, by the way. Wow, okay. Uh, so United are due to come in as well at the same time as 
Jackie Chan DC and uh, Jota. United will be in the same lap as the 37 and the 38. OK. Right. So more pit stops. This is the MR Racing Ferrari, car number 70. And door open, so ah, it's Olivier Beretta getting in. Stand by in the steward's room. It's got a damage at the front, front left. Big damage. Ah, so Kai uh, Kotsu, uh, who was in it before? That's not uh, just a Motowaki, Mo Motowaki Ishikawa, so yep. he's had a little clip with something. Yep. It's been something that's been overtaking because it's pulled it forward. Yeah. You can see the it's blue tight, rubber yeah. round about the wheel arch area. Tire mark on the front yep. there, so. Might just have been... He had that spin, remember? Might just have been, uh, yeah, a prototype sliding up the inside of him somewhere. Yeah, but it's a very high wheel. Get yeah. the big tape, they're saying there, the big tape. Get the big hammer. it's going to sort of hang in it no. without a lot of tape over it. There you can see the brake smoke coming out of uh, the inner of the wheel duct of the Ginetta at the pitch stop. That's the area where you get the heat soak. And right now, if you stand at the end of the straight or down into a big deep braking area, you'll see those discs glowing red. With the LMP cars, they're shrouded to try to get a better airflow through and a better efficiency of cooling as well as actual working for aero downforce as well, how they channel the air. But uh, in the uh, GTE cars, you can see it a little bit, it's a bit more exposed. <laughs> Is that Simpson? Yes. Simpson, you doofus. Where's your passport? <laughs> uh, moving on. Uh, MR Racing still in the pit lane. Instead of fannying about with gaffer tape, would it not have been easier to unclip the damaged nose and clip on a, let's say, not damaged nose? Yes, uh, in practice it probably is at that stage but uh, it, in reality sometimes you sort of get into something and it and it's only when you're actually into it you realize it'd be quicker doing it the other way around both uh, the jota sport cars are into the pits jackie chan dc racing car in front 37 that's exactly how they were on circuit so there'll be no time loss in uh, them stopping together right who's doing what with tires Used going on what side of the 38? No tyres at all for 37. Well, somebody was putting tyres down. 98 just came in as well. That was the Aston that flew past through shot. Ross Gunn bringing the car in. Paul Dallalana still with more time to spend in the car, I think. Left-hand side only yeah. for uh, the Jota Sport 38. And uh, I think Gonzalez still stays at the wheel. That car. Yeah. Uh, Yet yeah, Paul Dallana will still need to do. Let's have a quick look. 20 um, odds minutes. I, I think a little more than that. Yeah. So Fritz van Eyde comes in for Racing Team Netherlands from sixth in LMP2. I would suggest 20 laps. Ah, uh, driver change going on here. Is that uh, that's too tall for Nick de Vries? Surely. Uh, the little one, Louise says. You mean he's not quite taller than Louise? So it is. It is Nick de Vries. I can only say he's of average height, Nick de Vries, 1 meter 65. Mm. Poor to average, I would have thought. <laughs> so you say it in 1 meter 65, makes it sound like it's quite a lot. Set at 5 foot 4, it sounds considerably less. A uh, bit of a handshake there from Gerda van der Gaard for Fritz van Aert. And Nick, Nick de Vries, like Alan McNish and Louise Beckett, in fact, is a proper racing driver size. Me and Ben Barker, a little less likely to fit in most racing cars. Now you see the flag marshal there ready to check to see if uh, he was going to wave the blue flag to alert de Vries that there was a car coming down the main straight. Just be careful as you go into that first corner. We've seen incidents here in the past in many, many formulas. And uh, right now, also in the pits, Rebellion racing from third. Well, actually, it's dropped down now. It'll be fourth place because uh, LNT of Jordan King will have gone back up into third with that particular stop. Norman Nato in the car, releases the speed limiter, accelerates out. And there we have uh, the car that's in fifth place with Michael Simpson coming out to turn 13. Well, let's get down to the MR Racing team. Car is now left with Olivier Beretta. Motoaki Ishikawa brought it in, and Louise Beckett is with him now. Damage to the 70 MR Racing, uh, but you put in a good run. So what happened? Why was there that damage? 
Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this year, uh, it's second uh, series for me, and uh, now I used to uh, I used to driving a uh, 488 GT. So, but today at uh, this time, uh, the car is very oversteer, and uh, in case of new tire, uh, the car is very good. But uh, after 10 laps, uh, the car is very loose. So uh, today, Kay and Olivier and me are not so fast. Okay, but you're putting in a lot of work, I can see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hard to hear in the garages. I have to say, he's doing a lot better in English than we were doing Japanese, Alan. And uh, they are struggling with time. I mean, everybody is expecting to struggle with tyres, but I think that he was suggesting there that it is definitely a lot more of a struggle for them. Yeah, Slow car on track. In fact, it is parked. That's the number five car. Yeah, that's a fourth place. Uh, Jordan King, we just said that he popped up into third place with the Rebellion Racing Spit Stop. And uh, he has now stopped. And that's on the hairpin up out of turn number eight towards turn number nine. That's not looking good. Pulled over to the side. Yeah, and he's pulled over. So clearly the car has developed a major problem. And the issue Otherwise. is that he's going to have to have a little bit of power to get it to move up the hill. Here we go on board. Oh, bag of nails. Yep. As he braked and then changed down, then it lost all drive. It sound, sounds like that uh, the input shaft or drive shafts or something's broken there. Engine's still running. Input shaft connects the engine to the gearbox and across or alternatively the drive shafts that uh, are going out from the gearbox to the wheel. Well, thumbs up from Chris Dyson, but that does look like the number five car is not going to make it back round. New tail, you pointed out earlier on, Alan, this wasn't fitting properly on the number eight Toyota. On the right hand side, it looked like it had a, um, it, it wasn't fitting uh, correctly. And so therefore they've also changed the tail. Uh, Louise said that it was wobbling as it came down the pit lane as well. And so obviously they let it run until it got to be a, a critical problem point. Now the eight, eight car is also quite a long way behind. It's a, it was a minute and 20 seconds before coming into the pits behind the sister car. So in reality, the safer thing is to just stop and repair it. Alan, yes. you know how you've got the rule book on your laptop? Are you allowed to have people changing tyres and doing other things to cars? As Louise pointed out that they were changing the, the tail and also changing the tyres at the same time. So we'll have to wait and see what the stewards make of that. Well, here is the concerned looking Ginetta Team LNT. Jordan King stranded out on the circuit. And they're waiting to hear on the radio what's going to happen with that car. I'm sure he's being uh, told to try and work through things. Charlie Robertson there, you can see, uh, with his overalls half on. The car's now being pulled back behind the barriers by the marshals. And if only they could find a gearbox there behind the barriers. <laughs> and those days, I'm afraid, are long since gone. Jordan King stranded out on the circuit halfway round the lap. Less than halfway around the lap, he needs to have a little bit of help from the electronics. Change for third place, change for second place rather, and that is uh, G Drive's Jop Van Oyter just slipping up the inside of Hope in Tung in the black and yellow Jackie Chan DC racing car. So G Drive up to second, United Autosports still lead, and United now up to fifth place overall. They have gone by, and Jordan King shutting the door. The team have told him. I think that there is nothing left to do with the car, and that's a real shame for Team LNT. Wait and see what news we can get from the pit lane from Louise Beckett. For that change for second, Jop van Oyter. He's been impressive with his pace in this car this year, as he was at Le Mans, and gets by hope in turn now. Graham Goodwin, uh, van Oyter on fresher tyres, I think, than hope in turn. Is he? 
Uh, Hope's on a second stint in this car. Uh, so the job for Utert is on new tyres on the, in the 26 car. He's 15 laps into this stint. Uh, Hope in Tung onto a second stint yeah. on older rubber. So he's now three laps into. He's got 20, his tyres 25 laps old. Uh, job for Utert 15. Meanwhile, Jordan King jumping back or wriggling himself back into the cockpit of the number five car. So he's going to plug the radio back in and talk to these guys. There's Lawrence Tomlinson in the back with his hands on the headset. He is the LNT of Team LNT. Lawrence Tomlinson, the boss of Geneta Cars. And so I'm not sure whether Jordan was in just so he could steer the car for the Marshals to pull it further back. Doesn't matter how, how far back it goes, if he gets drive, he can drive back on track. Here we come through the left hand and down to where something failed. Just there, just as he lifted off and then started to downshift. And there's a lot of clunking and banging in things, so to me sounds a little bit gearbox diff input shaft related. Yeah, he's pulling levers on the steering wheel and it's not engaging gears. He's got no drive, he's had. So he pulls off to the side, he's back in the car to allow the marshals to position it out of the way. And they will continue to talk until there is no chance left they can fix anything. And uh, the new engineer sitting in there, Paul Thomas, who's someone that's very well known in this paddock and others, having been in this sport for over 20 years at Toyota in the GT1 programme, Latterly, Dragon Speed uh, with their various successes around in ELMS and also Daytona 24 Hours and uh, now with Team LNT as well. Here's the sister car, it's still running. Well, Mike Simpson at the wheel of the car, he started it. Uh, Guy Smith and Chris Dyson have had their stints in it as well. Simpson back at the wheel, but uh, we talked about this when one Porsche had a damper problem and so the other one was coming in slowly. If one car has a failure, unexpectedly that's not due to hitting the scenery, you then tend to immediately start looking at the data coming back from the other car to see whether there's a potential problem with it as well. Yeah, the problem is if you didn't see the data that caught, you know, there was no indication that there was a problem in the previous car, then you haven't really got much of a, a thing to go on until you do a physical inspection there. In the background, stripped to the waist, Ben Hanley looking at concerned as all of them are in the Geneta garage. Jordan King getting a ride back to the paddock. And he's out and on his way. Yeah. That Watch looks me. like they have told him there is nothing that can be done. And so he is heading back. So that may well be our second retirement of the race. The first being the 88 Dempsey Proton Porsche that was crashed by Khaled Al Kabaisi uh, about an hour or so ago to the last corner. Just coming back to you on the point, and I didn't actually see the pit stop itself for Toyota. Uh, once you've done your refueling, then you're allowed to have uh, one driver attendant. You're allowed to have four mechanics that can do anything on the car, or you can have two mechanics to change the brakes or the tires and tire temperatures. No other operations allowed at the same time. So well, let's get down to Lawrence Tomlinson at Team LNT and find out what they know. We could see Jordan struggling with the car in the pictures. Uh, tell us what he reported back. Yeah, it's been um, it's been quite a race for us from the, the start, really, with the turn one incident. The car got quite a whack. Um, we then had um, a fuel flow meter went down, which we had to change. We had a great race back. All the guys did a great job. And uh, now we just lost the battery voltage. Whether whether it's related to the initial incident that we've had or it's just a little freaky incident, but it's basically just the, the car's just lost electrical power. So battery connection or just something similar. We don't know. So it's no concern about the number six then? No, I think it's just totally one of those things. So um, probably related to the initial incident, I would guess. Okay, thank you. Again, quite often, you need a full post-mortem afterwards to sort it out. The other car had power issues, all sorts of uh, systems failing, dashboard failing, all down to battery problems uh, earlier on in the weekend in free practice. One thing we don't know, well, what we do know, is they, they couldn't hear what we could hear. They couldn't hear the bagganelles that you described because they'd have been watching pictures but only able to hear the sound that we could hear. And if they've got a power supply problem, it may very well be that Jordan couldn't speak to the team. 
Uh, at the end, he, he's obviously reported something back, and they've got the data, so they should know. It's just, you know, the noise that it was as soon as he braked and started to downshift, then uh, maybe there's a couple of problems in there. But anyway, unfortunately for LNT, it's not only just the fact the car is out of the race, it's also the fact that it's less experience for them and the team in terms of building their sort of bank of understanding of how to get the performance and how to get the reliability out of this car, which is clearly quick, yeah. but speed's good for one lap for a race of eight hours or endurance or let alone come into 24 hours of Le Mans, then that's a very different matter. And this is a team still, remember, looking for its first World Championship podium uh, finish. It's uh, they, they were in that position after five hours, of, well, almost five hours of the race uh, elapsed. We've come through two four-hour races. As we said at the start of the race, gentlemen, an eight-hour race is an altogether different challenge. Back to our GTE Pro lead battle. 95 Aston Martin has swung back into the lead of the race. And again, it is being harassed by cars from behind. And again, this is how the new tyre, old tyre battle follows uh, through the race. You saw Miguel Molina watching from the pit lane and his teammate looking to make his way through. Uh, Davide Regon right behind the lead Aston Martin. This is for the, the first place in the GTE Pro class. I looked at this battle maybe about 20 minutes ago and it was at four seconds, so it's taken a heck of a long time for the Ferrari to come up on the back of the Aston. The Aston's just sitting there nicely, neatly doing its job. Uh, if we remember back a little while ago, it was Nicky Team that was, uh, uh, what was it that Christensen said? This is the real Dane the train, real when Dane he was train, sitting yeah. behind them and couldn't actually do anything <laughs> about it. And so the Aston is consistently just delivering the performance that it can achieve and it's keeping itself right in this mix of the race. A proper display by the Aston, gets its nose in front on strategy, digs in and then holds the others up when they should be going quicker on fresher tyres. 71 had a penalty awarded to it that has just been rescinded, and Louise Beckett suggesting that is the second time a penalised Ferrari has had the penalty undone. So uh, clearly either somebody's been quick to judge yeah, yeah. 62 car. The yeah. 62 car, the five second penalty rescinded. No, sorry, the other way around. The other way around. 41, it was a dem it was a decision 41 yeah. um, that actually was taken, which was uh, the Dempsey Proton. Yeah. So, so 77 had it rescinded yeah. and the 62 got it. And yeah. So, it, yeah, but there's, there's been a few things that have sort of changed around there. The, um, the, what was I going to say? I was going to say something about the Ferrari battle there. Yes, we saw it. this uh, Molina was on the pit wall and that uh, just got to remember that that car is effectively out of this world championship fight because of the dnf at the first race at silverstone where it collided uh, with one of the lnt cars coming through the very very quick entry to the beckett's essays so for them this season now is just about amassing as many points but if they can get 38 out of this one yeah. it just maybe oh, helps yeah. them on their way and gives them something to think about coming towards le mans well that undoes half the zero doesn't it because they They'll get if they end, if they could end up winning it, they'll get another half points win. So it'll end up being the same as having been third at Silverstone. So that zero then becomes less of a zero. I know, I know that's not logical, but the win is worth more. It is. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yes. Uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> but exactly what you mean. But even my English uh, can't <laughs> describe that. However, what it can do is lead us back to Aston Martin versus Ferrari. And Ferrari in third place as well with James Collado. And again, Alan, exactly as you pointed out a lap or so ago, the Aston Martin just needs to block. I mean, not, it just needs to defend, doesn't even need to move offline and block. It just needs to stop the Ferrari using the Ferrari's advantage. Aston Martin and Ferrari both have an advantage on the Porsche towards the end of the straights. What the Ferrari doesn't have that the Porsche does is so much an advantage through the middle of the corner against the Aston. I think they're very much more evenly balanced, perhaps, than the, Ferrari, than the uh, Porsche and the Aston. Yes. Or indeed the Porsche and the Ferrari. Certainly, there's not a lot between any of these cars in GT Pro. It's fantastic battle, fantastic class in the World Endurance Championship. One that just keeps on giving absolutely every event, keeps giving something. And I think it's the fact that uh, you've got a very, very good balance between the manufacturers involved, but you've also got some elite teams and drivers that are running them as well. 
new dad, Nicky T. Oh, hello. <laughs> That's the second time I... This is Big Tomma, the cameraman, who's caught Nicky Team by surprise for a second time in one weekend. That almost never happens in a year. Just in front of them, by the way, is Ant Davidson in the Jota Sport car, third in LMP2, and about half the length of the front straight behind the car that's second in LMP2. That's the G-Drive car of Jot van Eutert. And van Eutert's last lap, a 150.8, Ant's a 51.4. So that gap is seesawing up and down in traffic, but Ant is not making a big impression yet on the G-Drive car in second place. The gap much smaller here in the GTE Pro class, though. And at the moment, Marco Sorensen clinging on by inches ahead of David A. Rigon. Sorensen's younger brother, Lassie, uh, is in Sunday's rookie test. So he's one of the four guys that will be run, in fact, half a dozen guys, I think, being run by AMR and TF Sport in two Aston Martins in the uh, rookie test sessions on Sunday morning and on Sunday afternoon. In between that battling duo, insinuates itself the number 37 Jackie Chan DC racing car. That's Hope into him fourth in the LMP2 category. And top four in LMP2 covered by 36 seconds. So it's still a very close battle with three hours to go. Sorensen and Regon first and second. Collado 41 seconds back. So this is a two horse race right now. It certainly is. And these two cars have got three equal stints to make it to the end of this race. Three stints of 31 laps. So they're on the same fuel strategy. The question is, are they on the same tyre strategy? Now, how did they do that? Because 95 took themselves out of the normal run of things early on in the race. I didn't think that the Ferraris had, so 95's obviously done something to get back into that. They've, they've started counting back from the end of the race before we got to halfway and have worked out. And that may have happened in that full course yellow uh, that we had a little earlier on that was... It's pulled uh, everything back into line yeah. again, I think, between them all. They were able to uh, top up with fuel and get back onto strategy. Now, again, as we said, tyres, what you've got left at the end of the race, might decide where you finish. Will decide where you finish, not yeah. might. It's going to be a will decide, I think, on that one. It's what you've got up your sleeve in the final hour. That's the card you play, and whatever you've got left, Depends how clever you've been in the rest oh, of the race. He's been compromised here by the cool racing car coming down the inside. That's given the 71 a little bit of opportunity. Just and enough. so Gons going round the outside, oh, got yes. through. Again, great opportunity. You've got to be so aware of this, haven't you, when you're in any class battle, whether you're in the fastest cars or the slowest cars or anywhere in between, traffic can really compromise your race or your battle. Racing drivers are opportunistic people. They live for that second. And uh, that was Regon that was gifted a chance there just by the cool racing LMP2, which is driven by Borga, uh, just trying to sneak through in front of the Aston Martin. Well, that was enough. And uh, half a sniff, and then they go on board. Now with uh, the race leader, Mike Conway at the wheel. He started the race, he led the first stints. This car's led every single race, ev every single lap, sorry, of the 156 laps so far. Yeah. And has got nearly a two minute lead over the sister car. Yeah, it's quite gap. impressive over this car, the number eight. And I think we should listen to Sebastian Buemi, see what he's got to say. Track limit warning, turn 13, and the two which let it work. Turn well, it well, let it well, because maybe don't turn 13, it's doing the best I can, and I'm losing so much, I'm doing the best I can, I'm not driving bad. I know, I know that, I know that. As in Formula E, come Seb, come. That's the first words his engineer always says in any Formula E radio broadcast. Come in, Moussa, come to us. Uh, yeah, but he's, you know, th there's a point that if you get shoved out there, then uh, you get a track limits warning, and that's what he's saying. Is yeah. he's, I'm not doing anything. I'm, look, at the end for him as well, he's in second place. He's not going to win unless there's a problem for the other car. Yeah. He's not going to finish third unless there's a problem for his car. Uh, for his car. Yeah. So therefore, he's in a position of just running around to the end of the race to some extent with three hours to go. And so there's a bit of frustration there. But we have seen track limits warning coming up automatically because they are done yep. to a great extent automatically for people having spins. And so I would just keep it a little bit calm, probably to some extent. The engineer should have maybe reiterated that, that it was just a piece of advice. Now that pass for the Ferrari to take the lead of the GTE Pro class was on the in-lap for both Davide Rigon and Marco Sorensen. Neither are changing driver, both are 
fueling and there are tyres to go. Left side's on the Aston. And right. down and gone. And left side's only on the Ferrari. And down and gone. And back out in front with, again, a car length between them. Uh, so Ferrari's taken a bit of an extra lead there over. It's more than a car length. That's uh, They've taken a few seconds yep. out of it on that one. We're talking four seconds different. So the same two drivers, the same two cars, the same full tank of fuel and the same tyre change as well. And the Ferrari already sliding out of turn two as it exits the pit lane. Martin, just to confirm your point earlier about the difference, this uh, change the points for the longer race, the 1.5 times the normal points will make. If it finished as it was as they came into the pit stop before the race, uh, the points gap from top to bottom in the t in the six cars in GT Pro was 42 points. After this race, if it finished the way it is now, 26 points. Wow. So in other words, a maximum point score for a regular WC weekend. I yeah, just sort of also say that uh, there is a difference in the amount of fuel they put in the Aston Martin by the BOP regulations, or EOT, uh, then it's uh, six litres more than they put in the Ferrari. And uh, so, therefore, that's part of the balancing of it. There's other adjust small adjustments between them. But this is a race where there's been no adjustments between the last race and here. And uh, so that's part of the time, but it's still quite a long time on the, dis and the difference of the pit stop. So is that a second or maybe two more stationary? Second or so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah done. OK, driver change here at Team Project One. And unless Ben Keating is really feeling up for the fight, I'm rather guessing that they put your own Blokemola in for the first time. Larry Ten Ford are doing a double that car coming in from the lead in the GTE AM class. And that hands the lead over to the 98 Aston, which has now got Darren Turner at the wheel, Ben Barker in the Gulf Porsche. That's the gap, first to second, or possibly second to third, depending on how long it takes the Team Project One car of your own Blenkermolen to get out of the pit lane. Was 45 seconds in front when he came in, so actually he may just about have stayed in the lead. You're looking for 57, 98 and 86. Alan is looking at our GPS spotters. Uh, they come across the line now and he's already gone from the pit lane. I think Jerome Blake Merlin stays in the lead. He does, he's yeah. He's in the lead by about 20 seconds. He's yeah. already coming down through turn seven and eight as they go into the first corner. And so Blake Merlin's uh, well in the lead of this one. And behind, uh, Aston Martin, Darren Turner in the 98, a 159.5 last time round, but a 158.7 Ben Barker. to the action here, GTM. This battle here for uh, second and third place, Darren Turner at the wheel of the Aston Martin, which is uh, the green car in the middle there, and directly behind him, now we've got uh, Ben Barker in the Gulf Racing Porsche. And they're putting a uh, lap on Christian Reed in the number 77 car. And uh, go down to hear what's happening with the eight Toyota. Yeah, Mike, uh, that is to swap position at turn one. Position one. Yeah, well, Mike Conway being asked there to switch with Sebastian Boemi, who's directly behind him. This isn't a change of position because Boemi is actually one lap behind, and so then he'll be allowed to bring himself back onto the lead lap. However, I would say that uh, Conway heard the radio message. He hasn't quite executed it yet. In fact, he's not executed it at all. Well, in fairness, Bremery's got to get close to him first before he can let him get by, unless he wants to pull over park and have a sandwich. Yeah, he's got a lap lead, though. Yeah. yeah. 
But, yeah, when he gets to you, let him go by. Perhaps should have been the message rather than, could you let him go by? Yes, I will. Well, there's a clear agreement, turn one. Yeah. That's me. That's me. Maybe next lap or the lap after. Let's watch this uh, GTM battle <coughs> back on. And the Totas pick their way through it. And Mike Conway will lose a little bit of time here to Sebastian Boehme, so maybe in a position to see that track position at least this time around. Um, Jimmy Bruni hands over to Richard Leitz, and this is the Porsche that currently lies in fifth position, so the less delayed of the two. Uh, remind me which bit broke on this one? This was damper. the damper one, wasn't it? Damper the other on one the was... Rear. Yeah, the other one was the uh, right front puncture or right front wheel failure, nut loss. Actually, sorry, this was the puncture This car. was the, the one with the, was that the one lost with the nut, yep. yeah, OK. As he came into the pits. So uh, the gunman at the front will be triply careful. Nice shiny tyre going on the left-hand side. And he goes down. So left side's only, I think we can safely say there. Having a quick check of the dashboard. As he's still on the pit limiter. Meanwhile, the battle continues in GTE Am. Oh, three wide in GTE Am and Pro. Pro class Ferrari on the inside of the 5662 battle. And oh, in fact, that's 5762. 56. Is it? 56, all right. Well, 56 is a long way up the order. Uh, Charlie Hollings, it was. No, it's not, no. It's Matteo Cairoli. That car is the last running car in GTE Am, in fact, ahead uh, with battling with Charlie Hollings, but they are uh, a lap apart, a lap apart. So, in fact, it was unlapping itself. Um, is there some handbags going on there in the back of the Porsche garage? Yeah, clearly, it's a little bit of a frustration there. I think they, were, they thought they were in for a good position here, getting pole position yesterday, and uh, then it all sort of falling apart for both the Porsches and bringing Aston Martin and uh, the the Ferraris really back in, not just to this race, but also to the World Championship fight. Yeah. And you never want to take your foot off your rival's throat, do you, in any situation? And unfortunately for Porsche, uh, they've been sort of pushed out of the battle a little bit here. Darren Turner, by the way, has managed to pull away a little bit. And back and uh, listen they... again to what's going on with the number eight Toyota. So, Boemi. The tires, they felt like if they were crooked, sliding everywhere. But then if it's a uh, real pain, uh, we can also anticipate the stop and talk earlier. It's uh, your decision. Right, so first of all, he's complaining that he needs to get by the number seven Toyota. Now he's complaining that the tyres are sliding around. So even if Van Davidson, uh, if uh, Mike Conway slows down and gives him a lap back, it sounds like he's going to pit early anyway. Well, he's uh, got the option to switch to the softer tyre late, uh, later on. I think they were trying to keep it for a little bit later on, but uh, if he's struggling now, tyre's got a temperature working window, and if it's outside the temperature, then uh, it does feel like it's on ice. But here's a pretty good battle so fourth. between fourth position, yep. Job van Oyter and uh, Negrao, who has been one of the stars of this race in LMP2. Now, don't forget, Van Oyter was behind, was it originally the G-Drive car was ahead of the Jota and Jackie Chan DC racing cars. It's now behind, and it's been caught by the Senior Tech car. So, Andre Negrel, and again, him and his teammates, they are one set of tyres short, because they completely destroyed them in a big oh. spin in qualifying. Uh, in comes Sebastian Buemi. You know what he has got? He's got the hump, that's what he's got. Oh, he's got Brendan Hartley in the car yeah. now, so we'll see if they actually, what they do with the tyres. There's tyres there going on, definitely, with the new driver in the car. <laughs> and it is a fresh set, brand spanking new set of, certainly on the left side. Yeah, well, it sort of just depends what compound they're putting on as well, but uh, Brendan Hartley will go out. I'm sure Sebastian Buemi is happy to give up that struggle. Let's hear from the race leader, though. They might just go in four car eight, anticipate their stop to change for medium tyres again. So they stayed with a medium tyre again. So that's an English translation of the French phrase. They haven't anticipated their stop, they've no, actually they done their stop. Yes. No, he was yeah, meaning yeah. they actually didn't run to the end of the fuel yeah. mileage, they brought it forward. Exactly. So that's why he's dropped out of the back of the mirror. But at yeah. the same time, thinking a new tyre is the reasoning that yeah. they lost the tyre. They needed a new tyre. Well, let's catch up with the Jota Sport team. And Davidson lying in second place, his teammate Antonio Felix da Costa. Antonio Felix da Costa is what 
marching on to all the action. Uh, what can you do to try and catch that United Autosport? I don't know. We're trying to find out as well. Um, they're fast. They're really fast today. Uh, they probably have a little bit of an edge on us, but um, we'll see. It's, it's going to be. It's all about the second stint on the tires. It's a, a lot of tire deck here, uh, and we're trying to manage it as, as good as we can. So we have. We're in good shape at the end of the race. But they will be hard to beat today. You know, there's another Portuguese guy in that car, and I really want to catch him. But uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. What do you have left tire-wise for the rest of the race? Are you going to have to start splitting it, left only, or...? I cannot tell you. I know you can't, but you know I've got to try. We've got a lot of new tires left. <laughs> Thank you. I think he that's can tell us. I think he that's can tell us. We're only telling a couple of million people, but what we're not doing is going down the road to United and spilling the beans. Uh, would say, by the way, that uh, that gap has closed. Yeah. Uh, though it's going out a little uh, more over the last uh, two or three laps. Was remember up to about well, just shy of a minute. Then stable about 45 seconds. Came down to about 25 seconds. Now back up to around 30. And by I the way, it's tra very traffic dependent as well because. Uh, you know, if you just look at the last lap of Phil Hansen, who's in the United Autosports car at the moment, uh, he's just banged in a lap that's one and a half seconds quicker than Anthony Davidson. So it track, it's traffic affected seems to be the biggest part. Well, get, to give you the, the averages over the current stint for Phil Hansen and, and Davidson, it's about 18, 19 uh, laps each. As uh, there's a further discussion of some merit there with uh, <laughs> uh, Boemi. Uh, it's, it's classic <laughs> Boemi, isn't it? Half an hour after he's got out of the car, he's still chuntering on. One 150.703 the average over this stint for Phil Hansen. 150.729 oh. the average for and Davidson. This so, is so little between them, and that's that early advantage. When United came through that early brush with, with the front runners in LMP1, even though everybody immediately was held up behind the safety car and they couldn't escape. They did escape because there were other cars between them and the rest of the LMP2 field. That gave them 30 seconds and they've never given it back. And now they still have a 30 second lead. By the way, if you want might more of the comedy of Antonio Felix da Costa, look on the, the WEC app at, uh, as his role in the Whose Helmet game show. Five hours of eight hours down in the eight hours of Bahrain, the final race of the decade in the FIA World Endurance Championship and a return to Bahrain for the first time in a couple of seasons. Bruno Senna starting on pole for Rebellion, the black Ginetta from Team LNT alongside Charlie Robertson. They were very even on the run down to the first corner. Senna's inside line advantage at first appeared to have paid off, but Robertson stuck to his guns around the outside. Then too much gas too soon, looped the Ginetta around, clattered off the Rebellion, through went the number seven Toyota and the 22 United All Sports LMP2 car. And in GTE Pro, Ferrari lunge for the lead, paid off, dive bombing the two front row starting Porsches to get in front. And that set the seal for the rest of the race. Safety car was out briefly. Toyota led from United, the LMP2 leader, and the number seven car ran away at the start. It took a while for the delayed cars to get back past the second place United Autosports car. It stayed in the lead in LMP2 and remains there five hours later on. Early problems for the recovering number one rebellion. It had a gear shift electronics issue. A fierce battle all the way up and down. The order continues to rage in GTE Pro. This Porsche versus Ferrari moment soon caught up with the Aston Martin that led, and they both eventually went by. Aston Martin, Porsche, and Ferrari have both, of all three, led in the GTE Pro class, not without incident like that with Alex Lynn and Fritz van Aert in the Jumbo Supermarkets LMP2 car. And eventually, after holding everybody off for about an hour, the Nicky team's tyres gave up and they started coming streaming by. Great work in traffic for the number 51 Ferrari to dive past the 92 Porsche and take a narrow lead of the class. The Porsche recovering immediately. In LMP2, G-Drive, Jackie Chan, DC Racing, Jota all chasing, but United Autosports leading. And then five That's, uh, minutes of drama. The 92 Porsche in the garage with a problem. The 88 
Amclass Porsche clattering the barriers and bringing out the first full course yellow of the season of the uh, race. And then 91 Porsche coming in after the full course yellow stops. A loose wheel nut had caused uh, huge damage and a puncture and both Porsches out of action. And also at the track side, the number five Janetta has retired from the race. Live action in the pits here. This is the remaining Dempsey Proton car. 88 has been retired. The door is down on them. And a driver change, 77. That's Christian Reed, the team boss, getting out. And I think it was Matteo Cairoli's turn probably to get into the car. So they are struggling for pace here. Uh, there is a Porsche at the front of the GTE AM class. It's the car that started at the front, the number 57 car. And then there's this battle for second in GTE AM. The Aston Martin of Darren Turner ahead of Ben Barker's Golf Racing Porsche. 97 Aston comes in from the lead of the GTE Pro class. Ahead of Davide Regan in the 71 Ferrari and Nicky Team, who's now in the 95 Aston Martin. And clearly now all of the GT Pro cars are working on a strategy that will get them through to the end of the race with the minimum fuel stops remaining. Two hours and 48 minutes left on the clock in the eight hours of Bahrain. The longest race of the season so far. And they are going for a full set. Oh, joy unbounded for the driver, getting actual tyres all the way round. That's been pretty rare so far in this race. You saw there the battle for second in GTE Am. And a quick squeeze round the nose of the Aston, taking out some tyre debris. And a bit of ticky-tacky to hold something on there at the back. A few seconds longer spent in the pit lane, but it's better than being called in again because something is astray. Fixing his belts. Out goes, uh, who came in? Maxim Martin, so out goes Alex Lin. Uh, just to confirm, by the way, 77 is Ricardo Perra. You, like me, earlier in uh -huh. the, the show, got mixed up with which uh, team uh, Matteo Caroni is driving with here. Yeah, it's uh, actually Project One. But oh, so he is. And also, <laughs> and also completes Christian Reed's driving time. Right, OK, so he is, is completed. Uh, ben Keating in the lead 57 car completed his driving time in the first three hours of the race because he did the first three hours of the race. The minimum requirement is two hours 20 for the uh, bronze drivers in that class. And he based in fact for bronze and silver drivers in that class. And in fact, he did three full stints at the beginning. And when Louise talked to him about 10 minutes later, uh, with the smile on his face, looked like he was happy to go again, but I think he's going to leave the rest to his teammates. Darren Turner in second, Ben Barker in third. Good battle between the British drivers, the Gulf Racing team from the UK, Aston Martin Racing from the UK as well. So uh, an awful lot of good ground being shared between these two. I saw a little stat by uh, Simon Strang, uh, the Aston Martin PR man, when they, when they raced here, I think he said it was 2016, Darren Turner and Johnny Adam set identical lap times in qualifying, inseparable to the thousandth of a second. In qualifying yesterday, although Johnny Adams was later pinged for track limits, they set track times that were just two thousandths of a second apart. Who was the quicker? Uh, Darren was because his lap stood. I was about to say something rude about Darren and losing pace with age. <laughs> yeah, do, uh, yeah, I hold you. No, he's got quicker by 2000s. But the odd thing Johnny Adams said was you overlaid the traces of their laps, utterly, utterly different in every way imaginable. So they've come up with the same answer, but the working out in the margins is, yep. has got nothing to do with each other. Completely bizarre. LMP2, exactly. LMP2 leader in the pit lane. And Phil Hansen brings in the number 22 United Auto Sports car. Now, is he staying in? Door's not open yet, so looks like it is. Uh, stays in, and fresh tyres for him as well. And this is a great view of the little oasis of light in the darkness of the desert that is this Bahrain International Circuit. That's, and that's how tight turn one into turn two is. Turn one is a, a proper stop. 
Toyota Gazoo Racing 1-2 here ahead of Rebellion. They're up to third ahead of Team LNT. Number six car remains in the race. Number five is retired in LMP2. Jackie Chan DC Racing now just ahead of United and Jota as the pit stops cycle through. G Drive in fourth, battling for supremacy with Senior Tech Alpine. And of course, is Ferraris. Sandwiching the Aston Martin 95 at the top of the GTE Pro class. Two Astons, two Ferraris really in the hunt. The two Porsches have dropped down among the AM class cars. Team Project One leads from the 98 Aston and 86 Gulf Porsche. That is the top three in the GTE AM class. TF Sport in fourth ahead of the best of the Ferraris, fifth and sixth. The pit stop as well for the Racing Team Netherlands car, Nick de Vries. Uh, walks away. Fritz van Eerd owed us one more stint. I'm not sure whether he's getting... Okay. No, that's him in the background. So I think Jeroen Blakemolen uh, is getting in. That's Fritz there uh, standing watching the action. Fritz van Eerd has done three full stints. And that, in which case, if he's done all of his, yes. yeah, it'll be uh, the two younger drivers ready to go. This is great choreography, isn't it? So racing, racing Team Netherlands with a two-tyre, no, four-tyre change. So Rowan Blakemolen will be in for a double stint here. And with two hours 45 to go, that will leave us with two more stints, possibly for the LMP2 cars. Uh, what is this? This is their... I've lost them on the screen. This is their eighth stop, so he's starting stint number nine out of what should be ten so they should ha oh, they can't have one more stop in two hours 43 minutes four four, four, stints. four to go so uh lmp1 are doing 10 stops we reckon okay so lmp2 uh, up to 12. and they are slightly shorter in terms of the number of laps and uh, so they'll have more stops but it looks like it's equal number of laps 22 lap stints four times between now and the end of the race Gabriel Aubrey taking over 37, Jackie Chan DC racing car that came in, uh, I think still in second behind United Autosports. And the number one rebellion is in as well. Little break smoke there, Norman Nato stays in. Left sides only. There are another pair of tyres available, are they going on? Can't quite tell because we are seeing Sticker fresh tyres going on the back of the 37 car, full set for 37. I think it was as well for the rebellion on the right hand side. They'd used tyres earlier. Yeah. Used tyres as well for the Jackie Chan DC racing machine. So fresh left, probably a half a set on the right that did qualify. Now, when you're using those qualifying tyres, the car, the tyres are on the right of the car have rotated in one direction. And the cars that were the tires are on the left have rotated in the other direction. Can you then use them on the right, or once they've gone in that, do they, are they di are they unidirectional? Can you only use them in one direction? Is yeah, my question. Michelin, certainly with Michelin, they don't like you using them in the opposite direction. So you'd have to unmount them and remount them with the wheel the other way around to use no, them. No, you could whip them across, but it's it's, yeah. it's basically the tire construction is designed with the braking and especially the front axle, the yeah. braking force. Uh, to be in one way. United Autosports leading in LMP2 as they have been right from the start of what is turning into quite the race for them. Certainly that was the way that uh, the tyre was a few years ago. Now with the restrictions then I'm sure they've been developing and adapting. However, in principle I would think it's still the same. So what you can do is take your left sides off from qualifying, take them off the wheel, turn the wheel around, put them back on, so they're still rotating in the same direction, but the wheel is now a right-hand wheel rather than a left-hand wheel. Um, and of course, you've got time between qualifying on Friday and the race on Saturday to do that with, with your tyres if you need to. United Autosports lead now by 25 and a half seconds from Jota in second. G-Drive in third, Jackie Chan DC Racing's uh, number 37 car just leaving the pits in fourth place at the moment. But again, although uh, barring drama in the next two hours, 40 minutes, almost a whole American Le Mans series race, for those of you with a long memory, uh, barring, barring drama for United Autosports, we're trying to work out who's going to take the other positions on the LMP2 podium. Unless United suffer some cruel fate, they're unlikely to give it away. 
Well, this car, in terms of the podiums, is going to take the lead in the World Championship if it is uh, finishing in the way that it is at this moment in time, and also by a few points as well because of that extra uh, difference of 11 points between first and second in comparison to the seven that you normally have in a race. So in that respect, it's going to be a good one for Conway and Co to try and get into their pocket. And also, it, same going to be, I think, in the other categories as well, where the World Championship lead will definitely have a big swing. In the pits is the number six Team LNT Janetta. Out get Mike Simpson, in will get Chris Dyson. And a pit stop penalty for car 77 for an infringement. That's the remaining Dempsey Proton car. And again, that is likely to be too many people working on the car, not having an earth lead attached, not having the visor down on the fire extinguisher man or the refueling man. There's the fire extinguisher guy. Refueling guy's got to have his visor down. Can't step across the white line unless it's a safety issue like checking the tires, the tire man, or cleaning the windscreen until the fueling has finished. So this is all carefully rehearsed, and the more pit stop practice you do, the less likely you are to run into trouble. Leader in the pits. So Mike Conway, I think, at the end of a double stint. And by the way, um, nope, not your own Blake Molen in Racing Team Netherlands, because he's driving in the uh, Keating uh, Porsche. It is, of course, as every fool know, Gerd van der Gaard, who's taken over at Racing Team Netherlands, and Conway stays in, exactly as Graham suggested would be the case. Yep, so this will be him going on to a double stint now, 25 laps. Averaging the 147s for Mike. Reconnecting the drinks tube. Fresh bottle. Or if he's got a cup of tea in there, Al, do you think? No, I used to actually have uh, cold tea that then became lukewarm tea. Yeah. Just black tea. Yeah. Uh, on occasion. So Mike Conway stays in for a second stint and uh, fuel and new uh, tyres going on. Comes back out in front. And the number eight car unlaps itself. Brendan Hartley at the wheel of uh, the car in front of Conway that's just rejoined the circuit. That was something they were trying to do for a little while, if we remember back when uh, Seb Buemi was uh, going to overtake into turn one. Conway was going to let him pass, but Buemi struggling badly actually with uh, the tyre and not being able to sort of feel the grip, the edge of the grip. And so they brought their stop forward, went over to Brendan Hartley with a new set of medium compound tyres and uh, Hartley's lap time seemed to be working directly in the window but the car that's really on the performance window at the moment is Norman Natto in the third place rebellion who's just done a 46-0 just to give you a bit of a comparison there uh, the Toyota of Brendan Hartley's last lap was a 1 minute 48.1 the fastest lap overall Jordan King in the LNT of a, a 45-2 which was uh, quite a few hours ago now that 52 for that, that was uh, Jordan King's second lap out the pits, I remember, but the car has, of course, now retired. And Norman Nato on this stint? Norman Nato on this stint is at the end of 23rd, in fact, this is three laps in, uh, he's actually just early into this stint, and it's so early, I can't even read the, the average lap time for him, but he's been yeah. doing 147 to 148, certainly matching or bettering the, uh, the Toyota lap times. Don't forget he was in the pits five minutes ago ahead of the Jota Sport car as well because they were both in at the same time. Uh, shiny new tyres for the 98 Aston Martin and a shiny new driver as well. So who brought the AMR car in? It was Darren Turner. So it looks like Ross Gunn taking over and a full set for a long run. So now we're getting into the meat of trying to win this race for the 98 Aston team. Remember, we've still got some time to burn for, uh, for Paul Dallano at some point, but it'll be track position they're looking for here. I'm not sure whether that was Paul Dallano going in or Ross Gunn. They're I'm afraid, afraid I wouldn't win that round of Who's Helmet. If I had to choose which was Paul and which was Ross, I'm not sure I would know. That, uh, my friend, is Ross Gunn. Right, OK. 
and uh, you know that because you're looking at a timing screen. Correct. <laughs> I didn't see you get in the car. All right, so... Yeah, they, they are physically rather different, it should be yeah. said. <laughs> yeah. So here is the number eight Toyota second in the race, and just under, well, yeah, inches under a lap behind its teammate. Conway is not going to let him get away if he can help it, is he? I think they would like to keep him under tabs if they can. Ah, you keep them in sight. There's no question about it. You want to just keep them in sight and to make sure uh, you've got uh, an element of control over it. But saying that, I say the number seven has been the car with the speed today. Just watching the ebb and flow in LMP2 as we're on board here with the number eight Toyota. And that lead gap still coming down a little, 24 seconds now. Uh, but the lead pair well, it's just herring away from, again, a, I think, tyre-hampered Jok van Utert as the two Toyotas monster their way through traffic. Yep. You saw the 36 senior set Alpine going out very wide at corner 13. So wide, in fact, it almost left the circuit. Now, here comes the number seven car, toes up behind number eight, sends it down the inside. Uh, it was an overtake without yep. any problems there. Conway's put another lap onto his teammate. That's back to status quo. Uh, just to remind everybody that the two cars are very slightly different due to the success performance differences between them. Uh, the number seven's got a little bit more energy to release per lap. It's also got a little bit more fuel per stint and a very slightly larger fuel restrictor as well at the pit stops. So it's only small, small amounts. They're both on the same weight, uh, but it's uh, just a small amount, so small differences. And when you're fighting as close as these two are, it's going to be the small differences that actually take effect. Uh, in, in a field as competitive as this, no, no matter which class you're looking at, there are no big differences between the cars, are there? Well, to be honest, I would take any advantage over my teammates that yeah. I could get at any point whatsoever. And especially if it's a psychological one, winning by a lap is different from winning by a bit. Depends if you got overtaken by the bit in the last lap. <laughs> it's like beating Australia by an innings or by one wicket or one run. It's always nice to beat them, but beating them by an innings will be very different indeed. So, number seven is a lap ahead of the entire field. Second is the number eight Toyota. We ride on board with Brendan Hartley. And in third place, Norman Nato in Rebellion. Let's see what the team said. Okay, we swap positions on one, we swap positions on one, you stay on your right. Yeah, I understand why they didn't do it in the double sit. We can see each other on the same part of the track, the same front. Fair comment from Brendan Harley, don't understand why we didn't do it in the pits. Okay. Well. Toyota 7 and 8, 1 2, Rebellion in third. The remaining Team LNT Janetta, Chris Dyson at the wheel of the number uh, 6 car. He is in fourth position. And then in fifth overall, down from second overall, um, five hours ago, United Autosports and Paul De Resta, the LMP2 leader. Jota Sport in second, G Drive in third, Jackie Chan in fourth in LMP2. In GTE Pro, the 71 Ferrari, there it is, is our leader. The 95 Aston, the Dane train at the beginning of this stint, it was in front holding up the Toyota. The, uh, the Toyota, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Ferrari. Uh, Davide Regon's in front and Regon's last lap, a 58.9 compared to a 58.6 of the Aston. Looks like the Aston is coming back to him a little. Yeah, the Aston's sort of hanging in there and it's sniffing up onto the back of the Ferrari. It's a bit of ebb and flow there, but uh, this is definitely a performance. And I would have said it's not from a speed performance, but it's a very good performance by the guys in uh, this car. Remember, the 95 Aston Martin was the one that blitzed everything in China until it had a pretty catastrophic tyre failure coming down the main straight. It won at the previous race in Fuji with an excellent decision to stay on slicks in the middle of the race, which saved them uh, 30 seconds at a pit stop, and they won by, what, 30 seconds? Yep. And so they've been right in the mix of led 85% of the last two races. And so it's not a surprise that they're sort of hanging on by the fingernails at times, but hanging on. But you're absolutely right, Martin. It is coming back into it, the 95, across this now 17-lap stint for both Davide Recon and Nicky Team. Something like a tenth and a half to the good Nicky Team. He is catching. 
third place in the class, James Collado, the 51 Ferrari, 97 Aston in fourth. The Porsche's out of it, a lap back after five catastrophic minutes that saw one car box with a damper failure on the left rear and the other car come in after a full course yellow that had been caused by the crashing out of the race of the Dempsey Proton 88 Porsche. Uh, it came in, had a pit stop under full course yellow, left, came back in because the wheel nut had come off and the wheel had machined itself to pieces and the tyre had punctured. So a long, slow in lap for that car. So both of the Porsche GT teams that were first and second in the championship were uh, really hit in, in a very brief period. So Aston, uh, Ferrari Aston, Ferrari Aston is your one, two, three, four. And a gap between James Collado and Alex Lynn is considerably bigger than this. It's around 17, 18 seconds. The gap between first and second in the class here. Davide Regan ahead of Nicky Team by Point one and a half. Yeah, something like that. But that gap third to, uh, fourth to third is closing more quickly than the gap uh, between the top two. Nearly a second a lap on average. There's a point from Nicky Team's perspective that if he does get a lot closer than this and he can't have and he doesn't have the total speed to overtake, he is actually better staying about one and a half seconds behind because he's got a little bit more chance of saving those front tires and also keeping the brakes cool as well. Because this is at the point of the race where you've lost a little bit of the efficiency of the front splitter. You tend to start to pick up tire grip onto the track because of the circuit, but at the same time your radiator ducts, your brake cooling ducts are starting to get filled with just all manner of you know stuff that's lying around the track. And so if he hasn't got the speed to get past and drive past, then you know, a sensible thing is actually just to hold back a little bit. And we heard Kevin Astor being told that by his engineers earlier in the race. If you can't get by him, save your tyres. And so save fuel. catch him and save fuel. Catch him, have a go, but don't just beat yourself to, get to death and beat your car to death trying to get by him. Save the car and let's see what we've got a little later on. Now, that's great advice for a lot of the race. Once you get into the final hour, that starts to become, OK, now we need to think about getting by him, no matter what it costs. Well, I think uh, probably the last two hours you want to have track position just in case of silly things like safety cars and bits and pieces. Now, they've got, they're have got they on the same fuel strategy. They can go to the end. The question is the tyre strategy. And that's something that it's we don't know what they're going to do, and that could swing it by 15 seconds one way or the other. So the other thing is if team knows that he's not going to be changing tyres between uh, now, apart from the, the one set that he will do between now and the end of the race, and he knows the Ferraris are, then he can actually sit pretty as well. Yep. However, if, he's, if it's the other way around, then Rigon at the moment is the one that's sitting pretty. But that's the thing we're going to find out uh, when we get to one hour before the end of the race, when uh, they do their final stops. Yeah, somebody else has wrapped that particular present, and we won't get to find out what's inside it until later on. The teams will be watching each other like a hawk, so they'll be trying to plan their own strategy over what they've done, what their rivals have done. And, of course, it makes it easier for Ferrari and Aston because Porsche are no longer in the hunt. Paul de Resta nearing a thousand kilometers in the race so far. That's a normal six hour race. And we are five and a half hours in. It's gone green a long way here. We had three laps of safety car, was it two or three at the beginning? And a couple of laps, maximum of full course yellow, maybe even only one for some people. 205 overtakes, moving up one spot from the grid. Mind you, earlier on in the race, in the first hour, he was second because of what happened in front of him at the first corner. So they have never lost the lead in LMP2, and they have been second on the road outright earlier on. Uh, United All Sports ready to pit by the look of things. That's why that's the Sport Group. That's Tim. Uh, yep. You're talking a couple of stats there. Here's one for you. Um, a WEC milestone to end the decade. The eight hours of Bahrain at some point here has seen the 400,000th racing lap in WEC history completed. 3.2 million kilometers in the uh, well, seven and a half seasons uh, so far in the FIWC's history. That's pretty cool. Crikey, that's nearly as many kilometers as I've flown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, joke. Uh, that is an astronomical amount of mileage, isn't it? These cars have produced and as you say, the end of a decade. 
and since 2012 the FIA World Endurance Championship has been pounding up the miles. 178 laps in the books for Toyota Gazoo Racing's number seven car currently driven by Mike Conway leading overall and in LMP1. 22 United Autosports car currently being driven by Paul DeResta, leading in LMP2. Our GTE Pro leader is Davide Rigon in the 71A, of course, a Ferrari. Lippity Lippity. And the 57 Team Project One Porsche, driven by Rowan Blake and Molan, 18th overall, leads the GTE AM class. The Silverstone hair has come a long way to be part of this That's final race of the decade. He's more local. That's Brendan. I, I, I don't think Brendan, being a Kiwi, is more local than the Silverstone hair. Hartley in hair. Fairness. It's Brentley Hartley hair. I know. I know where you were going with that. I've already made the Hartley <laughs> hair in pump. CF Sports, head of the 54 Ferrari. That uh, comes alongside now. And this is for position. Charlie Eastwood under pressure on his outlap from Francesco Castellacci, and the Italian slides by. Alex Harris. Harrison, who tweets us at WEC Data, is the man who supplied the information that we will see the 400,000th racing lap covered. And he's now going to spend two hours, 23 minutes, and 41 seconds. Answering telling my, us my which GT car Sorry. and on which lap it was. Sorry, but Alex. If, if you throw things like that out there, you've got to people expect people to say, well, when's that then? So, sorry, Alex. <laughs> nice stat work, but a rod for your own back. I bet he will. <laughs> I'm sorry, I bet he will. Well, he's now got two hours, 23 minutes and 18 seconds, 16 seconds, 15 seconds. Giancarlo Fisichella. You know, we can know that because uh, one, it is him, and two, it's got his name on his pajamas. <laughs> very handy for when you wake up after the party on Monday morning. Uh, look in the mirror. Oh, that's who I am. That's who I, am. That's who I, am. <laughs> I haven't fared well in the last 24 hours. Here's the 54 Ferrari. The AF Corsa car has Francesco Castellacci at the helm. And they are currently lying in fifth place. They're the second of the Ferraris in the race. Air, of course, is other car, the 83. Manu Kolar is at the wheel of that car in fourth place, chasing down uh, two Porsches and an Aston that currently occupy the podium spots. There's the TF Sport car that is behind Castellacci. Charlie Eastwood just 2.6 seconds behind at the beginning of the lap, ahead of this Toyota. That's the red Aston. And there is the Gulf Porsche as well. So the Gulf Porsche, uh, that is uh, Andrew Watson. Uh, he is chasing the Aston of Ross Gunn. He's not far behind him either. 11 seconds. Another great run from uh, the Gulf Racing team. Yep, they've been up and down the top three all race long. They've had their shot at leading briefly in the gaps where Ben Keating wasn't hogging the limelight and the 57 car. That's a good stint from Andrew Watson. And leader going by Charlie Eastwood there with no major dramas. Caught him on the back straight, slotted right by. Uh, climb that. over the brow. And then this tightening right hander, 12 into 13, opening up onto the back straight, plunging down the hill into this compression here. Ferrari in front, flashy, flashy headlights, not going to have a lunge. Just not quite close enough. The full hybrid boost engages and disposes of the Ferrari instantly as he runs up across to start lap number 182, Mike Conway. So, so great view from on board. Apologies. Uh, 21 minutes until we get to the traditional six-hour mark, but two more hours to go, of course. Yeah, only a fool goes home. That's Absolutely. Six. Yeah, real men stay on for eight. That's what we're saying today. 29 Ooh. of the 31 starters. He's got a text, and it said A78. Now, I wonder what that meant. Maybe his direction's home. Maybe he's got the sat on. <laughs> uh, but uh, 29 of the 31 cars still running. As uh, you said just a little earlier, the 88 empty Proton racing car. Uh, Khalid al Kabazi having an unfortunate uh, incident under braking. Putting the car into the barrier in turn one, and then the Team LNT car, when running third overall after running back uh, up through the field, after what can only be described as a rather chaotic start to the race for number five, um, the team reporting loss of power 
what we were hearing though, Martin, sounded altogether more mechanical. Well, it's a little bit like that Nigel Mansell final lap in Montreal, where he was going so slow that the engine wasn't generating enough electric power to paddle shift, and it selected a neutral. It, uh, it, it's, well, we'll wait no, to no, see. It, it, it may but be that it's mis-selected a gear, and, I, uh, I, and I, I mean, it, it certainly sounded like somebody had dropped a spanner into the it, box. It did, but yeah. uh, uh, sadly the number five car, I think it's the first retirement for the Ginetta this year. In fact, I'm certain it is. You might well be right. And uh, again, again, you know, this is the fourth race for the team, and that car is really a new machine in development. Oh, yeah. Uh, with that AER engine, which uh, Lawrence Tomlinson said has the advantage that it keeps running and doesn't drink more oil than, than fuel. So um, that, they, they feel that's a big step forward for the car, <laughs> easier to package. Yes. Uh, everything about it is a whole lot better. And actually, that's why the car predominantly is over-radiated. He was talking about having to blank off almost all the cooling in the Ginetta. It's because the car was initially designed for a very different engine that had an awful lot more in terms of heating requirements. And as we said earlier, it's easier to fit a smaller cooling radiator into a hole built for a big one than it is to fit a bigger radiator into a smaller hole. So they have the option and it will require some CFD style wind tunnel work to work out how best to fit a smaller radiator but clearly unless they get somewhere that is searingly hot the car has more cooling that it actually needs and more anything than you need apart from power is never a good thing in a race car. Well, I should say the, the one place I think we're due to visit for the remainder of the, the uh, season may be Sebring, may be Le Mans to extreme temperatures but uh, we'll wait and see. Number 29, meantime, sixth place at the moment in LMP2. Let's go down and speak to Louise in pit lane, who's got Fritz van Erd with her right now. It's not necessarily the performance we've expected to see from Racing Team Netherlands. So uh, what is it about Bahrain that's not maybe clicking so well with you guys? Oh, I really, I really don't know, to be honest. Uh, we are really pushing. And... Uh, I think everybody's really, really quick here. It's uh, me as a bronze driver, I have to push very hard. And uh, the first thing was good, the second one was not good, and the third one was, was very good. So, But <laughs> now we are not leading at all. But uh, it's really competitive in LMP2 in these races, uh, even more than we expected uh, when, in the first, when the season started. It looked much better than it does now for us, but... Uh, just another two hours to go, and uh, we will see. How are those tyres going to hold up? Excuse me? How are those tyres going to hold up? Yeah, we will, we will, yeah, we try. We have, I have Nick, I have Guido, two fantastic good drivers, and uh, and the team is doing well, so we need some luck today, and uh, we will see. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, they were jubilant with their first pole position in the series. They were over the moon with their first win in the series. But as uh, was famously said, motor racing is a long series of disappointments, occasionally brightened by a period of ecstasy. So with every win, you've got to take the fact that you're not always going to be on top. That's why it's called motor racing and not motor winning. Here is the car that is leading, but Graham Goodwin, these guys have had up to two minutes over the rest of the field. Right now, Paul Derestri in the United Auto Sports car, fewer than 20 seconds ahead of Jotas and Davidson. Have they gone too hard too soon on their tyres? Are the Goodyears working better in these conditions, maybe, than the Mutual has? I mean, all of these... A question that's going to take us two and a half hours to answer, I think. Well, clearly the, the good years on the number 38 car are working very well at the moment. 18.7 seconds, and Davidson on this stint is closing and closing pretty quickly. But beyond that, the lap times that are coming behind the, uh, the, uh, the uh, United car uh, are showing that Michelin cars are running very quickly. For give you, for instance, the moment 151 for the United car, 148.7 for Roman Rusinov last time around. That is on new rubber. So he's out on new Michelins right now, but that is the drop-off, if you like, between peak performance of those Michelins at the start of uh, a stint and on the Michelins by the look of things. I think this, this may be 
on the second stint for them. I, yeah, the Diresta, yeah, I think so. And he's not getting the so. drop off at all that the uh, G Drive team have been experiencing with theirs. Uh, certainly, it looks to me as if Jovanita has had well, pretty, pretty rough ride in terms of getting the worst of the tyres. Yeah. Uh, 153s across a full stint for him on old tyres at the moment. Paul De Resta, 151. Yeah. But not uh, obviously only not two thirds way through a stint. Drop off could be pretty extreme. Three wide here coming into turn one, including. Roman Rusinov in the G-Drive car. He's storming he... along right now. And you know, I, I can't remember the last time I saw an underwhelming performance by Roman Rusinov. As well as being decently quick behind the wheel, he is very, very consistent. So uh, Roman, you know, when Roman's on form, it's a joy to behold. Yeah. Uh, but he is another one of these guys that does tend to kind of tend to wear his emotions. How can we put this rather publicly? And that sometimes shows itself out on track, and it gets in the way of that consistency that will make the difference between a race-winning performance and potentially uh, being left to explain to Louise Beckett just why it's not gone their way today. Looking back at our GTE e Pro lead battle, remember about 10 minutes ago, Alan was saying, if you're Nicky team and you can't get by Davide Regon, sit about a second and a half behind him in clear laminar airflow, so your wings work, so your radiators work, so your brake cooling works. That's exactly what he's doing. He's now sat right where he needs to be in the clear air, and Davide Regon can't get away. Whether Miguel Molinar can do anything about it when he takes over this car, We'll have to wait and see, but Nicky Team will hand over to Marco Sorensen. And as it always seems to be the case with both these teams, just turn and turn about, turn yep. and turn about. James Collado and Alessandro Pierre Guidi tried a very different way of doing it in the four hours of Shanghai. Collado basically sat in a deck chair for two hours while, while Alessandro's doing the donkey work. And then halfway through the race, they swapped over and Alessandro rested while James did the other half. But normally, the Ferrari and particularly the Aston Martin team like to keep the driver as fresh as they can and uh, change with the tyres. I should say, with the number 51 car, Alex Lynn is still eking 10th after 10th after 10th out of that advantage, now down to 7.6 seconds uh, as they cross the line this time around. Meanwhile, I should say as well, the two Porsches, both delayed of course earlier in the race, have made no impact whatsoever uh, in drawing back the time required and still sit, by the way, behind the AM-class leading yeah. 57. And, and the problem for those two Porsches is the four guys in front of them are going just as quickly as they were. And if they, those two Porsches hadn't had their issues, they'd be right in the middle of these battles. But they did, and they ain't. And that, unfortunately, is a bad day at the office when points and a half are on offer. They will still get points if they finish where they are, four, fifth, and sixth. No matter how far behind they go, you know, a lap or two laps won't make any difference. But the difference between 10 for fifth and 25 for the win goes up to 15 for fifth, but 38 for the win. Correct. And that is a huge extra loss. There is another loss to explain here at the moment as things stand, because the GT Drivers World Championship is for all GT drivers. Yes. So right now, all of the Porsche factory drivers having points taken off them by a customer team. Yep. Because they sit <laughs> ahead of them. They That's will therefore true. finish with points for uh, sixth and seventh in the drivers' championship because the 57 car sits ahead of them. I've got to say, actually, with two hours to go, no, they ain't going to. Uh, closest to the factory Porsches is 16 seconds. Richard Leitz behind your own Blake Molen. Two hours, he's going to do that. Kevin Estra is a minute behind. In two hours, he's going to do that. Probably not least because unless the AMR 98 and the Gulf Racing Porsche 86 get a lot closer. Team Project One will have enough in hand on the last lap or two to be able to allow the factory cars to go by. And it will make no difference at all to the trio in the Team Project One car, as it stands now. Absolutely, there's not a vast difference in terms of where they are on, on pit stop strategy at the moment between those three. Yeah. And in terms of the current lap speeds for those three cars, quickest of the three is actually the 92 car that sits third in that row. Uh, and across the, the stint, it's about a 159.5. 159.7, Ricard Leitz sits ahead, 
Um, Jerome Bleak a moment. So struggling slightly towards the end of this uh, stint with an average of 2 minutes, 0.338. Larry Tenvorda, by the way, uh, has been much, much quicker than that. So I agree with you. I think at the moment it looks like that they will vault by the customer car, but as things stand today, right now, this moment, they're, taking, they're, they're losing points to a customer team. I wish that David Heinemeyer, Heinemeyer Hansen was doing live his driver comparisons and then we could see actually who is the fastest of the drivers well, I can tell you that in the uh, GTE AM class is it 10 Forder uh, give me a moment and I'll tell you exactly All right, I'll give you a moment car. meanwhile number eight Toyota is in for fuel a lap behind the leaders now it's not about trying to catch overhaul unlap and win the race it's about managing second place and making sure you don't fall out of it down to third or below. So two hours and nine minutes to go. It is now about managing your position. If you can't win, be second. If you can't be second, be third. Don't chuck it off the road, make silly mistakes, fumble pit stops or any of the above. Some days are your days, some days aren't. For the number eight Toyota, this isn't but eighth is a lot better than they were looking at on lap one. Their second rather is a lot better than they were looking at on lap one when it all went off in front of them. So number seven, Toyota still with a lap lead, which is getting on for two minutes in front of the number eight car. Uh, as for the fastest driver uh, across, well, either fastest lap or indeed uh, the best 10 laps in uh, GTM so far in this race, uh, not Larry Tenford, it's Ross Gunn, and by oh, distance... Oh, good stuff, really? Uh, Ross Fantastic. Gunn, uh, fastest lap of 157,242, which, by the way, is faster than the fastest laps of Nicky Team, Alessandro Piergridi, James Collado, Michael Christensen, Maxime Martin and Richard Leeds. So Ross Gunn has put in uh, a lap that is quicker than two of the four factory Aston drivers Correct. in identical machinery. Well, he is a factory Aston driver. He just happens to be plying his trade in the GTE AM class in the 98 car. He's in second in the category. So too is the 95 car we're looking at here, Nicky Team. And he is closing in again on the Ferrari of Davide Rigon. Rigon with just a half second advantage now, and team with the flashes going, just making sure that Regon knows he's there. Looks like he's sat back, nursed his tyres, and feels he's got a little bit of an advantage now on the Ferrari. He might be about to try and undo some of the damage that was done early on. How much longer on this stint for these two guys? They're three laps apart, we saw from the graphic. Nicky's now 27, 28 laps in. Uh, we're 24 laps, uh, sorry, excuse me, it's 28 laps for both of them. Okay. So they're due in the next three laps. Right. Okay. That will give both of them, uh, in fact, no, it will mean Nicky team, sorry, the, the, uh, the 95 car will require on current schedule two full stints, but there's a potential that he might need a splash. Uh, the Ferrari almost certainly will. Into the pit lane comes the number 42 Cool Racing LMP2 car. Alexandre Coigny gets out. Uh, little dicky bird in my ear, called Louise, says, is the United car getting slower or is the Jota Sport car getting faster? And the answer is right now. yes, both. Last lap for Paul De Resta, 151.6. Last lap for Ann Davidson, 150.1. Now, that's one lap in isolation, but on that one lap in isolation, he gained one and a half seconds. Uh, so if I look at the map, you watch the screen just in case anything happens here. 22 coming down at the pit, uh, down the main straight. Not much traffic behind him and not much in front of 38. So United Autosports getting ready for a pit stop. Leader is already into turn one, and Chris Dyson in fourth place in the Team LNT Janetta. On the current stint, uh, there's no doubt that on average, the United car is not outperforming the chasing Jota Sport car. On occasion, yeah. it does with traffic, uh, but generally speaking, Ant Davidson is catching them. Now, the, held, the lead's now being held a little better, but uh, well under 20 seconds. We've been tracking this for some time. 
and it is now going to be about exactly what Louise has just told us, Maria, is what tyres have you got left for the remaining two hours and five minutes? Driving change going on here at Setila. Giorgio Sanagiotto gets out. I'm not sure whether it's Andrea Belicki getting in or not, but he's got his helmet on, his hands device, his fireproof balaclava, socks and underwear, fireproof boots, fireproof wave suit, fireproof gloves. And to undo it all, he's got his fireproof race suit pushed back up to his elbows like he's a rally driver in the 80s on the Safari Rally. You know, and if, if you've got a fire, you don't want your forearms burning off any more than the rest of you. Roll your sleeves back down. It's not big or clever. And also, by the way, if you get spotted by the officials, it's a return to the pits to because yeah, you're definitely not dressed legally anyway uh, it, it was Andrea Pelicki I sort of suspected it might be he often has a sleeves rolled up mentality in his driving style this time it's literal gap between the top two in GTE Pro is still now half a second and of course are just ahead of Aston Martin now, Andre Baliki, through his many years with Rebellion Racing and before that, the Seba uh, outfits known as the Don. Had that look around him. There is the uh, United Auto Sports car, the team working to just clear cooling ducts. Well, Louise was saying there were tyres ready on the apron for the car, but I think the word she used was scabby. So well, that's, that's having, having looked a little past their best, and as Paul de Resta stopped, the lead changed. Jota Sports and Davidson stays out and leads in LMP2 with two hours to go for, I think, the first time in the entire race so Check far. That now. I don't remember United losing the lead in any pit stop before now. I may be wrong. It would not be the first time. Third place, Jackie Chan, DC Racing's 37 car. You're looking at now the yellow nose and the red roof picks them out. No tires on, so those scruffy children that were being laid out for them, they didn't use leaders are coming towards you, Louise. The GTE lead battle hits the pit lane, nose to tail. And depending on whose pit speed limiter is more accurate, the Aston Martin may end up actually pushing the Ferrari as he peels off into the box now. You saw the difference there. It's the, the, the hand span of a relatively small and diminutive mechanic. Let's see who comes out in front and what tyres have they got? Hold these shots, we need to know. So driver change in both cars. I was watching the Ferrari. Did the Astons change driver? I don't want to see this. I want to... Big wing wiggle there from the, the Ferrari. Ferrari upbraked itself. Yeah. And the Aston going through. Well, they, they came in with the Ferrari in front. But again, we've lost any opportunity to see what was going on with the tyres. That's the other front. It was the other Aston. Yeah. That was, it was the other Aston in the Ferrari. It was Lynn going by Collado. OK, don't know what happened with the Aston. Um, used tyres going on the left-hand side of the Ferrari. They changed the rights as well. But they will, if anything, also be used. So the Aston, I think that was a two-tyre call on Aston Martin. Well, that's a switch around as well. Yep. So a bit of track position. And while that was happening, as you saw, yes, uh, Alex Lynn going by James Collado as Collado skated off down at uh, turn 10, it was, wasn't it? It was. Uh, Jota Sport in the pits from the lead in LMP2. That was indeed the first lap that they led. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, OK, uh, United just coming past the pits now, but it's going to be very close because out comes the Jota Sport car. There'll be maybe 10 seconds in it. United down at turn one, maybe a dozen, maybe more, but I think that gap will have come down. What did Jota do in terms of tyres? What did United do in terms of tyres? So, Louise says they both stayed on the tyres they were on, and that means that Paul de Resta potentially will continue to lose time to the car, excuse me, the car that gives chase that's now dropped to third, because in between the two of them now is Gabriel Aubrey in the Jackie Chan DC Racing 37 car. But so... He, he does need to pit. He does owe us a stop. Now, is it the case, and we'll only know after the race, there were, there were two ways of going about this. 
use your tyres early, get a big advantage, hang on to the end, or spread the load a bit more evenly and have a bit more to fight with at the end of the race. United Auto Sports have had a big lead for a long time. Have they done that by using their tyre allocation earlier and more consistently than the Goodyear runners in Jota Sport and Jackie Chan? Only the end of the race will tell us. We've got two hours to go before we really find out the answer to that question. Four fresh tyres going on the number one rebellion. So Norman Nato, I think, staying in. Driver change here at Ferrari. It's been a big change around the last five minutes in favour of Aston yeah. Martin because both those uh, Ferrari Aston Martin battles are now the other way around. Uh, so the 90, uh, the 95 car currently ahead of the 71. Yep. And although he came across the line in third, ping, 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 yep. as soon as he gets to the next sector, he'll be up to first. Remember, the 97 car is on a slightly different strategy. That now leads, so yep. it's now an Aston Martin 1 2 again. Alex Lynn just ahead. Of, sorry, 28 seconds ahead of Nicky team yep. with Miguel Molina are now forced to chase again. James Collado's body language there was pretty disgruntled, was it? And we saw how much he was struggling on tyres in the last couple of laps. They're not absolutely brand new tyres going on his car as Miguel Molina takes it over, uh, as uh, Alessandro Pierguidi takes it over rather, but they didn't look too shabby. The question is what their grip levels are like Six hours in, two hours to go in Bahrain. And Alec Manish has brought around the reviving cup of teas. Thank you very much. I know that uh, in my retirement, I was very good for something, and a cup of tea seems to be one of the things here. I have to say, looking at it, I think Karen Chunduk still has the edge on being able to yeah. make cup of tea but among the old racing drives. Ah, now then. That's because he's got his all-access pass, you see, and uh, that being Martin Pass, who's popped by with the cup of tea. <laughs> United Autosports, and I think uh, as the number 37 car pulls away, I'd say they are struggling with tyre management here without a shadow of a doubt. It's still 16 seconds is the gap, so changes galore in, a, in GTE Pro with Aston Martin to the fore now. Mr. Theresa Pass tells us that there are still tyres left in the United Autosports armoury, so they have been trying to spread them out rather than bury themselves early on in the race. And uh, Conflab at Rebellion, there's no, there's no chance after that delay they're going to catch the Toyotas no. on pace, is there? There's well, not, but they're on the podium, so it's still they, a big point. They're just going to have to push and push and push and yeah. hope. Well, there's they, nothing else they can really do at this no, point. And there, there is nothing else they ever really do, is there? They are, at the moment, uh, by the look of things, they are 35 seconds and a pit stop clear of the, uh, the remaining Ginetta. Chris Dyson currently the wheel. And so yeah. 35 seconds, and the LNT car will pit next time around on schedule. Bruno Senna now bought the number one car, by the way, and putting in, of course, quick times with brand new tyres on the car. But uh, the pendulum in GT Pro firmly swinging to Aston Martin with, well, not only the mistake on track from James Collado, who'd been caught on track by Alex Lim, but also then the switch around the pits between what uh, had until that point been the leading pair. And we'll have to wait and see how that plays out with this 95 Aston Martin. They took two tyres, the Ferrari took four, and Miguel Molina is flashing Nicky Team to get by. However, experience tells us, as it must tell Ferrari, Nicky Team does not let you go by. He can spend two hours cheerfully holding you up and not even feel remotely guilty about and it. And having fun doing it. Yes. Richard Leitz in the pit lane. You've seen single-seater drivers with a tear-off visor. Well, we have tear-off windscreen covers as well in GT racing, so that when they get pockmarked by stones, covered in black filth by bits of rubber thrown up and oil and everything else, you can peel it off and bingo underneath a crystal clear visor. And Alan, at night, particularly with all the lights reflecting around, that's worth its weight in lap time, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is when you start to get into precision corners and precision braking, like coming down to the end of the straight here. A bit of a kerfuffle there, couldn't get the wheel out and couldn't get the wheel on there, so we'll probably have a second lost on that uh, left front there in the Porsche stop. First official use of the word kerfuffle by Mr. McNish in the entire race, a full four-tyre change for the 91 Porsche. 
That, uh, that car now a lap down on the battle ahead. Ross Gunn, by the way, moves into the lead in the GTE AMB class 98 car. Also moves ahead of the factory Porsche. Yeah. And uh, so does the Team Project One car of your own, Blake Amolan. Uh, that is now in 19th place overall. The lead factory Porsche in 20th place overall. And uh, what is he, 4th, 5th, 7th, 8th among the GT drivers. So Ross Gunn, by the way, about two thirds away through a stint. Uh, so has taken the advantage from Jerome Blake and Mullen just emerging from his latest pit stop. Golf racing effort still going well. Andrew Watson, by the way, second fastest lap of the race in GTM. Well, let's get down to pit lane with Louise Beckett, United Autosports leading in LMP2, and the co-owner, Zach Brown, is in the pits. Well, the number 22 has been put in a great performance all race, but Zach Brown, that gap is closing, so how can you gain it back? Well, it's very tight. Uh, we were pretty pretty comfortable the first half of the race. We have uh, we don't have the balance that we would like here at night, so... Uh, we're uh, kind of trading laps here with Joda right behind us. I think it's going to be pretty close here to the finish. Tyres, an issue for everyone. Have you got anything in your back pocket? Uh, we'll find out. I'm not sure we do, but uh, I think everyone's given it all they've got and just need to navigate through traffic. Still, still a long way to go, but I think if it stays as it is, it'll be a bit of a nail biter. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, we used to close finishes in our classes all the way through the World Endurance Field. And he, I think he's right. It, it could come down to the last few minutes to decide victory. We've seen that very regularly, Graham Goodwin, in Michelin Le Mans Cup racing with prototypes, oh, yeah. in European Le Mans Series racing, as well as World Endurance. The cars are so even, it's hard to maintain a balance. With the temperature range and the long distance of this race makes that really tough. Absolutely, and LMP2 continues to dole out the entertainment. Remember, you know, there's a lot of similarities between these cars, but it comes down to pure driving and strategic talent. And that's what's so intriguing about the way this is going right now. It's no doubt at all, for the first time in the race, United Autosports are on the back foot. Yeah, at this moment in time, uh, you know, you talked about the temperature range. The temperature's actually only dropped track by six degrees from the beginning. Uh, and so it's down at uh, 24 degrees now, and it was at 30 at the beginning of this race. And so I don't think the temperature is going to be the bigger fact. I think that for the tyre, it's more the grip that's gone down onto the circuit, which has picked up a little bit of front grip and maybe pitched the car into a little bit less of a balance. But uh, that gap is not quite the straight. It's a little bit more than the start and finish straight between uh, the first and the second cars in LMP2. But it'll soon be visual where you could see it. Toyota, Mike Conway, as we are just going down the start and finish straight with Alex Lynn on the right-hand side, has just popped into the pit lane for another stop. That is on schedule. Yep, arrives at the camera as expected. And he hops out. Kobayashi hops in. So Conway, I think, will be pretty happy with his stints, the way things are going at the moment. He, with Kobayashi, Jose Maria Lopez, keeping the advantage that they were handed in the first 10 seconds of the race. And they have doubled up and doubled up on it. The sister number eight car tried to get the lap back, couldn't find a performance, ended up having to pit early because it was all going away. And then they have again put a lap on their teammates. Two full stints and about 10 laps required for that car. Roman Rusloff being warned for the very final time about abuse of track limits. And in the car, the driver will be told which corner, or indeed corners, specifically he is erring at. Now, there are only three that are particularly being watched, and the drivers all know what they are. So it does narrow the field a little. Paul Howarth at Aston Martin Racing with his man Alex Lynn leading by 26 seconds from this battle. The Aston Martin ahead of the red Ferrari. This is Nicky Team holding off Miguel Molina. And Molina, 
Alan, while you were busy brewing up, the Aston took right sides only, the Ferrari four tyres, Molina was in front as they came into the pits, was behind as they came out, so Aston Martin got strategic territory in front by inches, and we've seen what Nicky Team can do, he can drive a nice wide Aston. Yeah, also Nicky Team managed to slip past on the in-lap where... Uh... You know, Davide Rigon slid, slid, sorry, Miguel, it, no, it was Davide Rigon, that was actually, Calado. wasn't it? it was, that uh, slid a little bit wide. Yeah. And uh, so in that respect, he's in a position now where he can try to control. They've got performance at different points on the circuit. And uh, thankfully, I would say from the Aston point of view, Nicky team, it's on the areas uh, where the others could overtake and where they can't overtake, the Ferrari definitely is a little bit quicker but it's going to be really, really close between them. And the important thing for Nicky Team is he just keeps that Ferrari behind as long as he physically can, because I would suggest that there's no more tyre stops for either of those two between now and the end of the race. Remember, though, Alex Lynn does have to stop, and very soon, next couple of laps, uh, will put him on a, uh, a schedule with one full stint and about 22, 23 laps. Yeah, so they might then split it into two equal stints as opposed to doing a full stint and then... Uh, a sort of halfer they might put into two, three quarters to be able to achieve the same goal, but with a slightly more performance window for it. But the, both the Aston Martins have been gifted a little bit uh, the championship points at this moment in time because of the incidents for the Ferrari, sorry, for the Ferrari, for uh, the Porsches. But uh, the Ferrari now of Molina is always, that is one area they're very quick and he looks to get down the inside on the brakes into that one. And uh, the rest of the circuit, yeah, it's a little bit nip and tuck. He's very, very strong in the brakes. That's where the Aston is struggling a little bit. As long as Nicky can park it on the apex, the Ferrari struggles to get by. At the end of the straight, the Aston will be alongside, but the Ferrari with the inside line, we saw this before against the Porsche, and the Ferrari on the inside nips through. So a change for the lead uh, for second place in the race. Aston uses the power up the hill, tries to get the car hooked up. Can't quite get back there though. So that was good planning by Miguel Molina. That's a move he's not shown before. He sold number corner eight hard to distract Nicky Team a fraction from the fact that he was going to try and get him down the little back straight. I don't know if he really knew he was going to try and get him. He just sold him something mm. to try to see what could happen out of it, to try and see what opportunities presented, if anything, did present. Uh, it was a matter of time. Nicky Team, as we said, was just trying to keep him behind. It is just the Ferraris had very good traction all day, especially out of that corner. It's positioned, it's rotated the car very well on the front when the steering, and uh, then he's been able to get the power down very, very well every single stint through there. And then it's controlling the exit out of 11 as you start to climb the hill. Very easy to wash out wide, but he holds the lead now. Uh, holds second place, rather. Alex Lynn still leads. Let's get down to Toyota with Louise Beckett. And she's caught up with lead driver Mike Conway. Mike Conway's finally out of the car. A great run from you. Yeah, um, at the beginning of the race, obviously, we, uh, the road opened up with the two guys spinning in front of me. And um, yeah, so we just got in the front and I just pushed as hard as we could. And I was amazed, really, that we could pull a big gap um, because, you know, I thought the rebellion would, would be fast on us most of the day. but. Luckily, we had a good gap, we could keep pulling. And then uh, the rest of the day, we've just been strong. We've just been able to pull the gap when we need to. And um, yeah, guys done a great job with the car. I mean, we copied our we copied our sister's setup, the sister car setup today, because we were not really happy of practice and qualifying. So yeah, I guess thanks to them giving us a good car. So, <clears throat> but team doing a great job and uh, Jose and Camus as well. So. Still a long way to go, out 46 minutes, so just got to keep pushing. There is a still a long way to go, but um, the points that you could get from this would be handy, wouldn't they? Yeah, a few more points being the longer race, so that's good. Um, yeah, we know we'll pay a little bit the next one, but um, this pays a bit more points, so hopefully we can uh, you know, take advantage of this, and, um, and then I'm sure Kota will be again a similar story in terms of better pace than the private cars but you know as long as we get in the racing closer that's all we want all right thank you thank you take the points always take the points doesn't matter what comes after points on the board is what's going to win you the championship 97 is in from the lead of the gte pro class and from the far end of the pit lane i'm going to send louise 
uh, quite a long way back down in the other direction to pit box number six from pit box number 32 because TF Sports Car is in the pits and has been for longer than it should have. It's so in the garage, I gather. Um, right. And that, remember, is the championship leading car at present. Significant moment for the championship and for TF Sports. It's really thrown it around this race, hasn't it, for yeah. the championship battles and fights? It really has. Well, Ross Gunn leads in the 98 Aston. Your own Blake Molan second in Team Project 1, the 57 Porsche. Gulf Racing still in third. That's the 123 in AM. But in the Pro Class, 97 car, they've just stopped dropping down to third. So A, of course, are now lead ahead of 95. Just looking at that pit stop of Alex Lynn in the Aston Martin, then there's a heck of a lot of brake dust coming out of it. We know this is the hardest place of the season. On oh! brakes, is a, ooh, a bit of a spin there. Yeah, that was that's a Andrew Watson in the Gulf Porsche ran out very wide, came back on at unabated speed and clattered Kai Cozzolino's MR Racing Ferrari. He was in third place there yeah. as they ran wide and sort of dropped back, but there was a few people, I think, breathed. And a sigh of relief that there was no collisions Trouble. once they got back in. Trouble. This is Chris Dyson being wheeled back in from fourth place. That's just five laps on that stint for Chris Dyson. So trouble for the remaining Janetta. Right. WC officials there watching in the blue fireproof suit. They watch all the cars in all the pit stops to make sure that everything is legal and above board. And the Aston Martin sitting behind the Ferrari, giving chase. Right behind them, Senior Tech Alpine coming across the line. With who was that behind? I guess that was probably the uh, pool racing car. That's not a battle for position. If you look at it here, the Ferrari got past and looked like it got past reasonably easily. He was able to overtake in a, without too many dramas, but he's not pulled away. No. And we saw that before, and when the Aston was sitting, you said, you know, you need to sit about a second and a half behind the Ferrari, who was able to close up quickly. Uh, is this another gear selection issue? Kind of looks like it. Depends yeah. which side the actuators are on, but, uh, yeah, I think it's... Julian Simpson uh, taking a look at the back of the car. Yeah, and there's the, the other car, the yeah. Stricken, the other sister car stricken at the side of the road which they said was an electronic issue. Uh, it's battery. a lost power, lost yeah. power. Battery. Sorry. But uh, I, don't, I don't think they could hear what we could hear, which was a distinctly mechanical sound, wasn't yeah. it? No, they get the same pictures in the pit lane, but of course they've got their headsets on with team radio, rather than listening to us witter on, I can't imagine why. Uh, so they may not have heard everything that we heard. They will probably have heard from Jordan King, it just went clang and there was no drive. They're cleaning up in the area well if they've just they've just dropped out of fourth place to the united autosports car which is now just 15 seconds ahead of the jota car yeah it's like they're trying to sort of blow all the rubbish and things out of there as well as spraying something into it Bruno Senna, third place in the number one rebellion. Carlos started on pole position, and after a win last time out, they must have been very hopeful of at least maybe for half the race holding off the Toyotas. They had a slight performance advantage in terms of outright pace, where the Toyotas' ability to spread the wear on the tyres in the acceleration areas out of the slower corners would in the end have told. Well, we'll never know. Uh, meanwhile, after the uh, last stop for Alex Lynn, drops him back from the lead to fourth as in comes... Is this the 98 car? It should be. Ross Gunn pit pitting the car for the lead it is. in uh, at GTM. And the other Am Aston TF Sports we're hearing have a fuel rail issue, which means it's not getting the gas it needs. That may not be a quick fix. Gearbox, but... I've been told. Oh, are you? OK. Yes. Well, I'm uh, guessing that uh, the message you're getting is via the Johnny Adam network. Uh, yes, I'm guessing so too. Hopefully not both issues. Uh, but uh, either way, TF Sport in some trouble right now. Uh, so to, to finish the point about Alex Lynn, dropped back down to fourth position, but is now again catching, uh, and this time Alessandro Pierre Guidi for third. So it's, it is currently Ferrari, Aston Martin, Ferrari, Aston Martin again. Well, you're looking there into the Team Project One garage. They have gone back in front of GTE AM. That's the car on the left, the 57 
car started by Ben Keating. And then with Larry Tenford and Jerome Blakemola, they'll do the rest of the driving on his way again, the 98 Aston. And how big will the gap be as the Aston comes out of the pit lane? I'm looking on our tracker to see where the 57 car is. And uh, it's hidden by something else. Well, there's Larry Tenford looking pretty relaxed. I wonder if he's going to get back in again. I think he might probably need to do before the end. There's one full stint uh, after this one to do. Well, the uh, eight laps into a stint, so about 52 laps to go uh, on the current pace if it stays green. OK. Just over 200 lap mark from our race leader, Kamui Kobayashi, in the number seven Toyota. 203 laps in the book. And Jerome Blakemolen leading in the GTE AM class. Leader in the GTE Pro class, Miguel Molina, in the number 71A, of course, a Ferrari. And as you can see, the gap first to second. The Aston Martin behind him is in second place, is a little over a second. And as you said, Alan, a couple of laps ago, the Ferrari got by. It's not really getting away, not by any hugely measurable margin. It's Job van Oet, sorry, Job van Oet, it gets out. Fritz van Ert gets out, wanders off. No, that's... Uh, it's not Fritz van Ert, apologies. No, no, that, is that, that's John Ervain getting in. Roman Rusinov. Roman Rusinov getting out, yes. It's correct team, one car. <laughs> Indeed. Same, same bit of the pit lane. Um, so, yeah, the uh, TF Sport Aston Martin, Charlie Eastwood still in the garage, and that car has now gone nine laps down on the leaders in the class. His tyres going on the 26. Yeah. Well, the way they go, John Eric Van heading back out on track. And in LMP2, United Autosports leading by 17.8 seconds from Jota. In third place, Jackie Chan DC Racing, a further, uh, what's that, 50 odd seconds, 45 seconds behind. And then Pierre Rag in fourth for Senior Tech Alpine. Jaron Egevan rejoins in fifth in a G Drive car, head of Gerda van der Garde Racing Team Netherlands. There is the Racing Team Netherlands car. And Louise has made it down to TF Sport to find out what's going on there. She's caught up with Charlie Eastwood. He's out of the car as the team do the work. The problem, what's happened? Yeah, just at the start of my stint, I started to struggle slightly with uh, a few up changes. And then throughout the stint, it just got progressively worse, and, and we've just got a problem with the fuel rail in the car, so it's starving the engine of fuel essentially. So uh, yeah, not great, and you know we've had a lot of luck and, and a great run until now. So it's always gonna uh, something's always gonna go wrong at some point. But yeah, it's pretty difficult to swallow when there's so many points on offer. But on the bright side, you know, we with 45 kilos this weekend, it was it was always going to be tough to get on the podium, get a result. So, um, you know, it wasn't like we were right in the lead when it happened. So, um, yeah, a bit of a difficult one, but but we'll look forward uh, to the next round. This is going to put a big dent in your championship points for sure. Yeah, it's going to be massive. Um, the good thing is there's a few teams like golf that are trying to take a few points off others in the championship. So. You know, we've still got the whole of next year to think about and, and obviously there's so many points in offer going to Le Mans, it'll really stem down to that. But yeah, we could have had a nice relaxing Christmas all being well, uh, but it obviously hasn't happened. But um, yeah, that's motorsport. OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, a tough one. They're going to be 16 points off the lead of the championship, considering they came out the block so, so well in the first round at Silverstone, then dominated the race in China yep. and had a good run as well in uh, Japan that it is a tough one as he says and uh, the, if it is as it stays now the new leaders will be the winners of this race being Team Project 1 Absolutely, and they'll leapfrog to the top of the timetable yep, from third and up to the top of the, uh, the points table and uh, coming into this race they were 24 points down remember that 
uh, from the conversation we had a little earlier about the points difference in LMP2. It can change that quickly. In pits 33, high class racing. Car coming in from seventh place in LMP2 and has fueled back, brought the car in. I think he has stayed in. Uh, that's a quick one, the 22 car. We'll that wait and see as he's 33 as he comes sorry. out. Uh, still show, oh no, Mark patterson has gone back in. Okay. So this will be the stint he needs to complete his drive time, I think, because he did two singles. <laughs> He did two singles, yeah. where one of which was uh, was split with a stop on the full course yellow. So okay. yes, he will need to do 40 minutes now. All right, so that will take him to his minimum drive time. And into the 54 Ferrari, or well, out of 54 Ferrari gets Francesco Castellacci. And again, on uh, whose helmet is that? I think that... I couldn't see, sorry. No. Uh, everybody's shouting at their telly, telly who was watching that and not looking at the AM class points at the time. Um, I'm not sure if that's Giancarlo Fisichella or Thomas Floor. I think it's Giancarlo Fisichella, actually. I think Thomas Floor is, um, how can I put this politely, uh, a little bit more of an obvious sized driver in the cockpit. Now, in the AM class, Team Project One still leading. I doubt it's Thomas Floor because he's finished his drive. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so I thought, that was, yes, my guess was Giancarlo, and I think it probably was. Uh, Team Project One leading, Aston Martin, AMR Racing, 98 in second. Darren Turner out the wheel of that car. Golf Racing's Ben Barker, 86 in third place. We haven't received on our screens any notification of an investigation into that moment where the golf car went out very wide, came back on and clattered into somebody, yep. which to me seems a little odd that they're not looking at that. And if they are looking at it, they normally notify everybody, but they haven't, so we have to assume that they aren't until we are notified of a penalty that says that they were. 22, United Autosports, Paul De Resta, being passed by the race leader. So that's your race leader and LMP2 leader, nose to tail. And the gap between the one and the other is now seven laps. So in six and a half hours nearly, the LMP2 leader has only been lapped seven times by the outright race leader. That shows, shows how close in pace LMP2 is these days to LMP1. Now, the Toyota uh, army would obviously argue that without the success and race winning and points balance, then they would be faster. But then without the hybrid system, they'd be slower. So you have to take everything into account. Toyota 1-2, third place is Rebellion. And the second Team LNT car appears to be in a state of going back togetherness and hoping that the front is largely being reflecting is largely reflecting what's going on at the back although there still seems to be more poking prodding and having a look at things than actual reassembly going on there the engine noise is not coming i don't maybe it is coming from the ar turbo i it thought is. it was from a car outside oh no, that's an ar turbo right okay there we go ah oh. is that the rattle of gears that was him selecting a gear, wasn't it? So it's got some drive. So you can hear, what you can hear there is the engine cut every time he's pulling a lever, but you can't hear the clunk of the transmission. They just spotted something and yeah. he's starting to kill it again. So yeah. one of the guys just spotted something there. So what's happening is is whoever's in the cockpit is running the engine and pulling the lever, and that's the burr, burr that you hear as the engine is cut, or the fuel to the engine is cut to allow the gear shift to happen, but the gear shift is not happening. I'm going to slightly correct, by the way, something Alan and I talked about just a few moments ago to do with where the points would lie if it finished as it is now in GTM. The new championship leader would not be the Project One car by a single point. It would be the AF Course or Ooh. 83. Uh, it's tight, and it's going to uh, revolve around just exactly where the top three, four cars finish. But if my reckoning's correct, the 83 car, which currently sits on 
55 points would get 18 for a total of 73. Now the and only 57 would get 38 for a total of 72. It's like flying the ointment. Pole pole position. Correct indeed. So it's, it would be even Stevens then. And the flying the ointment for 83 and Nick Nielsen at the wheel now might be the garage sharing 54 car with Giancarlo Fisichella at the wheel, who is 46 seconds behind with 90 minutes on the clock and is just about to set the car's fastest race lap. <laughs> Indeed. Because <laughs> you can always rely on Giancarlo to uh, play the team game, uh, possibly. 33 and 26, the high class racing car. And the G-Drive car, John Van in the G-Drive car, is a lap ahead of Mark Patterson in the high-class machine. And sneaks her on the inside, uh, following the gap opened up by Bruno Senna in the number one rebellion, rebellion with the three red lights on the side of the car. Third place overall. In time, the United Autosports uh, car beginning to eke out a bit more of an advantage here, coming back up towards 20, 20 seconds now. So they've managed to recover some of that ground lost. And for the first time in this stint, is lap average going below that of Anthony Davidson? Uh, yeah, so going faster than rather Indeed. than going slower than. Yes, yes, so the lap time is, uh, is less than that on average of all the laps in the stint. Uh, car 86. Oh, there you go. Uh, they are listening to us. Car 86 reported to the stewards for rejoining the track in an unsafe way. At 21.13, it that is now 21.30. That would so be backwards, wouldn't it? 17 minutes ago, this incident happened. I was just questioning what had happened about it. And sure enough, a couple of minutes later, oh, the stewards have uh, had a report about it. I'm not sure how they're sending the report to the stewards. Maybe a three-year-old with a, a note in a cleft stick and a poor sense of direction. There is a time period and a process they have to do to regulate how information gets to the stewards and then for the stewards to be able to look at it and decide whether they are going to investigate or not. Uh -huh. So sometimes it's not quite as quick as what we expect and uh, we obviously know that they've been quite busy as well this week. Uh, this is a bit of a battle here between the Signatech Alpine and uh, Jorik Fern I think just passed the uh, 36 car. He has. Uh, yes, he has. This is for fourth place in LMP2. Pierre Rag just behind jean Eric Van now. So we just saw Jeff going by the high-class car. He was hurrying to get onto the tail of the Senior Tech car. And again, let's tell the Senior Tech story because of a lurid high-speed spin by Pierre Rag in qualifying that rooted a set of tyres to be unusable in any way, shape or form in the race. They are an entire set of tyres shy of anybody else. So that was always going to come back and haunt them as the race progressed. And that may be where we are right now. They are struggling for pace right now. Pierre Rags pace well off here. Yeah. But in fairness, even on identical tyres, you'd expect John Eric Van to be quicker than Pierre Rag. The cars are basically the same, although one's called an Aris, one's called an Alpine. The engines are exactly the same, and the way you run them in conditions like this is what tends to make the difference. Now, G-Drive really struggled for pace early on. They hadn't got the right tyre compound on the car. They admitted that. They've corrected that, and now it's more like the G-Drive we expect to see. Of course, the deal with G-Drive is they didn't do the first three races of the season. They're not going to America, so they won't do Cota or Sebring. We expect them to be in Spa as a traditional warm-up to Le Mans, for which they have an entry, but they're not going to be a championship contender in any way. Unfortunately, what they are doing for the championship contenders, potentially like Senior is taking points away from them because... No, they're not. Oh, they're not. Are they invisible no, they're for invisible points? points? They're invisible for points. Yeah. Excellent. All right, well, here is our LMP2 leader.
One hour, 24 minutes remaining of the Bahrain eight hours round four of the FIA World Endurance Championship season eight, the last race of the calendar year and the halfway point in this championship. It's also the longest race we've had so far. Eight hours means points and a half for winning. And that looks likely at the moment to go to the number seven Toyota crew. And Alan McNish, that's what they need to haul in their teammates. They'll have a little bit more in terms of ballast and so on when they get to Kota in the new year, but get the points. That's what wins you the championship. So you'll take the pain next time for the gain this time. Yeah, no question about it. And they've had a very good run in that particular car. They've been strong uh, all race. I wouldn't say they've been strong all weekend, but they've been strong all race. And now their sister car from second place pops into the pits. It's going to have probably another uh, at least one stop from here after this one. Yeah, 80 minutes, 83 minutes on the clock. They're doing sort of 43-ish minute stints. And driver change coming up as well, yes. Kaz Nakajima will take over from Brendan Hartley. Well, they're a lap behind and they're stopping a lap earlier. So are they working on some way of squirreling themselves into the lead or are they just taking life very conservatively to hang on to second? I think at the end uh, they've not been in a position from performance or strategy to be able to do anything about their sister car so I don't think they're stopping a lap early so, so they're not, they're not even a, game plan This was, remember the uh, they switched these things around uh, two stints ago, it's another 25 lap stint, every stint for this car has been 25 laps with the exception of the one where they took advantage of the caution and then again uh, with a 14 lap stint where they tried to switch things around there yep. I think they were hoping for a bit more performance having saved tyres towards the end of the race so now you've got uh, Nakajima in the car with a fresh set, and that fresh set will take him all the way to the end of the race. Here's our LMP2 leader, still United Autosports, Paul De Resta up, and he's opened up the margin now to 25 seconds over Ant Davidson. It was half that about 10 laps ago, midway through the stint, but he has recovered that composure, and we are ready for a driver change now. So Felipe Albuquerque will take over. And again, should be just a bit over two stops or two stints for these guys. So, as you say, Alan, if you've got to do two and a bit, you don't want necessarily to do two full ones. Also, Felipe Albuquerque jumped in there, pulled the rest out. I think the rest has had a pretty stunning weekend here, yep. actually. Yes. No question. And uh, now his job is done, and it's a case of uh, Felipe trying to sort of manage the gaps between now and the end of the race, as uh, there's a, a switch there, actually. And uh, Davidson now is just being overtaken there by the G-Drive car of Jean-Eric Verne, I think it was. Yeah, Jean-Eric Verne unlapping himself. He's in fourth place still. Uh, and Davidson leads now from Jackie Chan DC Racing's Gabriel Aubrey. Oh, and the uh, mechanic there limping away from the far side of the car. So he's hurt himself in that stop. Uh, pit stop also for Senior Tech Alpine. Pierre Rag brought their car in. Settler are in as well. Andrea Beliki coming in. And we heard Zach Brown earlier on saying they may have something in their pocket. And uh, <laughs> what, what he meant was they had some brand new tyres ready to go for the end yeah. of the race. Well, let's see that they've still got to do uh, 80 minutes on them, so they'll be considerably less than brand new by the end. Let's see what Jota Sport still have there in their locker as well. And again, the performance between the two tyre brands, between the Michelin, which United are running, and between the Goodyear that Jota Sport are running, we don't seem to have really seen any noticeable difference for much of the race. It's been about... United having got a time gap and being able to maintain it. Correct. Uh, looking at the best laps of the race, Paul De Resta has the fastest LMP2 lap uh, of the race, 148.579. Second fastest, remarkably, is Roberto Gonzalez with a 148.618. Oh, wow. When you look at the 10 best lap averages, uh, the remarkable thing, though, about the United Autosports effort is all three of those drivers are in the 149s on a 10-lap average, and that's remarkably rare when you look down that order. There are others that have done it, 
uh, 148.96, uh, the best 10 on average for Paul de Resta. 149.8 for Jan Panutet, 149.5 for Philippe Albuquerque. 149.8 for Hope in Tongue, 149.8 from Phil Hansen. Uh, identical best 10 laps from Ant Davidson to Phil Hansen. That's a remarkable testament to young Phil. They are the only men who've actually managed the 10 best laps average under 150. Driver change again. Nick de Vries back in to the racing team Netherlands car. Chris Van Aert has done his time behind the wheel, and so it's now de Vries and uh, Van der Gaard who will complete the race. Almost said Blake and Merlin again, but the ghost of Fiona Miller's hand on my shoulder just reminded me to choose the right Dutchman. Too many to choose from, that's the problem. So de Vries files out into turn one. Yep. And that car currently running in seventh place. It's not the race that they were hoping to have after winning last time out, but you don't always get the same race twice in a row. On pit lane 37 car, Gabriel Albrecht brings the 37 Jackie Chan DC racing car in from second, sorry, from third in LMP2 at this point. Driver change was underway. Well, in fact, as he came across the stripe, he was only 29 hundredths of a second in third place, so he was being caught by the United Autosports car, which went by at the line. Rebellion overshoot because they got a swing in past 37. Weren't Rebellion in quite recently with Bruno Senna taking over? Uh, no, that's a full 23 lap okay. stage. It's a, a, a remarkable how quickly these things come around. But 37 goes away. There should be Will Stevens back in to the finish, and Will has been very quick indeed. Yeah. And away he goes. Again, they have to pull back. Just unfortunate for both teams that they're nose to tail in the pit lane and there isn't enough room to do that. And as they leave, in comes the Jota Sport car from the lead of the race at Davidson. Yep. So this is going to be a critical pit stop if we're going to see a race to the flag here. It needs to be turned around quickly and with no dramas. And we could really do with seeing what sort of tyres are going on there. Here we go. There are tyres ready, the guns are ready, but they are used tyres. You can see chalk marks on them. I'm not sure those are brand new. I think they're not shiny enough. Are they going to change or are they going to save it until the final hour? Out goes the Rebellion. And across the line comes the number 22 United Autosports car back into the lead. The Rebellion comes out behind it. Here comes the Jota car, and that is a longer gap this time, isn't it? Was that a full four-tyre change? Was that a two-tyre change? Those men know, but apparently there's no way of us finding out from them. Uh, Drive-through penalty for the Gulf Racing 86 car for an unsafe rejoin of the track after flying off across the runoff area and coming back on and clattering the MR Racing Ferrari, which has been hit more than its fair share of times. Here, Here we go. We go. Look it's at that. I'm sure it was the MR car. It was, because that is car. the one with the m wrong door on. It is. From having been clumped earlier on on the other side by somebody else. Racing first of the wrong trousers after that uh, clump on the side. But uh, the 86 car, that shouldn't cost it a place. The moment has something over a minute's gap to the chasing 83 car. It'll be close, though, that Ferrari. Nick Nielsen and that team, they could end up tied for the lead. If they get a place from Gulf Racing, yep. they will move into the lead of the championship. So that'll be very important. How close is Giancarlo Fisichella? Well, actually, he hasn't got any closer behind Nick Nielsen. Nielsen is matching him lap for lap. Well, Nick Nielsen strikes me as being someone who Ferrari have got plans for in the future. We'll be getting a, a chance in the GT Pro car tomorrow's rookie test. Quite I rightly. I think Ben Barker is just serving that penalty. He's in the pits at any rate. Yeah, there he goes. He's come out, so he's served the drive through penalty. The team are made aware of it before we are, and so he knew it was coming. They knew it was coming. Get it done immediately. Don't argue. Just get in, get it done, get gone. And remarkably, as he takes it, he actually gets a place because he's got past the still stationary six LNT car. <laughs> right, OK, so an overall position goes to him. Yep. Uh, but he stays in what is third in the class, so still in a podium position despite that drive-through. But uh, does mean that Nick Nielsen is 
well, fully 30 seconds closer to him. However, he is still a little distance back. 29, Racing Team Netherlands. How far up the order can Nick de Vries push them? Every time he got into the car in uh, Fujian, Shanghai, he grabbed a hat full of positions. A potentially significant moment about to come in the GT uh, Drivers' Championship because Ricard Leitz has caught Jerome Bleeker Molen, the GTM leader. Remember, at the moment, the 57 car is taking points from uh, the two pro squads uh, for Porsche in the World GT Drivers' Championship. But, uh, not for much longer, it seems, if Leitz can get by. Um, He's caught a lap on him in the last couple of hours, so I think uh, there's not going to be too much of a problem there. Maybe a bigger problem for Malcolm Christensen, who's a further yeah. 46 seconds back. It will separate the two Porsches a little bit more. But Christensen has got another hour and a quarter to make up that difference. And again, it's entirely possible that the factory Porsche team may prevail against uh, upon Team Project 1 for Team Project 1 to keep their win and their points in the AM Drivers title race, but allow the factory car to pick up another position. Yeah, but because it's a championship for both Pro and AM, and so therefore... But there is also an AM Drivers yeah, points, and the 57 guys aren't going to win the World Championship title outright. No, nope, they're not. I think not. of that much we can, we can all be agreed, so if it gets close to it in the last couple of laps, then the chance to help the factory team perhaps up the ladder towards the World Championship. I'm sure Team Project One will be amenable to that. So on board with Michael Christensen. He is the tail end Charlie of that group as Richard Leeds has gone by around Blake Molen. And 46 seconds, 46 actually seconds. the gap back to Christensen yeah. to this car. So 46 seconds up the road, which actually is uh, so down the start right. finish straight up towards turn four and into turn five. It's a hundred and odd, 110 second lap for a GT car. So he's looking at about a third of a lap. Mind you, the car is sliding around a lot. Here's the, the pass. Sister car, Richard Leitz. Making going that by, pass, yep. yeah. Going by the 57 car that leads and has lead, led all but. It'd be interesting to see at the end of the race, in the total of AM laps, how few any other car has led apart from Team Project I'll One. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, we haven't finished yet. You've got another round 11 minutes to go. Then. Tell you exactly how long it is so far. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> uh, I would say we won't need to take our shoes and socks off to no. count up those laps. No. Alex Lynn fourth, Richard Leeds fifth in the GT Pro class. And the gap between the two of them is a lap at the moment after those delays. Matteo Cairoli, Porsche factory junior driver, apparently doesn't know what track limits mean. He's been given a final warning in the 56 Gulf racing car for ab uh, abusing, I beg your pardon, Team Project One car for abusing track limits. This is a good battle though because Alex Lynn is looking at the back of Pierre Guiri's uh, Ferrari yeah. in the same way that Nicky Team is looking at the back of the assist of Ferrari, Miguel Molina, and in fact, he's gone wide, gone very, very wide, locked up the rears into turn one, Pierre Guidi, which has allowed Alex to just get that little bit closer and that little bit closer. There's actually quite a number of laps they've not led, mainly with pit stops. The, the stat I was going to chuck you away a little earlier is I think I'm right that at no point, even with pit stops um, during Ben Keating's three stints at the wheel, did he drop lower than third? Right. Well, they, the AM class leader has done 198 laps to now, and Graham, in a moment, will tell us how few they've not led. Let's hear from Alex Lynn and the team. We will advise when the window is open to follow them if you want in the pit. Currently, do not follow the next pit. Oh, interesting. All right, there we go. So of the 100 and, OK, Graham's working on that. Of the 198 laps so far run by the AM class leader, I'm guessing can't be more than 20, probably, that Team Project One have not led. And, uh, I think you're going to be surprised. Oh, really? OK, well, uh, I know the golf car has. I know the 90, I think 98 Aston was in the lead for a while. Uh, 
little shot always of turn one makes everything look very slow, but that is very slow. That is the Settler car not going much quicker out of turn three than it was out of turn one. Down into the first car. Ah, I see why. Oh dear. Yes. Well, handy we had that outside shot, because from the inside you just thought, right, it's locked up, why is it not going well? That tyre has let go down the straight. So there's uh, Roberto Lacotte. A little frown on his face, and I'm not surprised because his teammate has got very nearly an entire lap to get back on the rim and the carcass. Giorgio Sanagiotto, the trio of drivers, the team coming up from the European Le Mans series where Settler uh, raced for several seasons. Now their first ever year in the World Championship. As we watch that flapping away, uh, the answer, by the way, is 48 laps they okay. haven't led, uh, but f to four different cars. The 77 car led for one lap, the 88 car led for two, 86, you're quite correct, led for 14, and 31 laps in the lead for the 98 Aston Martin. Uh -huh. Okay, so the Aston is the second most leading car in the class, but of the what is now nearly 200 laps, uh, 199 laps, they've led actually three quarters of they them. So been. that has been a pretty impressive run so far. Of course, let us not uh, count our poulets a little too early. We've still got an hour and change to go in this race. And anything as TF Sport approved and both Team LNT cars could yet happen. And at the moment, Team Project One have got the AM class surrounded because the 57 car is at the front, leading them away, and the 56 car is at the back, trying to catch up from behind. So it's been a very different story on either side of that Team Project One garage. Really is turning into a bit of a champion's year for Egidio Perfetti and the 56 guys that won last year's title in AM. Uh, it's rather, isn't it? Uh, in terms of the uh, where we're on fuel for the lead four in uh, the GT Pro competition, 27 laps of 31-ish uh, for the lead two, Miguel Molina and Nicky Team. 25 laps at the moment for the 51 car. Uh, and 18 laps, remember there was the 97 car went off strategy early on, has not got back to that. So they, at the moment, have got something like four laps before they've got a full fuel stint left. So that would probably mean as well that uh, they won't have a uh, full tank in at this moment in time. Uh, correct. They've done 19 laps right now. So it's uh, the, the choice, I guess, is three laps now until you get to a full fuel stint or 12 laps to end the stint that you've... You know, well, what you need to do is you need to try and get past and get track position. Correct. So you yes. force that issue. And uh, or alternatively, you try to get the undercut if they have filled it up so they won't have as much fuel to put in now so they gain on the refueling time so it depends on how much fuel they put in at the last stop which way you would go right now remember what the engineer's message was do not follow the ferrari in i will tell you when the window for following him in opens so correct what does that tell you al has he got a full tank or yes he's got the opportunity yeah. to be able to continue along so he's got a full tank so he'll try the undercut yeah. by refueling less once uh, they come to the pit stop itself. And it's just one left hand rear tire for the Settler Dallara, which is now back on its way. So Giotto at the wheel taking it back out as we are now looking at, uh, oh my goodness. Where's that? That's around the back of the grandstand. Right, that's what we are doing after this race, gents. By we. Gotta love a little. I'm not, uh, doing that's, that, no, not doing that. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Uber around here is altogether totally different, isn't it? Terry Grant is the man doing the stunts in the, on the two wheels. Not these two wheels, but actually the uh, riding, riding the car on two. Hopefully we don't see any of that on the circuit. And in fact, the Aston's going past, Lynn is going past. Down the start finish straight, he's got to run out to the final corner and he's on the inside, so he'll get this braking done. In fact, the Ferrari's very good in the brakes and the Ferrari's trying to go around the outside. So it's going to be a bit of a fight. Oh, my goodness. 
It that is a bit of a fight, isn't it? That was a bit aggressive by both of them, actually. Well, Alex Ling was damage. trying to box him in, or trying not to get boxed in himself behind the Project One Porsche, the AM-Class car. Yeah, but the thing there was that Alex was alongside and passed, and he got done on the brakes. So I think he's either struggling a little bit on the brakes, or alternatively, the Ferrari is just absolutely phenomenal on the brakes. But uh, he was already on the inside and passed at this moment, and then the Ferrari was able to sort of go around the outside. Alex squeezed him across, but uh, there was clearly Puer Giri wasn't going to give up. He's not a give up type of guy. But now Alex has got to A, catch back up again, as well as trying to get rid of this uh, 33 Orica that's uh, in LMP2, which is actually just more getting them in the way. Mark Patterson's at the wheel of that car. And uh, what Alex needs is that Mark actually just disappears. But at the moment, he's kind of compromising the run back up onto the back of Ferrari. Very surprised there how well uh, the actually went the, the Ferrari was as it sort of turned in and ran round the outside. It's going to be a real old fight for this third position. A great view from on board Alex Lynn as well, hearing the noise of this new Aston Martin V8 Vantage, less of the bellow that it used to have before. And that's courtesy of the silencing or the muting effects of the turbochargers. He is closing in on the Ferrari, though, slowly but surely. But it must have been a mistake by Alessandro Pierguidi that brought him from sort of a second and a half back to suddenly right alongside in the braking area. Uh, he was kind of there near the boats, and he was catching a bit of traffic more than necessarily a mistake. But out to the final corner, then Alex was able to get a bit of a run on him, and that was, that was uh, what I thought was going to be the job done. But actually, yep. it wasn't the job done because Pierguidi had different ideas about it. 222 laps in the books, starting that, uh, continuing uh, after that 223, our race leader. Having just pitted. Yeah, closing in on one hour to go. Jose Maria Lopez at the wheel of the number seven Toyota Gazoo Racing TS050. And all of a sudden, by the way, LMP2, Felipe Albuquerque is pulling away. He said Da Costa has sort of struggled a little bit through this sort of stint. I think they've kind of run out of the tyre a little bit, or their options on the tyre. Remember, it was a new set that went into Albuquerque. Didn't think much of that mechanic Sporum, did you? That was a bit odd, wasn't it? Yeah, bit, bit tatty, really. But... Well, looks as though uh, Louise from the pit lane suggesting that Jota Sport might have had a new set of tyres on. Right, on board I, with I'm Jose pretty certain they were, I'm pretty certain there were not new tyres for that Jota car. I think we saw... Last stop we saw, they were they were at yeah. least scrubbed. Yeah. They were not shiny, shiny, shiny. Well, as we're on board with Lopez looking at uh, the intense eyes of the Argentinian, Nick de Vries talking about LMP2 has just delivered the car's fastest lap of the race on uh, lap 221 for it, as it's a few laps behind. In fact, a little bit less than that, 218 or something, as it's a few laps down from the overall late race leader. Jose Maria Lopez. What's De Vries's plan for the 2020 season? Do we know? Is he? He's going to continue on with uh, with this car racing yeah. team Netherlands through until Le Mans. And then after that, uh, I don't know. I'm not I'm not party to his contracts. No, I was just wondering in terms of single seaters whether there's anything else beckoning for him. He's racing won. in Formula E with Mercedes. Of course, yes. So we'll have to wait and see how. The newly announced calendar ties in with Formula E. Joanna Ver was saying that they have set the world endurance calendar and have given it to Formula E so that if there is a possibility to avoid clashes, a lot of the drivers and some of the team managers would be quite happy with that. I think overall, from a motorsport perspective, it's better that uh, you don't sort of trip over each other. However, yeah. it is very difficult to create calendars across the board, not clashing with anything else because there's I remember it, there's only 52 weeks in every single year. I believe you're still correct. I don't think they changed that rule. Mark Patterson steps out of the number 33 high-class racing car, and it looked like new tyres on the front and worn on the back of the car, um, which is an interesting combination to have left as the final hour of the eight hours of Bahrain is just about to start.
into the final hour of the Bahrain Eight Hours, round four of the eighth season of the FIA World Endurance Championship, the last of this year and the last of this decade. Four more races in the new year in 2020, up to and including Le Mans 24 hours to decide our champions. And as we get into the final hour of what is the longest race so far this season, all of our front runners are looking at trying to finish perfectly at the end of their race. In the pits, Miguel Molinar, leader in the 71 AF Corsa Ferrari. Nicky Team, second in the 95 Aston Martin. And in from fourth place has just left the 51 Ferrari of James Collado. All those in the GTE Pro class, and that means that Collado now leads from the 97 Aston Martin of Alex Lynn. But Lynn still needs to uh, stop. Lynn, Lynn, st uh, Lynn takes the lead now because the Air Force car has just stopped. No, Collado's already left the pits. And Alex Lynn's only just come by, so how did that happen? Because the other two cars have stopped. We've got the 71 and the 95 on pit lane now. Yeah. That's going to change as well, because the Aston Martin gets ahead again. Ooh. So well, Aston Martin again going two tyres. I was trying to study on the timing screen to figure out how James Collado, who left the pits before Alex Lynn came past, is still somehow behind him. Four seconds quicker in the pits for the 97, sorry, the 95 car over the 71. So who took what? Let's take a look. All right, that's the end of it, but it doesn't tell us why the Aston stop was a little quicker. Have they fueled slightly shorter? Spinning the wheels. Oh, yes. Well, that's a penalty, obviously. But yeah, Spinning the wheels, somebody did get a penalty for spinning the wheels. Yeah, that was no, uh, Christian Reid. It's absolutely a rule, so, yeah. Christian Reid got his penalty, which was uh, the stop and go, was for spinning wheels leaving the pit stop. I, I tell you what, the Ferrari team will be mighty happy if they're awarded a penalty in the final hour, because it's a drive through penalty. Oops. Meanwhile, 57 is in front of us, that's our GTE AM class leader, your own Blake Molan. And as we rode on board there with Alex Lynn, he was flashing the headlights through, they're going, please make some room for me to come through. The key now is what is Alex Lynn's pace going to be now he has that window? Is he going to come straight in? That was his in lap, that's what he needed. Well, well clearly... The engineers have said the window is open. The window is absolutely open. He, you know, uh, predicted somewhere like 30 laps left. It could do 31 laps on fuel. And presumably, they think this is the better tactic. All right, well, the pit lane is empty. Yeah, but that car ahead of them, from... they want to get out of the way. That's oh. actually doing the tail end thing. They're making adjustments or changing the rear of that car. That's not what they needed. Mark Patterson stopped ages ago. The car has still not left. If they're going to have to do a pullback, then you've lost three seconds, give or yeah. take. And on that, that any already. advantage of your potential undercut has long gone. And here also, comes, here come the uh, the uh, chasing pack. Right, there's 95. That will move from second into first, and Miguel Molina will move from third into second. The high-class car has gone. Full set of tyres. Full set of tyres, they are used, they may be qualifying tyres, potentially. They look pretty good. Yeah. Well, they spent a lot of time scraping the muck off and clearing them all up before they're used. 98 Aston is in the shot at turn one. Here's 97 coming back out. Where is Came Collado? in from the lead. Where is Collado? We'll have Passing to wait now. and see. It's good. Yeah. 97 down the straight, and right up behind him is James Collado, 70 uh, in the 51 car. Well, let's get down to Toyota number eight and hear from Brendan Hartley. Well, try as they might, the number eight has not been able to unlap yourselves from the number seven. Was there a problem? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, the race didn't start very good with Seb. We picked up a bit, a bit of damage from the beginning. We were hoping we could fight the other car today, even with a bit of success handicap. But in the end, we had a, a bit of damage also later on with Kazuki. So we now have a big hole on the floor, and it's a little bit of damage limitation. I, I think it would take, take second. Um, we knew it was going to be hard to beat the Janetta and the Rebellion on pure pace. They both had problems. So I think 1-2 is a good result for the team, and we couldn't really do much more today. OK, thank you. No worries. Now, while that was happening, 
Uh, Alex Lynn came out of the pits inches in front of James Collado's Ferrari. So, uh, in fact, it was Maxime Martin. It was a driver change as well as fresh tyres in the 97 Aston. Uh, so that battle for third in GTE Pro is nose to tail, heading out of corner 11 and up the hill to turn 12, just ahead of our race leader, Jose Maria Lopez, now out of 11 and up to 12. And they lead by over a lap from the sister car number eight. And in fact, he'll be coming onto the back straight behind our GTE Pro battle. That's the lights you can see in front of us. Well, the lights of the city, obviously, but just in front of the cars. On board with Alex Lynn in the 97 Aston Martin. He's in third place. And if you could see in his mirrors, you would see the 51 Ferrari of James Collado. Between them, about 20 meters and one Toyota. Alex Lynn just got out of the pits in third in the Aston ahead of the Ferrari and is managing to keep his nose in front. In fact, it's not Alex Lynn, it's Maxime Martin who took over from Alex. And Maxime had four new tires. Now, talking to the Aston Martin team yesterday, they were always looking at trying to go into the final out with a new set of tires, not brand, brand new. May well be the ones that they used in qualifying, but Paul Howarth was determined not to get outfoxed on tires, and it looks like they've played their cards well. Uh, indeed, 3.3 seconds is the gap between Marcus Sorensen leading GT Pro from uh, Miguel Molina. Then it's a further 1.5 seconds for the third to fourth, 32 seconds between those two groups. Eight hours of Bahrain, final race of the decade for the FIA World Endurance Championship. Halfway through the season, race four of eight in season nine. And the race started with Bruno Senna on pole position ahead of Charlie Robertson in the number five Ginetta. Toyota's qualified second and third. LMP2 went five wide behind, but the leader did not get safely out of turn one into turn two. A big spin up of the rear wheels from the Ginetta driver took him and the Rebellion out of the front of the field. The door opened for the number seven Toyota. The door was opened quite forcibly by the 51 Ferrari taking the lead of the GT Pro class. Safety car came out after the first corner kerfuffle. Ginetta needed a pit stop for uh, repairs as the number seven Toyota leapt away into the lead. Second at this stage, the number 22 United Autosports LMP2 class leader, but the recovering Ginetta and later the recovering Rebellion would go by to move into the top three. The race and all the celebrations around it, part of Bahrain's National Day, a long four-day holiday here in the small kingdom in the Arabian Gulf. As night fell, within an hour and a half of the start, the racing continued at a fervent pace. Top three in GTE Pro, the Aston Martin ahead of the battle between Ferrari and Porsche. The Ferrari getting in front, and then the Aston Martin at the head of the queue, running out of tyres and gradually being relegated from first down to fifth and then eventually sixth in the class. It's been a story of tyre wear and brake management throughout. This highly abrasive circuit is really tough on the rubber. And depending on what state your tyres were in, so swung your race. Until halfway through the race, two Porsches were in trouble first. The 82 car pushed back into the garage with a damper problem. Then 88 bringing out a full course yellow as it crashed out of the race. In the pit stops that followed, 
the wheel nut was not done up properly on the 91 car. It came in one lap later with a loose wheel and a puncture. Both Porsches out of the hunt for glory, which left Aston Martin versus Ferrari. The first of the Ginettas retired trackside with a gear shift issue. That was car number five. And then we had two Toyotas, one Ginetta and Rebellion battling for the outright lead. Uh, an unsafe rejoin by the Gulf Porsche cost it a penalty, but it remains in third in the GTE AM class, chasing the 98 Aston and the 57 Porsche. But more troubles at Ginetta saw both their cars by the side of the road. Into the final hour of the race, Aston Martin using clever pit work and good strategy to move themselves up the leaderboard. And worse than that for the 71 Ferrari, Miguel Molina in second place. And he has now been investigated for wheel spinning out of the pit lane. Bollard on track in the middle of the start, finish straight. This might mean full course yellow. We've had one safety car, one full course yellow, all race. We're in the final of eight hours of racing here in Bahrain. And Alamo Nisha full course yellow now uh, will help Aston Martin because the 32 second gap between Maxi Martin and Miguel Molina may well be closed up if the Ferrari gets a penalty. So sealing the race now with a, a full course yellow might help the Aston Martin even more. Yeah, I think in, uh, it'll be a very, very short one, if anything, because it's just someone to run on and pick up that corner and run off again. I don't yeah. see it being long by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but it uh, certainly is something that I'm sure is going through Edouard Freitas' mind is how do we actually solve this problem? He likes races to flow. He doesn't want to interrupt them in any way. And uh, so he's, I'm sure he'll be scratching his head trying to understand if this can actually get knocked out of its way naturally. Like this, uh, Bruno Senna weaves away from it, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen, I'm afraid. And that's been taken out by a car in the final corner, and it's got stuck in the bodywork and then finally fallen out halfway down the main straight. So you don't normally have bollards on the straight, so it can't have come from there. Very true. It's realistically one car uh, actually no longer because it's just pitted. The 98 Aston Martin could have profited at this point uh, for a significant overall position in its class for a full course yellow. 98 yeah. pitting from second, Team Project 1 to the lead in uh, GTM. Yeah, the 98 Aston was in fact in front, but it has dropped back down and Team Project 1 back in front after that pit stop. Well, let's get back to United Autosports. Felipe Albuquerque leads the race in the number 22 car in LMP2. And Luis is with his teammate, Paul de Resta. Paul de Resta, it's, uh, it's not been an easy one, has it? No, we've had some issues in the pit stops as well, so we've lost some time with a sticky wheel and stuff. But we're still where we need to be, but at the same point, there's some debris on the main street at the moment, so hopefully that's not going to interfere where we are. Um, and you just never know towards the end where it's going to be. It's very high degradation, so the last double stint needs to be played very calculated, and even the stint before that was quite hard. That, that gap was bigger, got smaller, it's getting bigger again, it's ever-changing. It is ever-changing, but like I say, anything can just throw you out the window. Um, you know, Philippe's in the car to the end now, so it's up to him to try and do that, but at the same time, you know, track position is key if any, any of the other things that can interfere with it happen. Thank you. Getting into the window for the final P2 stops of this race. Uh, we've got something like 26 laps remaining. It's about 22 lap uh, fuel stint for the LMP2. So the next three or four laps is going to get pretty crowded down in pit lane. So if that's how many laps they can do a maximum, who has got enough fuel to get to that point and who hasn't? Uh, well, at the moment, uh, we are four yeah, laps away. Are we all going to go full course yellow? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, full course yellow. On the start finish straight, on the start finish straight, all cars to bear right. On the start finish straight, all cars to bear right. 
Well, what remains of what remained of the bollards, it was clattered last time round by the 37 Jackie Chan at DC Racing Car of Will Stevens. He's pitted, that may have fallen well for them, but if he's pitted now, He's, he's going to need a splash. They're going to need a splash, aren't they? Anybody who comes in now comes in because they have to, not because they want to, because it doesn't fall well for strategy. And United Autosports are in as well. Now, is Jota going to need to come in as well now? I guess they're going to lose less time if you pit now on the full course yellow. So you may as well take the splash at the end. Yeah. Rather than, uh, yeah. Well, the, the other factor is it depends how long this is going to be. If it is quite Correct. a long one because they're cleaning up everything else, then uh, you can imagine that it's going to be a benefit. Yeah, I guess any stop under full course yellow is effectively costing you less time than a similar stop. Left sides only, it looked like going on at United. 38 car, meanwhile, is on the back straight. Yeah, so 38 might get a chance to come in under this full course yellow. 26 in fourth position has got a, posi a, a, a opportunity to pit now. They're just coming on to the start finish straight. Well, I think you'd take it, oh, wouldn't do? you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have seven. it. Yeah. So two is the leader. So anybody who's within shouting distance. This puts them with this will be the final stop for the lead car. Yeah. OK, so 44 minutes to go. And the number seven Toyota makes its last stop. Is that 56 in the pits? Yes, it is. So 57, Larry Tenforder leading. And the 98 Aston Martin, Ross Gunn took over the 98 car. That's now dropped down to second place. And Larry Tenforder in the 57 Team Project One car with seven stops. And the 98 Aston with eight. The Golf Racing car with nine. One was a drive through. So it seems to me that Team Project One owe us a stop somewhere. Team Project One owes us a stop. So I'm just looking here. Final 40 minutes as Graham uh, checks out who needs what. Toyota 1-2, Rebellion 3rd. 4th place is our LMP2 leader. United Autosports ahead of Jota and Jackie Chan DC Racing. In GTE Pro, it's Aston Ferrari, Aston Ferrari, and then the two Porsches hanging on in 5th and 6th. In the GTE Am class between the GTE Pro cars, the leader team Project 157 ahead of the 98 Aston and the 86 Gulf Porsche, which has just stopped as well. Leader number 7 has stopped leader number eight is in so too is the number one rebellion 43 minutes and counting before the end of the race so that's how the bollards are fixed hopefully About and five then minutes we'll see how they're taken out <laughs> yes. often it doesn't take that long however this isn't touring car racing but uh yeah as we get to the end, and there are going to be some pretty close battles, the bollards may suffer a little of collateral damage. Now, the intention of the bollards, obviously, is to stop drivers cutting the curbs. Here on the inside at turn one, for instance. Still full course yellow, everybody at 80 kilometers an hour. And that's whether you're the fastest or the slowest car in the field. Now, what are we seeing here? So a little bit of drama with Oh, look, brand new tyres in the final 40 minutes. Seems a little odd to be keeping an entire set of brand new tyres that late it's into the race. Side. Yeah, but even so. Waste not, one not. Yeah, well, I mean, you're going to use them. I just Yeah, but just remember that they didn't anticipate this race was going to be gifted in the way that it was. Yeah, that's very you know, true. There was an incident at the first corner that sort of left it in the hands of uh, the Toyota team. And so they were planning and preparing for a bit of a slog all the way to the end of the race. Yeah, but on lap one, we knew that that plan had changed. Yeah, but still, <laughs> and if here you're now. quick enough and capable of doing the job and yeah. you can, you stick to it. Fuel for the racing team Netherlands car. And we go back to green. So immediately everybody picking up the pace with the 97 Aston responding quickly to the attack of the Ferrari. Looked like the Ferrari was just a fraction quicker to release the limiter and goes the long way around the outside. Is he going to make it out? It's a tight hairpin and he runs out of road on the outside. He runs wider than wide out of there. Um, I think that's going to be... I'm not sure that, that is going to stick, no, in fairness. 
That definitely is him. not the right way to play the game there. No, Miguel Molina way out wide. There's no way that he can argue that he didn't take the position by exceeding track limits. He'll say, well, he pushed me off. He didn't actually push you, he just didn't give you the, the, the room on the racetrack. You're on the outside, you know what yeah. the options are. Oh, there's a fresh bollard right. has been bollarded. So here's the other Ferrari Aston battle, and 95. That's uh, just changed. Uh, yes, Marco Sorensen back in front. So it wasn't the other battle, that was the lead battle. So uh, Marco Sorensen ahead of Miguel Molina. And in the inset, 97, that's Maxime Martin chasing James Collado. So Molina gave the spot back immediately, but the car is still under investigation for Will spinning off the pit apron. The unfortunate thing for them is it happened on camera, which makes it very hard not to spot. Even we saw that, and we're not judges of fact in the pit lane, or observers in the pit lane. So it is Aston Ferrari, Ferrari Aston, who is going to get spots on the podium in the next 40 minutes. Well, probably, although nothing is certain in endurance racing, Le Mans teaches us that on a regular basis, probably not a Porsche. And you said that out loud. Yeah, I, I just said probably. You know, <laughs> we've, we've all been uh, in mouth, jaw-dropping, mouth-opening situations in endurance racing over many, many years, and uh, nothing will, well, it, it often surprises us, oh, and there goes another Bard. Um, so, uh, you said in the next half hour, we've already lost two, and it's on the first lap away from the restart, lap two now. Would you like some good news? Go ahead. TF Sport are back out in the race. Ah, excellent. By the look of things. I'm right, they've done 75% of the race distance to get the points. Oh, that's a very 70. good question. Their, their pit stop, by the way, was an hour and 11 minutes. 71 minutes and 22 seconds yes, is their last stop. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that also means, by the way, oh, there was a stat I was hanging on to. Uh, it's been since, let me get this one right, uh, Sebring last year since we had more than two retirements right. the, uh, or non-classified cars, other than Le Mans, which is a completely different... Uh, now, if TF Sport can finish and finish in 10th, that means they won't lose the championship lead because they will score some points. Let's get down and hear from Nicky Team at Aston Martin. Nikki team looking on in the final m minutes left. Uh, oh my goodness, this is so close. Yeah, this is what we love, isn't it? Close racing. Eight hours, it's unbelievable. Eight hours to be fighting inside one second with the Ferrari. Um, it's been a stunning, stunning race so far again. Eight hours, it's uh, quite a highlight for, for the wake. I would say it's the first time and it's what a, what a place to do it. And uh, obviously it didn't look like we had the pace from the beginning, but now somehow we are, we are fighting for the win and I'm just uh, super proud of the boys. I'm not going to tempt fate and say anything else. Just thank you. <laughs> well, um, yes, very nervous times. It would be two points, by the way, for TO Sport, uh, not one. That would place them fourth in the championship points by half a point behind the number 98 Aston Martin with the, uh, the 57 and the 83 level on points. Gotcha. And about 13 points ahead. Well, Nicky Team nervous in the garage. The Aston Martin that he shares with Marco Sorensen is the leader. That's the green and yellow car you can see there. In the inset, Alex Lynn chasing the other Ferrari. That's the battle for third. It's not Alex Lynn, it's Maxime Martin. I must remember that. So Marco Sorensen leading from Miguel Molina, James Collado in third. At the moment, Ferrari with two podium spots, Aston Martin with one, but still that question, a big lock up there from the 71 car, Miguel Molina. Big question over, to, over whether they will be awarded a penalty. They gave the position back, so I don't think so. No, no this is the pit stop. They're being investigated for wheel spinning ah, away wheel from spinning, the last yes. pit stop. Apologies, yes. I thought you meant for the overtaking uh, no, off no, no. the circuit in a different country. Exactly. If, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> he, he used the um, the causeway to Saudi Arabia to make the pass, but uh, big lock up here. Just got a little offline. Road dropping away underneath him. But it's that wheel spin off the pit apron. I think the standard 
um, punishment for that is a drive-through penalty, and that's really going to hurt them because this is a close race. Yes. Not just between these two, but the other guys are only 34 seconds behind, and a drive-through would probably drop them off the podium. It's worse than that. It's a stop and go. Oh, it's worse than that. It's a stop and go, Jim. Aston Martin Racing, first and fourth. Will they take two podium finishes out of this? At the moment, if, even if 71 gets a penalty, there is a second Ferrari ready to take second position, and that will be the 51 car. There's the of course, the team. Spoke to John Gall after first practice, and they were so far off the pace, and I think uh, right now he would take the positions that they're in, never mind uh, the opportunity yeah. to have two cars on the podium. But it's been a pretty impressive sort of response to a very, very difficult start to the weekend for them. I think all six of the cars in the GT Pro class have led at one stage or another. Porsche had its supremacy, Ferrari's had its supremacy, Aston's had its supremacy. The two different cars from each team on different strategies. Now Molina towing up behind the Aston. But the Aston just creeps away at the end of the straight with or without that uh, slipstream the Ferrari only just stays where it was not close enough to put in a move and we've seen when particularly Nicky team was driving the 95 car at the head of the field with a four car queue behind it started out as one car ended up as four behind him because he was able to hold everybody up and by the way uh, much as we've got the we talked about the drivers championship a massive hit here for Porsche in the manufacturers championship yeah. Uh, not just one car, but a double car hit. That's exactly right. A double right. car hit at 1.5 times points. Yes. Yeah. Crikey. Yeah. That's. Um, it's going to be a, a tough night for them. I would predict that he's going to have a go into turn eight, into that other that corner that they've just went into. It. Uh, that's where the Ferrari looks pretty good out through the chicane, but very, very good in the brakes. It's able to stop the car consistently and get it turned into that corner. Larry Tenford, a leading GTE AM in the 57 Project One car. Louise is down in the garage with his teammate. The number 57 has been dominant throughout this race. Uh, the team have put in a great job. Yeah, I mean, it all started with uh, a sort of an Iron Man run by uh, Ben Keating. Unbelievable what he did, almost three hours in the car. And uh, yeah, he brought us all the way up there. And since then, uh, we got a full course yellow, which really helped us. Uh, we were a little bit short of fuel, so we had to save fuel for the last couple of hours. But uh, now we're all good to go. And uh, yeah, perfect race. Nothing really went wrong. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Well, nothing's gone wrong for them. It has gone badly wrong for 71. They have been handed a stop and go penalty for spinning the wheels after a pit stop. Now, it doesn't seem like a massive infringement, but it is a safety issue. Information to the pit line. Stop and go penalty car 71 for spinning the wheels at the end of the pit stop. Stop and go penalty car 71 for spinning the wheels at the end of the pit stop. And look, it's, it's really hard to do. It's not grippy tarmac like the racetrack. It's smooth concrete, and it's smooth concrete that's covered in sand and then brake dust and yada, yada, yada. And these cars have a clutch like a light switch. It is very, very easy to do, but the penalty is severe. A stop and go, that will take them out of the podium. That will probably drop them to fourth in class, but it won't cost them a position to the Porsches. So the 95 Aston Martin, now, they'll be relaying immediately to Marco Sorensen that message. So Sorensen immediately pressure off. If he goes, let him go. He's going to have to serve a stop and go in the next three laps. And that is a disaster for the 71 Ferrari crew, Davide Rigon and Miguel Molina. It's been a tough year for the Ferrari squads so far as well. Especially for them because uh, they were really in a strong position strategically in Silverstone and uh, got taken out by an LMP car, which effectively meant the season was done and dusted before the start with the competitive nature that we have here in GTE Pro and uh, now to be fighting for a win. However, this one was a, obviously a little bit self-induced. You can't sort of look to anybody else apart from uh, yourself in that respect. However, it just means that from now to the end of the season, the rider going to play complete support and backup 
to uh, the 51. James Collado and uh, Puyar Gidikar, or alternatively, they're just going to go all out gung-ho for anything that they can get. Half an hour to go. Settler make another driver change. Giorgio Sanagiotto has completed his driving time. And it looks as though the wind have gone out, has gone out of the sails of Miguel Molina. Um, we've heard that the penalty has been awarded. Davide Rigon, that's his reaction. Tough break, as you say. One car taken out through absolutely no fault of his own at Silverstone. A win on the road for Ferrari also denied uh, after the flag last time out in Shanghai. So that's two potentially strong point stores gone begging. And now this second place also going away from the number 71 car. Uh, under half an hour to go, seven and a half hours in the box. So is this the final drama? Yeah, well, no, probably not. Almost certainly not, <laughs> let's face it. It well, seldom no, is. Here's the battle for what is now second place. This might potentially end up from being what looked like a tough weekend for Aston Martin, end up as a one-two. Because Maxi Martin in fourth place, oh. right behind the 51 car, gets a great chance as a run, really slow out of the pit lane, comes to 47, settle our car, and that was close. Both the Ferrari and the Aston, nearly disaster. Half an hour to go, Maxi. That's Collado at the wheel in front. You can get him. But now you can get him. <laughs> I love mind games that the engineers play. The irony there, Come of on, course. Son. The settler car run by F Corsa. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was uh, Roberto Lacour going very, very slowly out there. Not only did he nearly collect the fry, but he really nearly collected the Aston on the exit of the corner. And just for a moment there, I mean, huge reaction from James Collado to somehow maintain momentum. But uh, I think that was as much luck as judgment, exactly where the Settler car meandered off to, because it could have ended up right in the middle of the apex at turn two, and neither of them would have got by safely. Molina on pit road now. Yep, this is for the stop and go, don't forget. So coming down the back straight right now is the 5197 train. There's the stop, there's the go. Yeah. He will emerge ahead. It'll be briefly more than 30 seconds I would think down the, in the pit background lane. there there in the background is the chasing pair yeah this is going to be tight well 30 minutes and they are still in second place and he will get up to speed and be clear of them but Ferrari thought they had the pace to beat the Aston Martin to the race win and Ferrari blimey you thought Porsche were having a tough day of it the 51 team manager has been summoned to the race director. So the 51 Ferrari is now in third. The 71 car is still in second. And by the way, the next car they've got to deal with on track, should they catch it, is the 91 Porsche. Right, OK. Um, I, I do, yes, I'm not quite sure how that's going to win. Uh, 91 Porsche, what sort of lap time is it doing? That's the car in fifth place, Jimmy Prudy, 158.2. Pushing on. They're doing 158, so it's going to be a long while before they catch him. I don't think they will. No, maybe not. Well, it depends on how it works in traffic, when the, what the Porsche's got left in terms of fuel and so on and so forth. And does anybody need a splash in the GT Pro class? Uh, no. No, OK. So they're all good on fuel. We heard from Jerome Blakemola in the GGM class that Team Project One were a little shy on fuel. They've been saving their juice for the last couple of hours and then um, the full course yellow saved their bacon because they could go in and get a sort of partly free pit stop done, top up, good to go.
inside the final half hour in Bahrain. Seven hours and 34 minutes raced. We have 25 minutes and change left to go. Jose Maria Lopez leading for Toyota. Toyota Gazoo Racing, TSO 50 Hybrid. First and second, number seven ahead of number eight by a full lap and more. Just one car, I believe, does need fuel for the end of this race. It's not one that's going to be in a significant position. It's the 33. Hard class racing, in fact, it does it as we speak. Yeah. Kenta Yamashita in the pit lane. And uh, likely that he will stay in with 25 minutes to go. Riding on board with Jose Maria Lopez. Down this sweeping turn nine into turn 10. Turning, 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 stopping, stopping, stopping. And right in front of him is Maxime Martin. And right in front of him is the Ferrari of James Collado. And not too far in front uh, is 71 Ferrari. That's actually only just up over the brow in turn 12. So the 95 Aston is about a third of a lap ahead as the number seven Toyota comes up behind that Ferrari. Number eight car in second place, Kaz Nakajima at the wheel. Again, none of the prototypes now. I don't think anybody else has any need to return to the pit lane. The one car whose pace is interesting at the moment in a podium battle in LMP is LMP2. Jean-Eric Fern is rapidly catching Will Stevens. Ah, very interesting. Will Stevens, a minute and nine seconds behind second place. And that's Jack, uh, Jocha's uh, Antonio Felix da Costa. And John Eric Van, 23 minutes, 16, 17 seconds. He better be catching him rapidly. He took 1.7 seconds out of Will Stevens last time round. Now, quite a lot of that might be down to who catches what traffic. But it's enough if he continues like that to actually oh, yeah. take third place from the Jackie Chan DC racing car. It depends how much tyre he started the stint with, how much he burns up getting there, and what he's got left at the end. There's the Jota Sport car, the blue and yellow car of Antonio Felix da Costa in second. And there is the G-Drive car, just gone through shot. So he's coming down the S's, and it's 37 is at turn 10. Incident between cars 51 and 97 at turn 10 under investigation and that was uh, the Aston Martin and the 51 Ferrari where the car was it 51 that ran it's out into the right, boonies yes. yeah, yeah and then took the place but then gave it back yeah. so okay I thought that was Molina yeah it was Molina that did that there's the 71 not the 51 yeah yeah so unless there's been another incident that we weren't uh, didn't see we weren't shown well, it says at 10 19 it is now 10.37 local time, so it's not hours ago. Alex Furtz, someone that I had many a battle with and many a discussion on the Monday morning about the battle on the Sunday afternoon. He's uh, overseeing a 1-2 again from Toyota. A slightly unexpected one in a way, not expected in terms of the result, but inspected in the gap, unexpected in the gap back to the Rebellion, which yeah. is now three laps back in third place. I think it would have had, had the first corner is and not happened, it would have been a very different LMP1 battle. There's Sean Eric Van coming across the line in fourth place in the orange, Goldie Orangey G Drive car. Car 51 must give position back to 97 because of the previous incident. Well, was, did, did we misidentify that? Uh, uh, Maybe did. I d uh, yeah, we. We thought it was 95 and 71. Yeah, so it's, po it's possible we yeah. did, but whichever way that Ferrari has got to give that Aston Martin the position, which means right. that Ferrari will drop to fourth and Maxime Martin will go back up to third place. Right. So we watched that happen. We Just watched now. the Ferrari drift out wide and come back on in front. Then we cut away to something else. Then we came back to an Aston in front of a Ferrari. And because there were two Aston Ferrari battles, the obvious there happened. We missed which Aston Ferrari battle we were looking at. Because unfortunately, the wretched things are identical in color, <laughs> so there was no easy indicators. Well, now, luckily, the stewards are cleverer than us. Place has been given immediately, by the way. So yeah. now we're to Aston Martin Ferrari, Aston Martin Ferrari. 
in the sequence of the happenings between car 97 and 51, where 51 overtakes beyond the track limits at T10, it is decided that car 51 must give the position back to car 97. Car 51 must give the position back to car 97. Now we obviously did uh, misidentify which Ferrari Aston battle we were talking about as they were both attacking each other at the same <laughs> yes. time. Well, let's hear from the Aston Martin team their comments on that. Or not. Okay, we've, uh, that one's dropped out of the system. Not to worry, the end result is Aston Martin are now first and third, Ferrari second and fourth. Doesn't help Porsche germanely as such, but who knows what the other four races of the championship might throw up. But we saw David Richards, the CEO of AMR, in the garage earlier on. He was on the grid. He's been here uh, for part of the weekend, and I'm sure he'll be happy. Uh, let's take a look at, well, this is the... Uh, here's the pass. Yeah, 51. Down into 9 and 10. Yeah, it is, it's 97 and 51. We saw yep. from the front angle at this moment, and uh, that's where the Ferrari came back on. And in my view, it was quite clear that uh, he had actually done that from uh, overtaking and gaining an advantage. This was earlier on, which uh, was the switch of... Yep. Sorry, later on, which yep. was the switch of position to give it back. So now uh, we have a situation where Maxime Martin is in third place, and now he's got 19 minutes to defend from what is going to be quite an angry James Collado. Yeah, very. Of course, yeah, what fooled us was he immediately cut, caught to the, uh, cut away to the other Aston-Ferrari battle where the Aston was in front of the Ferrari and we thought, oh, they've switched back immediately. That's very clever of the Ferrari driver. However, uh, it wasn't. It was just very dumb of us. Marco Sorensen leads from Miguel Molina, Max Martin third from James Collado. It's Aston-Ferrari, Aston-Ferrari in the top four, Porsche fifth and sixth in GTE Pro. So a few twists in the tail, I'm afraid, this race for both Porsche and Aston Martin. And that Porsche team with its driver lineups first and second in the Drivers' Championship and Porsche itself leading the Manufacturers' Championship with points and a half being awarded in under 20 minutes. It's not a weekend that they'll relish remembering with any great uh, fondness. Well, there's the 37 car, Jackie Chan, DC Racing in third place. Will Stevens, 14 seconds ahead of Jean-Eric Verne. So Will has responded. The gap has come down a little. Two seconds in about five minutes. It's not enough for Verne to be able to leapfrog, but also if we do remember the longer into the stints, the worst performance the, for whatever reason the G-Drive G yeah. has in comparison to others. So it's going to be a tricky one there. 57 you're looking at here with the purple mirrors. That is the Project One Porsche. And Team Project One have led this race for at least three quarters of its distance from pole position with a proper Superman triple stint at the start from their uh, gentleman driver. Ben Keating really setting them on their way. Great running qualifying from him and Larry Tenforder. They were jubilant to claim their first pole position in the series. And again, as we saw with Rebellion last time out, if they claim their first win, and we've seen from Racing Team Netherlands as well, then the jubilation uh, will go right off the scale. It'll be definitely an early Christmas present for everyone in the team. Second place in LMP2, Antonio Felix da Costa. He's still 70 seconds ahead of the third place car and 33 behind our leader, car number 22 of United Autosports, Philippe Albuquerque. And I don't think da Costa is going to catch United. Not sure that Will Stevens is going to be caught for third place either. So for Sam Hignett's Jota Sport team, that runs the Jota car and the Jackie Chan DC racing car. This could be 
a big result to end the first half of the season, to end the calendar year and to end the decade. I think if uh, that car finishes in the position of third, it will actually take the lead in the Drivers' Championship as well. But only from a couple of points away from Albuquerque and Hansen, who have really brought themselves back into contention. And I've got to remember at Silverstone, they stopped in the start and finish straight, went right up there as well. Yep. So it's been a heck of a recovery from United. And they had problems in Fuji as well. The car ground to a halt as well, didn't it? Again, when uh, Phil was at the wheel, I think. So but he still finished third in Fuji yes. and third in Shanghai. So yep. this is also their first victory of uh, their WEC campaign after what's been a sort of stumbling start. But yeah. Paul, I would, I think they've led nearly every lap. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, it looks like with 15 minutes to go, it's going to be a victory. And again, you've got to say that the car stopping out on track is not necessarily a feature of the team that's running it. So United Autosports, hugely professional. It might be their first year in this championship. It's not their first rodeo. I think they're a very well-tuned organization. Exactly. And joint owner Zach Brown is here uh, be nice for him to celebrate the end of racing in 2019 at least I think it will probably be the end of racing can't imagine he's going to any more in the next couple of weeks uh, weekends with uh, a victory and at the moment United firmly on target ahead of Jota Jackie Chan then G Drive Senior Tech Alpine in fifth racing team Netherlands they've sort of rallied after losing ground early on like G Drive did They'll finish in sixth at the moment. But in the GT Pro class, Marco Sorensen in the 95 Aston, 22 seconds ahead of air, of course, is Miguel Molina. And the Ferrari's got nothing in pace now, really, to show the Aston. The Aston, a two minute one lap that time round, clearly held up in traffic a bit, but uh, got clear air coming up in front of him. And there is the Ferrari, a long way back. Max Mar Maxime Martin, 6.4 seconds back. What was Maxime's last lap? A 59-0 to the 59-8. Near equal. Or 59-1 that time round of Molina, so he may not catch him. Now, there you see Molina coming into the first corner. The next car is that Aston Martin that's yeah. just going to be overtaken by the second place Jota in LMP2 with uh, Antonio Felix da Costa at the wheel. Now, interestingly, Maxi Martin, now he's free of James Collado, is pulling away from Collado and closing in on the second place for of Miguel Molina, but 13 minutes left, not enough. If he was right behind him, it would be really tough to unseat him from second place in a quarter of an hour, and he's not right behind him, so he may get close, but I'm not sure he's going to get a 1-2 result out of this. There's Zach Brown at the far end of your shot. Chief Executive of McLaren Racing, but also joint owner of United Autosports. And that's the shirt that he's wearing here this weekend. Uh, one quick point here. Uh, jean eric Verne is beginning to catch again, and pretty quickly. Uh, okay. Running out of time to do it, but it's going to be under 10 seconds when they get him across the line next time. Jeff likes a last lap lunge. Sorry? I said Jeff likes a last lap lunge. We all like a last lap lunge. <laughs> For a Silverstone-type finish. Uh, 22 there, that's United Autosports. jean eric Venn, the problem for him in trying to catch the third place car is he's got to unlap himself from the leader first. But then I would expect that there's a little bit of a radio conversation going to the leader, to Felipe Galbuquerque, to say, look, yep. no point fighting this one, just let it go, let it go. You've got a fair old chunk of a lead over to Costa. And uh, that's a Portuguese battle, because he's Albuquerque being Portuguese and the yep. Costa being Portuguese, so... Really? Yep, absolutely. And Antonio, we heard him talking to Luis earlier, saying, I'd love to beat Felipe because he's a fellow Portuguese. I want to be the best Portuguese in the race. Well, he's not going to get a chance to here. Top Portuguese, it would be. Top Portuguese, I, I don't understand. Can you explain that? <laughs> but uh, also, uh, worth saying here, by the way, it's uh, Jorik Van chasing what would be a second WEC podium for Aris uh, under the G-Drive banner. Uh, did that at... Uh, Spa last year for the only time. Yeah. Uh, the other quick one to actually point out: Golf Racing at the moment sitting third in GTM. First time they would have been on a podium if they make it to the line uh, where they currently are since Shanghai in 2017. When you say last year, you mean this year, obviously. Last season. Last season. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, this halfway this year, halfway next year through the winter racing Very confusing. thing. confusing. Yeah, no. Can confuse a simple man, and there are enough of them in this booth for us to be largely fairly confused. 
What's not confusing is that we are within the final 15 minutes of this eight hours of Bahrain, and Toyota still with a dominant race. 250 laps completed, and the leader still one ahead of the sister number eight car. Three laps ahead of the third place Rebellion. Here is our GTE Pro leader. And this is going to be a massive turnaround in the point standings in GTE Pro. At the moment, yeah. the 95 crew sit third. They would take the lead and take the lead by over 10 points. If you're going to win one, win a big one. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 92, by the way, would retain second place. 91. Uh, so it's uh, second place 91 would stay would go third right uh, but the 97 Aston Martin would close right in started this race uh, was at 17 points off the 92 car it right. would finish this race six points off and two points off the 91 so Ferrari for all the pace they've showed here and they may well yet finish second and fourth in terms of their results this season it's been a bit of a non-starter we're this is our fourth race of eight yeah and we've got more mileage and more points to cover in the second half of the racing than we have in the first, because we've got uh, points and a half at Sebring, double points at Le Mans, Correct. and only two single point races, or normal point races, at Cota the, and at Spa-Francorchamps. As Alan said, the bet that, in fact, the 71 car will overhaul the 51 car if it stays as it is right now, yeah. but it will be 38 points <sighs> off. Now that is, the top point score here and the top points score at Sebring. So to actually yeah. get uh, to actually get to the top, they need to win Sebring and no one else finish. Now it's they, however, who potentially might get 25 points back if they're 51. Un uh, 51 if they're unexcluded from Shanghai. Yes. Is unexcluded even a word? Great right. word. Is it's now. Oh, well done. That's at the moment, they are instated because they've appealed. So therefore, the result of Shanghai stands as it was on the podium. It's just uh, from there, we have to wait to see what the... Uh, Sean Eric Fern is going to catch uh, Will Stevens. It's now under six seconds. So unless that pace falls off massively, mm. he is doing enough to get there. More than enough to get there. Yeah, Eight, Will Stevens minutes. only in turn three as Sean Eric Fern turns into turn one. This is going to be... Very tough on Will Stevens. Nine minutes, let's say ten. That is well, it depends six where the laps. leader is. It depends where the does leader depend of where the, the leader race is. Yeah. leader as yeah. opposed to this particular battle. Well, no, like because it doesn't matter when the leader crosses the line, it matters when they cross the line. Yeah, but it depends how many laps. Yeah. Yeah, but they'll still be behind the leader. Leader's ahead of them, he's not going to lap them. Yeah, but if he crosses the line, one second after the time, then it's another lap. one, one yeah. second before. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But still, Will Stevens will feel the pressure. Will Stevens in turn 10, and there behind him, now in turn 10, is the G-Drive car of Jean-Eric Vern. He's been eaten up here, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So, G-Drive somehow have turned around their early tyre calamity. There's Roman Rusinov watching. Actually, he's wearing the face that he was wearing at the end of the race in Portimao in European Le Mans series. Wasn't he? Not entirely sure that that's going the way that he wanted it to. He was very disgruntled not to win the title again. But it was a very close run thing. Mm, don't want to be exceeding track limits too often like that, Jeff, because if you pass and then get a penalty, that wouldn't be very clever. 51. Oh. Well, that's our Italian on Italian, A of Corsa on A of Corsa. That's blue on blue, it's isn't Palado, it? Italian Palado, actually. Italian car, right, car. Italian car on Italian car, or Itali team car. It's both run by A of Corsa as well. Yeah, but that was... Yeah. yeah. For Ferrari and for Porsche, it sort of all slipped away in the most difficult way. For yeah. Aston Martin, they've risen to the top for, for uh, the other guys, and it's been a bit of a struggle today. They've been got in involved in incidents, some of their own making, some certainly have not, but at the end of the day, that's part of uh, the way the game is played. I know Paul Howth and the Aston team were working really, really hard to turn around their practice form and come up with race strategies that would somehow cover off their rivals who seem to have a bit more pace, and it looks like they've done a fantastic job. Six and a half minutes remaining. Lead is not going to be caught unless the engine expires now. Oh, I shouldn't say things like that. Second place is a lap back. Third place, two laps back. 
So our LMP1 podium looks set. Uh, LMP2 podium still up for grabs though. Uh, yep. Still catching him, but Will Stevens has responded. So is he saving what little grip he's got left? in those well, tires he's using what he's got left he and just certainly has get, take the whip to the horse you're in the final furlongs just give it everything better to go down slithering around with canvas than to go down meekly with enough tire left perhaps to have defended it in the end even if John Eric Van catches him he's got to get by and he won't have much tire either debris on track at turn one that'll be a bit of Delara bodywork somewhere there yeah, a bit of Delara mixed up with a slight bit of Ferrari I would say yeah see a tiny couple of bits of black specks there in the track yeah. it's not uh, in fact it's out of turn one on the way to turn two so I think it's quite a long way to drivers left there's a the race leader and sweeping up the hill avoiding running too wide out of turn four and then plunging down through the S's and drop some time that time around. So Will Stevens, 4.7 seconds ahead of Jean Eric Van. It is still very tight for third place in LMP2. A second a minute required. And a pass. And a pass. Yeah. <laughs> second a minute is a second and a half a lap, isn't it? In fact, it's nearly two seconds a lap. It's a minute 50 lap here, so. That's a lot to ask from Jean-Éric Van. I wonder whether he's asked just everything his tyres had to give him. Here's the third place car. Bruno Senna, Gustavo Menezes, Norman Nato. Senna and Nato jubilant with pole. And they were looking forward to a really entertaining race with the Toyotas and the Ginettas. But it all ended effectively in terms of competition in turn one, lap one, when the rebellion was spun round by a little bit of over-enthusiasm uh, by the Ginetta. The reality is the Totas did not need to push. Uh, that, that is the reality. The, the after, that, lap times tell the story. On lap times, the rebellion certainly had it, but we don't know how hard the Totas were pushing today. Well, what happens when we get to Cota now is Toyota will have maximum possible success ballast and performance inhibiting on both cars. Uh, doofers and uh, it'll come back a little to the Ginettas, more to the Ginettas, and a little to the Rebellion. I'd say there's going to be three laps left for Jean-Éric Fern to be able to get this done. Toyota, the leading car, has just gone across the line at, at four minutes to go with uh, one minute 50 laps. Uh, He's going to do a two, and then he has got the lap after that. Last, last time round, sorry, Graham, last time round, John Eric Van took just two tenths out of Will Stevens in the battle for yep. third. I think he two has run out of tyres. Here's the car that's in second. There's a Johnny Adams family watching on. Uh, ju so just notice the learner way. there as well. Yeah, the TF car has stopped again and has stopped for some little while. So oh. I'm not sure they're going to cross the line. Don't cross the line, no points. It's in the garage. And that is a disaster. Somehow they've got to get it to, well, you can't stumble around in the last lap anymore, can you? You've got to have uh, competitive performance as well. 71 Ferrari second in GTE Pro, ahead of the 97 Aston. And the 97 Aston is seven and a half seconds behind the Ferrari, so unlikely to be a change for that second podium spot in GTE Pro. Who's weaving because they've got muck on the tyres or sloshing around for the last gasp of fuel? It's the GTE Am leader. Hopefully that's trying to scrub some muck off the tyres going offline. Hopefully. He's, as if he's fine. If he's got any fuel surge issues, it would be coming up through here. Trouble for the cool racing car. That car has pitted. Yes, Nico Lapierre at the wheel of the 42 car. Maybe they've misjudged and needed a splash that they didn't get in in the full course yellow. It wasn't a long full course yellow. They may have been too far away to take advantage of it and just deciding not to pit in case something else happened in the last few minutes. Uh, Van has taken a further second out. It's 2.3 seconds now, but wow. under two minutes to go. There's Nicky Team watching over the monitors very closely. That's his teammate Marco Sorensen leading here, heading so far into the final two minutes for victory in the longest race of the season so far, the eight hours of Bahrain, and for a huge 38-point score. It's going to be this lap and one more by the look of things for the overall leader. 
and our LMP2 it battle. Could be two. It could be two laps. Yeah. He's about 10 seconds ahead of it. Yeah. So it could actually extend it to two laps, which would be a saviour, I think, for Jean-Eric Fern. It a saviour for Will Stevens would be if uh, the lead Toyota, which we're looked second car in this group, now overtaking, if it actually slowed off 10 seconds so that when he crossed the line, it was at zero. And the battle, Will Stevens is in turn six, Jean-Eric Verne is in turn five. There's the number one, uh, number one rebellion coming up between the two of them. And that may compromise Will Stevens' pace. Nothing is compromising the pace of the number seven Toyota, Jose Maria Lopez. So, Alan, you better trot off to the pit lane to go and talk to our winners. I think I'm we know... I'm not sure who it's going to be in <laughs> well, terms of the podium. I know who the winners are going to be. Pretty but not sure the who the top four are going to be, or the, the top one in each class. But, yeah, the final podium spot. That'd be a nice surprise for you. It is. No <laughs> well, they won't come nope. in. Second and third won't come in. 28 seconds to go. One more lap, then. It's double jeopardy for Will Stevens for third place in Jackie Chan DC Racing. Two and a half seconds is the gap. Stevens to Verne. Here is our LMP uh, GTE Pro class leader, the 95 Aston Martin. All our podium positions except third in LMP2 look to be tied in. And it could well be a last lap change after eight hours of racing, 256 laps for the leader. It could be a big change for the AMR mechanics heading to the pit wall. G Drive is in the pit lane, John Eric Van in the pits. It is all over for third place. Jackie Chan, DC Racing, and Will Stevens will hold on for third. G Drive, were they a smidge it's short fuel. on fuel? It's that last lap, it was fuel. It was where they, they, they what uh, stood to profit them also uh, ended the, the opportunity. Final lap for Toyota. And. Jose Maria Lopez heading towards victory here I in Shanghai and in Bahrain. I should tell you, though, the 37 car has done 23 laps. That If they've been in fuel safe, they could run out of fuel on this lap. Last lap. It will wow. be a 24-lap stint. So wow. as Will Stevens been saving fuel. Same as Thomas Laurent. He's on a lap 24. Well, Will Stevens. Same as the 38. Same yeah. as the 22. They're all running dry. They're all running on fumes, but not the Toyota. The checkered flag is out. The eight hours of Bahrain, as in 2017, falls to Toyota. Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi, and Jose Maria Lopez are are your winners and it is a Toyota 1-2. Last time here it was Buemi Davidson and Nakajima who won in the number eight car. This time it is their teammates who win in the number seven. Aston Martin's 95 comes home. Marco Sorensen brings home the Dane train ahead of Miguel Molina in the 71 Ferrari. And the 71 Ferrari uh, won here two years ago, and that was driven then by uh, Davide Regon and Sam Bird. 57 victorious and well-deserved win in the GTM class for Larry Tenforda, who brings it across the line for your own Blake Molan, and most especially for Ben Keating. The American claims his first European soil race, uh, uh, Arabian soil race win, his first world championship victory on the road. 98 Aston won last time and United Autosports claim their first WEC victory. Phil Hansen, Felipe Albuquerque and Paul de Resta putting together a great race after grabbing second in the first corner. There's a lot of people breathing happily again. Richard Dean in the headset, Zach Brown there, joint owners of United Autosports. Dick Hansen, and they, Hansen's father. And they end the year with a win. Toyota 1-2. Well, if you had to put money on anything, that would have been as safe as bet as anything else in a, a race that was always going to be severely tire limited, despite their lack of outright pace to Rebellion and Team LNT with that four-wheel hybrid drive off the corners, they were always likely to be in a better place in terms of tyre management. No last lap fuel dramas for any of those LMP2 runners. It does end United Autosports ahead of Joe and Jackie Chan, DC Racing to Goodyear. Shot cars on the podium, but not the step they wanted. 
the G Drive. Aris will come home in fourth position. Yeah. Aston Martin with their three factory entered cars, three podiums, including the one they wanted, the win in GT Pro. Yeah, fantastic effort there. First and third in GT Pro and taking second place in GTE Am as well. And unfortunately, TF Sport not counting as a finisher here. So after a really strong start to their season, their uh, shoelaces come undone here in the longest race of the year so far. Well, Mike Conway looks delighted with that. Probably almost as delighted as he was exiting turn one when the two cars in front of him speared off in either direction and he was suddenly gifted a lead that I think Toyota probably thought it would take them three or four or maybe five or maybe six hours to eventually win their way into the front. Picks up all that lovely, lovely marbles. Yep, increases the weight of the car, increases the ride height. <laughs> what's happened there? Uh, is he he is now turn? getting full lock on to go into the pit lane from the wrong end. And that is never an easy turn. Racing cars are not meant to do when he's going to have to go all the way around the RFID. And even so, that does not make it easy. Going down the pit lane to our top four podium. Greeted by the team. Yep. And the last LMP1 race before the hypercar era here in Asia goes to Toyota. Yep. And you can see Mike Conway there uh, <laughs> opening his hands going, what? What, are we chopped liver? He and Kaz Nakaji uh, in uh, Kabu Kobayashi rather having to chase after the car. Oh, I thought you'd never stop. Get the step count up. Yep. Well, the good news here is the car proceeds entirely on electric power. So he can smoothly roll away. Doesn't have to worry about firing the engine up, stalling it or anything else. Nice, quiet run down to the winner's area. There's Nicky Team on the pit wall. His teammate heading in. Yeah. Oh, hello. What was that all about? Hello. Little bit of uh, after the flag incident there between G Drive and Jota Sport. Not sure what Jean Eric Venn and Antonio Phillips de Costa were doing there. They're long standing rivals, of course, in Formula E, but I'm not sure that it's ever really come to blows. Big smile from Louise Beckett there, waiting to chat to our top three. And you can hear Alan Manish as well. He's gone straight to Mike Conway. The difficulty at the first corner, you find your way through and pulled a big gap on the leaders. This is taking you to the top of the Drivers' Championship. It must be a good feeling to end 2019. Yeah, definitely. Um, as you said, you know, a bit of a mess there at turn two and just managed to weed my way through and, and after that just push as hard as I could and try to get the gap and um, it was surprised a little bit that we, we managed it. I thought um, we'd be chasing right back down. Go down to pit lane with Louise and talk to Kamui Kobayashi. Jose Maria Lopez has just got out of the car now. Kamui, you you three deserve that one. Well done. Yeah, I mean, you know, we had a tough week in the beginning, but uh, I think we made it in the race. Uh, obviously, I think uh, Mike and Jose did a great job. I think we had a really great pace. Uh, I think absolutely, I think uh, great performance for all the team guys. Thank you. And enjoy it. Yeah, thank you. Yep, Kamui, very happy indeed. Here comes the 95 car home. Fine win again for Aston Martin with this new shape, new powertrain, Vantage GTE, the turbo-engined V8 car. United Autosports, Orica in the background, it's Philippe Albuquerque. It's uh, after the car and on top of the car to celebrate the 57 team you project more for us. Used to winning races with United in LMP2, but never a world championship race. There's Ben Keating on our side of the 57 car and uh, I think he might get our man of the race actually there's been some very impressive performances but Ben Keating 
I think for me, you know, to start the race and do nigh on three hours straight off the bat, all right, it wasn't 40 degrees, but on the other hand, it's not easy no matter what the weather is like. These cars are pretty brutal. Alan's gone off to chat to him. Louise lining up Nikki team. In the foreground are GTE Pro class winners, Nikki Team, Marco Sorensen. It'll be actually a third uh, WC race win in his career for Felipe Albuquerque after two wins in 2016 with the RGR Sports uh, team. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, multiple podiums. But you're absolutely right. First win with United Autosports and the first win in the current iteration of LMP2 in the WC. Will join, I'm guessing, what must be a very exclusive group of people indeed to be race winners in the European Le Mans series, the WC and IMSA. Absolutely superb. Marco, you must have thought this was going to be a one tricky race to take a victory out of and the way it looked at after first free practice. That's for sure. Uh, we came from kind of, kind of from the back uh, and it for sure was a hard race. Um, the brakes were kind of going in the end, so it was all about managing that last hour. So, yeah, just super happy. We jumped them in the pit stop. Um, and both Nikki and I, we were just doing whatever, whatever we could to, to keep it up there. So everything was on, on point today uh, and definitely a, a good race. Well, that's two victories in the last three races for your car and you're now leading the World Endurance Championship as well. So that's a nice little present to go into your winter break. Now, gentlemen, if we could all come together for a joint picture up onto the podium, if we could all close up a little bit for your picture and if we are ready, let's celebrate. Well, there's plenty of celebrating going on in the Kingdom of Bahrain. It is Bahrain's National Day holiday this weekend, a four-day series of spectacles, of entertainment, of music, of concerts, of shows, and part of that has been a spectacular eight hours of Bahrain. The winners, Toyota Gazoo Racing car number seven, Jose Maria Lopez, Mike Conway, and Kamui Kobayashi. LMP2 victory against United Autosports, the number 22 car of Felipe Albuquerque, Paul de Resta, and Phil Hansen. In GCE Pro, the 95 Aston Martin of Marco Sorensen and Nicky Team. And in GTE Am, the first win for the number 57 Team Project One Porsche, Ben Keating, Larry Tenforda, and your own Blake Merlin. The Kingdom of Bahrain staging the longest race of the FIA WEC in 2019's first part of season eight. The eight hour race getting underway with Bruno Senna on pole for Rebellion and the Janetta of Charlie Robertson alongside him. The challenge from the two second row starting Toyotas didn't transpire into turn one, but from the Ginetta it did around the outside of Senna, who looked to have covered him off, but the Ginetta driver spinning up the rears under throttle, catching the Rebellion as he too went off, and through went the number seven Toyota for a comfortable lead. A change right off the bat, Ferrari taking the battle to Porsche as the 37 Jackie Chan DC racing car spun off, safety car scrambled after a lap. Back to green flag racing, the number seven Toyota had been gifted a lead, it would never give up, it ran away. Second overall was United Autosports leading LMP2 until the Ginetta and then the Rebellion started to recover. Problems for Rebellion with gear shifting issues cost them two laps on the leaders, moving the number eight Toyota up into second. Night fell early, but nobody was calming down. In the GT Pro battle, Aston versus Ferrari versus Porsche raged on and eventually the 95 Aston ran out of tyres and holding up the queue became uh, a thankless task. 92 Porsche into the pit lane, then the 88 car crashing out, Alcabaisi at the wheel. That brought the first full course yellow. 
during the pit stops that followed, the 91 car's right front wheel was not attached properly. It came in a lap later and dropped out of contention. It was Aston versus Ferrari then for GTE Pro. As first one, Ginetta fell by the wayside with, it seems, transmission errors. The battle raged, seesawing to and fro in GTE Pro. The second Ginetta also transpired or expired with transmission issues as the racing continued in the GTE class. Aston Martin gradually clawing their way back into contention, battling with the two Ferraris. Full course yellow for debris and a final chance for some late race pit stops into the closing stages. 57 Porsche had been out front on pole in the GTM class and romped to victory. 95 Aston winning in the GTE Pro class. The number 22 United Autosports car won in LMP2 and winning by a lap, the number seven Toyota leading home a team 1-2 in Bahrain. Overall podium and also our LMP1 podium in third place, the team of the number one rebellion, Bruno Senna in the centre, Norman Nato and Gustavo Menezes offering their congratulations to the number eight Toyota team, Sebastian Buemi, Kazuki Nakajima and Brendan Hartley and our number seven Toyota team heading out to the top step of the podium. Smiles all round from Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi and Jose Maria Lopez. Kobayashi. All of his races have been won at the three Asian tracks. It's a 10th WEC win for Mike Conway, the second Briton after Ann Davidson to reach that milestone. And Pachito Lopez claims win number four of his WEC career. Not once has he been a double winner. He has won at Fuji at Shanghai at Silverstone and now here at Bahrain. It's six of those wins for uh, Mike Conway overall, the others in a stellar start to his WC career in LMP2. And the trophies on the first podium being presented to our overall winners by Khalid Al Sabah, the general manager of special projects at the race sponsor BAPCO. So our race winners with a big 38 points added to their tally. 27 points for second place. It's points and a half here. And in third place, 23 points going to the Rebellion Trio. And continuing the celebrations, that will uh, go on tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening will be the uh, prize giving and end of season party. Not that it's the end of season of this season, it's the end of season party for last season. Well, LMP1 looked like it was shaping up to be a fabulous battle between the rebellion that started on pole, the quick Ginettas from Team LNT, and the Toyotas. We sort of suspected that with the high tyre wear here, Toyota might end up with the advantage. But the advantage came just two turns into the race as Mike Conway, the number seven car, broke free of carnage 
and never looked back. And there is the result, Toyota 1-2, Rebellion in third. United Autosports finishing in fourth place, the winners of LMP2, the other top six cars, Jota Sport and Jackie Chan DC Racing. Uh, they finished in fifth and sixth, second and third in the LMP2 class. Aston Martin Racing winning GT Pro and finishing in third with the A, of course, the number 51 car, 71 car between them. And our Team Project 1 Porsche winning in GTE Am. The British National Anthem for Aston Martin Racing. Victors in the GG Pro class, they finished first and third. In third place, the 97 car, Alex Lean and Maxime Martin. And they finished behind the Ferrari of Davide Rigon and Miguel Molina. And the winners, Marco Sorensen and Nicky Team. Prizes presented by Mr. Abul Ramin Galoum, the Bahraini Motor Federation board member. And a double podium result for Aston Martin Racing. Team boss David Richards on hand here to watch the race and the celebrations. Six wins now in WC career for Marcus Sorensen. All of them with Nicky Team. Nicky Team with 11. Wow. Nicky Team's fourth win here in Bahrain. Starting to become a bit of a favourite for him. And for Marco Sorensen, it's the first circuit outside the UK that he's won on more than once. Second win of the season for the 95 car. Might go some way to making up for the disappointment of their late puncture in Shanghai. And it looks as though the Danes, and there's Alex Lynn handing over the bottle to his guys. And they're going to be a... <laughs> <laughs> Drop it in there, it's going to bounce off your chest, man. Safe pair of hands, the Aston Martin mechanics will enjoy a little tipple before starting to tidy up tonight. That could. After first and third. That could. Uh, not too much of a tidy up, of course, because the car will be out testing tomorrow again. Yeah, not, not too much of a celebration either, because the car will be out testing tomorrow. Driver's points, Marco Sorensen, Nicky Team leap to the top of the standings ahead of Kevin Escher and Michael Christensen. There's that Dane train again. Jimmy Bruni, Richard Leitz down to third. Alex Lynn and Maxi Martin up to fourth ahead of Davide Rigon and Miguel Molina, who have barely got half the points of the series leaders. So a big turnaround in fortunes for Marco Sorensen and Nicky Team. And Aston Martin Racing now lead the points chase ahead of Porsche with Ferrari in third spot. So Aston Martin drivers lead the points. Aston Martin Racing leads the points. Whereas Porsche's drivers came in 1-2 with Porsche atop the manufacturer standings as well. Points and a half at a double podium finish 
That's good news for Aston Martin. In the Drivers' World Championships for LMP drivers, it is the drivers of car number seven who lead their teammates now by eight points. Tutagazu Racing scoring strongly with 1-2 here ahead of Rebellion and Team LNT. Neither car being classified as finishers. That is a tough weekend for them. Well, let's now go to our LMP2 podium in third place. There's Will Stevens with the beard. Hang it. Well, one of those with the beards. Hanging on at the end on what was left of his tyres and clinging on manfully ahead of a charging jean eric Van. It's Felipe uh, Albuquerque and the United team who will come out last. In second place was the Jota Sport crew. And there are the United team. Felipe Albuquerque leads them out. Phil Hansen and Paul De Resta. Congratulations on their first World Championship win. God save the Queen has rung out over an LMP2 podium since Jota Sport won in Spa in 2015. And United Autosports, an Anglo-American team. But uh, Richard Dean there on the left, the team boss and co-owner, delighted with that. Felipe Albuquerque's first win since Mexico 2016, as you said, when he was racing with RGR, the RG being... Uh, Gonzalez. Uh, uh, Who's Gonzalez. in second place? Uh, yeah. uh, Roberto Gonzalez brother. in second place. Yes, exactly. No, brother. Brother. So beat the family, having won with the family before. Uh, should say, by the way, this is the third consecutive WEC uh, race that two of the four podiums have been filled by British teams. Yeah. And uh, so. it's, uh, it's going to be five new winners uh, in WC with two of them featuring on the top step of this podium. In fact, all three cars run by British-based teams. Sure. Jota Sport running Jackie Chan DC Racing, but that is, of course, a Chinese team. There's Gabriel Aubrey with Will Stevens, uh, the other bearded driver in the lineup, hoping to between them. And second place on the podium in the uh, blue and white overalls, Ant Davidson, Roberto Gonzalez, and Antonio Felix da Costa. So Richard Dean, I sense, is going to come off worst here by some considerable margin, not least because those are the clothes he came in and then the clothes he's going to have to go home in, unless he's got a spare set somewhere. He does do a lot of forward planning. That may well be the case. Fritz van Aert has meandered on. Uh, that's because... It would have <laughs> because been... there's champagne? No, no, because he was top finishing car with a bronze driver, I think. Yeah. A fantastic job by Racing Team Netherlands again. They finished in sixth position. And G-Drive's charge at the end, stunted by having to go for fuel. Penultimate lap or the last lap? Was it the last start, start lap? Start the last lap. Splash. Goodness they, me, they, that came close. They coughed at 23. Everybody else went for 24. So there you are at the top of the table. Gabriel Aubrey, Hoping Tung, Will Stevens for Jackie Chan DC Racing. Philippe Albuquerque, Philip Hansen up to second because, of course, Paul DeResta hasn't been in all the races. But Racing Team Netherlands, Fritz van Aert, Geerda van der Gaard. Again, they've been the only two who've done all the races in that car there. Third ahead of Antonio Felix Costa, Roberto Gonzalez. Ditto for having done all the races with different teammates all the way through. Jackie Chan, DC Racing lead from United Autosports and Racing Team Netherlands. So despite stopping in Silverstone, the car stopping twice during the race, but still finishing in Fuji, United Autosports having a great season so far. And now they've got into their stride. You sense they might have a really good time. Next time out, we're in the US of A. This is modern circuit with all the hallmarks of an old style track. Rising, diving, twisting, turning, off camber, tricky track to master.
end of February for Lone Star Le Mans at the Circuit of the Americas, our next step. Well, congratulations to Team Project One, to Ben Keating on the left, to your own Blake Merlin in the centre, and to Larry Tenforder, who has got the Dickie Bow race suit on now at the end of the race to stand up on the podium. Golf Racing take third position. A great result for the Porsche crew. Andrew Watson, Ben Barker, Mike Wainwright in second place. Runners up in the GG Pro class. Winners last time here. Well, Paul Dallalana was at least in the IT to Aston Martin. On the right of him in our shot is Ross Gunn. On his left, uh, on his right, on our left is uh, Darren Turner. They claim second place. But victory goes to Ben Keating after a heroic three-hour stint at the beginning. Well, now he's done that, he can do that in all the races, surely. <laughs> do three hours of a six-hour race and just allow... Uh, he do the heavy lifting, your own Blake Molin and Larry Tenforder. They claim victory here. Big result for them. A big, big win for three, the 57 car. Three first-time winners, of course, and a first-time podium uh, sitter as well in Andrew Watson. Well done there. First podium finish, as we said earlier in the show, uh, from uh, Gulf Racing since Shanghai in 2017. Tenth American driver to take a trophy in GTEM. The last one was Patrick Lindsay, who inherited victory at Le Mans because uh, he was uh, because Ben, ben Keating was, was Ford was disqualified. I love the ironies in history. Third win for Project One, first by Porsche in the AM class this season, and Larry Tenforder. Uh, winning for his first time in the championship. Second oh. race, of course, started yeah. last time out. So taking a win in your second start in a world championship. Some result there. Yep. And uh, first official win of the season for, or indeed, in the world championship for Ben Keating, your own Blake Merlin, and Larry Tenforder for all of them, their first World Endurance Championship victory. And uh, a great run to pole by Ten Forder and Ben Keating. Saw them start on the right foot and they never slipped. Ben Keating, your own Blake Molen, lead the driver's standings now, tied with Manu Collar, Francois Perodo, and Nick Nielsen. Darren, Torn, Darren Turner, Paul Dallalana, and Ross Gunn are third, ahead of Charlie Eastwood, Johnny Adam, and Sally Yollock. TF Sport not scoring here. The car did not finish, I'm afraid, and that's a very major disappointment for them as they slip down the order. Team Project One lead with the 57 car in the team standings ahead of the 83 F Corsa, Ferrari, and 98 Aston. And TF Sport now are going to have to rally, and the second half of the season has more points in it than the first half. This has got to be their only zero of the year. Well, that is it from Bahrain, from Louise Beckett, from Graham Goodwin, from Alan Magnus, from me, Martin Haven, and the whole WC TV crew here in Bahrain. Thank you for joining us. Join us again when we restart racing in 2020. A new decade, the second half of the season, and the Circuit of the Americas awaits. Until then, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays from all of us here.
Rondo, so he got his score. That was it.